what's up. It's no secret that the lore and world of Pokemon are my favorite parts of the entire franchise, and anything that adds to it, or makes you question it, is amazing. And while for the most part Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee were just sort of yellow remakes but with a twist, they still managed to add something amazing. And that leads to a pretty awesome theory, if I do say so myself. It could also mean nothing, of course. But where's the fun in that possibility? Anywho, let's just get right into it and take a dive into this universe-changing theory. Pika, pika, elbow. So, it all stems from one image. Throughout the buildings in Let's Go Pikachu, there are pictures of various landmarks from throughout the Pokemon world, specifically mostly from the Japanese regions. Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh. It's neat. But in the museum in Pewter City, there are images and artifacts from all over. The one we're going to be talking about is this one. This big poster. Look familiar? It's basically a diagram of the Big Bang, the huge event that created the universe. Notably, this begs all sorts of questions. Did Arceus really create the Pokemon universe? Or are the myths and legends of its godly power just that? Legends. And ultimately, Arceus then is just a super powerful space Pokemon, not a creation deity. That's how many took this image. After all, it's not like a god figure could have created the universe with a Big Bang. <laughs> no! There's sarcasm in there. Anyway, I thought while looking at this, it seems pretty different from most Big Bang diagrams that I've seen. Normally, the explosion isn't as apparent and obvious and pointed out. It just sort of flows with the rest of the diagram more. This Pokemon Big Bang looks like it's trying to get something across, like the designer's wants you to pay close attention to this explosion, because it does have a very unique shape after all. I mean, first of all, what's with the odd shading on it? Looks kind of like a sun with a moon going over it a bit, like an eclipse. Plus, it's the same shape as the Pokemon Sun logo, but again has the moon-like shading. Pokemon Let's Go does have a ton of references to other generations, especially Gen 7, Sun and Moon. There are already loads of theories around the internet about the direct connections between Alola and Kanto that these recent games have been making. It's pretty stinking awesome. But you know what this makes me think? It spawns a new theory about how the Pokemon universe may have come to be. Or perhaps how this specific Let's Go universe came to be as a separate universe to the traditional Pokemon games. It's well-established canon now that each Pokemon cartridge is its own little Pokemon universe, and they all relate to each other, but are still separate. Plus, there are timeline splits now. One universe has Mega Evolution and the other doesn't. Omega Ruby wasn't just a remake of Ruby, it was showcasing the events of Pokemon Ruby in the Mega Universe. Similarly, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee aren't just remakes of Yellow, they are retelling of the events of Yellow in the Mega Universe. Or so says one theory. But this image leads me to believe in a different possibility. One that we'll get to in a moment. But first, Let's Go is interesting because it does not easily fit into either timeline properly. Red and Blue exist and talk about their past adventure. So it takes place after those Gen 1 games, yet Cubone still misses its mom, and there's the ghost event, Giovanni still has a gym and is leading it, and is still ruling Team Rocket, and then he decides to leave it, and Red isn't the champion, and the list goes on and on and on. So clearly, these games can't take place after the Gen 1 games. Many of its events are unfolding right now. But then Blue and Professor Oak talk about their past adventures, and... Ugh! It just makes no sense! Unless... We look at this diagram of the Big Bang as the creation of a whole new universe, separate from the other Pokémon games entirely. In this universe, these events didn't unfold during the adventures of Red and Blue. Instead, they are happening now in Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. Red and Blue had different events during their adventure. This would possibly also explain the whole catching Pokemon difference. It's just so much different, and that's just because 
that's the way it ended up in this particular universe. You don't have to beat the wild Pokemon into submission anymore, or prove that you're strong, and they want to belong to a strong trainer. That's just not how this particular universe works. You just throw balls. He's good. It's really fun. But then, how did this universe split off? After all, it was the firing of the ultimate weapon that caused the first timeline split, the original universe and the mega universe. So what cataclysmic event could have triggered this new split? Well, here goes the theory. It was all Necrozma. This is the universal reset that the last few Pokemon games have been hinting to. So hear me out, as there is a bit of what if involved here, but it's all just a theory. Starting with the observational evidence, this Big Bang here not only looks like the Sun logo, but also a bit like Ultra Necrozma's head. The big bad Pokemon from the last game that could have brought an end to the Pokemon world if you hadn't stopped it. Necrozma's whole deal is that it's trying to absorb all of the light. Yes, all of it. It's basically the personification of a black hole, or perhaps a black dwarf, which is a star that has lost all of its light and radiation. This works well with its name. Necro means death, and Chroma means color. Color is light. Death to light. Plus, the Z is symbolic of the end, too. A is the beginning, and Z is the end. That's why AZ, or AZ, brought an end to an entire region, but started a whole new universe. That's also what Project Azoth was all about. Ending the world as we know it, to start it over anew. Z moves are basically anime finisher moves. Etc, etc. Symbolism all over. Symbolism. Symbolism. Tangent over. So, Necrozma apparently used to be Ultra Necrozma, but since then lost all of its light and now is trying to get it back. But doing so steals the light from worlds, possibly universes. That's what happened to Ultra Megaopolis. Necrozma stole all of their natural light, but it left to escape to the universe of Sun and Moon, where it continues to feed on light. In both the games and the anime, it was unable to just eat enough light to restore itself to Ultra Necrozma. It took outside influence, artifacts, Pokemon, and help. So theoretically, an entire universe of just light might not be enough to restore it. It took a tremendous amount of Z energy, infinity energy. So it theoretically would go around consuming stars, consuming all the light bearing things, and light by itself can't restore it. And it eats, and it eats, and it eats, and at some point, all that light energy needs to be released. This, again, is what leads us to the idea of Necrozma being a black hole or black dwarf. Near the end of the universe, black holes and black dwarves would be all that exist anymore. Stars that have burst and become black holes, or that have slowly radiated away and are now black dwarves. As the billions and billions of years go by, you may eventually have black holes pulling the black dwarves into them and then into each other, slowly forming bigger and bigger black holes. Similarly, Necrozma absorbs light and stars, becoming denser and denser. Eventually, all these black holes and black dwarves merge so much that it becomes too dense of a singularity. And suddenly, there is too much matter in such a small amount of space that a second Big Bang happens. There are several theories about how our universe came to be and how it will end, and that's just one of them. If true, though, there's no way of telling how many times it's happened already. We could be living in the first universe, or the millionth. There's no way of knowing. Existentialism aside, we now get to the what if part of the theory. What if Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee take place in a branch off from the Mega Universe timeline, in an alternate reality we didn't get to see? One where Necrozma continues to consume rather than be shown compassion and friendship and getting help from the outside in the form of the player character or Ash. Instead of that, it's continuously shown hostility. So it continues to just consume all of the light. Not just from Solgaleo and Lunala, but also from the sun and all the stars in the galaxy and all the stars in the universe. Maybe even the light given off by Arceus. Essentially, then, 
ending the universe early. All of the stars are now black holes or black dwarfs. Many of them are inside of Necrozma, who, eventually, can no longer contain all of that energy, so it becomes an Ultra Necrozma, finally, for just a moment, before it explodes in a supermassive radiant burst, essentially causing a second Big Bang. Necrozma, then, essentially reset the Pokemon universe, which my old four-plus-hour theory from years ago hinted at being a possibility. I may sound like a broken record at this point to my regular viewers, but again, that old theory was based on the alchemic and astrological inspirations of Pokemon as of late, after Sun and Moon, or Ultra Sun and Moon as we later found out, the Pokemon world will go through a reboot or a reset and will go back to Generation 1, but there will most likely be numerous changes. End quote. There's four hours worth of evidence summarized in a sentence, and that's literally what Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu are. And this poster about the Big Bang featuring an Ultra Necrozma looking explosion, I think, just solidifies that further. Even if this is just the Pokemon Sun logo, it still works. Big Bang happened after Pokemon Sun, reset the universe, and then the billions of years go by and once again we're during the time of Gen 1. We're back to Red and Blue's time. But the events are slightly different because it's just a completely different universe. And by golly, this is amazing if that's actually the case. Now I get that this is all just theoretical, but this sounds pretty awesome. And that's... That's about all I can really say, though. It's awesome. To the toppest degree. Is toppest a word? This, like I said, would explain all of the inconsistencies with Let's Go's story. It's a whole new universe. It also explains why catching Pokemon is so suddenly different. That's just the way it is in this universe. It also sets up Let's Go as a proper side series, still mainline Pokemon games, but in a different universe. Just like the Zelda timeline splits, or the Mario timeline splits. They're all canon, just in different ways, different timelines. And the gameplays are slightly different between them. Plus, I mean, Let's Go has sold amazingly, and honestly, I had way more fun with it than I did with Ultra Moon. Just saying. So it's very likely we're going to get sequels to this and such. So, if you've been avoiding it, maybe give it a second chance. It took many, many of us by surprise at how good it actually is. They did a terrible job marketing it. Sometimes you remember a fun fact about a Pokemon and you think it's neat. Happens to me all the time. Like, fun fact! Slacking is the most powerful non-legendary Pokemon. It has the highest stats of any. And upon remembering this, I figured a video on the line would be pretty neat. The whole line is actually pretty interesting. But like always, let's ask questions along the way. Why and how does Slackoth sleep so much? How does Vigoroth possibly symbolize an entire medieval empire? And why is it so hyperactive? And why is slacking so lazy again? Slackoff sleeps a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. 20 hours a day, according to the Pokedex. So assuming, of course, that the Poke world has 24 hour days like our world, then that's a really long time. That only leaves four hours a day for it to go and explore the world. Though at least that's not as bad as Komala, which sleeps 24 hours a day. Here's a video all about that. But I guess, considering Slackoth's origins, that makes sense. It's a sloth. Or a sloth, as a certain Attenborough would say. And some sloths do sleep 20 hours a day, but most tend to sleep 15 to 17 hours a day. Either way, though, it sleeps a lot, and it's also super cute. It's a little baby swoff. A swoff! A swoff of swoffs! And you know what else sleeps more than it's awake? Human babies. Especially young babies. The ones that are always laying down because they aren't strong enough to support their own heads because they're stupid. It's kind of like how most of Slackoth's art shows it laying down. <laughs> because it's stupid. Human babies also sleep about 16 or 17 hours a day, which is over 70% of their day. And this isn't the only way in which Slackoth is similar to human babies. Look at this cute sleeping baby. It looks so comfy and cozy and relaxed. Doesn't looking at it make you want to take a nap of your own? Slackoth's Pokedex entries in several different generations all say that looking at it while it's sleeping makes those around it sleepy too, just like an adorable sleeping baby. There's actually a hormone response that can happen. It's crazy. 
Though, granted, most of the time, you get really tired when your baby is sleeping because you finally have a moment of peace. Mmm. It's Pokedex entry. Slackoth's Pokedex entry, not the babies, also mentions how even when it's awake, it doesn't move around a lot. Young babies don't really move around much either, because they do not have the developed musculature needed to roll from their back to their tummy, let alone crawl around. After about four months, though, they can start to do that, and then at six to ten months, they start crawling. But until, like, four or five months, babies are very slothy. This is why we're all born sinners. I swear, you kids had better get that joke. Uh, anyway, at level 18, it evolves into Vigoroth, which is supposedly a sloth, but it looks more like a weird baboon thing. I mean, oh my god, Becky, look at its butt. Plus, baboons are wild and crazy, like Vigoroth. But besides the butt, the rest of Vigoroth does point to sloth still. And based on its name and design, you can tell right away that it's now a lot more active and awake than its first evolution. So continuing on with the human comparison, this is very reminiscent of children compared to babies. Once they start toddling around, they never, ever stop toddling around until it's bedtime. And even then, sometimes not. Just like Vigoroth, whose Pokedex entry says that it is always itching and agitated to go on a wild rampage. It simply can't tolerate sitting still for even a minute. This Pokemon's stress level rises if it can't be moving constantly. This is a lot like kids. My wife is a preschool teacher, and she can attest to this being exactly like most children. Children are constantly moving around and doing stuff because playing and moving around is how they develop their fine and gross motor skills necessary to survive. Especially since exercise releases serotonin, and studies have shown that not producing enough serotonin in childhood can and does negatively affect serotonin production levels as an adult. In other words, Forcing a kid to sit still and calm down constantly can lead, and usually does, lead to depression as a teen and adult. This is why recess and PE exist. This is also a theoretical reason as to why depression is becoming more and more common among our youth, because as little kids they're being kept inside because it's safe and they're playing video games instead of playing tag. Of course there's nothing wrong with playing video games, so just remember, moderation. Health is super important. Another Pokedex entry, Vigoroth is simply incapable of remaining still, even when it tries to sleep. The blood within its veins grows agitated, compelling this Pokemon to run wild through the jungle before it can settle down. Have you ever put a kid down for a nap and they're just way too jittery to even sleep? And then you chase them around the house a little bit, and then they're so exhausted that they're practically asleep before you can finish tucking them in? That's probably what being the trainer of a Vigoroth is like. Its heart beats at a tenfold tempo, so it cannot sit still for for even a moment. Notably, children actually have higher heart rates than adults. Adult hearts beat between 60 and 100 beats per minute, and children between the ages of 1 and 10 have heart rates of 100 to 160. It is always hungry because it won't stop rampaging. Children, especially when they are going through growth spurts, eat a ridiculous amount of food for their size, especially if they're active or rampaging, which most kids usually are. Even while it is eating, it can't keep still. Kids often bounce around even while they're eating, and younger kids, if left with minimal supervision, tend to wander away from the table when they are eating, even if they still have food in their mouth. You almost get exhausted yourself just watching how much kids move around, and this youthful vigor remains for years, though for many it does mellow out throughout teenhood. Now then, there is a lot more to Vigoroth's possible origins, hence the thumbnail, but we'll get to that after we cover its next evolution. Starting at level 36, it evolves into Slacking, which I guess is also supposed to be some sort of sloth. Most notably, it's possibly the Ground Sloth, which went extinct during the Ice Age. When standing, this sloth was six meters tall, which is crazy, and I can see the inspiration for sure. Though, Slacking looks a lot more like a big, balding Bigfoot with creepy bedroom eyes. So, then if Slackoth is infanthood pokified and Vigoroth is childhood personified, then Slacking is adulthood personified. 
its Pokedex entry tells us that slacking spends all day lying around and lolling about. Ha! Like you! Hey, compared to children, most adults are pretty lazy and laid back. Children exercise and run around for fun and just use up all the energy that they have way too much of. Most adults have to force themselves to do so, and many won't even do that for more than an hour or so at a time. We also aren't nearly as limber or excitable as children, which again is just like slacking, lazy and chill. It's even in the traditional Japanese dad watching TV with beer after he gets home from work pose. And yes, that's a real thing that's pretty common in anime. Wherever slacking lives, rings over a yard in diameter appear in grassy fields. They are made by the Pokemon as it eats all of the grass within reach while lying prone on the ground. <laughs> That reminds me of my grandma's old dog, Peaches. She would literally lay in the same spot for hours and hours with her food and water bowls within reach so that all she had to do was raise her head. And it was hilarious and kind of sad. She laid there for a full day one time when I was being babysat by grandma for two days. She just didn't move. Nothing was wrong with her except that she was ancient. I guess that's just the way things go. Anyway, this is a decently energy efficient way of getting food, especially if you're conserving your energy like slackings do to attack. Notably, we adults are pretty efficient at getting food and conserving our energy too. It's actually much easier to get fat as an adult than it is to get fat as a kid. It's actually pretty difficult and very sad. It takes twice, sometimes three times the effort to get obese as a child, and yet there's still obese children. It's kind of sad. I was a fat kid somewhat, so I can say that. You hush. Ooh, skinny privilege. Eee. But I mean, it makes sense, really. Kids are growing and usually run around like torchics with their heads cut off. The Pokedex goes on to describe slacking as the world's most slothful Pokemon. Ha! Reminds me of someone. <clears throat> However, it can exert horrifying power by releasing pent-up energy all at once. Adults are way stronger than children and know how to use our momentum and weight in our favor, even if we don't do it very often. Any fully functioning adult could beat the heck out of a pack of rabid children who don't know how to properly even use their bodies yet. It eats grass growing within its reach. If it eats all of the grass it can reach, this Pokemon reluctantly moves to another spot. Kind of like how most adults will just eat whatever's in the house almost until there's nothing left before going shopping for food again, especially as millennials. So why is slacking so powerful then? Well, that's partially because it's based on a Bigfoot monster and a ground sloth, both ridiculously powerful beasts. Though also, it's to balance out its ability, make it a fair Pokemon someone would actually use. Slacking's ability is that it only does anything every other of its turns. That sounds terrible, right? Well, to balance it out, it does have the highest stats of any non-legendary in the game. It's basic game design. It sucks because of its ability. It makes up for it because it's ridiculous. So now, are you ready for some crazy deep theorization about some further design origins of Vigoroth? That's right. It's time for a theory, a Pokemon theory. Is Vigoroth actually a Visigoth? Ho ho ho, dear viewers. You might think this is stupid, and that's because it is. But I mean, they may just sound similar. But get this, the Visigoths were a thing from around 378 to around 718. 18? That's the level Slackoth evolves into Vigoroth. Also notably, most empires stay in one spot. But strap those brains back into your skull, loyal viewers. It's the only way to prevent this mind blow. The Visigoths were a group of nomadic tribes. That's right. And you know what that means because you're our smart subscribers. That means they never stopped moving around despite being an empire. Much like how Vigoroth doesn't stop moving around despite being a sloth. Vigoroth? Visigoth? I think I've made my point clear. And hey, that's just an assumption. A game assumption for you to take as facts from now on. Thanks for watching. And never stop using your noggin. Hello everyone, it is me, Lachstin the Human. I'm sure you know that though, because it's my face on the screen, as well as my name in the lower third text blippity doodad. This is a super special mega spectacular episode today on Noggin. 
No, it's not my 500th video or anything like that. That's lame. No, it's about my absolute middle favorite Pokemon. It's in the exact middle of all Pokemon, to me, in terms of favoritosity. Rank number 401 out of 802. This is the opinion of most people, actually. I assume. Because, I mean, it's cute. But not super cute. And that's about it. It's cool, but not really. It's kind of lame. And we thought, why not do a video on this Pokemon as filler? Because why not? Sometimes we do need filler videos. The darn YouTube algorithms. Oh yeah, this Pokemon is so bleh that I forgot to mention it in the intro. That's right, it's Dunsparce! Everyone's roughly middle favorite Pokemon. And maybe you say you like it more than that? You're probably wrong. You're probably just saying that just to be pedantic with me. Ugh. Grow up. I mean, just look at this thing. Like, it's a cute snake fairy that's got a gross bug face. And it looks like a shoe. Actually, if someone were to make Dunsparce slippers, they would just be perfect plushies of Dunsparce. But why is this Pokemon a thing? And why is it just so... Eh. And yet... Yet it's not entirely eh. Like, it's a half eh. It's eh. Well, its odd appearance is all because of what it is based off of. The Tsuchinoko, a Japanese cryptid that looks a lot like a weird snake slug thing. Ooh, and that's a fun word. Cryptid. The word cryptid coming from the Greek word crypto, which means hide. So essentially, like a hidden animal, or an animal that we don't actually have any substantial evidence to support its existence. Kinda like Bigfoot. He's out there, trust me. Though, even in the age where most phones have better cameras than Hollywood cameras a decade ago, we still only get blurry pictures of it. But hey, we get blurry pictures of game leaks if we all believe those. You people are all morons looking to get hyped and then disappointed. You stupid. Hype is a mistake. Anyway, anyway, unlike Bigfoot, this thing is spooky. Well, as spooky as a creature whose name translates to Child of Dirt, or Child of Hammer, could be anyways. The Tsutsunoko is like a lizard snake of uselessness. Recorded sightings go all the way back to the 1400s. Wow, even Bigfoot didn't exist until the 1800s, so it's pretty old. And according to its legend, its appearance is that of a brown camouflaged snake, sometimes with orange stripes on the belly. So that's possibly where Dunsparce's stripes come from. It's also apparently like a snake, but fat. And I don't mean it's very round like some fat snakes are. I mean, I'm talking its body is thicker than its head and its tail, which is a hilarious idea. It's also very toxic and is said to be as venomous as a viper. So deadly, let's just say. But other than being a fat snake, it's not really all that odd. However, this creature is able to chirp. Unlike snakes hissing, it chirps like a bird. And along with that fact, it can also leap at you from three feet away. The so-called Child of Dirt is also known to jump a second time while in the air to catch unsuspecting victims off guard. Those who think they are safely far enough away to avoid its jump. They're not, as this thing essentially can double jump. So double jumping was like a concept made by Japanese people several hundred years ago, and that's hilarious. But wait, there's more. This creature has another trick up its sleeve. Well. Whatever snakes have for sleeves, anyway. This thing can bite its own tail and roll out to travel at you faster. That's right. This chubby Ouroboros can wagon wheel in your direction just so it can murder you faster. Wow. Gotta say, that's pretty, uh, impressive. So, how do we get a Dunsparce based on that? I mean, that means Dunsparce isn't even the right type. It's normal type. I mean, come on. The cryptid it's based on is venomous. Shouldn't it be poison type? Or maybe even fairy type now, due to its wings and fae-like features. Poison fairy is probably a really good type. Ugh. I mean, it's pretty odd that this Pokemon even got into the game. In the state that it is in, at least. Being such a... Useless dunce. It's so cute. But useless. And it's not even that cute. But at the same time, I guess this little cryptid thing is almost perfect for this game, I suppose. As a Japanese folktale creature, it just kind of perfectly fits. And the creature it's based on is also permeated into tons of other games as well. 
I mean, just like a Monster Hunter world. It has a fat little snakey boy. It's pretty cute, but not that cute. I'm gonna have to go look forever to find that one now and fill my house with them because they are pretty cute. But I don't want too many to fill the house with because they're not that cute. Well, back to the Pokemon Dunsparce. This Pokemon is rather, well, sparse. It's not all that interesting, but there's enough for a short video, I suppose. Our goal is to cover every single Pokemon eventually anyway. And the most notable thing about Dunsparce is that, again, it's just perfectly near the middle of everyone's lists of favorite Pokemon. Except for a few of you weirdos. Funnily enough, this video's editor wanted us to do a video on Dunsparce because it's his favorite. Ha! What a loser! Right? Got any other Pokemon that you think is like the perfect middlemon? Let me know down in the comments, and as always, never stop using your noggin, and I hope you appreciate these filler episodes. This is me waving a flag of... Phil. Oh, Chatot. One of the few Pokemon banned just for being itself. <laughs> Poor little bird. But I mean, the move Shatter was pretty complicated, and with the whole, you know, being able to make a uh, Chatot say whatever you want. <laughs> uh, it was a cool feature, but the problem is most people would just have it say profanities and racial slurs. So, uh, can't risk that at a tournament. Therefore, Chatot was banned. And apparently, I was super boring with my chat out because I was a goody two shoes little twerp back during the day, and my chat out just said, Hello, I'm a bird! I'm serious. It was sad. I was so innocent growing up. I couldn't come up with anything more clever than that. Look at me now. <laughs> but what did you guys make your birds say? Let me know down in the comments while the intro plays. Hope that was long enough for ya. Okay, so in today's episode, we're going to talk about this dex entry for Chatot. Its tongue is just like a human's. As a result, it can cleverly mimic human speech. Uh huh. That dex entry never really set right with me. Like, a human tongue? In a bird? First up, ew. Just imagine a bird with a big ol' human liquor sticking out. <laughs> Secondly, I don't think that's how parrots work. I mean, normal parrots that talk in the real world don't have human tongues, so why would a Chadot need a human tongue? Actually, let's dig deep into this. How do parrots even work? Alright, but first, before we get into that, I have a fun tale for you. I think, I think it's my dad that told it to me. When my dad was in his youth, he worked at a, as a furniture delivery guy, and at one point he was delivering some furniture to a preacher that lived in a church basement. And the guy had like an 80 year old parrot that would just yell, Praise Jesus! Hallelujah! And that's funny to me. But back to the topic at hand, real parrots don't have flexible mouths and vocal cords like we do. So learning how to speak human language can be challenging for our feathered friends. What parrots do have, though, is a structure called a syrinx, which is similar to the larynx at the top of the trachea in humans. This syrinx, which is located in the chest at the bottom of the trachea, can be used to speak human words along with many other sounds. So, as the parrot attempts to use speech, the sound passes through the throat and mouth and is manipulated by the tongue. Ah yes! The tongue! That little fleshy, sexy tentacle that always moves around in your mouth, and as long as you're aware of its existence, you'll never find a comfortable spot for it to rest. Fun fact! Did you know that the primary language you speak changes where your tongue is most comfortable resting? Makes sense as different languages use different sounds more often, changing the result of the location. Neat! So here's another question, why do parrots even mimic human speech? Well, there's also the Pokedex entry of, it mimics the cries of other Pokemon to trick them into thinking it's one of them. This way they won't attack it. And this is actually pretty spot on. Well, in terms of fighting monsters that fit into a small ball in your pocket. You see, parrots are very... very... really social animals. They need to flock to survive, much like people really need other people for their mental health. The reason that they even make noise is to essentially talk or relay information to each other in the flock. 
To quote some bird scientists, a single bird in the wild is a dead bird. It can't look for food and look for predators at the same time. So when you, a human, adopts a bird into your own home or flock, it needs to pick up on the language. It just so happens that birds have super special parts in their brain to mimic most sounds. I mean, have you ever heard a funny noise and then tried to recreate it with your mouth? I'm sure we've all made a raspberry to mimic a fart. Come on, we're all human here. <laughs> Birds, especially parrots, are just able to mimic really complex noises like our languages. And some are actually able to put connections to the words, like pretty bird is when it's getting praise. So when it wants praise, or it wants to praise you, it will repeat it. Oh, pretty bird, pretty bird. You give Polly a cracker while saying cracker, it will eventually associate the sound of the word cracker with it getting fed a cracker. So it will start saying cracker when it wants one. <laughs> Perry wants a cracker. Perry, that's supposed to be Polly. Perry also works. It's pretty apparent now that parrots are super smart, especially for a bird. They ain't bird-brained at all. So, they have a fancy voice box, but, uh, Chadot apparently is all about its tongue. So we've got some more explaining to do. How would a human tongue help this bird talk like a human? Because really, human speech is pretty complex. I mean, we have the whole respiratory system to power our voice box, and then that sends air vibrations through our esophagus, and then that is modulated by our tongue to get the correct sounds out of our mouths. The lips play a big part too. The biology of phonics is complicated. And clearly then, this is where the human tongue in particular is great. We may not have the biggest, strongest, or longest of tongues, but hot dang are we dexterous with them when it comes to speech and other things. And a good thing too, it's super important. I mean, even middle tongue deformities can render your speech completely different. And those people who get tongue modifications, oh man, do they sound different before and after. How the tongue works is that, well actually, here, let's do an example. Try and say, go, but really slowly and focus on the G. Go, go, g -g -g. See how your tongue balls up in the back of your mouth? Now try to say, K, K, K. Tongue does the same thing. Now try and say both of them, but with your tongue unmoving and flat at the bottom of your mouth. Go. G g g g k k it's hard. It's hard, right? Don't turn that into a gif, please. <laughs> Ultimately, you just end up saying O oh, or A. Eh. A! Eh! Thus, the tongue is definitely a needed tool to facilitate the perfect letters that we use. And it's not just English. Every language has complex movements of the tongue to change the exact way the air vibrates out of your mouth. So you could say that without a tongue, you would be silent. Which is why in the olden days of yore, the kings or priests that wanted to shut you up with your criminal blasphemy would cut out your tongue, rendering you basically mute. Now back to parrots, they actually do have very nimble tongues as well, and this small fact, along with their very complex voice box, is really the true reason they are able to mimic human speech. In fact, humans and parrots are the only animals to have tongues as advanced as this at all, though humans are still way more advanced than a parrot. Humans have a bit more of a production chain when it comes to sound, as we have it go through the vocal tract, which filters the vocal cord sounds to help create our phonics. It was actually thought that parrots just used their syrinx to make phonics by default, but their tongue is the one that helps create the more vowel-y sounding sound specifically. Is vowel a word? Hmm. Probably not. But again, the nimbleness of their tongue is quite good. However, tongue alone is not what makes human word sound. Don't forget your lips. I mean, pee. Piper is such a lippy word, yet we hear parrots say pretty bird all the time. Pretty bird. Those are some lippy moves. And that is where their super cool syrinxes come into play. So Chadot could really have a tongue that's exactly the same as a human, but all that would do is give it a wee bit more flexibility in terms of speech, and without lips, that tongue won't even help that much. 
In fact, it may actually hinder its love for eating bugs and seeds because of all of the humanness of it. You know, bird tongues are all stiff on purpose because it has to devour bugs and seeds. If it had a soft, fleshy human tongue, then ouch for one and ew for two. Realistically, Chadot would need the crazy syrinx that parrots have to do what it do. And it probably does. I mean, it's a parrot. But explaining what a syrinx is may have been too complicated for kids. I guess. So they just said human tongue and went with that. I suppose this is another instance of the Pokedex not technically being wrong, but it could have gone into more detail. Because if you only took the Pokedex into consideration here, it's probably wrong because that's not enough to do what it do. All right. Pokedex is written by kids for kids. This is the old theory. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little look into Chadot's interesting world. And hey, next time you hear a bird speak, just realize that it only wants to be in the flock. It loves you, or at least it wants to love you, and that's why it's mimicking you. I remember one news story years ago about a parrot that escaped, and when they found it again, like a year later, it spoke Spanish instead of English. As it turns out, it flew away, and then a Spanish-speaking couple had been taking care of it after it just flew next to their house. It only took like a year for it to pick up Spanish. <sighs> ah, Valentine's Day. A somewhat arbitrary day that we humans have collectively agreed symbolizes love and flour and chocolate sugar crap because nothing says I love you like trying to make your significant other obese. And really, we all know what Valentine's Day really is. Pointless, pointless commercialism. If you need the markets to tell you to love people, there's something wrong with you. But regardless of our late stage consumerism slowly leading to the end of Western civilization, Valentine's Day is an excuse to talk about the topic that best helps my analytics, Pokemon. And seeing as this is the most romantic day of the year, what else is there to discuss but our favorite flowery friends? Yes, today we will be discussing the Pokémon whose designs have been based off of flowers and the meaning behind their real-world counterparts, and just for fun, we'll be seeing if these two things match up with each other. But first, a quick lesson on the language of flowers. For many millennia, the more poetic and philosophical of us have found deep meaning in the colors and nature of flowering plants, and have applied meaning to them. You likely already know some of it, such as the symbolism of the red rose, passion, and love, romance. No other flower has such pop culture relevance in relation to its meaning in the language of flowers. But many are unaware that nearly every flower has symbolic meaning, and when combined in a bouquet with other flowers, you can deliver very specific messages. And all this symbolism is called the language of flowers. So, in summary of what we are doing today, flowers have symbolism. Does that symbolism fall in line with the flowers that some grass-type Pokémon have? Well, let's find out, starting with Meganium. The flower petals around its neck are inspired by the Geranium genus of flowers, which is where part of this Pokémon's name comes from. Geraniums have several different and sometimes conflicting meanings, such as folly, stupidity, gentility, ingenuity, melancholy, bridal favor, unexpected meetings, expected meetings, preference, and true friendship, all depending on the colors used. The pink variety, the ones used on Meganium, are said to be good in love potions. Yeah, love potions. The, uh, the language of flowers can get pretty hippy dip. But Meganium as a species does line up well with gentility and true friendship. It's a starter Pokémon, after all, and it also fits as it's a peaceful creature that is often found trying to de-escalate potentially violent situations. Though the games and anime don't exactly show this kind of behavior, it's just mentioned. Also, every Pokédex entry on Meganium describes it as having a breath that can be used to revive dead plant life. While the real-life Geranium is incapable of this because it's just a plant, the petals do release a sweet-smelling aroma when touched, which may match up with descriptions of Meganium's breath. 
who's going around and just smelling Meganium's breath. Next up is Sunflora. This Pokemon is based off of, if you couldn't tell, the Sunflower. The Sunflower symbolizes adoration, happiness, loyalty, and longevity. Attributes that are also contributed to the flower's namesake, the sun. Though I hear that despite these flowers being considered happy, they make Lucas quite sad. I wonder why that is. I hope we can find out someday, Nintendo. Either way though, Sunflora is happy as heck like always. Almost never not smiling. Nice! Next, let's discuss Badoo and all the symbolism behind the Rosebud, which symbolizes beauty, youth, and a heart of innocent love. Now, Badoo being a Rosebud clearly is youthful, so there's that, but how do its evolutions hold up? The roses, as seen on Roselia and Roserade, one of my favorite Pokémon, symbolize love, honor, faith, beauty, balance, passion, wisdom, intrigue, devotion, sensuality, and timelessness. And on top of that, the different colors of a rose offer even more meaning. For now though, let's stick to the relevant information. The red rose is the ultimate signifier of true love, and has been used as such across Western culture, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Now as for the blue rose, funny thing, blue roses can't be found in nature, but they do exist. They are usually white roses that have their petals dyed. Now as for their meaning, they symbolize royalty, attaining the impossible, mystery, rarity, and an imaginative look on life. Perfect then for this unnatural beauty, and perfect for the masquerading rose that is Roserade. Such parties were reserved for the noblest of nobles, so quite frequently royalty, and the masks add a sense of mystery, hiding the true identity of those at the party. So it all works. Now on to Lilligant and the Lily. The Lily is said to represent royalty and regality, motherhood and fertility, purity and the beauty of youth, passion, drive, renewal, and rebirth. It's also an interesting flower, as the perennial lily flower never truly goes dormant. The flower has always been held in a high regard since the ancient Greeks and Romans, who would often include the flowers in many myths and legends. The color of lily, specifically used for Lilligant, means good healing and health. Which works really well! Lilligant is said to be able to soothe body and mind with its scent, and you can even eat its leaves as stated by the Pokedex. The leaves on its head are very bitter. Eating one of these leaves is known to refresh a tired body. Sure, that's its previous evolution, Petalil, but if it can do something like that, then context says when it evolves it can still do it. You know? Now for Skip, Loom, and Jumpluff, who are based off of the Dandelion Flower, which is meant to represent healing from emotional pain and physical injury, spiritual and emotional intelligence, the warmth of the rising sun, along with lasting happiness, surviving difficult trials and tribulation, and wish fulfillment. Good chance you knew about that wish thing, because dandelion wishing is still common! Now besides maybe the happiness, because they're always just happy and carefree, there's not much else to really connect these meanings with the Pokémon. Now, Florgis is basically a walking hyacinth, which itself represents engagement in sport and rashness. But again, color context. This Pokémon comes in many colors. The red hyacinth means recreation, as in recreational activities. The yellow means jealousy. Blue is serenity, and white means loveliness and prayers for others. And there doesn't seem to be a specific meaning for orange, as orange hyacinths don't exist, apparently. And based on what we know about Florgis, these meanings don't really hold up. <laughs> At all, do they? Florgis is all about protecting gardens and living a long time and decorating things. Not one of those colors really fits, besides maybe white and its loveliness. Hmm. But how about its previous evolutions? Flabebe and Floette also have flowers of many colors, and they seem to be about as generic as you can get. They seem to most closely resemble this family of flowers, pronounced, uh, oh jeez, I didn't look it up. Kiss to say ye, sis to say ye. Anyway, five round petals, multiple stamens, a round pistil, and all that. As well as being European and coming in a wide variety of colors, they are also known as rock roses, and they symbolize popular favor, essentially meaning generically good. The general public sees them as good and approves of them. Wow, 
These flowers can also say, your beauty enchants me. And they can also stand for strength and long suffering despite being beautiful. Works well, as these flowers are known for being able to survive summer heat and frozen winters and droughts and they don't need pesticides. This symbolism works a decent bit, as despite their small, beautiful stature, these Pokemon are plenty powerful. There is also a special Floette that we see, one belonging to Az. 3,000 years ago, this Floette died and was resurrected. It has a special coloration itself, white and blue, and it carries a special flower too. This flower is fictional, but it most closely resembles the Red Trillium, which is said to invoke blood and incarnations, as well as birth, as it brings spring with it. Notably too, this fictional flower shares design elements with Eveltal, the legendary Pokemon of death and destruction, which was introduced in the same game, along with Xerneas, the Pokemon of life, which shares some coloration with this special floette. This is all about death and rebirth, which the Trillium in a way symbolizes too. Alolan Klefki, I mean Comfy, isn't a flower itself. Rather, it likes to pick flowers and make lays out of them. Essentially, necklace rings of flowers. They are given out in times of celebration and greeting. Any occasion, really. Office promotions, graduations, birthdays, arriving in Hawaii. It is a symbol of the culture of the Hawaiian people, as they've been giving out lays since the ancient times. And similarly, that's what Comfe is all about, making people happy by giving them a lay. Now on to Maractus, which is another just absolute favorite Pokemon of mine. Maractus has a design based off of the cactus, and therefore has cactus flowers. The cactus flower is used to relay concepts of lust and sexual attraction. Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned that it's a favorite of mine. But it also symbolizes the loneliness of the desert, endurance regardless of pain, protection from danger, the warmth and care from a mother to a child, chastity, and abstinence from physical contact. Some interesting and contradictory meanings here. Those last few make sense though, as you can't exactly hug a cactus, so that symbolism fits, I guess. Perhaps also Maractus's more feminine design compared to the other cactus Pokemon also plays a role here with some of that earlier symbolism, but nothing in its symbolism seems to imply rhythm, dance, or music, which is what this Pokemon is all about. Shame. Cherim, specifically in its sunshine form, is a cherry blossom, also known as the Sakura flower in Glorious Nippon. This lovely flower is a staple in all of your anime, and I mean it really... Are you even watching an anime if there isn't a scene with cherry trees? Or those dang cicadas? Anywho, the Sakura flower has been a symbol of remembrance of the short-lived beauty of youth, as shown by the flower's ability to bloom every spring, only to perish quite fast afterwards. Because of its repeated blooming, this tree is also a symbol for rebirth. This kind of goes along with Cherim, as it goes between two forms all the time based on the weather. Goes from a looking down, kind of bummed out, kind of old thing to youthful and cheerful and full of energy only to become old and down again. So it works. It also works well with Sawsbuck and Deerling. They change with the seasons, and in spring, they too have cherry blossoms. Shaman has a special connection to flowers, so much that Game Freak made up their own flower for it, the Gracidea. However, this flower shares quite a bit of similarities to the Chinese hibiscus flower. However, while the hibiscus is a symbol of courage, rapid growth, and life, which would tie in very nicely to the transformation of Shaman into its sky form and its character development in its movie, the end game flower, however, means thankfulness or gratitude. Also, I just noticed it's kind of spelt like gracias, which is thank you in Spanish. I'm glad those two years of Spanish class are helping me here. And Shaman is the gratitude Pokemon, after all. However, according to the language of flowers, hydrangeas are the most common flower associated with thank yous and gifts of appreciation. And while not perfect, they do kind of look like Shaman's flower. Maybe if you squint. The next two Pokemon are Venusaur and Vileplume, as both have kind of similar flowers upon them. Though Venusaurs may not actually be a flower, but rather a flower-like tree. So, maybe this doesn't apply at all. But the petals and size make me think that it is possibly based off of the Rafflesia. And then Vileplume is very much, for sure, that. The Rafflesia is also known as the Corpse Lily because, well, it reeks to high heaven, it smells like a corpse. The reason is to attract not bees, but flies to pollinate it. However, the Rafflesia isn't really part of the language of flowers. 
Maybe because it's barely a flower to start with. It's more of a parasitic attachment that happens to have a flower shape. So... Yeah, there's no, there's no symbolism for it. Besides, maybe if we made up some of our own, it symbolizes death because it smells like a freaking corpse! Same thing with Bellossum. It's a hula dancer with smaller Rafflesias on it. Specifically, the Rafflesia kaithi, which similarly is a parasitic flowering plant with no meaning in the language of flowers, or otherwise. And to ramp things up, as this is like my favorite fun fact in this video, let's discuss Fomantis, Lorantis, and the Orchid. A fun fact is that these Pokémon are based on the Orchid Mantis, a praying mantis that looks like an orchid so that it can hide amongst orchids to catch prey. Except, these Pokémon are not bug type. They are just grass type. This is where the faux part of faux mantis comes into play. It's not actually a mantis. It's not a bug trying to look like a plant, like the mantis orchid. It's a plant, an orchid, trying to look like a bug. It's the reverse. It's hilarious, and I love it. Anyway, the orchid has been attributed to love, beauty, fertility, refinement, thoughtfulness, and charm. Green orchids mean good fortune, blessings, good health, nature, and longevity. Pink symbolize grace, joy, and happiness, but also represents innocence and femininity. The pink orchid that is these Pokemon then fits. The Pokedex entry states that its elegant appearance has led some to call it the most glamorous grass Pokemon. Thus, it has grace. And even the shiny coloration works, which is why I love it so much. The green orchid? Good fortune and longevity? What else do you call shiny hunting? And with all that said, there you go. The language of flowers. Such a beautiful thing, applying meaning to plant genitals and all. So peaceful and wonderful. Perfect for this time of year, or any time of year. Why prioritize dates? Live, love, and life, as always. Don't care about your grammar. But yeah, live life and love life always, not just at specific times of the year. Somewhat commonly known fun fact! Pikachu wasn't the original pick for the mascot Pokemon. Originally, it was Clefairy. But just how factual is this fun fact? I mean, you can't believe everything you read on the internet. I mean, could you imagine? Just think about health articles. One week, the article is, Scientists find that chocolate is good for you. And the next week, Scientists find that chocolate causes cancer. Both were done by scientists, so it must be science! And the media always takes science as factual, but then you actually dig in and read the studies they were referencing. One analyzed a large group of people over a few years, the other looked at 12 mice for a week. I wonder which one is more true! The media doesn't care. Media just wants clicks. So, what is the real story behind this Clefairy claim? Is it completely factual, or is it all just a clefable? So, where to even begin with this? How about the beginning? Pokemon Red and Green released in Japan February of 1996, and back then there wasn't really a mascot Pokemon at all. Pikachu only appears in the first commercial for under half of a second, just as a mix of all the other Pokemon. If anything, Charizard seems to be the main mascot. It's on one of the boxes and opens the commercial even. But that doesn't point to it being Clefairy now either, does it? But what does, however, is the very first Pokemon manga. Pokemon Pocket Monsters, which released in April of 1996, just a few months after the launch of the game. This manga is very weird, but it was early Gen 1. Pokemon wasn't all that established and fleshed out yet. They didn't have a concise world. Uh, but just for reference, Pokemon looks could vary wildly. I mean, look at this Charmander. Also, in this manga, Pokemon can talk and even evolve backwards. Huh. And notably, in this manga, Red doesn't get a Pikachu. At least not at first. His first Pokémon that then becomes his main Pokémon, and the main character of the manga, is his Clefairy. His oddly masculine, super rude and super crude Clefairy. I should mention that this manga series is a comedy. Mainly slapstick and crude humor. It entirely revolves around this Clefairy. I mean, look at it. You can tell that, like, it's a perverted Danny DeVito kind of character. 
it's great. But like I said, Red eventually does get a Pikachu, but it's only slightly more important than his other, other Pokemon, and still comes nowhere close to as important as Clefairy. It wasn't until a year later, April of 1997, that the anime came out in Japan and pretty much solidified Pikachu as the mascot. But up until that point, Clefairy basically was the mascot, I suppose, but only somewhat more than Charizard. This can't be the only reason people say it used to be a Clefairy, there's got to be more to the story. And there is. This book, Pikachu's Global Adventure, is a documentary book focusing on how Pokemon became the massive media franchise that it is, and how it's beginning to fail. Notably, this book came out in early Gen 3, which... Gen 3 wasn't selling nearly as well as the first two Gens, so at the time it looked like Pokemon was gonna die and Gen 3 was gonna be the last one, so... Context. Anywho, on top of documenting all this, it also has interviews detailing some insider secrets that hadn't been revealed publicly at the time yet. And one of the included statements detailed that there was no main Pokemon character back when the games were made, but Clefairy was specifically chosen to be the main Pokemon character for the manga series that launched soon after. And then, it eventually was swapped out for Pikachu in the anime, specifically in an attempt to attract younger female viewers, as well as their mothers. In their eyes, Pikachu was much cuter and cuddlier, and better reflected the idea of a cute pet, making the character more familiar to child viewers. And one of the biggest reasons, Pikachu is yellow. At the time, the only other big yellow character was Winnie the Pooh. So, from a distance, Pikachu stands out amongst a crowd of pop culture characters. So it's good for branding. Curious how the whole pink is for girls, boys think it's icky didn't come up. But just remember, that's because it's Japan. Especially at the time, they had a vastly different culture compared to the West. Anyway, that's not the only other source. There's also this article by the Yomiuri newspaper, which was all about the origin of Pikachu's design which includes interviews, and to summarize it down to its most important parts, Pikachu was entirely just another Pokemon in the beginning. In fact, Pikachu wasn't even a mouse until after the design was finalized. Now that's a fun fact. Also, there were only three Pokemon designers at the time, and they were good at making cool designs, but they were having trouble making the cute ones. So they hired on a Miss Atsuko Nishida. Pokemon needed a woman's touch, after all. And with the new improved team of designers, they started designing more cute Pokemon, including Clefairy, who even got a mountain story around it to emphasize it and push its branding more. Clefairy's cool. It's basically the mascot got its own little story arc in Pokemon game. So then, at the time, it's clear to see that Clefairy was more important than Pikachu. Especially considering how rare they decided to make Pikachu. It was sort of to hide the Pokemon and keep it exclusive to those willing to look for it. They did this because they liked the design so much, they wanted to make it special. Many people can go through Viridian Forest and not even see one. You gotta look for it if you want this cute thing. So ultimately, it all came down to marketing and business. They needed Pokemon to have a face, a mascot, and they needed it to be a Pokemon that appealed to most people and stood out as a mascot character. And Clefairy was not that. And with the release of the anime and Pokemon Yellow, Pikachu was basically solidified as the truest of the Pokemons. So, I hope you enjoyed this little history lesson. Got any other Pokemon questions? Let me know down below, and until next time, you never stop using your noggin. Yeah, it's good for you. Pikachu, Pika Pika, Pika Pika, Pika, Pika Pika, 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 Pika. That was probably loud. Eevee is never going to get another evolution. That's right! Unlike literally every other Poketuber coming up with the same gosh darn concepts for new evolutions that everybody else is, I, Loxton the Magnificent, am going to go against the grain and say Eevee isn't going to get a new evolution. No, in fact, Eevee is done. Dead. At least to me. And maybe to some other people, who knows? Eevee has to be one of the most weird and wonky Pokémon that this series has ever had. I mean, a generic cat, rabbit, dog, fox with a mane? Now that's original! 
Plus, Eevee actually has an interesting evolution scheme. I mean, it changes what it evolves into based off of in-game items, events, and locations. It utilizes almost every evolution mechanic, minus just a few, mainly ones that involve trading and that cool Malamar upside down thing. Is there even any other Pokemon that does that? No. No. If Eevee did do that, I wonder what type it would be. Probably Ghost, because you inverted its world and the opposite of life is death! So clearly, Eevee's not a one-trick pony. It's an eight-ruse dog. Puns aside, I really can't see Eevee ever evolving into any of the remaining types. Sure, there are plenty of Fakemon for the other types, but I feel like what we have now is all there will ever be. That's why they released that super celebrate Eevee statue. It'd be really rude to release that and then a few months later announce a new one for Sword and Shield. Rude. But don't worry, there's way more evidence for it that I will explain in a minute. But right now, the only evolution left that even seems feasible in my eyes is Dragon. And I doubt they would just drop that one in any old game. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen in Sword and Shield. I mean, dragons are pretty important to European myth and such. And really, why would they have waited so long to add another Eevee? I know all of you people out there love patterns, so why would Game Freak break their pattern with Sylveon? And only release one new Eevee? And it just happens to be of the one new type they added. Hmm? Well, maybe, until Fairy was introduced, they were out of types. Yes, I know, there are like nine other types if you count normal. I mean, that's half of the types. But hear me out, there is a neato little factoid that is the basis of most of all of this. All of the evolutions share one thing already. Prior to Gen 4, all of the evolutions, all of the types that they were, were considered special types, as opposed to physical types. For those of you who don't know what that means, I'll explain. You see, before Generation 4, instead of moves individually being either special or physical, entire types were special or physical. This defines how the Pokémon attacks. If it attacks with its body, like a punch, or if it hit you with magical powers, like a flamethrower, physical or special. There are a few exceptions to this rule, like Earthquake, but they are just that, exceptions. Please leave it at that. This is also how you determine what stat the Pokémon will be utilizing. The special attack stat affects moves like Flamethrower, but not Fire Punch, which is based on attack. And the defender uses their defense or special defense to block based on what that attack was. This is the current system, but prior to Gen 4, rather than basing this physical or special attack distinction on individual moves, it was based on the type of the move. Each type was considered a physical type or a special type. Most of these make sense. Rock, steel, fighting, clearly physical. Fire, electric, water, clearly all special, as even now the majority of moves in that type are special, not physical. The only one that doesn't make a ton of sense at first is Ghost. <sighs> I'm serious, before Gen 4, every single Ghost type move was physical. Uh, well, no, that was a little misleading. You see, every damage-inflicting move was physical. All the other moves were status-inflicting moves, which are neither special or physical. And the ghost type is mostly status-inducing moves. Another type that was only physical that was kind of odd was poison. However, it's not nearly as hard to figure out as to why that is compared to ghost. You know, those semi-corporeal beings that can just phase through objects. <laughs> yeah, completely physical. But technically, yeah, there was one more physical damage dealing move than special. So it's a physical type. Now getting to Eevee, it's been every special type there is. And I think there's a good reason for it. Every way it evolves is special. That's right, there isn't one evolution that evolves normally. Think about it. The first three are evolved with a stone. Those stones are crazy magical. The next two are evolved by the powers of the sun and moon and friendship. Last time I checked, being outside in the sun and loved can't turn you into a psychic. It's clearly special magic. 
And last but not least, the two that need to be near ancient sites of power, i.e. mossy rocks and icy stones. Oh wait, uh, I always forget the last one. Sylveon, again, it's the same argument as the Gen 2 ones. Oh, it's affectionate and it knows a fairy move? It evolves into Sylveon. Last time I checked, if I really loved my Onyx, who happens to know Toxic, it wouldn't evolve into a poisonous snake. <laughs> Imagine a naked Steelix! Ew. So, the types that are left are the types that you know there's a good chance Eevee's never going to be, otherwise known as the physical types. First off, normal. I mean, Eevee is already normal. A second evolution that's just normal would be odd to add this late into the series. I mean, wouldn't it essentially just be its true form? Wouldn't Sylveon or Umbreon or Espeon be closer to its true form, one that is happy and loved? Or is being happy and loved not the true form of life? <sighs> Let's avoid an existential crisis and continue with the video. All of these types, steel, rock, Bug, ghost, poison, dragon, ground, fighting, they all don't really scream small fluffy mammal that's cute, which is what Eevee and its evolutions are. Plain truth over here, kiddos. They are factually cute. I mean, what are you gonna do? Just slap armor plating onto your rabbit fox and call it a new Pokemon? I mean, I know Game Freak is lazy, but I would hope not that lazy. Though, you know, I have always wanted a ghost Eevee that you evolve with just like a large rock that you drop onto your Eevee. <laughs> Boom. Ghost type. Nah, these types, they all fit a different theme. I mean, they already are. They are physical, not special. But they also better fit cool or rad, as the kids say. These types do not cute fluffy things so easily. And while a lot of Fakemon fan art have good designs of what an Eevee of those types could look like, None of them really fit the official theming. Or, much more importantly to Pokémon these days, the branding of Eevee and its evolutions. So this is where I add a fun little theory proposal kind of thing. We ain't getting any more evolutions, but that doesn't mean we can't get a new Eevee. A new Pokémon that shares the same gimmick as Eevee, but using the physical types instead of the special ones. Now I'm no game design or character art genius, so don't take my word as law, please. But I feel like a reptile or a bug would fit these typings a million times better than a small cat fox, especially if you take branding into consideration again. All of the Eevees are cute, but most of these types that it isn't, well, they aren't so cute. But they are pretty dang cool. It makes sense then to make a cool insect or a cool lizard or something. Anything that could realistically change drastically, but non-magically. You see, that's the big difference between this new Eevee thing and the old Eevee. The old Eevee uses stones and other sources of magical energy trapped inside of things to evolve, whereas our new Eevee would use something more physical, or perhaps it just evolves based on its stats, similar to Tyrogue or perhaps through trade items. Like I said, the types that are left are all physical types. It physically bonds with the thing during the weirdo process of trading. So, let's have some fun. Let's design our own fake mon that fills in the other half of the types. The cool, new, Lizard Eevee. First, let's look at Eevee. It gets its name from the letter E and V from Evolution, because that's what it's all about. And its evolutions all have Eon in the name, referring to a long amount of time, how long it takes for evolution to actually occur. Our new Pokémon should do the same, refer to its whole concept of many evolutions, but not be as direct as Eevee, perhaps. We came up with this, a generic lizard, a skink, and we've named it Skinka from the English word skink and the Japanese word shinka, which means evolution. After all, Eevee is still basically named Eevee in Japanese, so it's only fair for the next mon with the same gimmick to take from Japanese, even in the English translation. Being a skink works well too, as out of all of the groups of lizards, skinks are the most diverse. Also, they have blue tongues, and that's really cool. Skinka is about the same size as Eevee, just without the fluff. It's just normal type, and these uniquely colored scales are all the primary colors of the types that it evolves into. But how does it evolve? 
Well, there are a few ideas that I really like, and all of them fit into the physical theming to further differentiate it from Eevee. One option, for instance, is that Skinka learns many different types of moves. Pretty much just a huge move pool of all of the physical type moves, but only the sort of beginner type moves, you know? And perhaps after a certain point in leveling, if it knows more moves of a particular type than the other types, that's the type it will become. To my memory, there's no gimmick like this yet. But if that's too complex to program, there's always option two. It evolves based on its hold item upon leveling up. But a difference is that it has to level up a few times with it. In a way, it learns to rely on the item for its stat boosting effects, so it prefers to use moves that it boosts. So then it becomes that type. They wouldn't even have to be new items for this new mon, just use the ones that already exist, like Dragon Scale, which already turns things into dragons. These items would include Dragon Scale, Steel Coat for Steel, Protector for Rock, and heck, pretty much most of the otherwise useless trade items for specific Pokémon that just take up inventory space because who actually wants half of these Pokémon? Who the heck wants this? What even is this? It would give all of those items another use, another purpose, besides just filling up the inventory. Plus, if not just those, there are also items of every type, not just the physical, that increase the power of the moves of that type. These would be a perfect way to almost show the Skinka what type it should be specializing in. Okay, Skinka. Skink! Here's a bag of soft sand. These increase the power of your ground type moves. Skinka! You know what this means, right? You're going to be using a lot more ground type moves. Kinka! It sure would be awesome if you also got a stab bonus by evolving into that type, you know? Kink! Many hours later. You're evolving! Oh! To legend! Alright, so I'll admit we aren't the best with names, but we played around with the idea of every evolution ending with gen, as in generation, as adaptation and evolution happens across generations. We also tried era, a long period of time, and we even tried dai, a Japanese kanji that denotes time passing. Yakudai, for instance, can translate to eternity or 100 generations. But we couldn't come up with good names for all of the evolutions using just one of these, so I'll just list the names we came up with as they appear. I'm sure in the comments you'll tell me significantly better ones. But this is Dredgen, from Dredge, meaning to dig, and Gen. Other names could be Terra or Diger. It's based on the shovel-snouted lizard. Mixed with a broad tail lizard, it digs super fast because of its shovely shape, and even has the extra eyelid to protect its eyes when in the sand. And this is Stalagen, or Boldeye, Boldera, or Die Rock. It's the rock-type evolution, and it's based on the armadillo lizard, which likes to curl up and roll around. This Pokémon uses rollout a lot, and has rocky spikes, like stalagmites, along its back. Steel is neat. We came up with the names Diluminum, Adamandi, Anodai, and such, as it's a lizard with a belly that looks like it's made of anodized steel. It's inspired from the granite spiny lizard's belly, and, well, anodized steel. Its scales are very shiny and metallic. And we played around with plenty of ideas with steel or chainmail armor as well. Flying is like the opposite of steel, and there are several flying lizards. Or at least gliding ones. But Gligar can only glide too, and it's flying type. For names we have Dysend, Era, or Sorgen. And we really wanted to avoid making it look too dragony, as there are plenty of dragons already, but no flying lizard Pokémon. And look, it even has the stupid neck flag thing! It's so dumb. Bug was a bit tricky. While a lizard suddenly turning into a bug makes more sense than Eevee doing so, it still doesn't make a lot of sense. But notably, not all bug-type Pokémon are bugs. Dwebble is a hermit crab, so perhaps to be a bug means to have a carapace or an exoskeleton, which most bugs do, which led us to the name Karagen, and the idea of this lizard being based on the large-scaled girdled lizard, specifically one that lost its tail to appear more bug-like. And it has a few massive scales, thick and large to the point where they act just as an exoskeleton, a carapace. It has become not a bug, but bug-like. Maybe it can even get a buggish jaw. 
The fighting type evolution is Bludgeon. Die roll, few die, or Tetsu die. It's a monitor lizard, which is a huge and very territorial aggressive lizard. It stands upright, it's ripped, and its tail is built like a Tetsu bow. The Japanese War Club. It could even take its old shedded skin and use them as fighting bandages. And similar to how all of the evolutions are about the same size but Sylveon is big, this one is big too compared to the others. Poison was really easy to figure out. There are loads of venomous lizards. Let's name it Dyksic, Venera, Dysera, or Pathogen, or something. And to help differentiate this mod, we went with the Frilled Lizard. It also has the body of the rough-skinned Newt, which is rough-skinned and is covered in a deadly toxin. In other words, please do not lick it. Ghost has the names Ectodi, Diplasm, Ethera, or Ectogen. It's a pale, creepy gecko, like a spooky gargoyle gecko, but with piles of super flaky, old, damaged skin all over it, giving it the creepy, classical ghost look. And lastly, for dragon, we came up with some simple names. Diagon, Dragera, Dragjin, Legion. Dragon just makes the most sense, really. I mean, it's a dragon. Easy, there. Dragons are just big lizards. But we wanted to keep it distinct from flying so it doesn't have wings. Rather, it just has draconic magic powers. In this case, powerful, all-seeing dragon eyes. I have special eyes. We based this on the Eastern Horned Lizard, but with more dragon properties. This lizard is able to shoot blood out of its eyes as a defense mechanism. But <laughs> that's kind of gross and dark for Pokemon, so instead, it just has magical dragon eyes. It shoots its dragon attacks from its eyes rather than its mouth, similar to how Snorlax shoots hyper beams from its eyes. And look here, the blood thing is still referenced in the red stripes beneath the eyes. Also, it too is big because of its draconic influence. It's on par with the fighting lizard. And that's our idea. Hmm? And again, these are just some of our ideas. Heck, I honestly don't even like some of them. But even these are better than a lot of the fake Eevees you see. A cat with fists, a rabbit in armor, a fluffy dog that flies with its tail. No thanks. Shoo, shoo, get. Shoo. So what do you think of our idea for a different Eevee? How would you improve upon it? Or are you furries too obsessed with this thing to accept anything else finishing off the types? Would you leave? <sighs> So what do you think? Is the branding of Eevee evidence that it will continue to get more types? Or does the branding of Eevee as a cute, fluffy special thing mean that it's done? Hello, hello, and welcome to this episode of Why Pokemon? Why? Where I finally tell you the answers to these questions you've had all your entire life. Questions such as, why are there Pokemon that are shaped like Pokeballs? Or why do Pokemon evolve when you trade them? Today, we're going to be looking at what the heck Voltorb really is, and why it's what it is. And while we're on the topic, we will also cover Fungus and Amoongus, the Pokeball-colored Pokemon also. Because something funky is happening here, and it's not the shrooms. No, no, it is definitely Game Freak. Right, so, let's start with what even is Voltorb? Or Electrode, for that matter. I mean, they are already pretty weird, but it doesn't help that they are the same exact colorations as Pokeballs. And aren't these animals supposed to be super powerful as well as... capable of existing? This one just explodes all the time! I mean, what kind of evolutionary advantage is exploding with self-destruct? Plus, according to the Pokedex, it rolls to move. If the ground is uneven, a sudden jolt from hitting a bump can cause it to explode! What? Who? <clears throat> Who thought this was a good idea? What, were Voltorbs and Electrodes like, Oh yes, I will pass on my exploding genes to further advance our species. It makes no sense, but this is Pokemon after all. Even the Pokedex doesn't fully understand where they came from, and well, neither do I. Well, technically I do know where they come from. 
Game Freak. But in-universe, they seem to have evolved alongside humanity and their Pokeball production. In fact, it seems like they are fairly recent, as they look similar to the modern design for Pokeballs, unlike the older style that we see in the anime and movies. I mean, Magirna also looks kinda like a Pokeball, but she's an automaton that was constructed by humans. Voltorb is a bit more mysterious. In fact, its first sighting was at a large manufacturing plant for Pokeballs, and this is where we get into our first theory of what Voltorb is doing. It's using camouflage to better survive in its environment. Think about it, even the slightest touch will cause them to explode with violent energy! This normally ends in the Pokemon fainting. How fainted Pokemon recover in the wild has always given me a headache when I try and think about how they continue to live. I mean, this world is full of extreme predators! Laying passed out in the middle of open land is super dangerous. But back to camouflage, there are two types of it. The first is normally used by mammals and birds. This is where the animal uses its body colors to mask its appearance thus allowing it to blend with its most typical environment. Like, leopard spots are there to imitate the dappled shadows of the forest, or birds that have feathered colors and patterns that blend with tall grass or tree bark. These types of camouflage have evolved over time and are most common in mammals and birds. Even aquatic animals such as fish, whales, and penguins all use a type of coloration that makes them more difficult to be seen. Darker on top to hide in the darkness of the ocean when looking down, and lighter underneath to hide in the bright sunlight when looking up. This adaptation, however, happens extremely slowly, and sort of by accident. So I don't really think Voltorb follows this method, even if it is darker on top, lighter on the bottom. The second way an animal camouflages itself is a more active way, by literally changing the color or pattern of their skin to mimic their surroundings. This happens with animals like chameleons or cephalopods. Heck, even some mammals can change their fur depending on the season, like the arctic fox, white during the winter, dark brown black during the summer. Now, I don't really think Voltorb is able to change its color actively to match its area. However, the shiny coloration does look similar to a great ball, which could be a bit of evidence of that. But they don't just change, you know? Though I would love a Voltorb of every ball, although that could get pretty messy as there are quite a few Pokeballs now. But back to its camouflage, camo in general is used for two things. To live, or to eat. Which is basically to live again, but in a different way. So, well, if you want to eat something, you need to avoid being spotted until you get close enough for the kill. When amongst a group of predators competing for the same resources, the prey in this example, the predator, which is not spotted easily, has the advantage. Thus, they will make more kills, they will eat more, they will use that energy to produce more offspring. Simple math, simple adaptation and evolution. On the flip side, we have prey camouflage, which is all about avoiding being seen and eaten. If an organism's brother who is more visible is eaten, while the more hidden organism survives, it has one more day to live, a chance to continue playing the game of life and having more offspring, which will have its better hidden genes. In Voltorb's case, it doesn't rely on prey or anything besides electricity, but it makes sense that it would want to hide just because they are so volatile. You know? You knock it, it explodes. So they want to hide. But that, of course, is just one theory, and we have another. Now I'm gonna lay it on the line in layman's terms. Not beating around the bush anymore, Voltorb and Electrode, they are mimics. More importantly, they are mimics because of game design more so than lore. Pokemon is an RPG no matter how you slice it, and one of the most iconic enemies from RPGs is the Mimic, something that is similar looking to loot or treasure in the overworld that then ends up being a trap, punishing overzealous players and rewarding cautious play. In fact, Mimics originated in one of the most classic RPGs there is, Dungeons and Dragons. D&D. Way back in 1974, the Mimic was a simple creature. Just a small trap that would add a little spice into the relatively easy time that was looting spoils. I mean, just think, who knew that a chest could eat you whole? As far as you knew, you were opening something that contains Boots of the Strider, but nope, instead you get Boots of Get Eaten. Now some may be saying, no, Voltorb is not a chest. Mimics are treasure chests. Duh. And while you're right, it's not a chest, you're still wrong. 
In Pokemon, the way they normally would show a treasure or item of some sort in the overworld is through a Pokeball on the overworld. So, that's what a Mimic would be mimicking. Plus, Mimics were never just chests to begin with. Sure, popular media has made them to be reduced to just greedy, ravenous things that take the form of a chest and gets its hands on all the treasure hunters, but that's not what they were originally. They used to be hyper-intelligent, extremely stealthy, and dangerous enemies capable of changing into... well, all sorts of things. I heard once that a mimic stood unnoticed in the middle of town for years until they found a pile of bones in one of the nearby sewers. <sighs> it was the well. It had to be the well. But back to Pokemon. Mimics are an integral part of RPGs, and Pokemon is an RPG! So while Voltorb is based off of a mimic, we really need to understand why it wants to do what it's doing. By which I mean, why would it want to be touched? It's a mimic, it's attracting people now. It knows people will touch Pokeballs on the floor. So why is it trying to do that if it can be knocked and then boomed? Well, we do have a small theory as to why. It's camouflaged itself as a defective Pokeball, at least in the earlier games. It's missing its button. And Electrode is even more defective, as it's put together upside down. And who would want to pick that up? And that is absolutely the greatest theory we've ever made on this channel. What is a Sveal doing here? You're not a Pokeball. Go. Gosh dang it, my drink! Oh my goodness! Dang it! Ooh. Though another theory that also goes into what Voltorb even is, I covered on this channel years ago. By which I mean, it was one of the first videos on the channel, like super early. In summary, it's a possessed Pokeball. I mean, the eyes on Voltorb are just like Haunters. The original Ghost Trio love possessing things and playing tricks on trainers. Some may get the idea that it'd be pretty funny to possess a Pokeball, Problem is, a Pokeball is made to contain Pokemon. So, well, the ghost possessed it, but because of all the technology in it, it can't get out. It is now trapped possessing the Pokeball forever. This mischievous ghost decides it might as well keep playing tricks on trainers by acting as a mimic, but considering it's a Pokeball, it needs electricity. So they hang out around factories and power plants too. Not the most detailed theory, but it does explain their origin and their role as mimics. So, maybe it is a good theory. Not all theories need stupid amounts of evidence. You don't need to spend 20 minutes explaining something that could take three sentences. People. But interestingly, Voltorb and Electrode are not the only stand-in Mimic Mons. Fungus and Amoongus are also both Mimic Pokemon, but they instead want to be touched for totally different reasons. Much like the Mimic, they need humans to live, but not because they want to eat them. Perhaps instead, they need things to touch them to spread their spores. Similar to those sticker bushes that you always have to pull out of your dog's hair. Essentially hitchhikers that are catching a ride to go live abroad. In fact, Fungus is a better example of predatory camouflage, while Voltorb is a good prey camouflage. One wants you to be close, and the other wants you to miss it. Perhaps. I mean, after all, Fungus has the button, so it's perfectly suited to get trainers to touch it. It's not defective at all. And then Amoongus has even more Pokeballs, a more enticing thing. Oh man, not just one, but three Pokeballs in a pile? That sounds great. It's similar to how the anglerfish uses its lure to attract its prey in the dark. And in fact, it's not just trainers that the Pokeball attracts, it's stated that it can attract other Pokemon as well. Now, this is just a theory, but remember that Pokemon like to be caught by strong trainers. And Pokeballs are a trainer's tools. So it's almost like Fungus sort of needs man. Without humans, there would be no Fungus after all. Or at least, not the one we know. However, the Pokedex does state that not many Pokemon fall for its tricks, but that means some do. And, well, if it works sometimes, then at least it's able to eat its prey and or spread its spores sometimes. Even a partially successful hunter continues to live another day. Plus, I mean, its name is Foon or Fool. It's obviously trying to fool people into touching it. Again, super similar to the classic Mimic. Just a touch to be glued to the devious monster, but in this case, it's just a touch to explode into a large cloud of poisonous spores, so you faint and can be slowly eaten. Or, 
explode into a big cloud of breeding spores to attach to you and eventually fall off somewhere else so that it can spread its genes. Or maybe it's both spores at once and your body gets poisoned and you continue walking and eventually collapse, fainted, dead, and the breeding spores, well, they hatch and they slowly start creeping under your skin and start sucking the nutrients from your body. And then you have more super cute Amoongus all over your corpse. Why are they so cute and creepy? Ah, spring is here and I'm outside. I don't like it. But hey, it's a bunch of pretty trees behind me. And by which I mean, we're, we're too late. We're way too late. Here come a bunch of petals in my face. Look at all these petals on the floor. It's been torrential rain ever since we started spring and we've been waiting for years to be here during the really pretty times, but nope. No, nature just says no every time. Hmm. It's Cherry City, otherwise known as Salem, Oregon. Also, it's one of the tree capitals of the United States, which just means that there's a really high tree to person that lives here ratio or something like that. So when you think of cherry blossom Pokemon, what do you think of? You think Cherim? That's quite a forgettable one. It's number 420 though, so there's that. But then there's always Sawsbuck Spring Form, and that's the Pokemon we're going to be talking about today. Anyway, the lighting out here is terrible, and the audio probably is too, so let's go back to the studio, which is over here, off camera. Ah, okay. Well, it's spring, and spring has definitely sprung. And that means it's time to spring into action and spring clean my theory ideas list. No, I'm not scraping the bottom of the barrel. That's Josh's job. I'm more of a barrel scraping supervisor. And there isn't anything quite as simple and clean as a Pokemon lore and design video. And with the ability to shoot on location with all of the beautiful cherry blossoms, I thought, why not do a Pokemon that ties to cherry trees somehow? So you're asking yourself, Cherim and Cherubi and Sazbuck. Nah, I'll leave. Bye. I'll come back next week when you cover something at least vaguely interesting. But hang on, just wait. You've made it this far. I mean, you clicked and that, that really warms my heart. And plus, these Pokemon actually have really interesting and to be quite honest, quite funny origins. Well, by they, I mean, just Sawsbuck. Sawsbuck's origins are really crazy. I mean, it's a pretty basic Pokemon. I get it mixed up with Stantler all the time. So you may ask, how could this easily forgotten Pokemon be interesting? Well, it's got a really cool mechanic that I really wish they hadn't just made the gimmick of the week, as most of Game Freak's ideas do. But uh, the season's mechanic, along with weather and day and night cycles, really helped add to the feeling of immersion and playing RPGs. It's awesome. The in-game reason that Sawsbuck changes its appearance is that it migrates, along with the changing of the seasons, like how birds fly south for the winter. And wildebeest migrate to feed crocodiles every year. And it's not just Stantler's body that changes. See, I did it again. The plant thing that lives on Stantler, Sawsbuck, the plant that lives on Sawsbuck's horns, antlers. Are the antlers? Are the antlers plants? Or are they antlers with plants on them? Well, either way, the plantlers change based off of the season too, just like many other plants, but not like most plants in Pokemon. It's weird that only one Pokemon really changes with the seasons, you know? Such a missed opportunity, come on Game Freak. Another thing to point out is that seasons in game only last 28 days, like what does the planet even look like? So many questions. Anyway, so many sidetracks. The Dex entry is rather interesting. They migrate according to the seasons. People can tell the season by looking at Sawsbuck's horns. Ah yes, because they can't just look around them to figure that out. No. Now anyway again, this is where I come to the first thing that is really odd, yet interesting. First off, deer do actually migrate in the real world, so this is a nice refreshing piece of truth coming from Game Freak. However, if Sawsbuck migrated like how most imagine, I could see a problem with this dex entry. A lot of people think migratory means, hey, it's getting kind of snowy, let's go south to where it's nice and warm. 
And you'd be right, that's really common. But if this were the case, then the plant on its horns would never need to die off, or really even be a deciduous tree at all. Uh, oh, and for those of you who don't know, deciduous trees are the types of trees that die off in winter and bloom in spring. Though they don't really die, rather they just hibernate and slowly grow off of stored sugars, and then spring ushers the last bit of sugars to burst forth and regrow all of the leaves. Anyway, again, <laughs> tangents. The key here is that the Pokedex entry does not say where to or how they migrate. So we can assume it's similar to real deer. What's with the voice cracks? Deer don't migrate like other animals, and even then, not all deer migrate. And those that do, really only migrate once a year. Normally, only coming down off of their safe mountains to the warmer valleys. All to avoid being buried in the snow and being unable to find food. This basically means that they only really move down in elevation a little bit. But they still live in the snowy areas, or frost-bitten landscapes during the winter. There still is snow, but not as much snow, like the surroundings aren't just snow. Which is why Sazbuck's plantlers need to hibernate, because Sazbuck is too lazy to move further south. Or perhaps it's unable to. Possibly it has a dietary restriction. Everyone has dietary restrictions nowadays. Now, while the reasons for its season changes make pretty good sense, why even make a deer have a tree for antlers anyway? I mean, why would that make sense? Well, really, it does in fact make complete sense. I mean, in a way, antlers are very similar to trees, first of all, looking like long branching sticks that are rigid and brown. I'm sure there are plenty of myths of people seeing something they thought to be a deer, but it was really just a scraggly bush. However, I think the real question here is why a cherry tree? Well, there are a few possibilities as to why a cherry tree. One, it really, and I mean really, signifies spring, especially in Japan, and in my part of Oregon. Why they decided to plant a ton of cherry trees here, I don't know. I'll probably look that up in a few seconds. Oh wow, it, it was just some dude that really liked cherries, so he brought a bunch of them with him on the Oregon Trail, and that's the story. As for Sazbuck, the cherry tree is super important to Japanese culture and the symbolism of new beginnings. It's perfect to represent the cycle of the seasons. But even that may not be the sole reasoning for this Pokémon's existence, as there is a story, a tale, a fable, perhaps, about a man hunting a deer, and he ran out of ammo. A very common thing when you have to carry around all your shots and you miss all the time because ancient guns are chaotic. But the man sees a deer just up ahead, and not wanting it to escape, he loads his rifle with cherry seeds, as they are very similar in shape to the shot he normally used. He fires and lands the strike on the deer. However, the seeds fail to kill the deer because they are seeds, not bullets. So it runs away. Then, years later, he claimed to have seen a deer with a cherry tree growing from its head. The seeds then were embedded in its skin. This is the tale of a man named Baron Manchausen, a famous baron based off of the real-life baron Hieronymus Carl Friedrich. I'm probably mispronouncing it. It's this guy. Check out that name. This guy. And if this tale is true or not is a matter of debate, as there were many grand hunting tales told back then. But such a thing is possible. This dude had a pine tree sapling growing in his lung. And to have it surgically removed. But anyway, we see this tale come to life, along with plenty of springly symbolism in Sawsbuck. A gimmick mon from one of the forgotten gens that in my opinion is the pinnacle of Pokemon, but whatever. Did you know that there are like a billion things in the Pokemon world? And a lot of them are crazy. I know, amazing, right? But the one thing that I really have always enjoyed is how Game Freak almost always uses Shelter as a baseline for Pokemon abilities. I also love that Game Freak back in the day used to say pretty much anything they wanted, lore aside. Here's a Pokedex entry from Pokemon Yellow. Its shell can withstand any attack. However, when it's open, the tender body is exposed. Notice how it says any attack. It's only weak when open, but then we see that it's directly contradicted by like a billion other Pokedex entries, stating a certain Pokemon can break its shell. I mean, 
it's the stinking diamond thing all over again. Actually, yeah, they do even state that Shilder's shell is harder than diamond. They even restated it in Pokemon Moon, a recent title. So what gives? What's going on? And how hard is it really to open Shilder's shell? You stupid little pung quack. And this is where a little bit of my useless knowledge comes in. Diamond isn't actually all that crazy. Sure, it is the hardest mineral, but hardness isn't what you think in terms of science, such as mineralogy, and no, not the hippy-dippy alchemy mumbo-jumbo, the real mineralogy that looks at real actual minerals and such. In that, hardness is pretty much a mineral's ability to resist scratching from another material. And it is not to be confused with the metallurgy definition of hardness, which is what most people think. And looking at Shelder, it's not metal. Alright? It's not stated that it's hard as steel or hard as a titanium gold alloy or something. No, it says it's as hard as diamond, so we can take diamonds into context, thus mineralogy, not metallurgy. So realistically, yes, its shell could very well be harder than diamonds, and that's super helpful for it not getting scratched, meaning not getting eroded away by the crashing waves flinging sand all over the place everywhere like jerks. But the statement, it's harder than diamonds, really isn't super helpful when it comes to crushing or shattering or just obliterating motions. However, that's not to say Pokemon that are able to get into the tender inside of Shell, there are pushovers, you hear? They're Pokemon, they're insanely strong. That's how they work. They're monsters that fit in your pocket, but they're world enders, every single one of them. But before we start talking about those, let's start by just talking about these clams. Shelder and Cloyster are both incredibly defensive beasts. I mean, Cloyster is the only water type Pokemon to boast a base defense stat of 180, so competitively, they are also very defensive beasts. Makes good sense though, it's a clam. And yes, even Cloyster, despite it having Oyster in the name, it is more so a clam. The closest real world creature to Cloyster is the thorny Oyster, which is named wrong because it's technically a clam. Great. So overall, clams and oysters alike went down the defensive route on the skill tree, completely ignoring speed to the point where they don't really move at all. But that's fine. Most animals are unable to open the shells, so they don't bother trying. Except for otters, and a few others. And in the case of otters, it's just because they're smart. They have little hand things, so they manage. And there's only so many otters, so clams survive through both their defensive shell and their high population numbers. However, in the Pokemon world, many creatures are more powerful than a mere otter. Likewise, Shelder's shell makes up for it by being just as ridiculous. But in this evolutionary arms race, currently it would seem Shelder is on the losing side at the moment. It has loads of predators that can crack it open with no problem, and we are going to talk about them. Let's start with one of the more odd Pokemon that's able to crack its shell, that being Rufflet. Now you would think that this tiny bird wouldn't be able to crack the shell of such a crazy beast, but its Pokedex entry reads, With its powerful legs and sturdy claws, it can crack even the hard shells of Shelder and pluck out their insides. I mean, yeah, it's a bird. Birds can crack hard nuts and seeds with their beaks, and even crack into bones of small prey. So. Let's go ahead and just put this baby bird into the toppest of tiers of Pokemon strength. It's able to break Shelder's shell. Hmm. Yes. Come on, Game Freak. That's not how you add lore, Game Freak. That's how you break lore. Just like this poor clam's shell. I feel like this Pokemon has gained a rather sizable amount of misinformation regarding itself. Or perhaps it's because of the classic, it's all 10 year olds gathering the data theory thing that's spread around all over the place. Notably though, real world eagle grip strength is nothing short of pretty impressive, being upwards of 400 PSI, or pounds per square inch. For context, humans normally have a grip strength of only 140 on the high end, and we don't have long talons. But Rufflet isn't the only thing said to be able to break its shell. Another recent entry from Game Freak's hate towards the shelter is Bruxish. It's said that even Shelder's shell is no match for its teeth. And while I do understand that this is because of the coral eating fish. What? There's fish that just eat coral? <laughs> Stupid fish. Bruxish has improperly designed teeth for crushing hard objects. I mean, it does have super sharp teeth, but 
Because of that, they would dull so quickly when chewing on rock or a shell that's harder than diamond. Bruxish is much more suited for eating fleshy fish than tearing off chunks of flesh all the time with its teeth. Not crushing hard things. That's bad. But really though, how can a fish that grinds its teeth together constantly have such sharp chompers? Bruxism is the grinding down of teeth, after all. I feel like they must be using their teeth to actually grab onto the huge fleshy tongue of Shelder to get to those tasty insides, more so than the other way around. Even Amastar, Amastar used to hunt prehistoric Shelder, using their beak-like mouths to open their shells. Now, an unknown amount of time has passed since then, so in that time, evolution must have taken place. So imagine how much weaker Shelder's poor little shell was back then. I bet the first time an Amistar preyed upon a modern Shelder, it was in for a shock when it bit down on something quite a lot tougher than they used to be. As remember, Amistar is a fossil Pokemon, so they went extinct and then only recently were brought back to life Jurassic Park style. So, it's not entirely clear that Amistar is actually able to break the shell currently, that is. Yes, it used to, but again, it's definitely gotten harder. That's how nature do, after all. I mean, it was also nature that ended up causing Amistar to go extinct, unlike our friend Shelder. And a lot of that evolution towards stronger and tougher, harder shells is likely thanks to another arms race. One that's still going on today in the Pokemon world, and that is the battle between Shelder and Kingler. Kingler is said to be capable of prying open Shelder and even cloister shells using its 10,000 horsepower pincer. Excuse me, what? <laughs> horsepower? 10,000 horsepower? No! No! It doesn't even have an engine! Why would you record a crab's pinching power in horsepower? I mean, horsepower was invented by the same guy who figured out Watts, James Watts. And pretty much it states that one horse could pull about 33,000 foot-pounds per minute. Yeah, it's a unit of energy based not only on different factors in the imperial system, which is bad enough, but also based on a horse! what a horse can pull one foot in a minute. That's dumb and so, so variable. Like, what if your horse is fat? Come on, different breeds of horse have different strengths and weaknesses too, so like... <sighs> but regardless of how dumb it is, most market cars don't even go over 500 horsepower. Heck, I think my Ford Fusion has 200. Not even a Ferrari 355 F1 can be anywhere close to that. It only is around 375 horsepower. You know what? Here's a video clip of an 850 horsepower drag truck versus a 10,000 horsepower dragster. And the truck gets a pretty big head start too. And why did they do this? Because humans have an unnatural need for speed. Also Red Bull. Now that. That is a lot of power. I mean, if Kingler used that power over one second, that means the arm is capable of burst energy up to 7,456,999 joules. Basically, 7.4 megajoules, or just a couple of pounds of high explosives. A joule is a unit of energy, by the way, if you didn't know that. This crab is crazy! And you know what? That's not even a good explanation. I'm gonna do it better. Really, first off, why would you even record it in horsepower? It's like measuring how fast you're going in your car in meters per second per second. Sure, you're not wrong, but it's not super useful in terms of common knowledge. I mean, the horsepower number we have isn't all that helpful without first knowing how fast the crab closes its claw. So for example, and, and in an estimation, if it closes its claw at five meters per second, then the 10,000 horsepower would equal 1,491,399 newtons of power. About a fourth of a rocket ship's power. I mean, the closest animal in the real world would be the saltwater crocodile with a bite force of 16,000 newtons. Yeah. That's what we're dealing with. Plus, if you remember that Kingler is four feet tall, this crab is terrifying. There's a reason one of its abilities is hypercutter. I mean, I know it's a big claw, but aren't claws supposed to be good at pinching? Not opening? 
Imagine how hard Kingler's own shell or exoskeleton would need to be to withstand the pressure of that much power being used to open a stupid clam. And even then, it's stated in one Cloister Dex entry that once it slams its shell shut, it is impossible to open, even by those with superior strength. Then that means Machamp wouldn't be able to open this thing. Heck, I think that Kingler, then, is the only thing that could. And all this is because of coevolution. However, though, Kingler isn't crushing these mons, but instead is opening them, which is said to not even be possible. That is, until Ultra Sun had to go and ruin it all with the addition of more lore. If you yank on its soft tongue, the shelter will open in shock. Why didn't Kingler just evolve some fingers to pull its tongue? I'll never know that. Instead, it got a 10,000 horsepower claw that it can't even wave around for more than a few seconds before getting tired. As the dex entry puts it, it waves its huge, oversized claw in the air to communicate with others. But since the claw is so heavy, this Pokemon quickly tires. But still, that 10k pinchy prior is what it takes to reliably open these shells. Crazy. So yeah, these things are insanely strong. But I mean, they are clams after all. Though you'd think with all that strength, they'd be more of a muscle. I'm sorry. So here's an interesting thought theory thing. Personally, I think that Alolan Shelder are much weaker in comparison to their mainland counterparts. Let's look at the data. Kingler is not native to the Alola Island group, while Shelder can be found there. And there are plenty of predators that prey upon Shelders in Alola, or at least Pokemon that we've seen recently hunting them. In Alola, essentially, Rufflet and Bruxish. As far as we know, both are only able to prey upon the weaker shelled Shelder in Alola, as it was in Alola, the Alolan Pokedex, that we got these Pokedex entries after all. Meanwhile, back in Kanto, you need the power of a Kingler to do so, and both Shelder and Kingler are constantly upgrading through evolution. It's pretty much the same reason Europe advanced so much faster than the rest of the world in the olden days. The constant war and interfighting between all the different kingdoms made them constantly advance their military technology. Conflict gets stuff done. Heck, even more recently, microwaves, nuclear power, microchips, the internet, freeways even, all researched and invented and expanded for war-related reasons. Back to the Pokemon, though. Fun fact, Kingler's offensive stat is almost the same as the Clam's defensive stats. In balance, they are. Constantly. In the end, though, we are left with the question of how hard is it to crush Shelder's supposedly impenetrable shield, really? Kingler may actually be overkill with its force of a quarter of a rocket ship. For all we know, you may only need the power of a little fire newt that was bred with perfect stats. Something like that in the Pokemon world. Gameplay over lore, just constantly in these games. The Squid Sisters have a secret. We know they aren't really sisters, but are they even squids? Okay, okay, I know that sounds weird. They're the squid sisters. They're inklings. Right? Hear me out. Have you ever looked at the squid sisters? Their ears, their eyes? They aren't normal. They're different from most Inklings. In fact, the idols in general are all slightly different from the Inklings and Octolings that we play as in the games. And this may be no accident. If we take a gander at the evolution chart from the first game's Sunken Scroll number 10, we see that Inklings ears being like isosceles triangles, evolved directly from the shape of their mantle. The ear shape, then, is indicative of their origin species. This is corroborated by the fact that octolings evolved from octopodes, and thus have round ears, similar to an octopus mantle. And what ear shape do we observe in the Squid Sisters? They aren't the regular isosceles, almost equilateral triangles like the playable Inklings. No, they're long 
flat on the top and curved on the bottom. They don't resemble the mantles of squids or octopi. They resemble the mantles of cuttlefish. And who would have thunk it? Their grandfather, Cap'n Cuttlefish, also shares this ear shape. And it's worth noting that the idol's pupils are also different. They're cross-shaped. In real life, squid eyes tend to have round pupils, like the inklings, whereas cuttlefish pupils are more... W-shaped. It's also worth noting that while octolings typically have round pupils like inklings, Marina has barbell-shaped pupils, more closely resembling the rectangular pupils of actual octopodes. Of course, it's worth noting that Splatoon is fairly loose with how close or not its races are to their origin species. For example, we have seen gastropod-based species, both with full humanoid body types and with, well, a gastropod body. Stomach foot. That's what it means. Flo, a sea slug, has a stump from the waist down, ending in a foot. And, well, one of the members of Sashimori is this! She literally just is a person with a sea snail for a head. What do you say to something like that? And yes, I am telling you that the two characters whose grandfather is literally named Captain Cuttlefish are cuttlefish. Not squids. It's a pretty obvious in hindsight, isn't it? Though we actually see some evidence of this in other places. Firstly, the elephant in the room, Pearl's forehead. I mean Pearl. Ah, I can hear you now! In the Splatfest art, her ears are shaped like that of an inkling! And she has cross-shaped pupils! What do you say to that? And to that I say, dear viewer, we're going back to the Octo Expansion. Again. We just keep using the Octo Expansion to justify stuff. It really packed a lot of lore in there! Do you remember this scene? Well, if we observe that scene, and better yet, if we observe her in-game model directly, we see that her ears are small and rounded, much like the mantle of her Japanese namesake, the Himeika, or the Northern Pygmy Squid. Which isn't quite a squid at all. It's more closely related to the, you guessed it, the Cuttlefish. Kali's Japanese namesake as well. The Aori Ika, or Big Fin Reef Squid, also has superficial similarities to Cuttlefish, given the shape of the fin around its mantle. However, it is worth considering that in general, Splatoon character names are not always one-to-one -one with their species. Craymond, named for crayfish, is a shrimp. Krusty Sean is also a shrimp, despite in Japanese being named Robu after a lobster. Names in Splatoon seem to be very loose. But before you think they're not really squids is sort of unprecedented, there actually are cuttlefish idols canon to Splatoon. In the Octo Expansion art book, Hikara Walker, there are images of mini CDs found in C14 Stick and Move Station. Among them are this, a picture of what the book describes as cuttlefish idols. And we know for a fact that they are cuttlefish idols because the book calls them Koika, rather than simply Ika, which more correctly refers to the superorder of decapodiforms, which means it could mean squid or cuttlefish. Do you see anything familiar here? Longer ears. In the case of the darker skinned idol whose ears are more defined, curved on the bottom and drooping downwards. Also, cross-shaped pupils. And most surprisingly of all, on the lighter-skinned idol, tentacles that change color at the tips. A feature that is exclusive to the idols we've seen until now. And Captain Cuttlefish. Perhaps such a feature is exclusive to Cuttlefish, as the only other time we have seen this is in a member of the band Ink Theory, an inkling named Yoko. But in this case, every tentacle is fully a different color, and it is described per Inkopedia as a mutation that comes at the cost of being sensitive to changes in barometric pressure, particularly during very sunny or rainy days. That is very unlike the two-toned tentacles we see sported by these cuttlefish idols, as well as the idols in each game. And it would be very questionable for Callie, Marie, or Marina to be the capable fighters that they are if they had such a weakness. The same goes for Captain Cuttlefish as well, who is even a decorated veteran of the Great Turf War. So clearly, Yoko is vastly different from them.
Interestingly, we have also seen pictures of the Squid Sisters and Pearl as children. In Splatoon Sunken Scroll 17 and Splatoon 2 Sunken Scroll number 1. Notice anything interesting? They aren't in the typical Inkling child stage. It is said that Inklings typically do not have a full humanoid form until 14 years of age. However, it is noted that some Inklings can develop a humanoid form early. Is that a scientific fact though? Or a mistake motivated by misidentifying what I will from here on call cuddlings as regular Inklings? Given that our only examples of this are Callie, Marie, and Pearl, I think this is worth considering. Now, it is also worth addressing that some fan artists have suggested that the cross-shaped pupils and different ear shape may be signs of inkling physical maturity, as the inklings we play as are much younger than these idols. However, if we reference this art from the Shio Karabushi traditional version video posted on Nintendo's Japanese YouTube channel, we can see both cross-shaped pupils and flat-topped bottom-curved ears on the Squid Sisters as children. And given how many frames this shows up in, and that it is corroborated by the Sunken Scrolls just mentioned, I feel like that debunks the physical maturity argument. And there is further evidence to be considered as well. Do you remember how we keep stressing that Inklings don't have bones? Well, what if I told you that unlike squids, cuttlefish have an internal structure called a cuttlebone, and that Callie and Marie and their grandfather, Captain Cuttlefish, have on multiple occasions, referred to having bones. I guess that's a cuddle bone then. Squids, of course, have a somewhat similar structure, a gladius. However, it is significantly more flexible, explaining why cuddlings would have bone-like structures and inklings wouldn't. Of course, though, this calls our past videos into question where we use the squid sisters' shoulder blades as evidence. Though, these are all just theories. I'm not going to say it. Now let's get through some things that can be disproven by looking at translations, as these carry less weight. Then we'll get on to the more significant examples. Firstly, we have a quote from Marie in Stage 14 of Hero Mode 2, Parking Garage. Surprised you haven't broken any bones? Well, squids don't have bones, so never mind. The implication of this, of course, is that Marie briefly forgot to hold the facade of being a squid and thus having no bones. Unfortunately, as is the case with many lines in Splatoon's translation, it has been punched up for effect. Credit to Samuel Obscure Messner, translator of Team Space World, for translating the original Japanese for us, which reads as follows. Wow, this is back-breaking work, but keep going up. Though, if translated literally, it would read, your bones sure break easily, keep going up which obviously makes no sense. Secondly, we have a quote from Captain Cuttlefish in the Octo Expansion. I'm pooped, Agent 8. Gonna rest my cuddle bones here for a bit. Unfortunately, this again was punched up for the translation. In the original Japanese, what he says is more to the effect of, I'm going to take a rest for a short while. It's not so helpful. But if we look at the dialogue for Black Belly Skate Parts Inkopolis News Bumps in the first game, we get something more promising. Kali. I'm bad at skateboarding. I'd probably break a bone. Marie. Squids don't have bones, but whatever. And translated from the original Japanese, this one actually still holds up. Kali. I don't like skateboarding. I feel like I'd break a bone or something. Marie. We don't have bones. Like the parking garage quote, this shows a temporary slip of the tongue. Kali, being a bit of an airhead at times, forgot to hold her facade of being a squidling. An inkling, being a squid, and Marie had to remind her in a way that doesn't draw too much attention. Of course, we do know that Inkopolis News is scripted. See the Squid Sisters' remarks during the Mountain Food vs. Seafood Splatfest. But, as someone who's worked in the news industry, news anchors go off the script constantly, adding in bits of their personality or thoughts now and again, or coming up with something on the fly, and messing up all of the pre-planned camera angle changes, and. They especially do this when they're talking about something fun, like a festival or an event or something. So that's very possible. And of course, it's worth noting that Captain Cuttlefish has a visible rib cage. So Cuddling's got bones. Another thing of note is the Japanese name for the Squid Sisters, Shio Karazu. 
That's my pronunciation of it anyway. This is a portmanteau of shiokara, or salted fermented seafood entrails and colors. Most people are aware of the Ika Shiokara implication, but what many may not realize is that Ika Shiokara is typically made not with squid entrails, but with the entrails of cuttlefish. <laughs> it's all coming together, but I can hear you asking now, why would they do this? Why would these cuddlelings choose to hide amongst inklings instead of making themselves known? Well, it is important to remember that this is not unprecedented. When the Octoling refugees from Octo Canyon came on to Inkopolis, instead of making themselves known, what was it they did? They passed themselves off as Inklings following a strange hairstyle fad. Octopodes were thought to be extinct after the Great Turf War led to their exile to the dilapidated human domes, and it was likely assumed that if they suddenly re-emerged without any sort of cover story, it would cause some sort of mass panic in the public, both among those who thought they were gone and among those who remembered the Great Turf War. I mean, we saw Captain Cuttlefish's deliberately portrayed as racist initial reaction to this, and he continued his well-intended but still insensitive behavior towards Marina during the Octo expansion. So, it could be problematic if such behavior became a widespread issue. So, it is feasible then that like the Octolings after them, Cuddlelings would choose to hide among Inklings, encouraged by their close physical resemblance to them. Which is not unlike real-life Cuttlefish's ability to camouflage, using the chromatophores in their skin. It is then also possible that since Callie, Marie, and Pearl already have experience hiding amongst Inklings, and with Agent 8's direct connection to the new Squidbeak Splatoon, and Marina being immediately aware when the Octolings arrived in Ingopolis, these Cuddlelings helped the Octolings devise a strategy to blend in. It's also possible that given the games are very Japanese in nature, the intended distinction between Inklings and Octolings is Decapodiforms versus Octopodiforms, in which case Squid Inklings and Cuttlefish Inklings are a different species, but considered part of the same group. Whereas octopus aren't. Completely different. Regardless though, the fact that both inklings and cuddlings are both decapodiforms explains why cuddlings would side with the inklings during the Great Turf War. So I suppose you could say that they aren't the squid sisters, they are the cuttlefish cousins. But that just leaves the issue of Marina. If she isn't a regular Octoling, what is she? Well, that's probably a question for Niver. Look who it is! It's me, Loxton, and I'm back with another water type video because man oh man do I just love looking at all of the water types again. Fish, salt water, or fresh water? Because when it comes to real-world water breathers, this is an incredibly important distinction to make. It's a matter of life and death. But what is the difference? And how does it apply to Pokémon? Let's find out. So what really is the big deal when it comes to salt water or fresh water? And I mean, who cares? Because you shouldn't even be able to get oxygen from the water. That's so much more work, so inefficient. Why are fish so stupid? So getting right into it, fish actually don't breathe. I mean, in the traditional sense. In fact, what they do instead has a bunch of its own fancy terminology. And it basically means how a fish regulates its body fluids. I mean, after all, if you breathe fluids, everything inside of you at that point is pretty much fluids. So, this fishy process is called osmoregulation, and really, almost all living organisms do this process. For humans and most land creatures, it's basically the process of intaking liquids and then losing it through various means, most likely peeing, and all the stuff in between. That's why, like, if you're working out and sweating a bunch, you don't have to pee as much. It's because you're sweating it all out. You're sweating out 
your pee. It's not the most scientifically accurate way of putting it, but it's the way I like saying it. And this process is a lot more difficult to explain in fish than you'd think. But it's the main difference between freshwater and saltwater animals. So we kind of have to. But first, let's describe the difference between the two waters. Saltwater is just pretty much normal water, whereas fresh water is the special one. In fact, fresh water is only about 10% of the total water on the planet. So fresh water is definitely the special one. The salt content or salinity of salt water is about 3.5%, whereas fresh water only has a salinity of 0.1%, meaning for every liter of ocean water, there is 35 grams of salt diluted into it. Whereas fresh lake or river water only has one gram of salt. So yes, fresh water does technically have salt, but a lot, lot less. Let's talk fresh water first, as it's a lot easier for the baseline explanation, as salt just adds complications. Freshwater fish are able to live in fresh water and are also normally hardier than their salty counterparts, as their habitats are smaller, so they can get a lot hotter and a lot colder easier. The ocean is a great temperature regulator, whereas lakes get steamy or frozen over all the time. And fish gotta live through that. Also, freshwater fish have more land-based predators than salty ocean fish, for obvious reasons. And along with being hardier, they also have a much higher salt content inside of their bodies than the surrounding water, which is very important information. Now, let's quickly go over osmosis, as it's half of the name in osmoregulation, after all. Osmosis is a common word in science, and it comes from Greek, meaning to move or transport. In microbiology, it describes the actions of cells as they transfer, mostly liquids, through a semi-permeable membrane, which occurs because there is a pressure difference on both sides of the wall. For example, if we have 10 molecules on one side, and two on the other, the molecules are going to want to be equal, so four of them will pass through the wall via osmosis, so there's six on both sides now. And this is where our fish comes into play. You see, if a fish has a high amount of salt in it and lives in a low salt environment, eh? You see where I'm going? The fish then needs to stop its body from losing all of its salt because living things need salt. It's super important for a wide variety of bodily functions in all life forms, pretty much. Many more terrible things happen if you're low on salt than if you're high on salt. We know now that at least in humans, not having enough salt is significantly more detrimental than having too much salt. And in fish, it is definitely a matter of life and death. This is where our freshwater fish become different from saltwater fish because freshwater fish are normally saltier inside than the water they're swimming in. Thus, all that water wants to flow in, flushing the salt out. Balance is key. But the problem is, if that were to happen, the fish would die. This kills the fish. However, fret not, young ones, for the fish has many ways to combat this. To start, freshwater fish tends to not drink much water. And yes, fish do drink water. Fun facts. And they don't need to drink much water because their body already absorbs so much of it. But even so, they still produce copious amounts of urine. And you thought swimming in a public pool was bad. Ha! Try a lake, or a fish tank for that matter. The goldfish in your aquarium may be producing a third of its body weight in urine every single day. Now you know why you need to filter your fish. A filter for your fish. Don't filter your fish. This kills the fish. Now, there is another problem with producing so much urine, and the same applies to humans, so listen up. Peeing too much means necessary minerals and nutrients, as well as waste products, are lost. It's called hyponatremia. Long story short, you drink too much water, and it washes out all of your necessary minerals and electrolytes through pee and sweat. Eight glasses a day, they say. Nah, just stay hydrated, but not overly hydrated. You shouldn't have to force yourself to drink because it's healthy. That seems difficult when you're a fish, though. But by ingesting food and absorbing necessary salts in places such as the gills, fish actively take in enough of these minerals and electrolytes to replace what's lost in its urine. So their gills are specially made to absorb ions in the water, too. Now on the flip side, like flipping a fish in a pan, Saltwater fish are the opposite in almost every way. They exhale ions through their gills and drink loads of water constantly. They also lose water through their skin instead of absorbing it. And they pee extremely concentrated urine. Pretty much 
only waste products are expelled from their body. In fact, the only reason they produce so much urea is because their kidneys are huge compared to the rest of their body. Plus, they have a large intake of ammonia from their salty alkaline water. Ammonia is a very deadly substance in large quantities, but through filtration in the fish kidneys, they are able to turn it into urea quick enough to skip this harmful stage. Urea, by the way, is much less dangerous of a chemical in the body and is part of what makes urine urine, if you couldn't gather that from the name. And the only reason saltwater fish produce so much urea is because they have to. I mean, most vertebrates can easily release the regular amount of ammonia from their body, but saltwater fish intake ammonia at such an insane level that they would literally die just by storing a relatively regular amount of it. So they need to convert it to super concentrated urea first and get it out ASAP. And this fact, along with their gills acting slightly differently with the water, allows them to live in high saline environments. Their lives are saved thanks to pee. But now here comes the fun part. What would happen if you put the saltwater fish in fresh water and the freshwater fish in salt water? I mean, first of all, they'd die before like anything super terrible happens, just because that's how fish do. But for some specifics, the saltwater fish would just balloon up as it's not really great at expelling water, whereas the freshwater fish would shrivel up into a tiny little raisin fish. Now, there are special cases of fish, of course, and I feel we're gonna be seeing a lot of these in the Pokemon world. Meet the Urahaline, an organism able to live in both salt and freshwater, and they're commonly found in tide pools, small bodies of water that change salinity with the tides. Think crabs, small clams, and barnacles, maybe an octopus or two, possibly sea stars, those kind of things, or salmon. Though, they are a special case, because they live in both bodies of water, but don't really change daily like the tides. Rather, they migrate from fresh water to salt, and then to fresh again. Different periods of life. Rather than constantly changing. Man, I feel like this is like the third or fourth time we've talked about salmon on this channel. I feel like my fourth grade teacher is haunting me with all of that salmon knowledge that she taught me. I guess that's what happens when you grow up near a major salmon hatchery. Another thing I learned in elementary school is that there are no saltwater amphibians. And HA! HA! I say to you, those were but lies. <laughs> but lies. For there is one! It's the crab-eating frog. However, it's only able to live in up to 2.9 salinity water, so it's on the lower end of salt water. Perfect for hunting in tide pools, then, where crabs live, hence the name. And the only reason it's able to live in this type of water is thanks to its stinking massive kidneys that are able to produce enough urea, much like saltwater fish. See, now that would make an interesting Pokemon, a frog in the ocean, kind of like the frogs from Wind Waker. It'd be cool. Well, anyways, there are many water type Pokemon that would actually fit well into this category, along with amphibian, or even just straight up land creature that happens to be water type. However, this video is more of a fresh versus salt water debate, so if I miss any Pokemon that you think breathe water, not air, let me know. But I'm going to exclude any water type Pokemon that I deem land lovers, like Squirtle and them. They aren't actually able to breathe water, they don't have gills, as well as they are based off of reptiles, which breathe solely air. Plus, if I remember right, I feel like I've seen Squirtle holding its breath while underwater in the anime, don't quote me on that. But that would make sense. There are plenty of water-dwelling creatures that still breathe air, like whales, dolphins, sea turtles, and more. You know? And also, just to clarify, because some of you are that glasses kid from Polar Express, obviously this isn't canon. Water Pokemon can go wherever. The games and the anime do not concern themselves with salt versus fresh water at all because that would only just complicate things. In this video, we are talking, if we added a bit of realism to Pokemon, what would they be? A fun discussion with some learning involved. So don't go down in the comments and be that guy. Okay, so first up, let's get the saltwater fish over with. Starting with Gen 1 and going down the list because I'm just gonna go down the list of them. It's a handy dandy Pokedex. I need to get a Pokedex prop, like Berkey Patobi, that'd be cool. Saltwater fish are generally found in the ocean, or possibly very brackish, salty, landlocked bodies of water. First up is Horsey, Seedra, and Kingdra, and also Skrelp is with them. They're all based off of seahorses, and if you didn't gather from the name, that implies the sea. However, there are some freshwater seahorses that you can see in pet stores, though these are normally actually pipefish, a cousin of the marine equine fish. 
Now, some seahorses can be seen in brackish freshwater estuaries, that is to say, salty freshwater places, kind of like those crabs we talked about, but they still are just normal, salt-living fish, but in the wrong places. Staryu and Starmi, along with Toxapex and Marini, are 100% saltwater fish. In fact, they would actually die, not because of the lack of salt, but because they need the calcium content from the salt for their bodies to function at all, since they are sea stars, and that's how sea stars work. They have a mighty high need for lots of calcium. Tentacool and Tentacruel are both squid jellyfish things that live in the ocean. Much like the real world squid and jellyfish, they are both marine environment inhabitants. Which, I should specify, does not mean water. Marine means of the sea, or of the ocean. So, salt water. Marine equals salt water. Anyway, fun fact, cephalopods are all marine animals, so this includes octillery as well. Ammonite and Amistar are based off of ammonites, who are marine-dwelling mollusks that lived near the bottom of the ocean during the Devonation through Cretaceous period. Similarly, Kabuto and Kabutops are also marine-dwelling creatures based off of troglobites, and also horseshoe crabs. They're like a cool in-between of the two. In fact, Wimpod and Golisopod are also based on them, and they are also two salt drinkers. Chinchow, Lantern, Huntail, Gorbis, and Relicanth are all based off of deep sea fish that live in much, much lower salt content waters than most other ocean fish, as, fun fact, the ocean floor is less salty than the upper ocean. Mantine and Mantike are actually based off of kite rays or flying rays, a type of saltwater ray. It's always interesting to think that manta rays breathe just by moving forward. If they ever stop moving, they stop breathing. In fact, now let's real quick just finish off all of the oceanic fish that are boring. Sharpedo's a shark, Quiltfish is a pufferfish, though note there are 29 freshwater pufferfish, but it's outweighed heavily by the VAST majority of them being saltwater. Relicanth, Bruxish, Luminion, Finion, Love Disc, Amolamola, Wishiwashi are all based off of ocean-pairing fish that live in a multitude of environments that share the fact that they are all filled to the brim with saltwater. Frillish and Jellicent are a little more interesting in the terms of their environment. All jellyfish are saltwater. However, there is a fish that looks exactly like a jellyfish that lives in freshwater. Though it's technically slightly different from a jellyfish, but we still call it a jellyfish because it looks like one. It's like how the thorny oyster is actually a clam, not an oyster. You know. Corsula is a coral that really needs that calcium the salt water provides. So again, much like Staryu and Starmie and the gang, they are also saltwater, and are even more dependent upon that than most. Shellos and Gastrodon are based off of the sea hair. I mean, it kinda looks like a rabbit if it was a gross slug. But they too are only found in, you guessed it, the ocean. Clauncher and Clowitzer are both based on shrimp, though in a really weirdly mutated lobster sort of way. Both shrimp and lobster live in the ocean. Binnacle and Babaracle are both based on barnacles, who in real life are solely marine dwellers too. And finally, for the saltwater dwellers, we have Pukumuku, the sea. Cucumber. So after the saltwater Pokemon, I'd say it's only logical to start on freshwater animals. These include animals found in rivers, lakes, ponds, who knows? Pretty much bodies of water that aren't the ocean or the seas. Goldeen and Sea King are both based off of koi, meaning that they are freshwater fish, as this fish is commonly used in landlocked ponds used for decoration, because that's what humans do. They take living creatures and make them decoration. Did you know that koi is technically just a kind of carp that we kind of bred to look different? They're like the dogs of the fish world. Speaking of carp, right next to Goldeen would be Magikarp, another freshwater fish. However, in-game you really are able to find Magikarp next to everywhere there is water, salt or fresh. But notably, its evolution Gyarados was first seen in the wild in the Lake of Rage, technically a freshwater source, which kinda, sorta specifies freshwater at least as a primary dwelling place. However, Gyarados is a special magical dragon serpent thing that probably could breathe both salt or fresh whenever it wanted, because it's magic. And because it's a Pokemon, Carvana is a piranha whose habitat is most notably the Amazon River. Other river fish include Basculin, who is based on a mix of a largemouth bass and a trout, both of which are lake and river fish. Barboach and Wishcash are also carps, but a lot less magical than Magikarp, so they get their own category of just carp. Wooper and Quagsire are categorized as the water fish Pokemon. But they are actually both based off of amphibians, not fish, game freak. I know, disgusting, right? How could game freak lie to us like this? Corefish and Crawdont are based off of uh, crawling fathers. 
comes up with these names? Anyways, crawdads are found in ponds and slow-moving rivers, and they are sometimes called freshwater lobsters too. But they aren't lobsters, because they are freshwater. And with that, we're actually done with all of the little fishes in big ponds. Next up are Pokemon that work out perfectly as a little bit of both, and in between. Really? I thought this category would be bigger, being that it's Pokemon and all, and pretty much all Pokemon can do it in canon because Game Freak doesn't care. But okay, whatever. These are Pokemon that work out perfectly as Yuri Haline organisms. I, I swear I must be butchering that. Shelder and Cloistry are interesting. While many bivalve animals live in salt water, there are a few small species that are able to live in fresh water along with brackish water. Again, the kind of water that can change. While I would have put them in the salt water category, I feel like they are more so based off of the urethaline animal. I must be butchering that as we see them basically everywhere in Pokemon, too. In fact, Krabby and Kingler are also in this category for the same reasons. Their evolution is so related, in fact, that we did an entire video about it. You should check it out here. It goes into their evolutionary tactics that led them to be the Pokemon that they are today. An odd one here is Remoraid. Being based off of the Archerfish, who is a freshwater species, however, there are two or three families that are Urahaline, though it's also based on the Remora, which is a salt-dwelling fish. So, it's fitting that Remoraid is in this category then. It's a combo of two different fish from two different worlds, just like Hannah Montana. And... That's it! Any other Pokemon that I didn't cover are either a water-dwelling reptile or mammal or some weird concoction of the two that breathes air. Or, they aren't water-type. I'm looking at you, stun Fisk, who would be salt water. For sure. And then there's Electros and its line, who would also be salt water. Unless it's based off of those scary New Zealand eels that are in lakes, or maybe river leeches. Those weren't water types, so I forgot about them. Blub. Blub. The sound fish make. Blub. Dragons. No other mythical beast is quite as prevalent across human history and varying cultures as the dragon. But what makes a dragon? And more specifically, why is dragon a type in Pokémon? I mean, think about it. It's weird. I mean, Pokémon has so many dragons! Like, there's Altaria? This month is Dragon Month, an entire month filled with dragon-type Pokemon videos. And next month, it's Fairy Month. Oh, fairies, and the little dastardly villains to dragons, like Altaria. But what question is possibly better to ask at the start of our special month than, why is dragon even a type? And what does it take to be dragon type? Normally I save such questions for the EVERY X-Type Pokémon EXPLAINED NOT TYPE series, but Dragon and Fairy are so unique and deep that we need to separate that into its own video, which is what this is. Especially since there is so much confusion when it comes to what makes a Dragon-type Pokémon. So, that's what we're going to figure out today on Noggin. Base facts first. The dragon type has been in Pokemon since the beginning, though with only one Pokemon line, Dragonite and Fam. Meaning that at the time, the developers really wanted Dragon to be a rare type, but why? Also, the dragon type has many quirks and characteristics that makes it out to be a rather interesting type, but the main draw for this typing, of course, is the real world's mythos. Thankfully, Game Freak didn't just make up all the dragon information because dragons are a big idea. I mean, what even are dragons, honestly? Not Pokemon dragons. We, we got a list of those. I'm talking real world dragons. What are they? Dragons vary. And when I say vary, I mean they vary, vary a lot. Hey, <laughs> grammar. However, almost every civilization has something like a dragon found within its myths and legends. And because of that, unfortunately, there isn't one cohesive idea of a dragon. However, there are some theories as to why almost every human culture has a dragon, and that theory points to our intrinsic fear of snakes, birds of prey, and big cats, all of which have common attributes across dragons. However, every culture seems to add or remove some non-key features, which brings up the question of, 
why do dragons even exist? And that's somewhat simple. The same reasons most fairy tales or myths exist to teach a lesson. Scary stories of the dark forest are a wonderful deterrent for children, essentially scaring them away from wandering off and getting lost. Dragons, in most myths, lived in dangerous areas like caves, volcanoes, vast deserts, and roaring oceans. Dangerous places for a child to explore unprepared. And the few dragons that don't live in such places were the nice dragons, used as a story device to teach a life lesson that isn't easily learned such as the Dragon's Gate in Eastern Legend, where if a carp works hard enough, it could be rewarded and turned into a dragon, teaching kids that hard work pays off in the long run. And this is where a huge difference in dragons between cultures comes up. How different cultures used them in stories. And even if you only split the world in two, east and west, the differences in dragons is astounding. For the sake of simplicity, let's just look at Far Eastern and European dragons for now. Eastern dragons are rather interesting in their existence. Where other cultures used them to keep children safe, these tales are normally used to teach wisdom. Eastern dragons are commonly benevolent or nice, rarely causing destruction, besides when people really deserved it. But in European mythos, dragons, specifically classic medieval hodgepodge of Greek and Roman dragons, were normally depicted as large quadrupedal lizards with wings, many of which could breathe fire. But this fire was distinct. It wasn't normal fire, it was advanced fire. Dragon's fire. That's right, and this is the first distinction in Pokemon that we found. Way back in Gen 1, there was only one dragon move, and it sucked. It's Dragon Rage, which for several generations just used a slightly modified flamethrower sprite animation. It was that lame. And basically worthless late game too, or competitively. Ugh. But that's not the point. Yet. Back to Eastern versus Western dragons, if Pokemon based its dragon type off of just one of these, then half of the dragons that we see in Pokemon would be cut from the dragon roster. So Pokemon's dragon type mustn't be just one type of dragon, it must definitely pull from all cultures. But by not clearly having a defined origin causes... mixed feelings? I feel like Pokemon's idea of dragon is both interesting and tame at the same time then. You see, you could just say it's all a mix mash of all dragons and media, however there are plenty of almost original ideas to be found, and it's these ideas that truly make Pokemon dragon type. We all know that looks don't make the dragon in Pokemon. Just look at Alolan Exeggutor or Altaria, and then look at Charizard and Gyarados. Two opposing issues with the dragon type showcased right here, folks. Plus, looking at the more recent dragon Pokemon, we seem to have classical dragons and new age dragons merging into this odd conglomerate of wacky monsters. I mean, just look at Haxorus. It's just a dinosaur with an axe face. That's like a Batman villain, axe face yet it's dragon type exclusively. Though, looks are rather important. Pokemon is a highly accessible game meant to be played at any age. So long as you can read, of course. This means that Pokemon types need to be easily identified by their looks and across all cultures. There are a few exceptions to this rule though, like Gumi, it's just a cute little slug, but these are more or less outliers or have very specific reasons for being dragon type despite not looking like a dragon, like Vibrava. It's a dragonfly. A pun. Not a true representation of a dragon. Pokemon are magical creatures for sure, but why are these creatures stronger? Because statistically, dragon-type Pokemon normally have higher stats than the other types, along with their rather impressive advantages and resistances and weaknesses. And even those have reasons as to why they exist. Dragon has always been seen as one of the more magical types. I mean, dragons are mythical. That's like half magic. Well, not like in Pokemon mythical, I mean like fairy tales, non-real, or real world magic which is fake. Maybe. You know, like Loch Ness and the Quetzalcoatlus and uh, dragons in our world. You know, they're, just, they're the square root of negative one. They're imaginary. But let's get back on track. 
I mean, the only reason Dragon is weak to Dragon is because that essentially says that they are so strong they can only really be hurt by other dragons. And since dragons are reptiles, most often associated with things like fire, ice, or cold is also a very effective weapon against them. And fairy is complicated. In most mythos, dragons were actually immune to magic because they are magic incarnate. Especially European dragons, it's almost stated directly. But in fairy tales and some other myths, it was said that dragons were weak to magic or could only be harmed with enchanted magical weapons, often blessed by a fey creature. And as for the reason steel resists dragon, well, it's a stretch, but in most fairy tales, a knight in shining armor would slay the dragon. Steel armor being the only way they had a chance. Dragon then resists grass, water, fire, and electric. Conveniently, the four base elements, as remember, in most fantasy, lightning magic is associated with the element of air. And these resistances, then, all relate to how dragons were immune to the forces of nature, the elemental magics. Plus, in the case of Pokémon, this almost helps instill the idea that dragons are strong, as those are the four starters types. So it seems, then, that dragons really do pull from their mythological roots, masters over the elements, and masters of magic. And another huge thing that dragons were known for across all cultures was their ability to manipulate that magic. And this this is where I'm just gonna say it, no more beating around the bush. Dragon type is essentially all about raw, arcane energy. In a way, you could explain it as an arcane type, or a sorcery type. That is what makes a dragon Pokémon a dragon Pokémon. Its ability to control this arcane power. Natively, that is. This is also why other Pokémon can learn Dragon-type moves despite not being dragons at all. They are just using a bit of that arcane magic, rather than sprouting a new dragon limb to use Dragon Claw with. Yeah! Dragons are very mystical and magical by default, and have the natural ability to wield such arcane power. However, they don't have the sort of refinement that you would assume magic has. Now, I know this may be a hard concept to grasp, let alone explain, so I've enlisted the help of D&D terminology. Basically, we're looking at the difference between mages and sorcerers, or wisdom charisma casting versus intelligence casting. Dragons know how to manipulate the flow of mana, the arcane energy that's everywhere in the universe, the energy that is present in all life. In terms of Pokémon, you could say that it's the infinity energy that surrounds everything. Where AZ used a machine to manipulate the energy, dragons are able to use their primal control of magic to affect the energy into useful abilities, such as Dragon's Fire. Relating it back to D&D, because it's pretty easy to explain that way, if you were to say that dragons are a sorcerer, you'd be correct. Basically, they have either knowledge or innate magical blood power pumping through them. At least of what I understand of common D&D magic, wizards practice learned magic. They study for years to learn how to manipulate and weave the mana and become masters of it. Sorcerers practice innate magic. They are gifted with an ability to manipulate the weave of mana and sculpt their interactions with it. Both things dragons are known for. However, their magic or their use of infinity energy is much more of a raw power, almost willing the magic to do the work by the sheer power or knowledge of manipulation. This is very different from other magics, such as wisdom or charisma-based magic, wherein they manipulate higher powers to help them or are channeling the power of gods to assist them with their magic, or knowing that special areas in the world have energy that enjoys being turned into fireballs or plant growth. They work with nature's own magic, flowing it along, just helping it do what it wants much quicker. But dragon magic is much more unnatural and controlled, basically forcing the flow of energy to fit into their design. This is why in D&D, Magic Missile is much less of a natural shape for arcane energy to be in, because its design is not by nature, but by the caster. You know that annoying thing where something is super interesting so the media start to pick up on it and then the general populace accepts it as fact? Unfortunately, that's how magic is portrayed in today's media. It's all fictitious, but one set of fiction is almost the base of all other fiction. Sort of like how just all fantasy movies and TV shows are just Lord of the Rings with a twist these days. 
Game of Thrones is just spicy Lord of the Rings. This is why I'm using D&D as an easy explanation. After all, its methodology is commonly accepted as the way fantasy magic works. But magic isn't the same in every universe, so perhaps you think this is totally wrong. This is where Pokemon comes into play. Let me explain a little bit. Infinity Energy is a term coined by the Devon Corporation, though I don't think they invented it like they say they did. They just definitely learned how to harness it. Basically, it's the power of life or spirit magic or mana, whatever you want to call it. But in Pokemon, it's called Infinity Energy, or maybe Aura. And dragons, heck, most Pokemon can harness this power to use their abilities, but that's a topic for another video. Instead, let's look at just dragons here. Dragons are an ancient Pokémon type. Much like rock and water, the type has existed for millions of years. In fact, that's why there are quite a few dinosaur Pokémon that have the dragon typing. Plus, almost all of the lizard-like fossilmon can learn plenty of dragon-type moves. Dragon is old, and it commands old magic. Magic as old as time, essentially. I mean, Roar of Time is a Dragon-type attack, come on. To figure out what I mean, it's sort of like in evolution. There's always things that are better at something than you. Rock types were good at using the Earth. Water, well, they were fish. But dragons, they were able to use this natural field of energy, infinity energy, mana. This is what let them survive. And of course, it being life magic, it's rather strong, which is why their stats are very good. But it's hard to master, and as such, there are very few dragon types. Fun fact that sort of helps my point. Dragon types only evolve through leveling up, the most natural and ancient way of Pokemon evolution. This could be because they are channeling infinity energy regularly with their dragon powers, whereas some Pokemon need special stones filled with power to evolve, or love from their trainer, or to be traded. Dragons also have, on average, much slower XP growth compared to other non-legendary Pokemon, meaning it takes longer for them to level up and evolve. Again, ancient ways. It takes much more experience to advance their power of this arcane force. Plus, there's the fun fact that more Mega Pokemon gain Dragon as a type from Mega Evolving. The keystones used in Mega Evolving are crystallized infinity energy, Pokemon Souls, which relates it again to strengthening the bond between Dragon and infinity energy. It's this usage of infinity energy or mana that grants a Dragon type its true power. Sure, other Pokemon can use this energy, but dragons get stabbed with it. Hence why they are dragon type. They are masters of mana, arcane adept, incarnations of infinity, super sorcerers, dragons. All synonyms in a way. Groudon and Kyogre, creators of the land and sea upon this planet. Their power is immense but it is not as strong as it once was. During the days of creation, they were primal, optimal, paramount. Now their powers lie dormant as they age. No longer do they need to create, for the creation is complete. But through primal reversion, we can take these demigod creatures and revert them back to their ancient, primal selves. But, what is a legendary trio without a third? Rayquaza, the great dragon guardian of the sky. The one that rules over the other two. What great power it must have had back in the times when it too was at its peak. Except there is no primal Rayquaza. Instead it gets a mega evolution, which is only possible because of people, so hang on a second, what gives? What? Really, this is a non-question. You're wasting everyone's time. Anyone who's played the game all the way through knows the answer. But what about those who haven't, Maxwell? And what about those of us who have a less than perfect memory? Hmm. Plus, it's Dragon Month. And this is a dragony topic to discuss. Not every video has to be some deep theory thing. That's dumb. You're dumb. Oh, nice comeback, boom brain. As nice as this video's topic, Flesh Fingers. Fuck! <laughs> So yeah, in summary, Groudon and Kyogre get primal reversions, but Rayquaza gets a mega evolution. That's a little unfair, but okay. Main question is, how does this get explained? Why is this the case? 
And thankfully, the Delta episode in Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire explains it quite well, and by that, I mean the Lore Keeper, Zinnia. Zinnia speaks of a tribe of Dragon-type Pokemon users in the ancient times, feeling the wrath of the two primal Pokemon doing battle around them. Then, eventually, Rayquaza came to them, descended from the heavens, and overwhelmed the two primal Pokemon. Yeah! Rayquaza by itself was still more powerful than Primal Kyogre and Primal Groudon. He doesn't even need the Mega Evolution, it's crazy! But her story continues. Later, a great meteoroid struck the land, creating the crater that Sotopolis now resides in. And the meteoroid had a great power, reawakening the two primal Pokémon. They both wish to take its power for themselves, as the meteor was essentially a keystone. As the two fought, the people remembered the legend of Rayquaza from a thousand years before. And in their faith, they wished and hoped that the Emerald Dragon would come to their aid once more. And eventually, it did. And by the power of the Keystone Meteor and all of the faithful believing of the people, the energy from their hearts whooshed into the Keystone and then to Rayquaza, causing it to Mega Evolve. Now with this great power, it was able to not only overwhelm Kyogre and Groudon once more, but did so to the extent that they both lost their primal abilities. Hey, what's going on over here? Oh, you used to fight him. Stop it. That's not mad. Also, just so you know, my lisp only empowers individuals. I am not making fun of them. I am a grown man. And that is the tale. So in short, what is the answer to our question? Why doesn't Rayquaza have a primal form like the other two in its legendary trio? And the answer is because it didn't need one. It's already more powerful than they are. Plus, considering the lore, that makes sense. Guardian of the sky? The sky has been the sky for as long as it's been the sky, but the creators of the land and the sea? They would definitely need to be more powerful than they were back when they were actually doing all of the creation. And now they just don't need as much. It makes sense, right? Yeah! And as for there being a Mega Rayquaza, well, I'm sure that's just because it looks cool for one, and Mega Evolution was the Gen 6 gimmick. But also, it goes in line with the lore of the whole Pokémon world. We'll have a video detailing the meteoroids later, but they were keystones, and were likely launched into space when the ultimate weapon was fired 3,000 years ago, and they just periodically fall down as more keystones for Mega Evolution, as those were created by the ultimate weapon. Mega Evolution takes a connection with your Pokémon, and you need a Keystone and a specific Mega Stone. In the case of Rayquaza, it was the faith and trusting in Rayquaza by all of the townsfolk, and the great energy given off by the Meteoroid that granted it the power to Mega Evolve. It's Mega Rayquaza, everybody. No, you're Mega Rayquaza. Then later, with your trainer, Rayquaza actually needs to eat a meteoroid to gain such power, making it sort of an exception to the Mega Evolution rules, but being a legendary Pokémon makes exceptions plenty acceptable. So I hope this video got your noggin joggin' and helped you remember all of that, or maybe even taught you that if you skipped the Delta episode or something. Ah, uh, I mean, it's Dragon Month, so we're answering all sorts of Dragon Pokémon questions, both simple and complex. Also, check out this dragon t-shirt design. You can pre-order it, link below. Super helps this channel stay afloat, and next month is Fairy Month, so check that out too. And until next time, please remember to never stop using your noggin, and uh, make sure you always pronounce Rayquaza correctly, because for the longest time as a kid, I always called it Rakzea because I was like 12, and I only ever read the word, and no one told me that it's not Rakzea because dyslexia is just the worst. Gee, Bill, why does your Game Freak let you have two Rayquazas? AKA, why are there two Rack Zaynards? I mean, if you look at the games, only one legendary Pokemon is available per game. Legally, anyway. 
And this is not including trading, obviously, because by trading you can theoretically get an infinite number of legendaries because each other game cart is an entire universe, canonically. But a single game, without trading, you can only get one legendary. So technically, no, there aren't two Rayquazas in your copy of Pokemon Emerald. But if we look into the anime movie canon, we actually get a good theory going. You see, Rayquaza has been in many Pokemon movies, along with quite a few episodes. Even if it's not the main character, it shows up quite a decent amount. But this is where we have a few issues. It's rather hard to differentiate between Pokemon of the same species unless otherwise noted. I mean, if you were to show me a picture of Pikachu, it's easy to assume. It's Ash's Pikachu. It's the same Pikachu all over, even if it's never directly stated. Then again, you can also do the opposite. This isn't Ash's Pikachu. It's, it's hard to tell specifically though, because most of them all practically look the same. The Rayquaza in Destiny Deoxys looks the same as it did in Diamond and Pearl Anime Episode 142, as well as most of its other anime appearances. Sure, sometimes it mega evolves, but we never truly know if we are dealing with the same individual Pokémon. That is to say, if you believe... the theory. The theory of multiple legendaries. Which we'll get into another time. But in the case of Rayquaza, it has a shiny form. I mean, all Pokémon do, but Rayquaza has a canon shiny form, which makes it wholly different. It's widely believed that Pokémon Conquest is not a part of the main Pokémon timeline, and the fact that the main antagonist uses a shiny Rayquaza is some of the biggest evidence of that. But what if it's not? What if there's a shiny and a normal Rayquaza, and he just happens to have one of them at this time? Well, even if it wasn't, Pokemon Conquest still wouldn't be canon because this guy uses Flippin' Mewtwo, who would not have existed in feudal Japan. Unless it time traveled? Uh, we know that's possible in Pokemon. As is hopping through dimensions, though. No, no, too sidetracky. Back to my big boy in black, or green, or both! You see, in Diamond and Pearl episode 43, Malice in Wonderland, there was a Rayquaza under the ownership of Cynthia, and also a shiny Rayquaza. Case closed! Except it was only shiny because it merged with a Miss Magius, and it wasn't actually shiny, it was just Miss Magius colors, which are similar to shiny Rayquaza, but... Uh, also, the whole episode is an illusion created by Miss Magius, so, uh, never mind. But Green Rayquaza appears frequently throughout the whole anime, for realsies, and even in some movies, like the Hoopa movie, we see... Black Rayquaza. Hmm. You know, shiny Pokémon, while they do appear in the anime, they are still super rare, which makes sense. But. Of all of the Pokémon to make shiny, Rayquaza? A legendary? A super important legendary at that? And one that has already been seen in its non-shiny form in both the anime and movies previous? Hmm. You know, up until the season that this movie takes place in, Ash was always in regions based off of various parts of Japan. But in Gen 5, he was traveling around Genova, which is based on the United States, specifically New York. So basically the opposite side of the planet. While this Rayquaza was brought here by Hoopa, like all the other legendaries, including the ones that recognize Ash, it would be less work to bring the nearest Rayquaza there is. So maybe, since being the guardian of the ozone and upper atmosphere is a big job, maybe there's a Rayquaza for each of the hemispheres. The western and eastern hemispheres. Hmm? And one of them is shiny which makes them easier to differentiate. I mean, flying around to defend in the hemispheres would be a lot of work. The meteoroids all falling all around. Run Rayquaza would have a very difficult time doing that. Though, it would make more sense to split the world into northern and southern hemispheres, since the winds blow mainly horizontally. That way they each are circling the globe with the wind currents. And then again, We've never confirmed what the Pokémon world looks like. Maybe Unova is on a different hemisphere than Hoenn and Sinnoh and all those on a north-south basis instead of an east-west basis. But maybe not. There's no way to confirm that one. Maybe Hoopa summoned a Rayquaza from a totally different universe. 
I mean, that's sort of what happened in the anime recently. Ultra wormholes and the shiny Tapu Koko and whatnot. So that's it. It's a theory. A filler theory. Charizard isn't dragon type. What? This is the first I've heard about this. I mean, how could he not be dragon type? I'm sure no one else has ever covered this topic. With me as the host. Oh yeah, leave it to Loxton to cover an unoriginal topic. But fret not, because we're going to do it better than everyone else. Yes sir, because we're the best. And by feigning confidence, you'll possibly watch me more. Because that works for others, right? But really, this is a debate as old as time itself. That is, if time started 12,265,920 minutes ago. Yeah, we calculated that out. But heck, I remember back on Ye Old Playground, I started fights about this. Charizard was a big deal back then, and honestly, he still is huge. Sort of a mascot for the game. In fact, it sort of was one at one point. You can check out that whole rabbit trail in this here video. But in this video, we're going to be talking about a trio of terrible typers. No, not words per minute. I'm talking about Charizard, Aerodactyl, and Gyarados. I mean, why do these poor, obviously dragons not get to be dragon type? Alone an executor gets to be dragon, and that's just stupid as heck. It's a stupid stick. Even the Wikipedia article has jabs at Charizard's inability to be a dragon. I'm not kidding. Look here. Even though Charizard gains the flying secondary type instead of the dragon type upon evolving, it belongs to the dragon egg group and learns dragon moves like Dragon Claw. I feel like whoever wrote this article is pretty salty about this. But I mean, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, then it must be a duck, but whoops! Look here, it's a goose! And you're dead now because you thought you could just waltz near it, but then BOOM! Razor Tongue, you can't just type a Pokémon on its looks alone. You know, they seem to do that with almost every flying type, and every fire, and, well, water, and... Alright, they do that a lot. But, I mean, what does a dragon even look like? How can you say with confidence that a dragon isn't a palm tree or a thick slug? Why does a dragon have to be a lizard, huh? Heck, who said it needs wings and arms? There are so many types of dragons that even the modern acceptance movement can't agree on what constitutes as a dragon. Does it have to have wings? Are they a hundred feet long? Can they only have legs? Do they really need to breathe fire? What about scales? Are those required? Do they grant wishes? Talk to humans? Exist? Hmm. All valid questions that have incredibly invalid answers. Really, who gets to decide what is and what isn't a dragon? Or... Or anything for that matter. <laughs> Almost had an existential crisis there. Ha! It's also not even just Charizard, it's Aerodactyl and Gyarados also. Two other dragonless dupes. You know what? I think it's fair you know something about me. I have got my biases. I don't think they really deserve dragon type. Yeah, even Charizard. They just don't have that special sauce to attain the dragon typing. Sure, they're mad looking and mean, powerful, have wings, have breath weapons, and heck, even know multiple dragon type moves, but they're missing one crucial thing. Love. Ha! <laughs> no, they're missing that post-Gen 1 magic. That's right, it's Gen 1's fault, like always. Here we see Gen 1's dastardly legacy of undiversified types. Gen 1 really didn't have a bunch of types. I mean, duh, it was the first one, and type diversity wasn't super important. But they also had other reasons, such as rarity. Dragonite's line was the only dragon in Gen 1, and it was said to be super mythic, like dragons are in real life. So it only makes sense that there would be very few dragon Pokemon. Though, uh... Fun fact, it's no longer this way, as both Ghost and Ice have fewer Pokemon than Dragon, currently, as of making this video. It's probably going to be even more true after Sword of Shield come out, because I'm, I'm a predicting there's going to be loads of Dragons. So Dragon, being rare, was an excuse to have Charizard and the rest not have the Dragon typing. At least, that's one of the only real reasons people spout all the time when talking about this like they know something. <laughs> I'm sure that if you were to type them today, in this day and age, like if they didn't exist back then and they only existed now, 
you could argue that Aerodactyl and Gyarados would both be dragon without a doubt. I mean, one's a dinosaur with wings and a big jaw, so it's a dragon, easy, like many other dinosaur Pokemon that are dragon type despite just being dinosaurs. And then there's the other, there's Gyarados. It's Rage Incarnate, another dragony trait. Even Gyarados' origin story is dragonish, so it's a shoe in especially if they added a third type ever. However, Charizard, I feel, would have been fire-flying still. Just because Game Freak hates you, you, personally. Tim. Ooh, oh wait, even better answer. It wouldn't be fair at all. Even in Pokemon, a game of fighting animals, they need, they need to be fair to each other. Dragon type was pretty strong defensively in the meta of Gen 1, and giving an advantage to one of the starters makes for a very boringly uniform competitive and casual play environment. If it had dragon type, Charizard's water type weakness would be ignored by dragon's resistance to it. Poor Blastoise. Imagine if everyone only chose Char- Oh wait, they did that because apparently he's millions of times cooler than the rest of them, so never mind. Plus he's got a whole four more base stat than Blastoise and like nine over Venusaur, so he's obviously the best choice still. I'm so upset by this because Blastoise is so much cooler. Because he's water and it's the opposite of hot fire. But stop where your brain thinks it's thoughts because it's wrong. I'm wrong too. We're all wrong. Because it's not like Game Freak even thought about all this. Honestly, you people give them way too much credit. Even if the type advantage could be looked over, there's still this major factor. They don't just give out the dragon type to everyone. Plus, it's not even like the type is that good. It's the stats. Dragons, on average, have much higher stats than regular Pokémon. This makes it sound like the dragon type is a really strong type, when really, that's only partially true. You see, traditionally, the dragon type Pokémon have been the pseudo-legendaries, so their stats are all very high by definition. This, however, isn't actually a true reflection of the type. Just circumstance. So all of that unfairness and stuff gives Charizard not the best case for being a dragon. Especially if you start looking at Charizard's origins. When Gen 1 was being developed, there were no plans to release it in the West at all, and, well, Japanese dragons look nothing like Western ones. When looking to Charizard's Japanese name, Lizardon, meaning Lizard of Flying, there's nothing in there that screams, I'm a dragon! Instead, it screams, it's a flying lizard. Which is a thing, actually. Check it. Flying lizards. That's what they do. And if we look to the more, much more recent Mega Evolutions, it helps solidify the fact that Charizard isn't a dragon. At least, in terms of typing. If we look at Mega Charizard Y, we see that it just gets bigger. Gen 1 joke.jpg Nothing really stands out. Charizard gets edgier and its features act like other Megas. In a way, it's more Charizardy. Take Charizard's traits and exemplify them. It flies faster because that's what Charizard is about. It is a flying lizard, hence the name. Megas are an enhancement of the Pokémon's truest form. So in this case, it's non-dragon. Whereas Mega Charizard X gains the dragon type, and the design changes drastically. The wing structure changes entirely, his body gets more horns, and the traditional spine spikes like many western dragons have, it emits a darker aura, a much more magic-y, draconic essence. All things that it lacks in its other forms. If you take a look at our What Makes a Dragon Type video, you'll totally understand what I'm talking about. All in all though, when they took Charizard and made it more Charizardy, it stayed the same type. But when they changed Charizard drastically, even the color of its fire, now it's dragon type. In a way, it says Charizard clearly isn't dragon type, and we have to change it a lot to make it one. But okay, let's be honest. Again, the Gen 1 game was not really made with the West in mind. I mean, almost no one here understood what Kadabra even was, or what Jinx was. I mean, they're monster looking. So they're good Pokemon, I suppose, but they're just too out there for us Westerners. We never truly understood the reasons they looked the way they did. And typically in Japanese mythology, dragons were significantly more related to great storms and wind, and heck, even the ocean. But fire? 
It was there, but not so much compared to Western dragons. But Loxton, you said wind and storm, so why isn't Gyarados dragon type? He's literally storm incarnate. Well, you got me there. But if you give me a moment, I'm sure I can talk it away. Let's go back to the storm wind thing. Generally, when you think of storms that are destructive like dragons, you would think lightning, tornadoes, and hurricanes, yeah? Well, that's correct. Yeah, of course I'm correct. So, it would then be true that any true dragon would be able to do these things, these moves, such as Thunder or Twister, which is a dragon move. And with the wind and eastern dragons in mind, most of them are wingless. And despite being wingless, they can fly. Gyarados can't fly, while well, Dragonair can. Because it's a dragon. Gyarados ain't. And then Thunder. Yeah, Gyarados can technically learn Thunder through TMs, but not naturally, at least. But at least Aerodactyl can naturally learn Fly, so there's that. But when we look at Dragonite, we see that its move pool is much larger in terms of traditional dragon abilities. Plenty of elemental aptitude. Is that even a word? It is now. Now, as for a good lore reason, though, Gyarados isn't a dragon when you really dive into its origins. So Magikarp's evolution into Gyarados is based on a Chinese legend involving a carp climbing a waterfall and jumping over the Dragon Gate. Doing so would cause it to become a dragon. That much is pretty easy to understand, and clearly, Magikarp just turned into a Chinese dragon here. However, and a lot of people miss this, it's common in Japanese legends for dragons who abuse their power to lose its dragon status and become nothing more than a flying serpent. Let's think about what Gyarados is known for in Pokemon. Oh yeah, Rage Incarnate can think of nothing but destruction and it destroys villages that slide it. I see. Perfect. That sounds pretty abusive to me! Sometimes I think Game Freak might have actually cared back then, but then again, it's probably just a nice coincidence. Though Gyarados' stats are still rather impressive, basically comparative to a dragon's stats. I mean, 540 is nothing to sneeze at, only coming 60 short of Dragonite's 600. Also, while I was looking into this, did you know that Alakazam also had 600? And that just goes to show that Gen 1 balancing was way bad. Absolutely terrible. I can't believe people like it. So terrible, in fact, that there's actually no big reason Dragon was even good, other than, of course, its resistances. I mean, there was only a single dragon move back then. Yeah, Dragon Rage, a move that Charizard, Gyarados, and even Aerodactyl could learn in Gen 1. And this move wasn't even affected by type advantages or stab bonuses, because its whole thing is that it does 40 HP and damage, period. The one attack that dragons can use better than non-dragons. They don't use better than non-dragons because it's a metagaming move instead of real. But that is also another reason why Dragon was so strong in Gen 1, as Dragon was effective against Dragon. It's one of its only two weaknesses. But there's no actual Dragon moves to use against them. This is important in Gyarados' case, as if it were Water Dragon, it would essentially have no weaknesses at all, as Water covers the only other Dragon weakness, Ice. And Dragon covers Water's weaknesses, Grass and Electric. Gyarados would be basically immortal. Plus, Game Freak may also have already had a Sea Dragon in the works, with Seedra eventually evolving into Kingdra in Gen 2. Notably, they also added a lot more Dragon moves in Gen 2, so this fight isn't absolutely impossible. So really, all in all, Game Freak doesn't care about your wants. They only caved in once, and that was with Mega Charizard X. And they just slapped the Dragon type on it, and hoped that you'd be satisfied by the X version if you care so much. Gyarados is actually an interesting Pokemon with good reasons to be both dragon and not dragon. It's got good reasons for both, with the whole flying serpent if you abuse your dragon powers thing. Though, I would love to see a possible split evolution of Magikarp being a benevolent dragon. That'd be pretty sweet, actually. Oh man. And Aerodactyl! Well, no one really ever cared. But Aerodactyl. No one really even thought it was a dragon. It's just a dino wyvern that died to a meteor. What did kill the dinosaurs in the Pokemon world? Hello, hello again. I'm back, as promised in the Every Dragon Type Move Explained video, to explain in more detail what Roar of Time even is. It's easily one of the most interesting and complicated moves in the game. I mean, how does a roar distort time even a little bit? 
I suppose it makes sense that this is the signature move of Dialga, the Pokemon deity of time, but still, while the dragon type is based in a lot of arcane magic, there has to be a bit of science we can apply to it, right? Plus, I love Dialga. It's one of my all-time favorite box legendaries. I mean, it's blue and cool. What's not to love about his dumb elongated head? That's quite big. So I just needed an excuse to make a video all about it. Roar of Time is a crazy move. Here's how the Pokedex describes it. The user blasts the foe with power that distorts even time. The user must rest on the next turn. In a way, it's basically a reskin of Hyper Beam, but it's Dialga themed. And being the creator of time and all, I feel that it's perfectly acceptable that it can distort time. Also, in later dex entries, the end bit actually changes to the user can't move on the next turn. So this move is so crazy that even the creator of time has to stop for a turn to rest up. Jeez! Also, this is the strongest base damage dragon type move that isn't a Z move. Also, it just looks great. The best laser in the whole game. These are all straightforward facts, people. As for how it works, though, that's gonna take a while. To explain. And I don't want this video to go on too long, so I'm gonna start getting into it. So despite being named Roar of Time, the move actually appears to be just a mega blast of energy. I mean, the ability Soundproof doesn't work when confronted with this power, so it's not really a Roar of Time, is it? Hmm. However, we could take it literally anyway. And plus, fluff reasons. What would it take for a literal Roar to do it? Also, that sounds like a lot of fun. So let's do that. Plus, come to think of it, soundproof not blocking it makes sense anyway, because if we're dealing with a sound capable of distorting time, I doubt any sort of soundproof ability is going to matter. And before you ask, yes, its name is still Roar of Time in Japanese. It's very much a roar of time that then blasts a beam of energy forward. As if it roars and combines all that sound into a tiny space and then it forward. So, a power so strong it can distort time, huh? That's gotta be huge. I mean, is there even anything that strong? And if so, why haven't we invented time travel yet, huh, Mr. Science Man? Unless it was hidden under our noses the whole time. Though I feel like time travel and such is more a philosophical issue rather than a scientific one. I mean, time doesn't even exist, you know? Unless you believe that it does. Uh, in which case, time just is. It's essentially a constant. Time is pretty much made up by man to explain that things happen after each other. I do this, and then I do that. That happened after this. You can tell and prove it based on the time that they happened. Time isn't a force. It isn't an actual measurement of something. It's just a reference. Any number value is meaningless unless there is a previous number value. Basically, time is nothing. Now, to ignore the existential crisis, there are some fun things that Roar of Time does. It states that it can distort time due to its immense power. Now, we could just say that Dialga shoots a concentrated beam of TIME energy that explodes so violently it creates a micro vacuum in time, similarly to a small explosion in water. It expands and then immediately collapses. But what time energy is, uh, is fictional. So while I'm not sure on time energy, I do know a fair amount of real world physics. So let's try some of those on for size. Starting with gravitational time dilation. Basically, and this is super simplified, time is slowed the closer you are to very large gravitational fields, such as the Earth or other celestial bodies. This time dilation is really Really small. I mean, GPS satellites orbiting the Earth do actually have to correct for the fact that time passes very, very slightly more slowly on the Earth's surface than it does in low Earth orbit by about one second for every 60 years. That's nothing. But the computer needs to know this to get accurate GPS readings and all. And Earth is pretty big, whereas Dialga isn't all that large. I doubt it could affect time in this way, especially since that's more of a space thing. And that's Palkia's territory. However, there is one type of celestial body that I know of that may do the trick. And you probably have the same idea in your head right now. It's black holes. I mean, black holes, man! How do they even work? They're almost like magnets. Magnets of the universe. Mysteries 
of the universe. Black holes are super dense gravity generators in a way. Speaking of gravity, let's talk about Einstein, cool guy, with even cooler theories. Basically, energy is mass. You know, E equals MC squared stuff. So in theory, energy could be considered mass via that equation. In fact, it's his other theory of relativity that is what explains the whole gravity time thing. And that word, relativity, really hurts our Pokemon move. You see, the time right next to a black hole is unchanged. But Loxton, why do satellites need to correct them? Hmm? Ah, good, you were listening. I will try my best to explain this easily. If someone were to go into a black hole and flash a light back to Earth every second, time would be completely normal to them. They would continue flashing their light all the way until they got turned into soup or whatever happens inside of a black hole. However, if someone was watching them, they would see the light flashes slow down as they got closer and closer to the event horizon. Eventually, they wouldn't see the light at all, as the time between the flashes would be so long that they would die before they saw the next one. So time isn't really even broken with a black hole. It's relative. Both places are experiencing time at the same rate. A second is a second. So I'm not sure you can really even distort time enough to damage anything. It's the gravity that's doing that. Space. However, if something like the event horizon's gravitational influences affected a single point on Earth, impossible as that may be, I would definitely consider that a sort of time distortion from the outside observer, or Dialga, or anyone else in the battlefield that isn't the Pokemon being hit. And to cause that sort of distortion takes a lot of energy. A lot. In fact, if someone were to experience this time dilation, they wouldn't actually feel any different, because again, relativity, but to someone watching, they would almost not age at all. It's kind of like Interstellar, the whole movie about the theory of relativity, but how this slightly differed time or relativity hurts something, not sure. But the energy to create such a distortion, now that would hurt. After all, we're talking black hole power here. Okay, but taking the name literally, now how could sound even make a black hole? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, sound is a tricky thing, similarly to time. Sound isn't actually an easily quantifiable, measurable thing. It's a reference. Meaning, that lawnmower may seem loud, but it's relatively quiet compared to a jet engine now, isn't it? Also, if your ears are more or less sensitive, because you're an animal that has huge ears, or no ears. What is loud and what is quiet is completely different. However, most people make the base reference to the quietest thing as zero decibels, or nothing. Kind of like how we all agree on seconds for time, but we still had to make up what a second was. Fun fact! Since 1967, the second has been defined as the duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfinite levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom at a temperature of zero Kelvin. And funnily enough, that's basically because that's what the second that we made up already was, and then later we found an atom that happens to vibrate at just the right frequency, so now we have a second that's based off of a real physical thing, but our made-up number came up first. So with sound being basically the vibration of airwaves, we actually have the main source of energy. I didn't mean to throw them. But how do you even fathom that kind of energy? Plus, how loud is this roar? That would be a fun number to think of. And unfortunately, we can't really figure out those specific numbers as the power it takes to make a black hole is still a mystery for you, for us humans. But we can make crazy guesses, right? I mean, a rocket ship lifting off is 200 decibels, right? And the loudest noise in human history, the eruption of Krakatoa, which was heard around the globe multiple times as the sound waves continuously circled the globe, it was so loud, and it was around 300 decibels. And it's theorized that our sun could be 400 decibels loud. 
Thank God sound doesn't travel through space, because fun fact, if the space between the sun and the earth was air instead of space, we could hear it at a deafening 120 decibels. Which is basically if you stood next to a train horn, but always. And that's what the sun would sound like at our distance from it. And our sun is a rather small star. If we're talking black holes capable of changing time, then we may be dealing with something magnitudes higher than our lousy sun. Some estimate that this would be somewhere between 800 and 1,100 decibels. And that's ridiculous. The difference between one decibel, the quietest sound you can hear, to 100 decibels is a factor of 10 billion times louder. It's a stupid logarithmic function. Going from 20 to 30 decibels is significantly, basically exponentially, a greater change than going from 10 to 20. Even though the number differences are the same, that's not how it works. This is bigger than this. If that makes sense. So 1,100 decibels is absolutely ridiculously loud, let's just say. You don't understand. You really can't. 1,100 decibels is 10 to the 109th power times louder than 10 decibels. That's a hundred and nine zeros. Look at this freaking number. It's still going. Still. Now put it all on screen at once. The heck. And that's how much sound based energy you would need to just start to distort time. Interstellar is BS. Theoretically, anyway. We don't really understand this stuff yet. I mean, the closest comparable sound that you may have experienced, since Krakatoa happened forever ago, would be, like, the PS2 startup sound or something. Or video auto-playing on a website. Coming Which soon to all on DVD ears. and video. This attack is like a death vuvuzela. The vuvuzela. <laughs> Also, side note, there's no way anything could create that amount of power. The science just isn't there. But that's how loud this roar would need to be to even begin to distort time, and that only works based on certain theories of relativity. Time is dumb. Honestly, Dialga probably doesn't have that much power. I mean, if we look at facts, Dialga and Palkia combined couldn't even create major time distortions, even under the control of Cyrus. So, no restraint here. But if, if Dialga just kept roaring, forever, it would destroy the entire region with those sound waves long before any time distortion happened. So the attack that we see Dialga do? Nah. It's fictional time magic. Just like time travel backwards. Completely fictional. That's the only real explanation. But hey, it's fun to think of big numbers, isn't it? and to apply some semblance of real-world science to a fictional universe aimed at kids. I mean, you gotta enjoy it, that's why you click on my videos! I know you don't just watch it for me! Who would do that? So hopefully this video helps you truly understand that time is a man-made constraint. And also, as a bonus, now you know how the move Roar of Time works. Maybe. Dialga just yells super hard while also shooting an energy cannon. Of magical time energy. Easy stuff. This is the Tao Trio. I didn't go into super detail with them in my Every Dragon Type Pokemon Explained video because they would have taken however long this video ends up being to properly explain. And that video was already 30 minutes long. So now, here is the side note video that covers them in detail. Let's go over their inspirations that made them the way they are. And yes, Inspirations is plural. Most know of the yin-yang symbolism, after all. They are the Tao Trio. Also, yeah, I know however I pronounce yin-yang, I'm gonna get scrutinized, but I looked it up. It's yin-yang, if you're being proper. Yin-yang is just the American-esque way of saying it. I'm an American, so like, either way works. But other than their yin-yang symbolism, they also happen to fit right in with Western magic and mysticism in alchemy. But let's do the more commonly well-known Eastern stuff first, right after the intro. 
As a very base explanation, there was once an original dragon Pokémon, likely a theropod Allosaurus Tyrannosaurus European dragon mix. It wound up splitting into two when its twin prince trainers wanted to rule the land in very different ways. Though, this split into two caused a third to be born from the remains, which became the wild husk, Qrem. In an interview with Kansugi Mori, the designer of these Pokémon, he mentions how Reshiram and Zekrom are fully opposites. Not only are they black and white, but also Reshiram is stated as being light, airy, and feminine, whereas Zekrom is hard, tough, and masculine. This is even reflected in the names. The middle parts of their names come from the Japanese words for black and white. And then, according to Sugimori, the beginning syllables were chosen based solely on how they sound. Ray sounds soft. Zek sounds hard. Even the full names, Reshiram, flows smoothly. Zekram is harder and more punctual. Kyurem, then, interestingly, is right between the two, starting hard, but ending soft. It also ends with a different ending syllable from the rest. We have Rem, Ram, and Rom. The rest of Qrem's name pulls from Japanese words meaning cold, rapid freezing, snow, and nothing which is important for later. Now, the concept of yin and yang comes from Taoism and are directly referenced in the Japanese species categories of these Pokémon. You know, like how Pikachu is the mouse Pokémon, Reshiram is the white yang Pokémon in Japanese, and Zekrom the black yin Pokémon. And even their battle music in-game is named after this fact, blazing white yang and electrifying black yin. Now, to fully explain yin and yang is to explain a whole religion, so, I'll link a video that I think does that explanation justice in a short amount of time right here and in the description, but I'll also try a bit myself. The entire universe is filled with and made up of various energies. These determine whether something is yin or yang, but they are usually directly connected. Say, someone's back versus their front. A village on the east side of a mountain versus a village on the west side. The heads of a coin versus the tails of a coin. The male powers and the female powers. And even if something is yin or yang, it always has the potential to become the other. Thus the opposing color dots in the symbol. The water of a smooth flowing river can become a rapid waterfall. The sunlight hitting your face can become the sunlight hitting your back if you just turn around. The way the linked video puts it, in a way that a lot of Westerners can understand easier, is that you could sort of think of it as the dark side and light side of the Force. Luke and Vader. Vader has the potential to move to the other side, and he does in the movie. And similarly, Luke also has the potential to follow in his father's footsteps to the dark side. These beliefs are sort of what inspired Star Wars. Many have pointed out the Taoist symbology used in Star Wars, as even the users of the light side of the Force are imperfect, and even, as a whole, do some pretty dark things. You always have the potential to change, and the two sides wouldn't even exist without each other, and they have parts of each other. It's a constant flow, because life isn't black and white. Which gets into Reshiram and Zekrom's roles as the Pokémon of Truth and the Pokémon of Ideals. Their twin prince trainers wanted to rule the kingdom under those ideologies and fought for power. Only later did they realize the answer was somewhere in the middle. Because life isn't black and white. <coughs> or red and blue. <coughs> Both ways of ruling have their pros and cons. And if we went with the natural flow of the universe instead of filling our lives with complications and being stubborn about our ways, then, well, life would be a lot easier and more peaceful, wouldn't it? Then there is also Qrem, which symbolizes Wuji, which is the absence of yin or yang. It's cold and empty. It's nothing. Thus, nothing being referenced in its name. Its life is meaningless, so it searches for meaning, it searches for warmth, and thus goes after truth or ideals. Reshiram or Zekrom, based on the version of the game you get. For most people, the inspirations seem to end there. It's done! That's all it is. Yin Yang, there's nothing, nothing more. To some people, it's difficult to comprehend that a design can be inspired by multiple things at the same time. And even if the second inspirational source was the designer's main one, some people won't accept that as a thing at all, because it's the second thing that they heard. It's different from what they heard first, so it's wrong. You humans are... 
Us humans are so stubborn. Should get some Taoism in ya. So what is this second bit of inspiration? Well, if you remember my Alchemy The End series from uh, three years ago. Crap, that was three years ago! I was so plump and edgy! People really do always hate their past selves, don't they? What's important here is that I am referring to how alchemy, real world, magic, and mysticism is a major source of inspiration for Pokemon, especially legendary Pokemon. This peaked in Gen 7, but is also referenced in Gen 4 and 6, and as you'll soon see, even 5. Alchemy likes to use a lot of symbolism, and will often use planets or gods or animals to represent things like elements or processes. And most of the time, it was common to use animals, both real ones and mythical ones, for use in their symbolism. Now, similar to how yin-yang is opposites, but they each have a part of each other, in Western alchemy there are the two contraries, represented by a white fluffy dragon with two wings, and a black scaly dragon with four limbs. They too are opposites, but would not exist without each other. And while creative liberties were definitely taken, such as giving the black scaly dragon wings in Zekrom, and giving the white fluffy dragon bottom legs with Reshiram, the inspiration is still obvious! I mean, this is also probably why Zekrom has its wings separate from its limbs. That way it still has just four limbs to reference this. Then we can also look to Reshiram, whose claws are a part of its wings, to sort of imply it doesn't have arms, it has wings. Like this. So what are the two contraries? What are these magical creatures symbolizing? Well, they are Sophic Mercury and Sophic Sulfur. Sophic meaning a sort of spiritual wisdom. They are philosophical. Sophic can also mean the transferring of wisdom from spoken word to written word. It can also refer to a more scientific approach to spirituality, which is basically what alchemy was. It's spirit science. By specifying Sophic Mercury, it means not just Mercury, the element, but also all of the wisdom involved in it, the planet that symbolizes it, and the spiritual or magical power inherent to it. It can also refer to a specific mercury amalgam, one mixed with antimony and silver. It was believed by some alchemists that doing this would further bring out the powers of mercury. Thus it was sulfic mercury, and the same is applied to sulfur as well. But back to the two contraries as a whole, they are beasts which fight because they are opposites, yet they complete each other. Again, like yin yang. But they are also described as active and passive. Which could refer back to the inspirations of what these Pokémon symbolize truth and ideals. Those who believe in a world of truth tend to be more passive. The world is the way it is. Let's base our decisions and beliefs on reality here. And just to ruin the comment section by bringing up politics, this tends to be the conservative's way of thinking. Whereas, if you believe in making a world of ideals, you tend to be more active in pursuing those ideals. We must strive for the ideal world. Let's base our decisions and beliefs on what could be an ideal world. This tends to be the more liberal way of thinking. Have fun in the comment section. These two ways of thinking, these two ways of life, need each other to exist and keep each other in check. Which gets right into their philosophy of truth and ideals and yin and yang. And even the two contraries. Both of them are required for souls to exist, according to alchemy. They are what grants us free will and awareness. They're what allow us to even make our own choices to begin with. Which, again, again, is the whole life lesson moral of the story thing of Gen 5. Life isn't black and white. I mean, it's the theme song of the dang anime. It's never easy to make a choice. Oh, and also these two elements are two parts of what would make the Philosopher's Stone. No biggie. But now again, Qrem comes and messes things up, right? Well, no. Just like how it's Wuji in the Yin Yang symbolism, Qrem also fits perfectly into the alchemic symbolism as the representative of Sophic Salt. The three of them together making what in alchemy is known as the three essentials: salt, sulfur, and mercury. Basically, the three parts that, when combined, make up what is a soul or can be recombined to make a Philosopher's Stone. So hear me out, because this gets a bit complicated. The three essentials are said to be the child 
of the two essentials. The three wouldn't exist without the two. The three, the third one, comes from the two. This works out as Kyurem came from the splitting of Reshiram and Zekrom, from the original dragon. And it double works out because while these two dragons are depicted as the two contraries, when you merge them with the three essentials, it's depicted as this. A strange... what is called a dragon? It's a three-headed dragon. Honestly, the strangest dragon I've ever seen, but that's what it says it is. So, an original dragon that splits into three and an original dragon that splits into three. And we're still not even done. These essentials all interact with each other in various ways. The two contraries bash and clash, but complete each other. But in the process of merging the three essentials, you need to use the other essential, salt, in order to freeze the mercury and sulfur together, in order to ground them. Now what type is QRM? And heck, what was Getsus's plan in Black 2 and White 2? To freeze the whole region, including Reshiram and Zekrom, to gain total control over it. The symbolism works at every layer. So are you really gonna argue that Yin Yang is the only inspiration of these Pokémon? Most Pokémon mix more than one thing together in their design. The ones that don't are commonly panned for being boring and uninspired. It's just a seal with a horn! It's just a freaking dog! And to make this all come together, most Gnostic alchemists, come to think of it, believed in ways very similar to Taoism, but with a Western kick. Western religions like Christianity teach that Jesus and God are the ultimate good, and Satan and his demons are the ultimate evil. It is black and white. But Gnostic alchemists did believe in the Judeo-Christian God and his powers, however, not that he was a single entity of ultimate good. Rather, God, it, was a force of light of the universe, and Satan a force of darkness. Neither of them is 100% black or white, and they both influence us to act in different ways, even in writing books in the Bible. It's the light, natural flow of the universe compelling people, rather than a floating dude with wings coming down and whispering things into people's ears to write down. All in all, Gnostic alchemists did believe in the Judeo-Christian God, but with a sort of Taoist twist. Which is why a lot of alchemy involves symbols and religious flair. God is a force to them, like electricity or mana, and forces can be harnessed and used to transmutate stuff. Thus, metaphysics and things like that was born. Spirit science. It's really interesting stuff, thinking about the way people think. Now just imagine that I have a really nice conclusion paragraph here. Ultimately, you decide for yourself what you want to think. This is technically just theoretical. Maybe this Tao Trio connection to alchemy really is just a good coincidence. Really good coincidence. Fairies, fey creatures as a whole, have popped up around all of human history. Wherever a natural phenomenon goes unexplained, it is usually blamed on their actions. The epicenter of their origins is found in Western Europe, but as the world gets more and more connected, their influence spreads on a global scale, and it eventually reached Japan. Meaning, of course, it just had to be added to Pokemon. It's Fairy Month, y'all. And you know what that means? The exact same videos that were in Dragon Month, but fairy-themed. <laughs> Woo! airhorn.mp3, or whatever you kids are using these days. And much like the dragon type, fairy type is also quite interesting. At least interesting enough to require its own video. But since we did this with dragon and fairy, we're just gonna make this a whole new series. After all, you people love Pokemon videos, and as my good friend Mr. Krabs says, I like money. The fairy type was added in Generation 6, Pokemon X and Y. And then it killed the franchise! Coincidence? No, just poor marketing on their part. Would, would you be positive for once? G go! Get back to VP! Anywho, Game Freak has actually gone on the record stating that the reason fairy type was added was to bring dragons down a notch or two without actually nerfing them. Alright. 
Well, what's something so powerful that it could easily beat up dragons? Perhaps some eldritch type, horror type, an unspeakable power capable of tearing draconic beings to shreds. Or we could just make cute baby Pokemon and just say that they're stronger. I guess the, uh, the juxtaposition is kind of funny. And along with some all new fairy type Pokemon, they went back and changed 22 older Pokemon by making them fairy type too. Nothing wrong with that. They were basically fairies already. And when they introduced Steel and Dark, they did the same thing. But the big question then is, why were they given the fairy type? And what even is the fairy type? Those are the questions we answer in the not type series. But just like with Dragon, it's big enough that we're splitting it into two videos. So today we're answering the question, what is fairy type? Fairy types are generally cute and typically pink. And while I'd rather not talk about Snubble, it's noteworthy that in canon, women love them. It must be the pug thing again. It's so ugly, it's cute. I just don't get why you would want a genetic disaster of an animal. But back to actually cute Pokemon. Most of the fairies are pink, with only some exceptions, like Meryl. But again, going back to the question, why are they mostly pink and cute? Well, other than trying to expand the game audience to include more girls, because we all know girls love pink stuff. Game freak. Fun fact! Apparently the whole blue for boys, pink for girls is a western thing. Apparently in the east, they are sort of reversed, as blue is much more of a feminine color, flowing like water. Whereas pink is masculine, like fire. Pink is just light red after all. But here in the western world, we've seen pink as girly for decades now. And because of advertising and all those darn baby boomers, we of course have the media power to just explode our cultural values across the world. And so this mindset has started to become the norm everywhere, even the Far East. And pink works out fairly well because Game Freak needed a color to represent the type, as they do with every type, and there wasn't a pink color type yet, besides some depictions of psychic. But it's not like pastel pink now, is it? Plus it works. Fairy types are generally more feminine and also puffy and cute cute. Light, airy, fluffy, majestic, sparkly, pink. But thankfully, besides just pink and girly, some Pokemon actually have much more inspired reasons to why they are fairy type. Again, we'll go over that in another video. However, the reason I bring their diversity up is because the word fairy itself means a lot of different things. At one time, it was a small human that had a knack for trickery. Other times, it straight up meant goblins. Sometimes fairy means literally magic or enchanted, not even creature. It could be a rock and could still be fairy. Garbing. So the type is not just a single trope. It's not just Tinkerbell the Pokemon. The fairy type really encompasses magic. It's similar to the dragon type in this regard, but unlike dragon type, their magic is clearly different. They also differ from dragons in that they were an added type, a non-native type to the game. And by looking at the older Pokemon they went back and gave the type to, we may be able to get a better grasp on how this type differs from, say, normal type. A really good example of this is the Jigglypuff line, previously mono normal and now normal fairy. It's a quick to temper creature that is able to lull travelers to sleep and then causes mischief which already sounds mighty close to a fairy tale now that you mention it. Mr. Mime's dex entries say, its pantomime skills are wonderful. You may become enraptured while watching it, but next thing you know, Mr. Mime has made a real wall. That, along with its ultra dex moon entry, which states that if you're not impressed, it attacks you, basically means that Mr. Mime is a performer that enjoys entertaining people or inconveniencing people. And if you don't think it's super neat, it hates you. It's another very common fairy tale trope. Mawile is different though. It being based off of a dangerous yokai, a Japanese spirit, you'd think, how could it be fairy type? Fairies are good. And that thinking is to Mawile's benefit. You see, Mawile is a trap at its heart. It lures you in with its cuteness, which 
by definition, is a classical fairy trait. A fairy tale we all know is a story that is used to teach, or present a lesson to children, or to tell a narrative to help us humans interact with our environment, and dare I say it, society. However, where the line between a story and a fairy tale is drawn is rather mixed. Normally, the addition of magic or non-real beasts are found in fairy tales, and from these tales and imaginative stories, our culture has created a sort of understanding of the tales, and as such, we have a basis of what magic really is. It's this understanding that helps us create basic ideas or images that other humans can interpret easily. Basically, humans like things they already know, and most of us have been told stories of dragons and knights, fairies and demons and such. They are an assumed variable in marketing. Er, I, I mean, uh, it's a common thing that we all have in common. <laughs> yeah. But because of this sort of universal standard of magic, we can figure out what truly makes a fairy type a fairy, because it's based off of actual mythos. But classical fairies are quite different than what they are today. Remember, marketing. Kids don't want to hear about some gross old lady who eats kids. That's pretty messed up. They want to learn about friendship and stuff, right? Or at least their parents want them to. So there isn't a very concrete connection between all of the classic fairy lore and Pokemon, although that's not to say that there's none. There are quite a few things that predominate from fairy tales. One being their weaknesses, like steel. Most people today associate fairies with things like nature spirits in the form of sprites or pixies, and being embodiments of nature magic, things that harm nature would harm them too. Steel is man-made. It's as unnatural as you could get back when people believed in fairies. As such, as just one of many examples, in the tale of Maleficent, the fae guardian of the forest, Maleficent is weakened by just being in the presence of steel, and the king, wanting to keep all fey actions outside of his kingdom, surrounded the kingdom with a thorny iron fence. This weakness to steel is actually why horseshoes are considered good luck. By having horseshoes of cold iron on your horse, you would keep trickster goblins away and fairies away while you traveled. Steel is a poison to fey creatures, and so is actual poison thus the weakness to poison. Anything that kills nature would also be harmful to nature spirits, obviously. Thus the weakness to fire too. Forest fires are no joke. And also, all three of those things are associated with mankind. We made steel, we mastered fire, and our poisons and pollutants are extremely potent. These are the themes that unite almost all fairies in myth and Mon. Though sometimes there are stories about fake creatures making their own steel, such as some goblins, but that's a much more recent fantasy thing. A big difference between modern and classical fairies. However, while they may have their differences, they do have one other thing in common. Magic. You see, fairy or fae are all magical creatures by default. Magic incarnate much like dragons. However, where dragons were beasts of might and terror, they were more so trickster magicians. We explained that Pokemon are magical creatures in the dragon type video, and magical creatures are all equal. But some magical creatures are more equal than others. Dragon and fairy, to be exact. I mean, there's a reason that they are both tied for the third rarest type. It's because they're mythical creatures, you know? Fairy tales. In the dragon type video, we talked about how dragon type was essentially all about raw, arcane power. They control magic, bend it to their will through sorcery. And by comparing that to the much newer fairy type, we can really figure out what fairy is. And seeing how most of you totally understood my D&D &D references last time, and I totally know stuff and totally don't have to ask people, I'm going to try again to explain the differences of fairy magic to dragon magic. You see, where dragons control and twist magic or mana to do their bidding, fairies instead invoke magic. If a dragon is a sorcerer, fairies are much more like druids 
and clerics. They aren't taking over and reshaping the magic. Instead, they are channeling the world's mana and using it in a more recycled sort of way. Basically, borrowing power from the divine beings of nature. Nature's own magic, spirit, or aura is everywhere and everything has it. Flowers use this magic to grow slowly, but with the help of a sentient magic user, they can grow rapidly. Fairy magic. The moonlight is constantly radiating magic down to earth, and with just a little tweak, you can focus that magic into one spot. Not completely changing and twisting the flow, turning it into a completely different kind of magic, but rather just giving that natural magic a little nudge, focusing the natural magic that it has. Fairy magic, light, fluffy fairy magic, comes naturally, unlike dragon's dark arcane magic, twisting and bending it to its will. That moonlight, that mana from the flower, the dragon steals it and turns it into a raw blast of pure arcane energy. And this is the distinction that explains why the dragon type is completely useless against fairies. Fairies simply redirect the magic around them or just ignore it. You know, flow and all that. They are more natural. They use the flow of mana instead of controlling it. This scene here in the anime, a Salamence blasts an arcane force at a Wigglytuff, and it's as if the Wigglytuff is just walking towards a slight breeze. If you are a being that is magic incarnate, and your entire power involves flowing mana along, then being struck by a blast of mana is nothing. You just flow it along around you. Effortlessly, we see this sort of flow in many fairy moves. I mean, Geomancy is literally that, but others of note are Nature's Madness and Moonlight. In fact, Misty Terrain is another good example of all this. Most terrain moves change the battlefield to make their own type stronger, but fairy terrain is special. It makes it so all non-volatile status effects are ignored, such as Sleep and Paralysis. And here's the big thing, it makes all dragon type moves deal half damage, no matter who they are attacking. Misty Terrain is almost like bringing the fairy realm to our own world. Its effects are leaking or perhaps being summoned by the Pokemon. In many fairy tales, fey creatures live in their own realm, separate from ours but sometimes they cross over, such as during a full moon. Anyway, this intense, misty terrain is like a field of mana or aura or infinity energy that is much more difficult for dragons to control or take over. This terrain strengthens nature's own flow of mana. So now, for the dragon, it's almost like trying to take over and control an entire river rather than a small stream. The natural current is much more powerful. Though, because of this, it also fills all of the Pokemon here with fighting spirit, as infinity energy is abundant, meaning recovery from status conditions like sleep and paralysis happen instantly. They are nullified. This really helps to define our fairy type. They need to be some sort of magical creature that is in tune with nature, but not like plants and such, that's a grass thing. Rather, fairy types are in tune with the inherent powers of nature's spirit. Mana. They feel the magical flow and can use it by just redirecting it, letting the magic do most of the work. Now time for a tangent! Sort of. The move Hidden Power changes its type depending on what Pokemon uses it, and it can become any type besides fairy. Hidden Power will get its own video eventually, but in summary, Hidden Power's calculations and such are based off of your Pokémon's IVs. Basically, it's the true power of your Pokémon's cumulative strength, meaning the type of the move is actually changes as your Pokémon levels up. It's, it's weird. But the fact that it can't be fairy type actually helps my point. Fairy type magic is a magic that is essentially unlearnable, or at least not easily learnable. Hidden Power is a TM, a TM that many Pokemon can learn, and it would be quite a bit strange for all of these Pokemon to sometimes just be able to invoke the light magic of nature at will.
you know? Unlike the dragon type, which takes over and controls magic like wizards and sorcerers. A learned way. This may also be the reason why there are only two fairy type TMs, Clay Rough and Dazzling Gleam, neither of which are all that fairy y. Anything can play rough, really, and its name in Japanese is Frolic. Just frolicking! It's pretty easy to do. And then Dazzling Gleam is just a reskin of the rock type move Power Gem, so. I feel like it's more or less a more elegant or cute move compared to Power Gem, but otherwise it's just Power Gem, but like, without the rock. It uses a little bit of fairy magic, but doesn't have the main soul of fairy magic. And this leads to the next point. The fairy type in Pokemon almost seems like a pseudo light type. But hang on, don't you worry. I don't mean like the opposite of the dark type, which is the translation of evil type. So, I don't mean like that, I think. Or at least not much. Fairies in real life, real tales, were not very nice. Honestly, they are normally really, really mean. This is because of the whole lesson, moral, fairy tale thing all about stuff. In fact, most of the fairy tales you read are about how the fairies are hiding away from humans, only coming out to either harm or hurt them. Even the benevolent ones normally have ulterior motives. And if they do enjoy human company, it's either to show off their skills or to inconvenience them. Much like the Pokemon we talked about earlier, Jigglypuff and Mr. Mime. Hmm? However, in more modern fairy tales, we see fairies and elves and such helping humans understand morals and whatnot rather than teaching through negative repercussions. They teach us through more positive fashions. However, back to how it's light, there are many Pokemon moves that create light, or that have light in its main mechanic. And I don't necessarily mean light as in luminance, I mean light magic. Good magic, where dragon would be dark magic. Fairy is light magic. It's like Final Fantasy, white mage versus black mage. It's not inherently like an evil versus good thing. Rather, it's just how I and many others see the magic, which also would further explain fairies' immunity to dragon. Dark magic tends to be fireballs, lightning strikes, arcane blasts. Offensive light magic tends to be nature flowy, healing, and magical shields able to block the offensive magic, which follows literal light and dark. Dark is mightily powerful and spooky and dangerous, but with enough light, the dark's kind of useless. And speaking of light, specifically the light from the moon, as I implied earlier, fairy type Pokemon really do have a penchant for the moon, and there's more to it than just fairies and pink and girly and the moon is the catalyst of feminine power and alchemy and mysticism. It's actually quite, I mean, that was pretty deep, but like it's even deeper. You see, the moon is a very mysterious thing. It's huge and bright during the night, and it disappears monthly. Imagine yourself being an old-timey peasant looking at this thing every night because you have nothing else to do, and it just disappears sometimes. That's pretty spooky. Plus, all of your local fairy tales include the moon as a catalyst for magic events. Werewolves? Full moon. Accidentally wandering into the fey realm never to be seen again? Moon. Being able to see magical creatures because it's being illuminated by magical light? It's moonlight. Heck, the full moon is basically the brightest dark you can get. And we all know our imaginations run wild when we can almost make things out. Stupid survival instinct, adding spooky ideas to shapes that we're unfamiliar with so we run away to safety, all powered by the dim glow of the moon. Insert well-written transition. Fairy type is definitely a different type of Pokemon. I mean, it's almost alien, and that's, funnily enough, another popular theory as to what fairy types are. I mean, look at Sylveon. Disgusting. Look at those gross, fleshy tentacles. My ribbons are made of flesh! The whole fairy types are aliens theory is interesting, but a bit weak. In summary, it's just like the Deny from WoW. These odd-colored creatures crash-landed and started to spread out to claim territory. This theory is somewhat backed up by quite a few fairy moves being moon-themed, along with the moon and dawnstone evolutions in the typing. But that whole moon thing is kind of already explained when you look into fairy lore. You can easily see that the moon really is more fairy 
then it is alien. I just know that if I hadn't mentioned this theory, someone would complain in the comments about how I didn't actually look up anything. So ha! I still probably missed some. But ha! And if I did miss some, well, you know what to do. Tell me about it in the comments. You always do. Just put a little smiley face after it. So, yeah, I know you're not being rude. So now that we've covered what the fairy-type Pokémon aren't, let's summarize what they are. They are either magical users of light magic, which is invoked, or they manipulate the flow of natural magics rather than change it. Fairy Pokémon could be described as the natural magic type, the only true magic type, whereas Dragon is artificial magic type. And fairy type is also Game Freak's attempt to get more young girls into Pokemon. Even though I would sort of think Gen 2 was kind of the same with all the baby Pokemon. Hmm. Fairies really shouldn't be pink, but modern media and marketing disagrees with me. So I guess they're pink. Oh yeah, fairy type Pokemon ruined the game! That is, unless of course you like the fairy types, and then it probably made the game great for you. Ignore the opinion there that you don't agree with, and like me more because we share opinions. Ain't it great? Here's a quick question for Fairy Month. What if the fairy type was never added? I mean, they added it in Gen 6, that's pretty late. Well, for one, either Dragon would still be a super powerful type, or they would have nerfed it in some other way. After all, that's why they added it to begin with. Dragon needed a nerf. But the main question here isn't about balancing, it's about what the fairy type Pokemon would be if not fairy type. And obviously the old Pokemon they just added the fairy type to would go back to being their old typing, so we won't bother covering those. But as for all the rest of them, what would they be? Sad. Let's get the easy ones done first. Flabebe, Floet, and Florgis would be grass type. Many people already wonder why they're mono fairy instead of grass fairy already. They learn more grass type moves than fairy moves even. But I guess that has to do with the fact that they tend to flowers and gardens, but aren't flowers themselves. Like, take a look at Conkledur. Conkledur isn't rock or ground type because it carries around concrete. Farfetch'd isn't grass type because it carries around a leak. So why would these Pokemon be grass type because they carry around flowers, hmm? Though parts of them, especially Florgis, do look quite plant-like. Which is why, if Fairy didn't exist, they would probably be grass type for sure. Maybe normal grass to change it up, and also to show that they themselves aren't plants, they just have plant powers. Same goes for Comfey, mono grass or grass normal, for the same reasons. Spritzy, Aromatis, Swirlix, and Slurpuff would likely all be mono normal. I mean, their whole thing is that they smell good and they smell good. You could argue flying for Spritzy and Aromatis since they've got bird faces, but Aromatis doesn't really fly. And these faces are more references to the bird masks worn by plague doctors, as they would be filled with nice smelling herbs and flowers because they thought that would protect them from the plague. It did not. Also, funnily enough, Slurpuff also learns just as many grass moves as it does fairy moves, but other than that, it's not so grassy, so. Mono normal for sure. The Dene, I always forget, is fairy type. Like, why? That'll be a fun one to explain in the fairy type explained video. Well, it would be mono electric, like most of the Pikachus. Carbink would likely be mono rock, even though it learns psychic moves, as that way it would further differentiate it from Deontzi, who's special, and would be rock psychic, like most of the legendaries of its status, psychic. But you add a rock, because it's made a rock. Plus, it learns more psychic moves than fairy already, and by a lot. One fairy move versus five psychic moves. The heck. Klefki would be mono steel. Maybe steel normal? Maybe to weaken it down a bit. It's not super steely. It has like a friendlier, softer, fun vibe, which doesn't super fit mono steel. To me anyway. So swapping fairy to normal would reference that and make more sense. To me anyway. Primarina, mono water, just because it's a starter and no starters have the normal type yet, unless you count Eevee. Though I could see Primarina getting normal just so that it has a stab bonus with all the sound-based moves it learns, since it's a singer and all. Cutie Fly and Rabombi? Bug Flying, for obvious reasons. Morolo, Mono Grass, but Sheetonic Grass Ghost. 
It learns a surprising number of ghost type moves, plus its whole thing is that it glows in the night and can be spooky. Its Pokedex entries mention that the forests it lives in are a treacherous place to enter at night, and that people are confused by all of the strange lights they cause, and the people get lost, never to be seen again. It also puts people and Pokemon to sleep, and siphons off their vitality. That all sounds very ghostly to me. Mimikyu! Mimikyu has options. Swapping the fairy type for dark or normal. After all, while Mimikyu is a ghost, it's covering itself in everyday, normal materials. It's trying to act as if it were a normal Pokemon and not a ghost. Plus, Mono Ghost just doesn't really feel right when you compare it to the other ghost types. And also, it learns a load of normal moves. But Ghost Dark would work as well. The Dark type, of course, being the evil type in Japan. Makes it fit well. This Pokemon is filled with malice and jealousy, and it mercilessly seeks revenge and uses dark, dirty tactics such as disguising itself and overwhelming its opponents with shock and horror. So that works. Bagirna, Mono Steel. It's an automaton, a rock with a soul stored into it and then attached to gears. I mean, its fairy type reasoning was already a bit weak anyway. Fairy magic is what attached its soul to the stone, I guess. So it's got fairy type signature move, and that's about it. Impidimp, who I absolutely love. Mono Dark, maybe dark normal, just to bland it out a bit. We don't know much about it yet, though. Just thought I'd mention it. Now, the four Tapus are interesting. They all have the fairy type because they are nature deities, and the fairy type can be explained as light nature magic. So in removing the fairy type, you sort of remove what they are. And since they are a set, that makes things a bit trickier too. Having nature magic powers, you could swap fairy for grass? You know, nature powers. Plant growth, grass, but then Tapu Bulu is monograss. How unfair. Maybe swap fairy for psychic, as that's sort of magic and lighty, but then Tapu Lele is mono psychic. Hmm. Though I guess there's nothing wrong with one of them being a monotype. I mean, Tornadus is mono flying, where the other two in its trio get second types. Then again, I guess they could be monotyped. They are the embodiment of those types after all. But considering their theming, the fairy type truly works for these guys. You can't really remove fairy from them. And the same goes for Xerneas, a magical tree of life and fey-esque light magic. It's hard to remove its fairy typing. But if you had to, Grass Psychic, or Mono Psychic, I suppose. Because we don't have enough Psychic-type legendaries, which leaves us with Sylveon. Oh, Sylveon. If the Fairy-type didn't exist, neither would this Pokémon, really. And if you watched my video about there never being another Eevee evolution, then you would definitely understand what I mean by that. You could say Psychic, but there's already a Psychic-type Eevee. I remember when they released Sylveon, which was before they announced the new type, most people guessed that it was either flying or normal type. Or a new type that hadn't been revealed yet. And I guess I could see those. Especially since the name references the fairy, Sylph, who is the fairy of wind. So while Sylveon may not be able to fly, you could see its ribbons as its sort of whiskers. Yeah, you deserved that. Yeah. You could see its ribbons as sort of whiskers, sort of floating in the air, being one with the wind and the air around it, feeling it flow, perhaps allowing it to magically float, or perhaps just allowing it to move the air around it, deal air attacks, which more often than not are flying type. Air cutter, aeroblast, defog, gust, you get the idea. So if fairy type was never added and they still came up with Sylveon for whatever reason, it would be the flying type evolution of Eevee. And with that, we're done! Besides Alola forms and Megas, I suppose. But those are easy. Alolan Ninetales would be Mono Ice, and Mega Audino, Mega Gardevoir, Mega Altaria, Mega Mawile would just be their old previous forms. Easy stuff. Fairy type is, as of making this video, the most recent type added to the Pokemon franchise. But being the genius that you are, you probably already knew that. In fact, this whole video may be useless to you, but some may not understand the intricacies as to why this type was added. 
Back when Steel and Dark were added, there were a number of good reasons. In Gen 1, there were barely any Pokémon that would have fit those types, and also, it was Gen 1. Why bother with more unnecessary types before you know your franchise is going to be long-lasting? Just adds more complications than what is necessary. Also, in Gen 1, Psychic type was broken as heck! Way too powerful! So by adding new types, they would have an opportunity to add another type that's strong against Psychic type. Thus, Dark was added. But back then it was fine. The series was still fresh and young. Making drastic changes is just an everyday thing for early sequels of games. But a whole 14 years later, they would add the Fairy type in. Generation 6. Pokemon X and Y. And the reason wasn't much different. Over the five generations, the Dragon type was getting more and more powerful, eventually to the point they needed a nerf. But instead of dealing with actually nerfing them, why not just change the whole meta and add in a new type that is strong against them? In fact, more than just strong against them, but also immune to them. Yeah, that'll show those dang dragons! This would wind up being the fairy type, and this is also the confirmed reason as to why they added it. Various quotes and interviews from the developers prove it. But to make this video longer than a minute, let's also answer... Why fairy? Why was the fairy type added over something else? Let's get into it. So, why fairy and not something else? Well, first, you should figure out what that something else would be. It has to be something that previously existing Pokémon could be, otherwise there wouldn't be enough of the new type. So, what could that be? You could do sound, cosmic, magic, light, rubber? All have arguments for them, but I feel like those deserve a special separate video. But, as mentioned, the main reason they were even considering the addition of a new type was to have something to be super effective against Dragon, and none of those really sound like they would be. I guess magic could be, but then again, does fairy not imply magic? Fairies, and really fae creatures as a whole, are magical creatures themselves. It's similar logic to sound type never being a thing, because normal works just fine. Sound is a normal, everyday thing that just about everything experienced is. You know? Dragon, in and of itself, also sort of has subtypes after all. Not every dragon type Pokemon is a dragon, or even anything close to one. And plenty of Pokemon that aren't dragons, in the slightest, are still able to learn some dragon type attacks. If you watched our video that explains what the dragon type is, then you'll know this already, but in summary, you could say that the dragon type is another way of saying arcane type. It encompasses not just the abilities of dragons being dragons, but also that of dark magic, sorcery, bending mana or infinity energy to your will, which dragons in most mythology are capable of doing after all. Think of it this way, in the beta of the Gen 1 games, flying type didn't exist, instead we had bird type. <laughs> yeah. But later, they learned that more things can fly besides birds, like bugs, balloons, and of course, dragons. So instead of keeping it bird type, it became flying type, as that is the trait all of these things had in common. They fly. But in the case of dragon, well, back in Gen 1, it was just dragon. Dragonite and its line were the only dragon type Pokemon. It was a dragon. Dragon type. Only later did the definition start to change and evolve, and more Pokémon could learn dragon attacks, and more non-dragons were granted the type. All Pokémon are magical creatures. Some just have fire magic, or water magic, or plant growth magic, you yeah? know? And dragon magic came to sort of mean arcane. It's raw magic. Mana in its purest form. Just straight up infinity energy being blasted at you. So, how are you gonna come up with a type that's immune to that? And that's super effective when attacking it? It's science type! I don't believe in your magic, so I'm immune to it. <laughs> in most modern fantasy, especially JRPGs, magic has classes, or types itself. Typically, the simplest of these breaks it up like so. Fire, water, earth, air, light, dark. And if the arcane, raw sorcery that is the dragon type fits dark, 
then the new type should also be magic based and fit light. After all, if we take light and dark magic sort of literally, while the dark powers are super powerful both offensive and defensively, like dragon type Pokemon, all you need to do is illuminate that darkness and it's worthless. Light type. But now here's a problem. The dark type is only called that in the West. In Japan, it makes more sense. It's the evil type. If we were to add a light type, people are going to get confused as to why it's literal light when the dark type isn't literal darkness. Why is light more associated as the enemy to dragon instead of an enemy to dark? What's going on? It's confusing. Plus, there are many moves from a load of different types that produce light. Light works more as a secondary trait rather than a standalone type. Again, like sound. So while light type would work, it has plenty of reasons and plenty of good arguments against it. Same goes for magic type. Is that to say the other Pokemon aren't magical? Well, how about this? Nature type. Dragon is all about taking over the natural mana in the world and reconstructing it in their own image. Arcane dark dragons are the antithesis of nature. So that would sort of imply that nature is actually weak to dragon, which is kind of kind of the opposite of what we want. Although I guess the opposite also makes sense, but hmm. I mean, no matter how much something hurts nature, mother nature always hurts back more. Nature is eternal. Nature is the light magic dragons take control of and twist. So they can't do much against an entity that can just take that back. Uh, but that gets kind of confusing. Uh, I mean, I'm still confused by the last paragraph. And how would that interact with all the other types? And in a lot of places around the globe, we sort of associate grass type or plant type with nature. So it doesn't quite work there either. But do you see where I'm going with this? Fairies, fey creatures, if you were to really simplify modern tellings of fairy folklore, you could say that they are light magic using nature spirits. That's all three of the other possibility of types combined. And again, if you saw that video explaining how the dragon type works and the one of how the fairy type works, then you probably understand the connection here. Fairies flow with nature's natural mana stream, the infinity energy that everything has. Dragons take it and bend it to their will. But if you take that dragon attack and attack something that is in tune with the natural mana flows, like a fairy, couldn't that fairy just ignore the dragon attack? Fairies are magic. The dragon attack would pass right through them or just continue flowing around them because the fairy is perfectly in tune with it. The fairy already flows mana, infinity energy, around, so doing that while being attacked with it in its purest form from a dragon? That's no issue at all. Meanwhile, again, dragons base their attack on taking the natural mana around them, turning it into its raw form, and blasting it out. Think of it like changing the path of a small stream. But fairies well, they have full control of that stream and can flow it along and turn it into a river. Think of how much harder it is to control a river compared to controlling a small stream. That's why the fairy type terrain move weakens dragons even further. The mana is so much harder to control because of all this fairy aura everywhere. Imagine trying to cut down a tree. You're taking control of natural energies. But now apply the same fairy magic to the tree and it grows significantly faster than you can even cut! Ah! And that's why the fairy type was chosen. It doesn't mean Tinkerbell, not literal fairies, in the same way that the dragon type isn't just literal dragons. It's magic commonly associated with dragons. Similarly, the fairy type is magic commonly associated with fairies and elves and such. In other words, natural magic, the light magic of nature, the perfect counter to dragon. And that's why the fairy type was added specifically. Check it. I've got a god of war in the thumbnail. And an arrow pointing to her chest. Because that's what you people want, I guess.
And you clicked it! Just saying. So Pokemon designs tend to be very straightforward. This is a duck. That's a Yorkshire Terrier. That's a candle. That's trash. That's a very, very fat cat. That's, uh, what are those things called? Um, pangolin. That's a pangolin. And this... It's a Gardevoir. I suppose it's a ballet dancer. Well, Curlia is a ballet dancer. What even is this Pokemon line? And more specifically, what the heck is this thing in Gardevoir's chest? Isn't Gardevoir supposed to be the embrace Pokemon? It's all about hugs and stuff. Wouldn't that stab someone right through the heart? Well, maybe, just maybe, we can explain. All right, to start this discussion, let's start with Ralts. What the heck is a Ralts? Well, it's psychic type, and it's clearly based on a child, like many other evolutionary lines have a small child, youngster, and then adult form. You know, it's a common theme in the world of Pokemon. Ralts has the large head and the whole wearing pajamas that are too big for it thing going on with the feet. It's a fairly common trope in animation. Also, it has a bowl cut, which is common for little boys. Its name is interesting, as it's an anagram for Astral. An anagram is when a word can have its letters rearranged and it makes another word. Astral, in this case, refers to astral projection, which is when you send your consciousness to the stars, which is commonly associated with psychics. And just to prove that this isn't a coincidence, even in other languages where the name is different, it's still an anagram for Astral, Tarsal, and Trasla in French and German. And yes, its name is still Ralts in Japanese, which on top of being an anagram for Astral, also comes from Relate and Waltz, being a type of dance. And you'll see how each evolution relates to dance soon. But Relate comes from Ralts's heightened ability to feel the emotions of those around it, thanks to its heightened psychic power. Also note, the pink thing in this base evolution is up on its head, the larger part of it sticking out in the front, with the smaller part behind it, making a sort of banana shape. Similar to how Gardevoir gives others banana shapes. I'm so sorry, that was bad. Looking to Curlia now, we see obvious inspirations from ballet, specifically the pose, especially the whole standing on the tips of its toes thing, as well as the tutu-looking tufts. This time, its name is the same in every language. Curlia, which is a reference to Kirillian photography, an esoteric form of photography where you can see the psychic aura of people and objects. And note, its pink things now are still on the head, but there are two of them. They kind of remind me of hair clip things, perhaps holding together twin tails. Curlia can then evolve into either Gardevoir or Gallade, depending on a number of factors. If the Curlia is male and has a Dawnstone, it will evolve into Gallade. However, evolving a male or female Curlia normally will result in a Gardevoir. It's a common misconception that it's just a male-female split. Because it's not. You can have male Gardevoirs. Which is to plenty of people's liking. Gardevoir also has the same name in almost every language. The exception this time being in Japanese, where the name is instead Sir Knight. Yes, Sir Knight. Sir, in this case, isn't referring to its sex. Rather, back in the olden days of antiquity, when you wished to call upon a knight, possibly due to a misdeed, a stolen sweet roll, or a stabbing, you would yell out, Sir Knight! and a knight or guard would come to your aid. Sir Knight at the time was more of a way of saying, come here, knight. But through association and time, due to the majority of knights being male, Sir soon came to mean manly men that do knightly things, or man of high authority. The Japanese tend to understand this context better, but realized that there would be a lot of confusion in the West, so they changed the name for us to Gardevoir. Gardevoir, though, still gets its name from Guard, like the Castle Guard and all that. Though the spelling of Guard here makes it the French spelling of Guard. Neat! This goes along with the other words it's derived from. Garter, meaning to keep, and voir, which is French for sight. Which guards tend to do. Especially from keeps. This name makes perfectly good sense then, as Gardevoir is essentially a guardian angel Pokemon. It protects its trainer to no end, and will even give its own life 
to do so. And it can make a black hole if it needs. The science of all that is up here in this video. It's ridiculous. As for looks, Gardevoir, like Curlia, closely resembles a ballet dancer, though of a much higher rank, likely the lead or principal dancer. Some have also stated that they resemble Anasama Ningyu, to a degree at least, which is basically a Japanese paper doll with a very thin body and an enlarged head. I can see the similarities. But interestingly, this time around, rather than in the head, Gardevoir has the pink thing in her chest. And then when she mega evolves, it splits! Huh. Well, before deciphering this, we might as well cover Gallade too. Interestingly, Gallade mixes things up. Rather than being psychic fairy typed, it's psychic fighting. Likely referencing its newfound ability to put up a great fight physically. Its elbows extend into swords, and it fights quite gallantly. Probably because of the pose, really. I'm gallant, and you got like your elbows out. I think that's a pose. I think I've seen like medieval paintings of things like that. That wasn't in the script. That's just something I just now realized. Maybe that, maybe that's a thing. That'd be cool. Also, if you couldn't tell, there's part of the name origin. Gallant, Galade. The aid comes from blade since that's what it fights with. Also, just like Gardevoir, its name is the same or similar in most languages, but different in Japanese. As this time around in Japan, its name is Irirido. And I'm probably terribly butchering that. Uh, Iriraido? Irirido? Iririrido? It also comes from blade, but also the word elbow and earl, which in the olden days of antiquity was a very prominent military leader. Hmm, yes. And further referencing its military origins and its swords, it has a head thing, and it somewhat resembles a Corinthian war helmet. Also, Gallade's stance resembles the on guard stance used by fencers. And Gallade's pink thing is also in its chest, but it seems to be reversed when compared to Gardevoir. Huh. And then when it mega evolves, it actually shrinks. Though now there is more pink on the sword arms too. So. Huh. So now that you know what the Gardevoir line is, sort of, we can uncover what this pink thing is. How? Well, by looking at the Pokedex. Probably should have just done that from the start, but this video is more than just the Spike thing. It's the whole What is Gardevoir video. The Spike is just the thumbnail because it's just so perfect for it. So looking at the Pokedex entries for Ralts, we get Ralts senses the emotions of people using the horns on its head. It uses the horns on its head to sense human emotions. And if its horns capture the warm feelings of people or Pokemon, its body warms up slightly. Oh, so A, they're horns weirdest horns I've ever seen, and B, they are used to sense the emotions of people and Pokemon. Kind of like weird psychic antenna. Makes sense that Ralts is the feeling Pokemon then. It's all about emotions and feelings, and feeling the feelings of others. It's the empathy Pokemon, what it probably should have been called. Cute! And, interestingly enough, there are studies that suggest babies are actually a lot more emotionally intelligent than people assume, especially when it comes to telling the emotion of their mother. Curlia, then, is the emotion Pokemon. Remember back when you were a little kid and it was always, Oh, did he hurt your feelings? And then as you got a bit older, you learned what the proper word is? Emotions? Maybe this category change from feeling Pokemon to emotion Pokemon is a reference to that. Also, Curlia's horns are much bigger than that of Ralts. And on top of being able to better feel the emotions of its trainer, its Pokedex entries also state Curlia uses the horns on its head to amplify its psychokinetic power. So these horns are for more than just emotion sensing. They really are full on just psychic antenna thingies for the technical term. I mean, that makes sense why it's on the head then. Psychic powers are all about brain manipulating matter stuffs. Again, for the technical term. And so having a horn come out from the head means the brain has a better means of... But why then would these horns move down to the chest in the final evolutions? Also, do Gallade and Gardevoir's Pokedex entries say anything about the horn? No, they don't, actually. Which just means we can assume it does the same thing. 
increases their power of psychokinesis and of sensing the emotions of others. Notably, Gardevoir being the Embrace Pokémon, and the most loving and caring of all, it may have the spike in her heart due to the classic idea of your heart being where you feel emotions. Gardevoir has an even deeper connection with the emotions of others now, as she feels them right in his heart. Then, upon Mega Evolving, this power increases tremendously. Look at these horns now! <laughs> Intense. Also note, they are in fact horns, and after all of my digging, I couldn't find a single instance of them ever bending or flopping. Which leads me to believe that yes, they are hard. So if you were to hug a Gardevoir, you would get stabbed in the chest. Likely, the heart. Oh, so you could have your hearts connected. That's so sweet. <laughs> the embrace Pokemon. <sighs> Though when Gallade Mega evolves, the horn on its chest gets smaller. And its Pokedex entries are more so about how its combat abilities are great, as it knows what its opponent is thinking. So I'd guess that Gallade is less about the emotion sensing, I mean, after all, knowing the exact emotion your enemy is feeling as you strike them down with a sword to the face is a bit, uh... It's probably not the best thing for your mental health. So it's much more so now about knowing the thoughts of the opponent. Perhaps the only reason it's in the chest to begin with is because Gallade is basically a specialized Gardevoir. That's just where the horn goes for the final form. But the heart connectivity with emotions and all is useless to it now. So, when it mega evolves, it shrinks. It's needless. And note, now its blades are pink. Is this sharp, hard sword material stuff the same as the horn was? Does this mean that the horn on the rest of the evolutionary line can be as sharp and hard as a sword? Why would you want to embrace that? So, an emotion-sensing sword spike with mental antenna powers. That's what this thing is. Ouch. But I do want to ask one more question about this line, and it's everyone's favorite. What's with the whole, like, Gardevoir can still be a dude thing? It's not even, like, mostly female or anything. Like, most of the more feminine Pokémon are either entirely or mostly female, but Gardevoir's 50-50. Well, I'd actually argue that perhaps it wasn't intended to be as feminine as the fan base in the West made it out to be. I mean, let's look at Curlia. Almost everyone assumes it's designed off of a little girl ballet dancer with twin tails, but considering all of the medieval, antique times noble origins, Curlia reminds me a lot more of a young prince or a choir boy. I mean, little prince boys that are in ballet dances are often picked on for being super feminine. Which of course there's nothing wrong with, but you know, it is what it is. Curlia's haircut even, it's like it's just a longer He-Man's haircut. This style, which is also pretty similar to Gardevoir, is pretty common for stereotypical princes. I mean, think about all of the flamboyant princes in media. Even the Mii Fighters in Smash Bros, the, the Prince hat has this haircut, or at least something similar to it. Overall, I feel like this was the idea here, or at least a part of it. While Gallade is the prince that had a more military focus growing up in times of war, Bardevoir is the princess, or prince, that chose to stick with dance and a more pompous lifestyle of nobility. <laughs> Fun fact for Fairy Month, I mean month. In Lever City, which is where the fairy type gym in Pokemon X and Y is, the clock tower shows 13 hours instead of the usual 12. That's not a mistake, and is actually pretty interesting. So let's talk about that. It all has to do with a number of phenomenons from folklore in the times where people believed in such things like fairies and witches. Some call it the 13th hour, some call it the witch's hour, or the devil's hour. But what they all have in common is that for just a few seconds, an hour passes. 
Sounds weird, but let me explain. Time gets wonky for a few seconds as far as regular humans perceive it, but for those few seconds, Fey creatures come out and experience an entire hour. The time this takes place differs depending on where you're looking and which folklore you're listening to, but for example, some say it's just a few seconds between 12.59 and 1 o'clock a.m., others say it happens sometime between 2 and 3 o'clock a.m., and others, 4 o'clock. But it all points to the same thing. These fey creatures and people who are in tuned with the supernatural, such as witches, experience a 13th hour, a time where black magic is at its strongest, or a time where the fairy realm and our world combine for just a moment. When the clock strikes 13, you'll be within the fairy's dream. Other games and media have referenced this 13th hour as well, such as Persona and Castlevania, both of which are filled with supernatural things. Speaking of which, it's also a thing in the show, Supernatural. Apparently, I haven't watched it. The Haunted Mansion ride in Disneyland also apparently has a 13-hour clock. I mean, it's a haunted mansion! It experiences an extra hour where supernatural things occur, or at the very least, the spirit world and our world combine, and supernatural things can leak into the mansion. You see what I mean? It's not exactly a super well-known pop culture thing, but it is definitely a cultural thing that many people creating media like to reference. The SNES game Terranigma also has a 13-hour clock, and it's stated that this is a time that does not exist. No, a time that must not exist. It's a time where supernatural things occur, and supernatural things are blasphemous. So why is the 13th hour referenced in Pokemon? Well, this is also the first fairy-type gym we see, also. And really, this whole city seems like it's pulled straight from a fairy tale, with the big tree and mushrooms all over. Plus, even the gym itself teleports you from room to room in a dollhouse. And the gym leader's eyes are so... strange and uncanny. Trainers often pick up attributes from the Pokemon they use, like mediums being ghost-type users, which changes how they act. But apparently, being a dedicated fairy user causes these sort of effects. As even the other fairy-type trainers, the fairy tale girls, have those strange eyes. Do they perhaps experience this extra hour themselves? Is this whole city built? near where the fairy realm connects to their world? Thus, the entire city experiences this 13th hour? Thus, the reason they have it on their clock tower? And this constant in and out of the fairy realm causes some trainers to start gaining some fairy traits themselves, perhaps. Hmm, that certainly seems to be the case. So, you think you know the Gen 6 legendary trio, do you? XYZ, Norse inspirations and all. But what if I told you that's wrong? Or at least, that's not all. This is the real origin of Xerneas, Eveltal, and Zygarde. Welcome. We have much to discuss. And before getting right into it, let's first cover what you may already know, as it's been quite some time since the release of Pokemon X and Y. Six years, in fact. Many know of the Norse inspirations of these Pokémon, and to find the specifics, we need to only look at the world tree Yggdrasil. This tree, Yggdrasil, also known as the World Tree or the Tree of Life, is the foundation of Norse myth and cosmology, as it connects the nine worlds. But that does not mean beings cannot exist between the worlds. This is where we will find our origins. There are quite a few horned and hoofed creatures residing all around the tree, such as the goat Hydrun and the heart Eikthyrnir, who graze at its foliage. That heart, or deer specifically, is said to have glowing antlers that drip dew with such abundance that it fills the rivers, bringing life and rejuvenation to the land. And that by itself serves as an excellent basis for the Pokémon of life, Xerneas. 
but there is even more to be seen. All around the base of the world tree, there are four stags, which are male deer. They are Dawin, Dvalin, Dunir, and Durothror. All of them reach up and eat the branches of the tree. Dvalin specifically, who is also a dwarf, because it's complicated, is said to be the dormant one, or the one slumbering, which may have inspired Xerneas lying dormant in the shape of a tree until it is actively awakened. There are a number of theories regarding the symbolic meaning of these deer. Some attribute them to represent the winds, or the four cardinal directions, which we will speak more of later. But another theory is that these four stags were added into the late stages of Norse mythology, and originally it was one great stag, which may point right back to Eikthyrnir, the deer of glowing antlers and life-bringing abilities. But what then of the other two Pokémon, Iveltal and Zygarde? Well, let's look at Zygarde next and find out. Deep beneath the land where the stag resides, among the roots of the world tree, there is a serpentine dragon known as Nidhogg, which sustains itself by gnawing at the roots of the tree, as well as chewing up the corpses of the inhabitants of Nastrond, the part of the world hell for the worst of the worst. Those guilty of such atrocities such as murder, adultery, and worst of all, oath-breaking. Crushing these evildoers may, in a way, keep those still alive in Midgard, Earth, from doing such heinous acts, similar to Christianity's burning in hell. This fear of punishment after death, in a way, helped sustain order amongst society, and Zygarde being the Pokémon of order may pull from this very aspect. Though a prevalent theme in Norse mythology is renewal, death, and rebirth. So some have theorized that by chewing on the corpses but not consuming them, it sheds the corpses to begin life anew. Sin and punishment, followed by redemption. Order. It is also worth noting that the arrival of Nidhogg heralds Ragnarok, Norse Armageddon which, in a way, was Lysander's plan in the anime, to use Zygarde to burn Kalos to the ground, ending it. But there's more to Zygarde than just its 50% snake form, isn't there? The individual cells are simply that. They resemble cells, perhaps like Euglena, but then its 10%, 50%, and 100% forms are easily inspired from the three children of Loki and Angerboda. The first is Fenrir, the giant wolf, clearly represented by 10% Zygarde being a dog, and it should be noted that Fenrir is bound, but when Ragnarok comes around it will break free and kill Odin, though it will be later struck down. Next is Jormungandr, the world serpent. While different from Nidhogg, it too works as another inspiration to 50% Zygarde. It is a sea serpent so massive it's wrapped itself around the entire world and bit down onto its own tail like the Ouroboros, and it is said that Ragnarok will begin the moment it lets go. And during it, it is prophesied that it will kill Thor with its poison, though only after being killed by Thor itself. Lastly is Hel, their giantess daughter and ruler of the realm of the same name, the one where Nidhogg chews upon evil corpses. Though she does not rule Hell by choice, rather she is bound there through force. But like Fenrir, will break free during Ragnarok. These three clearly match the forms of Zygarde in shape, though their roles are... loose at best. One could see the form of the Ouroboros taken by Jormungandr and apply that to Zygarde easily. After all, in alchemy and Gnosticism, the Ouroboros' symbolism is all is one, or everything is in order. Then Hell, being the ruler of the underworld where Nidhogg does its thing, is all underground, and that may point towards the ground typing of Zygarde. And then Fenrir's a dog. So overall, the Norse inspiration of these two still works well. Xerneas is definitely Norse primarily, and Zygarde and its forms... mostly. But now, how about Iveltal? High above the stags and Nidhogg, up in the canopy of Yggdrasil, there resides an eagle. This great eagle goes unnamed, though its companion, a hawk that sits between its eyes, is known as 
Vetterfolnir. This eagle knows many things, as it is wise and gossips with Nidhogg about all of the goings-on. And that is where our story ends. So, a smart bird equals Eveltal, the Pokémon of destruction known for absorbing the life force of all of those around it. No. Though there's also Heracevulgar, which translates to Corpse Swallower. And he's a giant that can transform into an eagle, one that sits at the northern edge of the heavens and causes wind to blow when it beats its wings. So that's something. Maybe if you mix the two birds? Mm, it's still a bit weak, though. He's known more so as the wind giant, not a giant of death. And all the giants eat humans and have names that insinuate violent things. So I guess this comes down to... I guess that's the inspiration, I suppose? But I'm never quite happy with that. That can't be it! While there are times Game Freak is lazy in its design, when it comes to the legendary Pokémon, they are often deep and pull from many inspirational sources at once. So, let's go over two more inspirations to get the whole picture. X. Y. Z. Why X and Y was a question many threw around when Pokemon X and Y were announced. Up until that point, every Pokemon game was either a color or a gemstone that insinuated a color. But X and Y? Letters? Many joked about chromosomes for a while, but then we got to see the legendary Pokemon, and the pieces started falling into place. Eveltal's whole body is shaped like a Y, as are its talons, and Xerneas' body makes an X and has X eyes, and several X's within its antlers. And then, 50% Zygarde, which was the only form we had at the time, when in its default pose is shaped like a Z. So, many expected a third version, a Pokemon Z, to happen, but it never did. Regardless of this, the second half of the Gen 6 anime was named Pokémon XYZ. This led many to theorize that this was going to be the end of an era for Ash and the anime. XYZ certainly insinuated the end of something. And in a way it was. The following anime series would take a completely different direction, both in story and art design, but for all intents and purposes... Meh. This wasn't really an end at much at all. XYZ, then, may simply refer to the fact that Pokémon X and Y were the first mainline Pokémon games in 3D, as they were on the 3DS after all. And in mathematics, and video game modeling for that matter, you use a three-axis system to represent the three dimensions. The X-axis is how far something moves left or right, horizontally. The Y-axis is how high or low it is vertically, and the Z-axis is how near or far something is. XYZ on the 3DS. And you can take this access information and apply it to the Pokémon as well. The stags around the Norse Tree of Life walk around on the ground, X, whereas the eagle flies up and down, Y. When on a 2D diagram of the tree, they are essentially the X and Y axes. But then here comes Zygarde, the Z axis? Near or far? Hmm. Doesn't really fit. Maybe that's why they cancelled Pokémon Z. We couldn't come up with lore! But what if I told you now that these directional inspirations lead us to a whole new set of beliefs, a whole new trio of gods? And for that, we look to Hinduism and the Trimurti, the triple deity of supreme divinity, the three dominant gods in Hinduism, Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. Now, being humanoid in nature, you might not see the connection right away, but what we have here is the god of life and creation, the god of destruction, and the god of maintenance and order. Being the Pokémon of destruction rather than of death may help with this connection, as it's the same word used to describe Shiva. Destruction. And there are even more connections to make. Like how Xerneas may be a single form of the four stags around Yggdrasil, thus its four colored antlers, it may also pull, then, from the four heads of Brahma. And most of all, how Vishnu has several snake heads behind his own head. Most commonly, five. And looking at 50% Zygarde, what else could these five similar-looking scaly heads behind it be? Plus, there is complete Zygarde. The previous main head becomes the chest face, and the five flat heads behind 50% Zygarde's head become a humanoid head and four long snake heads. You can more easily tell that they are heads by the way they open their mouths when attacking. 
And not only this, but in Hinduism, there are many gods who can descend to Earth in the form of an avatar, the material, physical appearance of a deity on Earth. And no other god is more associated with them, or has as many, as Vishnu. Replace avatar with form, and you'll see what I'm getting at. So the Hindu god of maintenance and order, the Pokemon of order, the snake heads and many forms alone makes it clear to see. And this goes deeper too. Brahma creates life, Shiva destroys, and Vishnu maintains the balance between the two, as too much of one or the other is a danger to the whole world, to the ecosystem. Similarly, Zygarde, the guardian of the ecosystem, must maintain balance between the two, but cannot, and will not, dominate or take over the roles of the other two. Being fairy makes Xerneas immune to Zygarde's dragon typing, and being flying makes Eveltal immune to Zygarde's ground typing, in a way that symbolizes how challenging that balancing act is, as both life and death have power over the Preserver. Thus, the Preserver needs more power overall to preserve it. This balance is often mentioned in the teachings of the Trimurti, and is why Vishnu is often depicted be between the other two, preserving. And it still goes deeper. We can actually look back at the directions again. As in Hinduism, there are gods of directions, north, south, east, west, northwest, southwest, etc. And Vishnu just so happens to be one of them, the god of Nadir, which is the downwards direction, directly below an observer. And what better direction would fit Nidhogg, who resides at the lowest point of Yggdrasil? Eh? It really does all come together. One issue I often see in the Pokemon fandom is the inability of some to see or accept the idea that Pokemon can have multiple inspirational sources. Sure, most Pokemon are just one thing, maybe with a small element or two from another, but some are such cultural, biological, and historical hodgepodges that things get too complicated and people refuse to see it. A brief example is the Fire Zodiac starter theory that I butchered the name of. Many see Fennekin as a fox because it is one, but because it's a fox, it's not a dog, so the theory is wrong. Whereas others see the Zodiac loosely, it doesn't mean specifically a domesticated dog, it means dog-like, which foxes are. Because Game Freak is allowed to take creative liberties, as they do that all the time. What the heck is Nidoking? Same goes for Cyndaquil. It's not a rat, it's a mouse. Therefore, the theory is wrong. Even though in Japanese there's no word that means one or the other, they are both the same in Japanese. It's rat-like, not rat, period. And this may be the case again. The Norse mythology theory popped up first in the Western fandom, and it has a good bit of evidence for it. Plus, it's easier for us Westerners to understand. So even if it doesn't fully explain everything, we accept it. It's a lot easier than having to learn about another Eastern religion. So, some may not accept anything else as an answer. But while the Hindu inspiration fills in the blanks, by itself, it also doesn't tell the full story. But Game Freak doesn't have to pick one thing and base a Pokémon on it. Pokémon is its own world that pulls some inspiration from ours, and as such, these Pokémon can easily be Norse, and Hindu, and based on 3D spatial directions. And that's just awesome. There's something that's been bugging me about Pokemon for like... When did the anime come out? For like 20-something years now. And on the surface it may seem like a simple question, but I assure you, it's more complex and interesting than you might think. And that question is, are legendary Pokemon truly unique? Are legendary Pokemon, and mythical Pokemon as well, one of a kind? Or are they just really, really rare? The games seem to most often imply that they are one of a kind, and for a while the anime seemed to support that, but 20 years is a long time, and there have been a lot of examples pointing to the contrary. So let's start with the anime. It'd probably be hard to find more than one of each legendary in the Pokemon anime, right? Even though we uh, just talked about that video ago with Rayquaza. Yeah! So, here's a list.
Yeah, no, it may have been true at one time, but here's just a few of the legendary or mythical Pokemon that appear more than once in the anime. Remember the Lugia, Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres that appeared in the second movie, and were responsible for the balance of nature, and could not be captured under any circumstances lest the world ends? Well, Frontier Brian Nolan caught a wild Articuno. Why isn't the world over? Did, th did this not count? Or maybe this is a different Articuno. We know there are at least two Lugia, because Silver has a Lugia that was the young offspring of another. And that's not even to mention all the other times that the legendary birds appeared all over the world. Are these guardians of the islands that hold the freaking planet together just following Ash all over the place despite their responsibilities that if they ever leave the world ends? Or are there more than one of each? And much like the Articuno situation, Darkrai has been seen both in the wild and in the 10th movie, and also owned by a trainer in the anime. So is this the same Darkrai at different points in time, despite neither one recognizing Ash? Or are these different Darkrai? Some even go as far as to argue that the Mewtwo in the first and 16th movies must be different Mewtwo. But since the backstory of the 16th movie Mewtwo is mostly glossed over, we can't be certain. And then there are also mythical Pokemon that we know there's more than one of them, like Fionn and Melton in the anime, along with the thousands upon thousands of Zygarde cells, as well as Genesect in the 16th movie. Genesect brings us to the next point. One of them is shiny. Seriously, it's a completely different color. So how could it be the same Genesect? Okay, well, it's obvious there's more than one Genesect because they're standing right next to each other and there's a bunch of them. But this comes up again as well. Rayquaza appeared in the seventh movie where there's also two Deoxys. But later in the 18th movie, Hoopa summons a shiny one. Oh, and I guess the legendary beasts had a shiny version too from the 13th movie. But that's not even all of it. Here's some other instances of multiple legendaries appearing in different regions. So, are legendary Pokémon unique? Well, the anime gives us an unequivocal no to some of them. Okay then, it's settled. Wait a minute, just because that's how it is in the anime, that doesn't mean it goes the same for the Pokémon games. It's not an uncommon belief that they take place in two different universes, and there seems to never be more than one of any legendary in the Pokémon games. But we're not done here. If there's only one of each legendary per game, then that makes them unique, right? But then again, when Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon let you soar through Ultra Space and into alternate universes, the one legendary limit was still intact. Even though it shouldn't realistically be at that point. You'd think that a multiverse would literally have an infinite number of them. So maybe the whole one legendary per game thing is a game mechanic as opposed to lore. Trust me when I say, the Pokemon games are filled to the brim with that. Game mechanics over lore, I complain about it all the time on this channel. So we need to look deeper at the individual species themselves. So what about Mew? As the common ancestor of all Pokemon, that must mean there have been at one point a population of them, and thus more than one, right? And what about other mythical Pokemon like Victini, Jirachi, Meltan, and the others? Well, the game is kind of ambiguous in all of their dex entries, although Manaphy is able to breed multiple Fionn. But Fionn's status as a legendary Pokemon is debated at best. However, the majority of legendary Pokemon throughout the games appear in different places, often completely different regions. For example, the legendary birds can be found in their nests in Kanto. They are also roaming Sinnoh, the Sea Spirit's Den in Kalos, and in Ore. Not to mention Moltres's nest in Kanto has three different places, Victory Road, Mount Ember, and Mount Silver. Ho-Oh is said to have resurrected the legendary beasts, right? So Entei, Suicune, and Raikou must be one of a kind. Yet they not only roam Johto, but they can also be found roaming Kanto, or within the trackless forest in Hoenn, or in the Ore region again. Even Kyogre and Groudon and Rayquaza can be found in the embedded tower in Johto, in addition to their local residences, Chillin' and Hoenn. So that means, None of them are truly unique. 
But then we must consider Mewtwo. Everything about Mewtwo's origins as a science experiment gone wrong seems to at least imply that Mewtwo is unique. Mewtwo's backstory is pretty heavily explored, even in the games in the first generation, and yet, Mewtwo somehow appears in the unknown dungeon in Kalos. But maybe Mewtwo just moved here, Mewtwo travels the world. He has been shown to wear a cloak in the anime to hide his true form. However, there is another way to explain the multiple legendary thing. The multiverse. Of course. The multiverse theory was around for a while in Pokemon, but Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire finally brought it up with Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon going all in on the idea. Essentially, the idea goes that every version of the game, and possibly each copy of a Pokemon game, is an alternate universe from one another. Not only does this explain how you can trade supposedly one-of-a-kind legendaries from world to world, but it could also possibly justify there being two Mewtwo, and thus multiples of all the others in various regions. With that presumption, Mewtwo simply lives in Kanto in one universe, but lives in Kalos in the other. The Kalos Mewtwo's past could even be different, and thus involve Mega Evolution. But do you see the problem with that idea? It basically invalidates all of the other examples we mentioned earlier. Any legendary Pokemon living in a different region in a different game could all be chalked up to the multiverse. But there's more. There actually are a few cases where the games break the one legendary rule, with legendaries that one may assume to be unique. Which brings us to the Battle Frontier. There are several frontier brains that use the legendaries of the region in which they live. Tower Tycoon Palmer in Sinnoh has a Regigigas, Heatran, and Cresselia. Pyramid King Brandon in Hoenn has all three legendary birds and the three Regis. Seriously, he has an entire legendary team. That means you could catch all three Regis and battle this guy, who has three more Regis of his own, all in the same game. But before I go off and say no legendaries are unique, you may stop me and say, Loxton, what about the gods? Surely they must be unique. And sure, if normal legendaries aren't unique, Arceus and its initial creations still could truly be the only unique, to the toppest degree, legendaries, which would be fitting for deities. But... Well, you might know where this is going. In Heart Gold and Soul Silver, if you bring Arceus to the Sinjo ruins, it'll just create a new deity of your choice. You get a Dialga, Palkia, or Giratina. And since Dialga and Palkia created time and space, and you're uh, standing in the ruins, like, right now, that means Dialga and Palkia are already out there somewhere. Yet, here you are, hatching another. And then there was Arceus, our last hope for some individuality. Arceus, as the creator of the Pokemon universe, may truly be the only guaranteed unique Pokemon in existence. In fact, it's possible that a single Arceus governs the entire multiverse from, like, the 11th dimension or something. But oh no. A myth about Arceus called the original story claims that Arceus was born from an egg that appeared in a void out of a vortex. So I have to ask, a vortex from where? And what the heck laid the egg? Did Arceus truly come into being out of nothingness? Or did its egg come from somewhere, laid by something elsewhere in the multiverse? Is it not possible that each time an Arceus reproduces, a new universe is born in the multiverse? Is it crazy to consider that someday soon an Arceus will breed two new eggs, send them off into a vortex, and they hatch to create the sword and shield multiverses respectively? There's no solid answer here, but it's definitely, it's definitely a case-by-case -case basis with that question of originality. Ah, oh, yeah! Pokemon Masters came out yesterday, beat it already, got a load of near max level guys, because I'm pretty great. <laughs> yeah. So, my favorite part about the Pokemon world is just that. The world, the lore, and world building is great. So, of course, I was wondering what Pokemon Masters adds to it which is exactly what this video is about. How does Pokemon Masters fit into the lore?
Pokemon Masters takes place on an artificial island named Pasio, which is nothing out of the ordinary. In Pokemon Sun and Moon, the Aether Foundation's base was an entirely artificial island too. The name of the island comes from the Esperanto word for passion, and Esperanto really is the best language to pull from for it. Because you see, trainers from all over the world are coming together to take part in the PML, the Pokemon Masters League, which is being hosted here. Of course, this means that several languages are being spoken here. I mean, think about it. Kanto, Johto, Sinnoh, and Hoenn are all based on various Japanese regions. Yanova is based on New York. Kalos is French, etc. I mean, do you really think the whole Pokemon world speaks the same language? This is proven untrue by Professor Bellis, the island professor. She is constantly using words from all sorts of languages, English, Spanish, Japanese, French, and more. And it would make sense for a professor of such a diverse island to know so many languages. And plus, she even mentions how diverse the people are here. But right, the point, the point I was trying to make, the point for this video. The name of the island comes from Esperanto, and Esperanto is a very recently created language. Created, yeah, created. In 1887, it was created with the purpose of being the easiest language to learn as a second language, which would better unite the world and help with international affairs. So it is perhaps insinuated that everybody here is speaking Esperanto? I suppose that's a theory. After all, all of these trainers are able to communicate without issue despite coming from all over the world. No, they all speak English, cause that's what I read it in. You don't understand localization. In anime and games all the time, even when you're reading it or even hearing it dubbed in English, there are sometimes moments of... Oh no, it's a foreigner! My English isn't very good. I hope they can understand me. They say as they're speaking English, because canonically they're speaking Japanese, just because they are speaking English right now doesn't mean that's canon. Anyway, there's a little theory. On to the next bit. Let's get back to talking about Pasio. Being an artificial island means, of course, that all of the dirt and plants were brought here. Gardenia at one point mentions how she's curious about how they chose which plants to bring. But considering that everything was brought here, it makes sense then that there are no wild Pokémon, because this isn't a natural landmass. All the Pokémon you see in the game belong to someone. Which is a really convenient story way of explaining the gameplay mechanics. You don't collect Pokémon, you add trainers to your team. But you would have never gotten this far in the first place without help from Professor Bellis. Her name refers to the Bellis genus of flowering plants. Think the daisy, or sunflower. And theory time! Do you think her name could also be a reference to Ellis Island? A mostly artificial island where people from all over the world speaking all sorts of languages came together to become American citizens? I mean, just add a B, and it's her name. I'm just saying. Though that's only her English name and French and Italian, but in Japanese, her name isn't that. It's just the Japanese word for the common daisy, so. Either the similarity in English was unintentional, or the localization team is just excellent. Anyway, her whole thing is that she is studying the relationship between Pokémon and Sync Stones, which are this game's main attack gimmick. They work similar in concept to Z-Crystals. It's an item that allows the bond between a trainer and Pokémon to manifest itself in a super attack. Though Sync attacks aren't as powerful as Z-Moves, but they can be done multiple times per battle, at least. Now, at this point, the game only has about the first half of its story or so, so more details will be added as time goes on. But right now, it's briefly mentioned that these sink stones were found in the ocean around the area where the island was built. In fact, it may be the reason the island was built here specifically. Putting some pieces together, we can theorize that Pasio was built somewhere near Alola, but not too close. Z crystals are found only in Alola, and considering how much of Alola is ocean, it's safe to assume that a load of Z crystals were lost to it. So perhaps a load of these ocean diving Z crystals washed away through the ocean currents, whipping and being ground down against the water and the waves and the salt and the sand. But then eventually the current takes them somewhere where the current gets too weak and it drops them all, and there's a common area, a common spot somewhere out in the ocean where all of these beaten up, battered down Z crystals land. And this is where Pasio was built. After all, sink stones are described basically the same way as Z crystals. They're just not as strong. 
So, I think that's a decent theory to make. Sink stones are just really weak old Z crystals. But speaking of Pasio being built, who built it? Well, we're introduced to that character pretty early on. And his name is Lear, an obscenely rich and snobby prince from another region not specified. In fact, the whole reason he had the island built was to set up the Pokémon Masters League to bring in all of the best trainers from all around the world, specifically just so he can overcome his weaknesses and win the tournament and prove that he truly is the best, like no one ever was. Because obviously he is the best. He's accompanied by two other trainers, his servants, Rachel and Sawyer, and all three of them are massive tools! <laughs> I'm not kidding! <laughs> no, really! Rachel, Ratchet, Sawyer, Saw, Lear, Plier. That last one might seem like a bit of a stretch, but his name in Japanese is Liar written the same way as plier without the P sound, and his various European languages are Alec or Alexis, which come from Alicet, if I'm pronouncing that right, which is Spanish for pliers. Yeah, it's hilarious. They are all tools. But that also goes into how they treat their Pokemon. Lear is even quoted as saying that Pokemon are nothing more than tools making him just like all the other Pokémon protagonists. I mean, what did you expect? Also, judging by his looks, I'm speculating that he's secretly also the leader of Team Break, the villainous organization of the game. You see him often fighting against Team Break, but I feel like either he's doing it to sort of make him seem innocent, or he actually hired all of the people to be an evil team for him to fight for training and or seem more heroic and important. After all, throughout the game you run into many Team Break members who have the goal of stealing your Pokémon to take the bond you share with your Pokémon and break it apart, hence the name. But a lot of them are clumsy, often forgetting to put on their masks on until later, or even the opposite, getting it stuck. None of them really seem like professional bad guys and half the time they have no idea what they're doing. And also, unlike every other villainous team in Pokémon history, they don't have their own models or outfits or anything. Instead, they are just the everyday people, but with masks on. Which all leads me towards that they are just regular trainers, but they are hired to act as bad guys. It's a theory, but we won't really know anything for sure until the rest of the story is added. But at least, as the story is now, you do get to collect every badge. You see, in order to qualify for the PML, you must first collect all five badges, and then you enter it. The Pokémon Masters League, which has more story continue after it, and is also the multiplayer part of the game. And that is basically all the lore there is. Pokémon Masters has quite the cast of obtainable characters. All of these trainers are Pokémon Gym Leaders, Champions, Elite Four members, Battle Frontier Brains, and more. But really, who are you people? Am I out of touch? Is my memory fading that bad? Do I really remember half of these Pokemon trainers? And more importantly, are they truly all masters? Which ones really are not Pokemon masters? What even is a Pokemon master? Well, as it turns out, there is no actual definition of what a Pokémon Master is. That's right, the one thing we are all aspiring to be isn't even defined by Game Freak. Yes, you heard me. The ultimate goal in Pokémon is to become the ultimate Pokémon Master. A term that I'm not entirely sure of the definition. I mean, the name Pokémon Master insinuates that you are a master of Pokémon, so does that just mean you're a trainer? Are you a master? And if so, then all you need to become a Pokémon Master is to play the game past meeting the Professor. And there are certainly some NPCs in Pokémon Masters that have only gotten that far, for sure. Oh yes! The Ultimate Tournament! All of the best Pokémon trainers from all around the globe will be here! I'd better bring my... Ah, uh, Tata! Don't judge. It's the top percentile of all the Tata! No, nah, that can't be it. It must mean a little more than just owning a Pokémon. I mean, why is Ash trying so hard to become one if he already owns some Pokémon, so he is one? 
Hmm? He's traveled the globe, constantly saying he has to become a Pokémon Master, and his attempts at that, while they may be unfruitful, we are able to learn some information from those attempts. Perhaps this will help our definition of Pokémon Master. First, he's constantly beating gym leaders along with trying to become the champion of any region that he's in, collecting badges and Pokémon along the way. All good things if you want to become stronger and be a master of anything. Improvement. So that would mean anyone who is actively part of the League, like, it's their job, are Pokémon Masters. Possibly only the ones who are gym leaders and Elite Four and champions and stuff then. I mean, they are the people you have to beat to become the champion, which brings up a good point. What happens to the lowest gym leader once they are beat? Do they all cycle down and every time the champion gets beaten? Who chooses the people to be gym leaders and Elite Four members? Is it the government, who also owns the healthcare system, allowing discounts for those competing? Man, Pokemarts are making mad bank off of the competitive scene of Pokemon. I mean, the latest games even have the Pokemart and Pokemon Center in the same building. Which would make sense, if they're owned by the same company. Or government. But that's getting sidetracked. Let's get back to the Pokemon Masters issue at hand. We're gonna have to do some research here. Ah, so after a wee bit of digging, we did find a single piece of information pertaining to the definition of a Pokemon Master. And it comes from a... less than reputable source? I mean, it's official! Technically. So why not? It's the Electric Tail of Pikachu, an old Gen 1 manga that I did a whole synopsis of the first chunk of it for. Link right there. It's pretty great at times. The manga states, A Pokémon Master is an elite trainer who is considered a professional, and regularly takes part in Pokémon League competitions. And that definition is... pretty good, honestly. It's rather clear that it's a job. If it is your job, then you are a master. However, this definition really limits who truly is a master now, don't it? I mean, Brock and Misty, they're gym leaders. I'm sure they get paid, possibly by the government, to challenge kids and make them buy more items. And then there's the champions. They also must be salaried. And that brings me to Ash. Is he already a master then? I mean, based off of the manga, I'd say yeah. He regularly is in the league, and it's practically his job. If it's not his job, then he's just a transient hobo. Anyway, with this information, I feel like we can look at the cast of Pokémon Masters and weed out those fake Pokémon Masters. So starting off, all of the gym leaders are A-OK. -okay. They are all Masters, along with the Elite Four members and Champions, and that already leaves only a few. Hm. Seems like they named the game correctly, but nevertheless, we shall continue. All of the player characters, like Red, Brendan, and Rosa, basically fit. It seems that at this point in the timeline they have completed their trials, such as Brendan beating his father, who's a gym leader, and Red and Blue being super. Though again, at this point I'm not 100% sure they've all beaten their region's champion or Elite Four, though they do recognize all of them. So I guess that's hinted at being the case, but then again, I'm sure you'd know about popular sports people if you were into a sport. Doesn't mean you've beaten them. But we, of course, at the very least, can assume that they do this for a job. At least as much as Ash Ketchum does. So we'll let them slide into this Pokémon Masters League. So what's left? Not much. So we have Noland and Thornton, both the head of battle at the Battle Frontier in their respective regions. Both are extremely strong trainers who work in the Battle Frontier, distributing symbols to trainers strong enough to reach them and battle them. And, well, I'd say being a Battle Frontier Master is basically the same thing as being a Pokémon Master. I'm sure they have to get paid. I mean, you can't even get into the Battle Frontier to compete until you've achieved something great, like basically becoming the champion or have gotten into the Hall of Fame. So I'm sure that these two factory heads are much, much stronger than the common gym leaders, so they too get a pass. Next up is Cheryl and Marley from Diamond and Pearl. Much like the last two trainers, this duo isn't in the main storyline, or at least you can very easily miss them if you don't look. They are in the Battle Tower in Gen 4, and they are two of the multi-battle partners you can team up with, Cheryl being the default, and then the others you need to choose the correct questions to get them on your team, and again, in order to even get into the Battle Frontier or Resort, you gotta be pretty fantastic for a trainer, so a Pokémon Master for sure. But after all of these characters' explanations, I feel like I left one out. Oh! That's right. The only person there that really has no reason to be invited to the Pokémon Masters League. 
And that's you. That's right, the player character. You are a nobody with a level 1 Pikachu. You barely know how to battle, thus the tutorial at the beginning. The heck? Your character isn't a known person. It's a nobody someone who was a blank slate. What did you do in the past? Why do you have a Pikachu? What got you here? Who knows? But considering your character needs everything explained to them, they clearly are not a Pokemon master. Which is kind of funny, I guess. Now, we're not done yet. There are plenty of characters in this game that aren't really all that fancy, and that is, of course, the filler characters. Obviously. Such as the swimmers and hikers and preschoolers. They aren't really professional Pokemon masters. Why are they here? Can anyone just arrive and join the thing? I guess that would explain your player character. Huh. Well, maybe it's not actually just a Pokemon Masters League. It might be just the new league in this new region that its creator, Lear, has just happened to have named the Pokemon Masters League in order to attract all of the big named trainers. Hmm? Maybe that's the case. Oh no. What sort of evil plans does this man who's gathered the world's strongest trainers into one location have? Remember the last time this happened? Mewtwo made a bunch of clones! Maybe he actually hired Team Break to steal all the strongest ones, and all these generic pawns are secretly the Team Break members. I mean, look at this comparison shot. Doesn't it look like if you just took this Team Break member and removed the mask? Doesn't it look like these are the same people? Something nefarious is going down. Pokemon has had an interesting history. Do you remember when Nintendo and the Pokemon Company changed a ton of Pokemon names? Like, more than ten! Like, ten tens! Oh man, that's around a hundred or something! Because yeah, that happened, and not even that long ago. With the release of Pokemon Sun and Moon, over 100 Pokemon names were rewritten and altered in a way that the series has never seen before. There were several petitions to stop this change from occurring, many of them reaching thousands upon thousands of signatures, but they were all for naught. The names were changed. Even Bulbasaur, Squirtle, and yes, even Pikachu had their names altered. I mean, it wasn't even that long ago. You do remember it, right? Well, I suppose I don't blame you if you don't, because it happened in China. Pikachu was changed into Pikachu and protests were had. To a non-Mandarin speaker, that may not sound too different, but for comparison, imagine if in English the name Pikachu was changed into Pikachu. It still works, but it's slightly off and it just makes people upset. Dazia was changed into Kai Luosi. Sandy Long was changed to Duo Bian Shou. Xian Qiu was altered into Yuan Si Zhu. Yang Yang Ma was modified to Qing Qing Ting. Chao Li Wang was changed to Tie Zhang Li Shi. Fu He Qi Qiu was changed to Sui Feng Qiu. Ai Ku Shu was changed into Pen Cai Guai. Shi Yi Lu was changed to Zhong Yi Shou. Mie Mie Yang was altered into Zuo Qi Xiao Yang. Zhan Dou Fei Niao was altered into Shuai Jiao Ying Ren. And dozens upon dozens more, from all over too. No generation was spared, but Gen 1 and 2 were hit the hardest. All of this was done for a reason, though, and what might that reason be? I mean, suddenly changing the name of your mascot and many of the Pokémon with the strongest marketing pull doesn't exactly sound like a smart business move. Though Charmander was spared. Charmander was already perfect. Xiao Huo Long. So why the sudden change? Well, a few reasons. The change of the franchise name was just so that the name sounds similar in all places, all around the world. It sounds like Pokémon. But as for the changes of individual Pokémon names, there's an innocent reason, and then to some, a more nefarious one. The more innocent reason is that 
they never actually had official names to begin with. China had some weird laws when it came to video games, they just straight up weren't allowed, with some exceptions. For a simplified summary, dedicated video game playing systems were illegal. They were considered a waste of time, a detriment to society. Really, all video games are. But who's the government to decide what you humans waste your time on? Wasting it with Pokemon is no different than wasting it with Mahjong. So consoles, handheld or otherwise, were banned. But PC games were okay mostly, since you can use a PC for many things other than video games. I, I can think of at least 34. Some console companies did get around this law though through loopholes, leading to this monstrosity of an N64 being China exclusive. The N64 hardware is jammed into the controller and plugs into the TV directly, like a plug-and-play system, meaning it's not technically, or legally anyway, a video game console. Because you can't buy game cartridges for it. That was how they defined a game console. So instead, this device comes with a 64 megabyte flash card that you can rent downloadable software to. Which means, like I said, doesn't count as a video game console, according to Chinese law, and it's hilarious. And with that tangent out of the way, it's no wonder then that Pokemon games were never officially released in China. However, what was allowed to release was the Pokemon anime. It was localized and translated wholly, with very few exceptions. Every episode of the anime was allowed to be translated and localized and released throughout China. And this is where the troubles begin. Because the video games weren't allowed to release in China, Nintendo and Game Freak didn't really get involved with the Chinese localization. Rather, just some Chinese localization team did so. And they did more than localize, they wholly translated it. So another way of putting it, from Generation 1 to Generation 6, China never had any official Pokemon names. They were all localizations. And you know what kind of localizations four kids did to the Pokemon anime in English. These donuts are great! Jelly-filled are my favorite! Nothing beats a jelly-filled donut! So think of that, but Chinese names. But eventually, the Chinese ban on video games was lifted, and Pokemon Sun and Moon would be the first Pokemon games, officially anyway, released throughout China. Which meant that for the first time, Pokemon would be getting official Chinese names. And that meant all of them. Game Freak, Nintendo, and the Pokemon Company had a say in the names now. And while a lot of the localization team's names for Pokemon were acceptable, a lot of them also weren't. So with the release of the Sun and Moon games and the Sun and Moon anime, they changed the names of over 100 Pokemon. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal, right? I understand why some would be upset at this change. I mean, it's a change. Ooh. And many of these characters are beloved. But to actually go out and protest in sizable groups? Jeez. But what the Pokemon Company may not have realized is that language has been a big political issue in the last few years in China. And most of the name changes sort of reflect that issue. You see, China is huge and has a lot of people. As such, they speak many languages, but the two biggest are Mandarin and Cantonese. And over the last decade, the Chinese government in Beijing has been pushing harder and harder to, as some would put it, reduce the number of Cantonese speakers and make its citizens all speak the same language, the official language of China, standard Mandarin. To many Cantonese speakers, this obviously sucks, especially since Hong Kong, which primarily speaks it, has a sense of independence from the mainland. There's a huge, complicated slew of socio-political stuff and cultural stuff going on between Hong Kong and the mainland that we won't get into here because it's complex as heck, and also there's currently a massive protest happening that sort of has to do with all that, and this video is not about that. But basically, a lot of the Pokemon names were changed to reflect Mandarin significantly more than Cantonese, and many saw this as the mainland government furthering its outreach, changing the names of popular characters to fit in Mandarin better, to get further support for the total language conversion. As one Pokemon fan put it, Our culture and language is threatened by the Beijing government, Mandarin, and simplified Chinese. We're afraid that Cantonese may be disappearing. And another. Pikachu is Beikatsu, not Peikaiyao. I hereby vow I will never buy from Nintendo again, unless you finally understand what is Cantonese and the correct Chinese usage. Nintendo, 
why do you want to insult Cantonese? After the protests and petitions, Nintendo did hear the complaints, but their response was... interesting. Since most of the complaints focused on the mascot Pokémon, Pikachu, they decided to change the name of Pikachu again, but not back to the original, unofficial name. Rather, the Chinese name of Pikachu is now Pikachu, the English pronunciation. Not much else came from this, though. Fans were upset, but the protests stopped. And besides Pikachu, nothing else was changed again. But it does make an interesting story, a noteworthy tidbit in the history of Pokémon that I only recently learned, so I wanted to share it. And now let's close by listing several more Pokémon name changes. Ba Da Hu Ba Da Die Yong Ji La Yong Ji La Bu Lu Bu Lu Xue La Bi Shi La Bi Meng Ge Nai Ya Meng Ge Xian Ren Chang Feng Ho Feng Nu Wang Pa Lu Qi Ya Pa Lu Qi Ya Tou She Gui Tou Shui Gui Lei Si La Mu Lai Si La Mu Dao Dian Fei Shu Dian Fei Shu Yes! 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 Yeah, thank you, Game Freak. Ah, oh, thank goodness. Game Freak isn't also dropping the regional variant idea from Sun and Moon. Alolan forms were an awesome idea, though it was a shame that they were limited to Gen 1 Pokémon. But now we have a confirmed Gen 3 Galarian form Pokémon. They aren't just limited to Gen 1 anymore. <laughs> yeah! So, what is up with these Galarian forms? How did they come to be? Let's figure that out today on Noggin. So this is wheezing. It's gotta be the new Alolan Executor joke, right? This thing is 9 foot 10 inches tall. That's a tall hunk. How does it even float anymore? And the amount of Britishness that it's got going on. <laughs> Noble or otherwise well-off British citizens in the olden days famously wore top hats to show off their status. Top hats were very expensive. And the more money you put into making your top hat fancy, the more you could look down on everybody else around you. At the same time this was in fashion, chops and beards and huge poofy mustaches and the like were all also quite fashionable. It was the Industrial Revolution. Having a beard was dangerous for factory workers. So by having one along with the top hat, that look said, check it. I'm rich enough that I don't have to work in a factory. Not being poor is actually one of the defining factors of determining what a society commonly sees as stereotypically beautiful or attractive. In the classical ages, having some chonk was beautiful because it usually meant you were well off enough to buy food, all the food you wanted, and you could afford to laze about. It's the same reason pale skin and body hairlessness came into fashion. You aren't working outside, laboring away, and getting tan. Instead, you are sitting inside of a nice palace or mansion sitting in your bath and cleaning yourself up. More recently, things have flipped a bit. A full-body tan is often seen as sexy because you can afford vacation and relaxation time, and being fit or thin is more commonly seen as sexy because it means you take care of yourself and can afford healthier food options. Society has always revolved around the haves and have-nots, and this was no different in the United Kingdom's Industrial Revolution. The people who owned the factories got rich and were able to grow such facial hair and wear top hats and monocles and oh, look at the time on my pocket watch. I have an appointment to the gentleman's club. And those industrial factories famously had very large smokestacks. They were often burning coal for power, and coal produces a ton of smoke. So smokestacks were built very high to keep that as far above the city as possible. Of course, a load of soot still came down and polluted the absolute heck of the cities, leading to all sorts of illnesses. But in the Pokémon world, all this pollution in the air well, that's what coughing and wheezing are all about. They are basically balloons filled with air pollution. Which brings us to the theory of how wheezing evolved into a different form in the Galar region. It was likely during the Industrial Revolution, which we see remnants of in Galar already. The air was already so polluted due to the factories that wheezings didn't make much of a difference. 
perhaps they couldn't reliably use their poisonous gases to hunt prey anymore because the prey all got used to poisonous gases in the atmosphere constantly because of all the pollution. So, instead of hunting prey, Weezing started eating the pollution itself. You see, unlike regular Weezing, Galarian Weezing eats pollution and exhausts purified air out of its smokestacks. It's like a tree, but even more concentrated, and able to do so at a much more efficient rate. It's so efficient at sucking up pollution from the air that a lot of it has concentrated around its mouths, and that's what its beard stash things are. It's a bunch of pollution! And if the wheezing so chooses, it can actually spit up this poison that it's stored here to attack you, thus it still being poison type. But the process of taking pollution and purifying it is quite a fairy-like thing. Fairies are nature spirits and are often at war with mankind's metals and pollutants. So in the process of developing a digestive system for pollution, it perhaps inadvertently gained the fairy typing, since fairies are sorta all about that. Now how about them goons? Get out of here. Oh man, kiss much, Motley Crew? You can't tell me that those weren't the inspirations here. Black and white, star design around the eye, the tongue thing? Come on. These guys pretty much defined hard rock, glam metal, hair metal, sneeze metal, all sorts of subgenres. And look, Obstagoon even has tufts of fur instead of spikes and straps that hard rock leather jackets typically have. That is exactly what's going on with this Galarian variant. Though interestingly, both of these world-famously notorious bands are American, not inherently British. I mean, they did do tours in the UK, but I do think there is an easy enough logic trail to follow here. Brits and Americans who are into these things often argue over who invented the genre. Ask a Brit and they'll normally say that they invented it. Then the Americans who are inspired by it changed it a bit and popularized it. Some Americans say the same, but others of course disagree. Famous bands and artists like Led Zeppelin, Gun, Tiger Tales, Bohem, Ozzy, the list goes on and on. Loads of metal bands and performers originated in the United Kingdom. But what's a more popularly iconic thing even to non-metal fans? That would be the face paint Motley Crue and Kiss did. It's instantly recognizable, even if it's specifically American. The genre as a whole is more so seen as British, and this face paint, though specifically American, is associated with the genre. You see where I'm going? Plus, turning Zigzagoon and Lanoon black and white makes them match the colors of the European Badger, common in the UK. So there's certainly a double inspiration here, a two birds situation. Then there's this new evolution, Obstagoon, a wicked metal knoll. A knoll is basically a mean humanoid hyena. They were first written about by English fantasy author Edward Plunkett, 18th Baron of Dunsany, though they weren't popularized until Dungeons and Dragons used them. But yeah, that means even gnolls are a British thing. These Pokemon designers are doing an A plus job. Granted, Dungeons and Dragons did take the original gnolls and made them into what we know of them of today and popularized them. But still, the roots. Now about this line. They are punks. Their descriptions state that they go wherever they please in zigzag patterns. They are rambunctious and often purposefully try to make people upset. They are a favorite among unhappy and angry youths, aka stereotypical punks. Obstagoon plays into this well. It's in the name, obsta as an obstacle or obstruct, which is also its main feature. It rarely attacks first. Instead, it taunts and crosses its arms, a very punk thing to do. And then it counterattacks with its obstruct move. Think about those punk-filled protests that sometimes go too far. Obstructing public transit and all. It's stereotypical, but often things like this and knocking over trash cans to show the man is a very punk rock sort of thing which also is a genre that has much of its origins in the UK. You see, by obstructing the day-to-day -day normality, the day-to-day -day peace, you get attention to your cause. Though sometimes it does go a bit too far. Disrespect your surroundings! Now here's something interesting. According to the blurb about Galarian Zigzagoon, it's actually the original Zigzagoon. And then when it left Galar, it mellowed out over time, giving us the Zigzagoon we're already used to which is an interesting take. 
it wouldn't have been mentioned without a good reason. The common Lanoon is a mixture of the Japanese badger, the striped polecat, and the ferret badger. Then Zigzagoon is the Japanese raccoon dog. Well, they're all somewhat related, I suppose, but it's not like these are all descendants of the European badger or anything. Perhaps then it's not about their biology, but just about their habitat and behavior. Outside of the Galarian culture, they may not have to act the way that they do, so they become more docile over the generations. Though, they don't lose that attitude entirely. These Pokémon are still said to be tricksters and little thieves. What I'm getting at is that this may be linked to the idea that... Well, the explosion of punk culture might not have happened if not for the common proper British culture. It's a common belief that countercultures only develop when the culture they are countering grows too strong. Society is always going back and forth on a pendulum, and when it goes too far one way, it is going to be pulled back even further. It's why politics is such a mess. One side stays in power for a bit too long, gets away with a bit too much, so the other side hits back even harder. So then the options are, for the original side to then hit back even harder, or they could finally find middle ground and mellow out a bit until it inevitably happens again. <sighs> Social studies. That's why it's a thing that you learn in school. For a good while there in the 20th century, the UK had just the right amount of properness and politeness and culture and policy and all that that led many youths to rebel harder than they ever had before. Aw oh, yeah, I'ma turn my hair pink and knock over a trash can. I'll make all my music be super energetic and loud while singing about sad stuff. That'll show those rich, pompous gentlemen. You see, I knew I'd fail at a British accent, so I didn't even try. So, the latest Pokemon Sword and Shield trailer finally revealed the evil organization of this game, and it's silly. It's Team Yell. Just a big bunch of pink punks. So of course, me being me, I had to learn of their inspirational sources, especially since I knew sort of right away that I would be very upset if Galar didn't have some reference to punkitude. Because it's a very British thing. But why is that? Why make Team Yell punks? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about. Team Yell really want to see their idol, Marnie, win the championship and they'll do anything to get what they want. So they are likely going to get in your way all the time and cause mischief and do nefarious deeds. You're sort of like your stereotypical punk. Going to all these protests and knocking trash cans over. Yeah, that'll sure show those people in power. So the Galar region is basically Great Britain after a massive earthquake-induced blizzard took out Wales. So it's gotta have something to do with this team's look. And well, it does! The UK is basically where the punk lifestyle originated. So here is a very brief history of punks and punk rock, starting with the Beatles. No really, nobody would argue that the, the British boy band The Beatles were a punk rock band, but they were revolutionary for the time, and already some were calling their music satanic. <laughs> But them, and the Sea Monkeys, and plenty more, pushed the envelope in terms of beats and song subject matter. In many ways, they planted the seed, and from that seed would sprout harder and harder rock. I mean, think of it this way. We all call the Beatles and Elvis and all them sort of soft rock these days. But they were full-on hardcore rock and roll at the time. But of course, definitions change. Throughout the 60s and 70s, primarily in the UK, though also in the United States, new genres were being born. Progressive rock, blues rock, and of course, eventually, heavy metal. And it grew and grew throughout the 80s and beyond, some subgenres growing more and more distorted and grungy. Sounding like the mic is shoved halfway through your esophagus. Now you'd think that if music kept going this way, we'd just return to how it was in the old times after the mic goes all the way through. But anyway, that's metal. But that's a part of where punk rock came from. The exact origin is heavily debated, but most seem to point to the youths who were growing up during the golden age of early heavy metal, especially those in the United Kingdom. It all started with a bit of garage rock and a bit of pub rock, 
coming together with some youthful angst and rebellion caused by cultural values prevalent among Western society, especially at the time, with this epicenter at the UK. One of the first big punk rock, in quotes, bands was the Sex Pistols, and their rebelliousness is in the name even. Talking about sex, especially at the time, was ooh, somewhat of a taboo, to put it lightly. Now here they come naming themselves the Sex Pistols. Fun fact, one of the very first punk rock clothing boutiques was even just straight up called SEX in all caps. And this was all for the sake of a counterculture. To paraphrase the Sex Pistols, it's specifically music your mum is not supposed to like. It is specifically a counterculture to the way you are supposed to act. And it often had many political views associated with it, going against the man like hippies a decade before them. But in a way, and perhaps in hindsight, it was seen that the slow and peaceful ways of the hippie didn't work well enough. Let's get aggressive, provocative, and fast. So a lot of punk rock has political topics, almost always related to anti-consumerism, anti-corporatism, anti-corporate greed, and anti-conservatism, anarchism, and more. And all of these things they were against were, from their perspective, getting worse, and they had to take action. And many believed that they could encourage many others to take that action, with their music. And to an extent, it worked. And again, back to those things that they're all against, these were things that were due to effects still rolling out since the Industrial Revolution, which the UK was at the forefront of. The factories that came out of that revolution made a few people mega rich, and large monopolies and huge corporations had their start. Fast forward just one century, which in the grand scheme of things is not very long, and they've grown only more powerful. Not to mention, the UK is famous for having some ridiculous levels of control in its society. And even though the government's all prime ministry now, they're still just parading around the old, rich, famous royal family for no reason. And all the pompous, conservative, polite ways of living and whatnot? A lot of people didn't like that. And so, punks came to be. And nothing was really quite as obscene as a man wearing his mum's torn up clothing with a gross hair color and spikes all over. Not to mention this famous image. Disrespecting the royal family? How dare! And that's just the lifestyle and look. The music itself was made as a reaction against various tendencies that had overtaken popular music, such as the normalization of heavy metal, arena metal, and progressive rock. Which makes it kind of ironic that they're using Lanoon and all them, because they're basically the kiss of Pokemon, and that's exactly the sort of metal that they were rebelling against. You know, metal that was more about the spectacle instead of the music itself. Nice one, Game Freak. Anyway, punk rock was also supposedly designed as the full opposite to disco, which was massively popular at the time, it was the late 70s. The 80s and 90s then saw the genre grow further, and also gave us the look that most of us today associate with punk rockers. The neon hair, the torn clothes, the badges, spikes and piercings and tattoos. Emo angst soon came from all this. And? Well, minus just a few of these aspects, Team Yell has quite a number of them. And then there's the spikes, dog collars, and chokers, and the wrist cuffs, like what Yell has. It represents the chokehold that the government and society have over us as individuals. We're like just bulldogs to them, man. Gotta rebel. Bite the hand that feeds you in this handout, happy country. We're all unique and individual. Labels have no place here. So dye your hair a wacky color, do drug sex it up, graffiti over everything, and wear torn up clothes and say naughty words like the rest of us labelless punks. That'll show those corporate crooks. Sent from an iPhone. Of course, as time went on, having dyed hair, piercings, tattoos, and all started becoming more and more accepted. To the point where it's not really that extreme of a counterculture anymore. I mean, honestly, what's more of a counterculture now? Being 
pro-legalization of marijuana and pro-equality and pro-humans, pro-women's health and everything that ABC and NBC and popular Hollywood and most of the common folk are constantly going on about. Or being a youthful conservative. In a way, the real definition of a punk is just the opposite of what's mainstreamly considered good. Like, the whole idea is that it's provocative and stuff. Which is why many have taken the look to an extreme these days, because otherwise it's just sort of normal now. Perhaps the real punks are the extreme centrists. Funnily enough, the punk movement has a sort of term for this thing. Being straight edge punk means you're a punk, but you don't partake in certain parts of the lifestyle like drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, being rude, having the look to its absolute fullest, etc. I mean, the whole punk movement and lifestyle is filled with people who look and act like punks. What's up with that? It's so mainstream punk now, it's pop punk. I ought to rebel against that and appear like a model citizen while also agreeing with some of what the movement stands for. You know, I like how punk rock was founded on anti-consumerism, anti-corporatism, and not selling out, and nowadays that's exactly what all the most popular punk bands are. It's strange. Society is just super interesting, ain't it? Anyway, that was a fun little sidetrack of an entire video. Well, you see, I'm rebelling against the fact that I'm a PokéTube, but how about that? All in all, Team Yell are punks, because punk culture has its roots in British culture. They've got a full, sort of basic, stereotypical, and still somewhat family-friendly, punk look going on. Perhaps with the added face paint to sort of resemble some extreme sports fans, since that's what they sort of are to Marnie, their idol. And that's pretty interesting. I'm really excited to see what some of their admins look like. So I hope you Pokemon fans who clicked this totally Pokemon related video appreciate this little lesson in the history of punks and why they are in this British themed game. I've got no idea how to end this, so... Today we are going to attempt to make a real alchemy. Why? Well because it makes the thumbnail and title to this video much more interesting than our original idea. What does alchemy taste like? Who cares? The weirdos care. Which does explain why we're the ones making this video. <laughs> this all stems from a recent bit of Pokemon Sword and Shield news. They revealed a lot. Like, curry and rice? You can use sausage! What is that sausage made of? So, uh, it turns out there are a load of different flavors of alchemy. 23 or 24 so far. To think that all these deck slots were taken up by this Pokemon. Having a living dex is gonna suck again, it's just like that unknown nightmare. I mean, 23 combos isn't bad, but here's the thing. The differences are a combination of cream color and accent topping, so if we line them up and do the math by which I mean counting, there's potentially, and thus very likely, going to be 40 creamers. That's a load. These dirty puns are banging. And since nothing else interesting is happening right now, we're going to figure out what these tasty Pokemon likely taste like. And then we're gonna see if that height to weight ratio is anything plausible by attempting to make one out of real whipped cream. Real whipped cream. Real whipped cream. I forgot the cool whip. Josh, I need the cool whip! Ah! And the reason we're using different levels of cream whipptitude is because we don't know how dense Alchemy is. So first, let's look at the name of this cream on. Alchemy is short for all the cream, but actually, it's cream and alchemy. Pokemon sure has been referencing alchemy a lot lately, but why alchemy? What is alchemy? Well, basically, alchemy is proto-chemistry. It was science in the olden days where they applied a bit of science to their mysticism, or some mysticism to their science, however you want to look at it. And in a way, isn't baking and making pastries and such a science? And fairies are magic. It's fairy type after all, thus alchemy. Plus its names in other languages reflects this. Mahobyu, mispronouncing that, comes from the Japanese words for magic and whipped cream. Charmily comes from French for whipped cream, and charm as in a magical spell or a magical item. A lucky charm. The German name, Pokusan, comes from Hocus Pocus and San, or Sane, as in cream. It's magical cream! Now then, 
Next up is the matter of taste, because if you're unaware, they do taste like stuff. I mean, everything tastes like something, but what I mean is, all alchemy are able to produce cream out of their hands. <laughs> Phew. This whipped cream is said to be extremely tasty, especially if it's happy. Meaning that the quality of its cream depends on if it likes you versus its fear levels. To achieve cream, you must first give it pleasure. Though interestingly, this is very true of about most animals that you would eat. The flavor part, not the cream part. Unless... When it comes to tasty meat, if the fish or cow or whatever is stressed or freaking out when it's just the short time before they pass, the meat will be somewhat sourer than otherwise. DFD, or dark, dry, and firm meat, are all results of when an animal's muscle glycogen reserves are depleted just prior to expiration. At death, muscle glycogen is converted into lactic acid. Lactic acid is the magic ingredient that makes the meat tender and flavorful because it is responsible for the decline of pH during rigor mortis. So, you freak a deer out with your headlights, they're gonna release a load of adrenaline, which prohibits the production of lactic acid. This is most noticeable in fish. I mean, the last moments of a fish's life are pretty stressful, being all crammed in a net and then slowly suffocating while using all of your remaining energy to flop in futility. It's actually why fish goes bad so fast. Vox did an awesome video on that topic that I'll link to here, where they show a cool Japanese way of killing a fish that doesn't cause nearly as much stress, and which thus results in the fish actually lasting significantly longer before getting that bad fishy smell, and also makes it taste better. It's nuts how this is a thing. Super cool, I definitely recommend it. And in the case of cream, which is usually made from milk, the same applies to cow's milk. Studies have shown that happy cows do in fact make better tasting milk, so this can easily be applied to Alcremie's cream as well. So what does it taste like? Well, the accented toppings are easy, and the strawberries are strawberries, the cookies are cookies, etc. Wow. But the cream. Cream comes in many flavors, though the default Alcremie, by which I mean just the first one we were shown, is easy. It's just your normal, everyday whipped cream, like what we have here. After all, strawberries and cream is a common pastry topping. Now then, Yellow with white tips. Obviously banana cream. Banana cream pie is delish, though it could also be lemon. Lemon cream or lemon meringue is also quite tasty. I'm leaning more towards lemon, since banana is also a possibility for the yellow with pink tips color. The pink, then, being strawberry. Fun fact! Did you know that bananas are technically berries? Now you do. Did you also know that strawberries technically are not berries? You know, come to think of it, why is strawberry banana such a common combination? Well, another fun fact is that the artificial flavor known as bubblegum was initially inspired by the combination of strawberry banana, though specifically the artificial flavors of each. This specific combo, like the bubblegum flavor, was designed specifically to appeal to the most children. Kids just happen to really like it in studies, and thus sales. So it got popular. Now how about these pink ones? Foley strawberry? I'm leaning more towards raspberry, another common and popular flavor variant. In candies, raspberry is normally portrayed as blue just to differentiate it from other flavors like cherry and strawberry, but in pastries, it's more often the saturated pink like this. Whereas strawberry tends to be much more light. It's a lighter color. Now mint flavor. Mint can go three different ways in terms of pastry colors. There's all that white coloration that symbolizes the wintry coolness it brings, though it isn't as common as light green and light greenish blue. The blue also reflects the cool mentholy taste, while the green comes from the color of the actual mint plant. The green is more common for mint flavor when it's paired with chocolate and fudge, but as a frosting or icing, it can be this greenish blue color. And before you say blueberry just because it's blue, no, blueberry cream is purple because that's the color of the insides of blueberries. And plus, that leaves the green for key lime or pistachio cream. May sound gross if you were unaware that that's a thing, but it's actually a super popular flavor, uh, specifically among older consumers, especially in Europe where the flavor originated. 
It's recently started to grow in popularity in North America, but it's been a strong flavor contender in Europe, especially Italy for forever now. And the Galar region is based on the UK, which is in Europe, so now you know. But since I brought up the white one, come to think of it, yeah, it's even more white than the default one. Maybe then the default one is strawberry cream and this one is your run-of-the-mill vanilla cream. Or it could be coconut or white chocolate. Those flavors tend to be much whiter than vanilla, which is usually white with a tinge of yellow beigeiness in there. And that leaves this brownish beige one. French vanilla tends to be more dark and yellowy than your typical vanilla, but the Brits hate the French, so I doubt the Galar region would allow these ones in their borders. I mean, have you seen how strict the Galar region is about which Pokemon they allow into their region? Jeez. So here we probably have butterscotch, coffee, or caramel, 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 saramel, or cookies and cream. That's a tasty one. Now, with that out of the way, what makes it so good besides the flavorings? The base cream? It even is whipped cream. Well, whipped cream is just heavy whipping cream, sugar, and a flavor if you choose so. But what truly makes your whipped cream good is the prep and ingredients. First off, you want fresh cold cream. This is important. You gotta be cold. So you get about a cup of cream. I'm not gonna turn this into a cooking show. We tried that once. Only memers liked it and nobody else. It's also the only time we talked about Earthbound on this channel. I'm sorry. So instead of making our own cream to make an alchemy, we're just gonna buy good old generic brand whipped cream and good old family guy joke. Epic. Now let's do the thing you clicked on this video for. Sorry about all the uh, cream filling. Get it, because it's filling out time in the video. It's... So alchemy, is one foot tall and weighs just over one pound. So we got a pound of whipped cream. And... Hey Josh! Josh! It, it just doesn't stack up. Alchemy then must be less dense than this stuff. So we also got a pound of whipped cream from a can. And we're... I'm about to do my best. A few inches later. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's possible when you're dealing with fairy magic. You know, we're almost there. So, uh, you know, just magical fluff. Woo! I'm a fairy. So I hope you liked this video. It's a filler video. Maybe you think it's kind of cheesy, but you'd be wrong in assuming that. It's a cream filler video. Though I guess cream cheese is a thing. Well then, this was fun. Uh, I'm gonna eat this Pokemon and then take a nap from the resulting blood sugar high. So until next time, you never stop using your noggin. This was fun. All right, towel me up, boy. <laughs> ah! The spark noise. I got it in my eye. <laughs> Duraludon, a new Pokemon whose relevance is already starting to fade. Let's check him out. Compared to the pre-Sun and Moon season, the hype train for Sword and Shield is rather small. Which I guess is a good thing for everyone who cried about everything being spoiled before the new games were even out. But it works out to being a pretty bad deal to guys like me! How else am I gonna guarantee extra income without blabbing mindlessly about every tiny snippet of news that everybody has already seen and talked about, you know? <laughs> Well, enough about generic Poketubing. Let's talk about that super interesting Pokemon that I am super excited about for real, no sarcasm. Ooh, 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 we could put that generic Poketuber font here. It'll piss everybody off. So, Druidagon. No, uh, Dorarabradon. 
do the dad do Don Giraffe Ludes Don Duraludon. Duraludon? I'm having a hard time remembering its name. Or it. So the website mentions that it rusts easily, and only some metals rust, so that's information to narrow some things down, because today, we are going to figure out what it is. And recently, the official Pokemon Twitter account was nice enough to give us a tidbit of information. Super glad that they took time out of their busy day to tell us that it weighs a total of 88 pounds or 40 kilograms. Meaning, of course, we've got some math to do. Like with every other Steel-type Pokémon, we figured out what type of metal they actually are in this old video here. And thanks to this Pokémon being basically entirely metal, and now we have its weight and size, we can figure it out too. I mean, we even did a video on what Metal Mario is made of when he's metal. Metal Mario, specifically, the Mario that's metal. Apparently, someone here at Noggin likes metallurgy. It's Josh. He's a massive dork. So, Didgeridoo Don is 40 kilograms and it's about 5 foot 11, or 1.8 meters tall. Meaning that if it were a human of healthy weight, it would be between 155 and 189 pounds, or around 80 kilograms. Meaning that, first off, huh. Very huh. Lighter than a human of the same size. By half, even. So I guess when it comes to Dragalgadon, you could say it's... lighter. <laughs> ha! Get it? It looks like a reusable portable oil-based tinderbox, because it's British, so it's a tinderbox. Torches are those flashlights, not fire sources. So what could Dorugerman possibly be? I mean, its density would have to be about half of a human's then, right? Well, that would only be the case if they were about the same volume. It definitely looks like there's quite a bit of wideness and bulk here compared to a human. So, we have quite a bit of error room here. Though, if a human had the same proportions, I'm sure that the human would be much, much heavier too. As well as being uh, horrendous looking. Anyway, needless to say, while we're doing our best to estimate, these will still be rough estimations, but as you'll see in the end, it's actually pretty perfect and spot on. Roughly. So, the density of the human body is about 985 kilograms per cubic meter, meaning for every meter cubed, it would weigh 985 kilograms. On Earth, anyway. However, it's normally calculated in grams per cubic centimeter, which makes it easier to measure stuff in a lab. Basically, scientists can't afford a cubic meter of gold to test density. But then, using these numbers, a human's density would be around 0 0.985 grams per cubic centimeter. That's just making things more complicated. But that's not bad for a fleshy meat bag. A good reference would be water. Water is exactly one. Again, it just makes things easy. Water is absolutely everywhere, so let's base our math on it. But another unit we could play around with is steel. Seeing as Dorugoromon has the wonderful type combo of steel dragon, and I have no idea about the density of a dragon, let's go with the steel part of it. Though, fun fact, I know it's not going to be made of steel. Most of the steel types aren't even steel. But common, mild steel has a density of about 8.05 grams per cubic centimeter, making him way too dense to be any semblance of solid in there. Like, not even cross beams, so it's obviously not steel. And this brings us to the first point of contention in this video. That being, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Wait, no. Right, right. Because it's a negative on me, I gotta include everyone, otherwise I look bad. It's we now. We don't really know what we're talking about. By which I mean, who even knows if Dirge Dawn is even solid? I mean, it could be hollow. And this would make the whole video wrong, no matter what. Though it does make sense that it would be slightly hollow, and not solid. It is an animal, after all. It eats. It's gotta be at least somewhat donut-shaped. Or are all donuts slightly animal-shaped? And because of Durdown's hollowness, its actual material would need to be 
far denser than a human. After all, a thin sheet of metal is rather light compared to a block of metal. And if it were only half as heavy, but incredibly small in volume comparatively, it would need to make up for that in its density. Meaning, since we don't know how thick its outer shell is or what's inside of it, it could be anything. But we can always just make assumptions because they're fun. Basically what I'm saying is, right now this is a total guess. And my guess is that Dan's density is around two. That's what I'm getting at. And thankfully, there are a bunch of charts and sheets that we can look through to figure out metal densities. One notable element with a density close to two is graphite carbon being 2.3. But we're looking for metal here, so that should help us limit down the options. We have cesium and magnesium at 1.7 and 1.9 respectively. So maybe we should look at some threes and also look at some alloys, not just pure metals. Let's see, we got beryllium, aluminum, duralium. Duralium. Ugh. Also, it's the alloy Pokemon apparently. And that's what Duralium is. It's mostly aluminum, but with some copper and other tiny bits of other metals mixed in. So, an alloy. An alloy that rusts like nobody's business, fitting the website description of this Pokemon. Hmm. Maybe, if I had just remembered the name of this guy, we'd have gotten here much quicker. Duraladon. At first, I really thought it was going to just be Dura as in durable, but... Now that we know that it's made out of a lightweight material similar to aluminum, we can dive into metallurgy and find that duralium happens to be decently close to my extremely rough estimates. And it, well, it fits the name. So what is duralium? And does it make sense? Well, the answer to that is yes, it makes perfect sense. It's pretty great. Duralium is actually very similar to aluminum. In fact, it's basically industrial era aluminum which fits perfectly into the Galar region. You know, I've said this a few times now in previous videos, Great Britain was at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution, thus there being remains and references to it throughout the whole Galar region. So this dragon being made out of an industrial era metal, that's cool. I mean, it kind of sucks for the Mon. It's kind of outdated. But still, the reference. It's neat. And plus, it being a light metal means it works out perfectly that it gets the light metal ability in the game. Though it can also get the heavy metal ability. Hmm. I suppose some of them have thicker armor than others, or more solid perhaps. Though they likely all share around the same density, that being the density of Duralium, which has a density of 2.78 grams per cubic centimeter. So, we're only slightly heavier than aluminum, but we're still totally able to be double a human's density. Plus a bit more, for the girth of the beast. So really? I guess my stupidity paid off! <laughs> Big new Pokemon leaks! That's right, you're hearing it here most recently, folks. Lord knows I can't say first because gosh, we're slow. I guess that's what happens when you spend more than a single brain cell making content. We're not even through the intro and I've lost several already. Whoa. Uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield comes out in two months. Meaning, of course, Pokemon leak and reveal season is here and wow. Oh boy, is it very disappointing. A duck with an onion? Oh well, let's get to the point. Here, it's right here. I have with me a multitude of leaks. Because today, of course, you know already, we are going to be testing the structural integrity of leaks as lances and or cutting implements. <sighs> I? I'm not kidding. I love you guys so much, I actually went outside. Josh was there, of course, but it's practically like I'm solo in a store with people. Here we are buying leaks, all of them. 
all the leeks the store had. Hopefully this video makes back the price of these vegetables. Either that, or I'm eating dirty leek soup for a few weeks. But let's get back to the Pokemon. I mean, have you seen this mon? From his widow feet to his bedroom eyes. This Pokemon is something all right. Funnily enough, this noble knight Pokemon is fighting type, as are most of the sword fighters in this game. What with Gallade and the Swords of Justice and all. But his noble nature lends itself to his fights. It's said that Sir Fetch calmly fights and always fights fairly. I guess it's trying to insinuate chivalry, the sort of pirate's code, except for knights. Only the far-fetched of the Galar region can evolve into Sir Fetched after experiencing many battles as well. And they are so famously noble in battle that they are often depicted and chosen as a motif for paintings. Of particular note is a painting famous in the Galar region that depicts a duel between Surfetched and Escavalier. Hmm. Knights versus snails, where have I seen that before? Well anyways, he's a pretty noble, confident, seasoned fighter. I mean, it's said that in battle, Surfetched uses the sharp stalk of its leek as a lance and the thick leaves as a shield. It maintains this leek over the span of many years and it treasures it more than anything. Surfetched will finally leave the battlefield and retire entirely if this leek of its ever wilts. It's kind of sad then if you just catch the leak on fire, isn't it? Well, it's time for you to learn a multitude of leak facts. How exciting. I mean, how long would a leak even last outside of the ground? We obviously see that Sir Fetched's leak is not buried, unless of course it plants it every night when it goes to bed, like it's tucking it in to sleep. <laughs> it's pretty cute of an idea. Uh, but an unplanted leak will last, depending on its freshness, only one or two weeks unrefrigerated or frozen. Those will raise the lifespan of the leek once it's out of the dirt, the same way that they save all vegetables, by cooling down and slowing down the decaying process. But there is another way to keep leeks fresh. After plucking them up, if you don't wash them, and instead just dust the excess dirt off, you will be able to store them in a dry, dark area. This will give them up to three months of storage time, and the key here is dry. Once they get wet, they start to wilt rather quickly. It sucks for far-fetched, or sir-fetched. The Galar region being based on the UK is quite moist and rainy. So I guess the only possibility is that they do keep it as dry as they can and do plant their little sword in the dirt every night. Hmm. What about the shield? Well, I guess dry hard leaves are better than soft floppy wet leaves. I really enjoy this detail. If you look at its sword and shield, they are the same singular leak that it cut to create both of these armaments. But now here's the real deep lore question. What did it use to cut them in the first place? Did its mentor cut the leak? Is there a never-ending chain of surfetches cutting the students' leaks once they are ready to become knights? Well, I guess Farfetch can learn the move cut. But how big do leaks even get? If the Pokemon is two foot seven inches, like the Pokedex states, then the leak being twice that would be like five whole feet. Or maybe the Dex is measuring the leak as the Pokemon? I mean, it's done stupider things before. But this is where things get interesting. The average leak can grow from 12 to 18 inches. But here we come to an odd crossroad. What type of leak is it? There are plenty of different types of leaks. Some aptly named for this Pokemon even. <laughs> I mean, there are Lancelot leeks! Lancelot leeks! A variety that is very resistant to plant viruses. There's even a leek named the King Richard, named after a famous English king. This leek is a summertime classic. Rather weak in the cold, though. There's also the Lincoln, not perfectly named for this Pokemon, unfortunately. But it is fast growing and has large, long, white stalks, much like Surfetch. I feel like Game Freak may have actually gotten this idea from the Lancelot name, or the King Richard. Richard name of a leak. I mean, if you're gonna make a Lance Pokemon in a UK region, you can't not reference Lance a lot. He lanced things all the time. Like a lot. And since there's a leak named after him, and Farfetch'd has a leak, 
Put two and two together. Did you know that there is a Scottish variant called the Giant Muscleberg? Not really sure how that fits in, but maybe that's why it's fighting type, because Game Freak is wonderful. Giant muscles, Ooh, fighting type, leek. Fun fact, the leek is very culturally important in Wales. In fact, it's so important that it's an emblem of the country. Another reason to reference it, since Wales is in the UK, even if it's not in the Galar region. Now, while there are plenty of leeks that grow pretty big, none of them grow quite as long and thin as Surfetch's leek. But I mean, it is the fantastical world of Pokémon. Who's to say they don't just have really big leeks? I mean, <laughs> Sun and Moon had massive leeks. But now comes the real question, the real fun question. How good are leeks as a weapon? Let's see what these leaks can do. Wow, how informative. You know, a duck probably couldn't cut its way through an obstagoon, that's for sure. I'm assuming obstagoons are a bit harder than uh, any of the things we hit. Also, these are just onions, right? Who uses an onion as a weapon? I mean, you could make your enemy cry, but that's not because of pain, it's because of synpropanethyl S oxide. It stimulates the eye's lacrimal gland, so they release tears. Is Celebi, like, the queen of the farfetches? She's like a mythical onion fairy. Hmm? Oh. My. God! Did you see the epic season finale of My Little Pony TM Frangicus Magic? Cause I didn't, but I can't believe it's finally over. <laughs> Finally. Game Freak totally knows that bronies were going to run out of things to loot when their series ended, so they had to tap into that market somehow, and there's literally no better way to do this than this, in my opinion. Let's take Ponita, make it a unicorn, and give it a My Little Pony to him from Jackie's Magic proportions, and add a fairy floss mane and tail! Yes! And so they did. Galarian Ponita. What an interesting way to reveal it, though. It was kind of, uh, long. It was really clever, but it was long. And during that whole long thing, they got everyone saying, Oh yeah! Fairy-type Ponita confirmed! And then later they showed that it was psychic. <laughs> also, I do want to point out its category is the Unique Horn Pokémon. Unique Horn. Unique Horn. But Psychic? Psychic! What? It's literally like, in the top three of fairy-type looking Pokémon. And it's not fairy-type? I mean, maybe maybe when it evolves into an Alicorn, it'll gain the fairy-type. But, but, but still, what? Game Freak is so dumb! They ruined my pony just to be a bit unpredictable. Trash! But hang on, hang on. Is it, is it not predictable though? I mean... We can find our answer, even in My Little Pony. I mean, just look at the unicorns in My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. They literally all have telekinesis, a psychic ability, the ability to make objects float with their minds, or in this case, their unique horns. Of course, in MLP, it's explained as magic, but in Pokemon, psychic is a stand-in magic type just as much as fairy is a stand-in magic type. But there's more. As many have pointed out, if it were fairy type, it would be weak to poison damage, whereas with it being psychic, it is super effective against it. What does this have to do with Ponyta? Well, because its whole thing in this Galarian form is that it's magically a poison antidote. Its signature ability, Pastel Veil, prevents it and its allies from being afflicted by poison. 
and it even heals them of poison if it comes out onto the battlefield. Its very presence is a cure, an antidote for poison. Now imagine if poison damage hurt it a bunch and was super effective on it. Yeah, that'd be dumb. But that's not to say a tweak to its ability couldn't have fixed it all. There are a number of abilities that remove Pokemon weaknesses and practically give some Pokemon a third type. For instance, just as a very quick example, Emoga and Electros are electric type, thus weak to ground, but they have Levitate, thus they are immune to ground. Delmize is Grass Ghost, but its ability Steel Worker makes it a Steel type when attacking with Steel type moves. Practically. Got clarify. Practically it does. But anyway, it wouldn't be hard to make Galarian Ponyta Fairy type and give it a new ability that makes it cure and resist poison as if it weren't weak to it. Mm, but of course the excuse there is that Mono Fairy is already a really good type and just removing one of its weaknesses makes it kind of an overpowered ability. So at least with it being psychic type, it's already a poison killer, so it makes sense. But this is all the meta game design reasoning. Is there an origin or lore reason at all for it being a walking antidote? Well, yeah, that's why I'm talking about it. Pastel Veil is a great ability for a unicorn Pokemon because in medieval times, especially in Western Europe, it was believed that if you were poisoned and a unicorn touched you with its horn, you would be completely cured of the poison. And also, if a unicorn touched water with its horn, it would make that water potable and clean. This belief eventually led to what were essentially snake oil salesmen importing ivory and narwhal horns and then selling them as unicorn horns as a cure for poisonings. And then we have the website's description of this Pokemon. It is said that they were exposed to the overflowing life energy of the forest over many generations, and this is why their appearance became unique in this region. It harkens back to the medieval belief that unicorns were intrinsically connected to the forests and the life within the forests that they live in. If the forests die, the unicorns die. If the unicorns all die, the forest dies. But unfortunately, that only points towards this Pokémon being Fairy-type more! Sure, the poison thing makes Psychic work really well, but the Fairy-type is also a sort of nature-type. Hence the Tapus being the thing, and Nature's Madness being a... Fairy-type's all about that magical connection to nature. It's basically a nature-type. Which is why I would be very surprised if Galarian Ponyta doesn't evolve into a Psychic Fairy-type something. A Rapidash or a new evolution that's Galarian specific. Or at the very least, I would be surprised if it doesn't learn a ton of fairy moves as to insinuate that it is essentially fairy type, it's just actually having the fairy type doesn't fit into the gameplay mechanics well, so they didn't give it to it. So, I hope that answer is satisfactory. Galar. Galarian. Alola. Alolan. Does that mean Johto? Jotoian? Or would it be Jotoese? Jotish? Jotic? Jot? Jotoian? I'm not even sure if that's all of them. Canto? Cantish? Cantite? Canto? You know, even in the real world, who gets to decide the naming scheme of all these regions? Did we all get together and choose? I'm sure some people were invited to that meeting. I mean, we've been naming each other things for centuries. Some countries aren't even that old. I'm looking at you, South Sudan. Couldn't even come up with a better name after breaking off from Sudan. But if you are from South Sudan, would you be Southern Sudanian? Or would you be a South Sudanite? I mean, I'm American, right? But what if I was an American? Amerikish? Amerikese. See, it all, it all flows wrong. And it's all just made up words. All words are just made up. Why do some things sound right when everything's just made up? So applying that to Pokemon, that'd be like calling a Galarian a Galarn. Galarish. It just doesn't work. Cause it'd be bad English. So how do we determine this? Where we're based in? Country or region or whatever. And thus, what would the forms of the different regions be called? If we went back to older regions and we introduced variants, regional variants of them, what would we say? Well, that is exactly what this video is about. Demonym. 
It's called a demonym. And that's not the evolution of impotent. That's an actual term that in no way relates to demons or nymphs. Breaking demonym down, we get nym, a suffix from Greek meaning name, and demon, from Greek for name, clan, tribe, and also from Latin for of a clan. And it's also used to mark specific groups of people. Thus, its similarity to denote, which means to be a mark or sign of, or to be a name or designation for. Thus, a demonym is what we call words like Canadian, Californian, Scottish, Oregonian, etc. So how do we take a name of a country or region and get its demonym? Uh, or adjectival? Uh, that's another thing. One refers to the people, the other refers to things within it. Like, for example, this pastry is Danish. It comes from Denmark, and it was made by the Danes. Yeah. So just know that I'll be using the more colloquial idea here, which means I'll be talking about both of them at the same time, basically, even though they're technically, if you want to be nitpicky, not the same thing, I'm referring to both. You know, plus a lot of them are the same anyway. You know, I'm an American. Have some delicious American cheese flavored products. So where do these words come from? Well, that all comes down to a few things. A few things that, according to the world map, is a topic of debate. The world's demonyms have their names based loosely on whatever the person who named it decided, and thus whatever became common. Ain't language great, but there has to be some rhyme or reason to it. Maybe we can figure that out. Well, uh, for instance, it always includes the country of origin in it, and oftentimes can pull from the region as a whole. And thus, we can probably start to notice some distributive patterns right away. For instance, while there are obviously exceptions to all of these, ish is mainly used for European nations. British, Swedish, Polish, French. It's the same sound. The e suffix, which is actually the letter i, is common for nations in the Middle East. Iraqi, Saudi, Israeli, ik and er seem to occur only after the word land, like Icelandic or Newlander. But the others, the others seem to be more random. So it mustn't be wholly geographical because then all of the Pokemon regions near each other would be the same, you know. Come to think of it, it would make the most sense if these words came about due to the original languages and their roots. For instance, if we look into Latin, we find the suffixes ian, in, and a uh, regularly. In fact, Ian means place in Latin. So it almost makes perfect sense to name a location with the suffix of place, such as Galarian, a person of the place of Galar. So regions that have Latin-based languages would likely end that way. Then looking further into it, Ease is an Italian Latin suffix. But then why do they call themselves Italians? Oh, right, the Italians didn't name Italy. The Romans did. But you know what the Italians did do? By which I mean Marco Polo and other such Italian traders? They found a lot of the New World along with frequent traveling to the Far East. Japan, China, all the way down south to Vietnam. Thus, Japanese, Vietnamese, Chinese. They're all Italian. Suddenly Mario makes so much more sense. Heck, even Japan is an exonym, meaning a name given to a place from outside of that place. The Japanese name of Japan is Nippon, and to refer to the people, it's Nihonjin. Heck, even their name for China or Chinese is different. Chugoku. Eastern versus Western world stuff, man. Let's get back on track. The suffixes er and ik we see having Germanic roots, although again it's mixed with Latin's greedy tendrils commonly found in Western language. But it seems that er always follows land as per rules of Latin. However, it seems like when talking about a person from a land place, you normally use er as in Icelander, but when saying it as an adjective, it's ik, like an Icelandic storm. Now ish, Ish is the totally Germanic language suffix, not even slightly tainted by Latin's roots. Though again, in case you were wondering, just like with the Italians, funnily enough, a German is what you call someone from Germany because Latin named them, not the Germans. But Germany named England. Thus you call them English instead of Englander or Englandic which would be correct if times were different in the history. That's a quote from me. No one got to take that. 
I'm just digging my grave deeper. And while language continued to change and evolve, these names that we have for ourselves stuck. Thus, also, Japan still being Japan to us in the West, even. And this is basically where these demonyms come from. It's from whose word for the people of the area stuck throughout the ages. Normally originating from whichever world power was strongest at the time. Though that's not to say they can't change. For instance, the modern term for an Israeli is just that. But originally, they were referred to as Israelites, because at the time, Greece was all powerful and stuff, something about an empire, and Ite was their word for ground or land and all things associated with it. Which, fun fact, is also why a load of minerals and rock related words also end with Ite. But they would also call the people living on certain sections of land by the same name. This rock is found in Canaan, thus, Canaanite. These people live on the ground in rocks known as Canaan. Thus, they are Canaanites. So now that we have plenty of real-world examples, we can almost piece together some of the words for the regions found in the Pokémon world, which is mostly based on our own world, so we can go ahead and apply some of our history to it, I guess. So we have Galarian, meaning they are a very old country, and or were founded by the Romans, or perhaps other major Latin-speaking language empire. However, just because we think the Romans founded them, and we also think that Galar is close to Kalos, doesn't exactly mean Kalos would be Kalosian. Though, that doesn't sound too bad. They may actually be Kalosian again. Kalosan, again, is still similarly named by Latin speakers. Then we have Alolan, also official. Again, Latin roots. I guess the Romans were much more into Pacific Ocean environment exploration than they actually were here. Now let's see, the rest of the main games, we have Kanto, Johto, Sinnoh, Hoenn, Unova, the Sevi Islands, and then there is the Ore region and Holon, Almia, Fior, Oblivia, Ronse, Carmont Island, Ferrum, Rhyme City, TCG Island, and two Pokemon Islands. Plus the anime had the Orange Archipelago and Decolor Islands. Now some of these we aren't sure count as regions or countries, like TCG Island or Pokemon Island, but they would simply be called Islanders, as per the linguistics. So, Sevi Islanders, TCG Islanders, Orange Islanders, etc. Kanto would likely be Cantonian, or just for fun, Cantonese, but obviously that's too close to the real world's Cantonese. But in Gen 7, we actually do see that it would be Cantonian, just like the name of the gyms in Mali City. Fun fact, in Japanese it translates to Gym of Kanto, just like Cantonian to us Englishers. Language is neat. Because of its closeness to Kanto, Johto would be either, again, Jotonian, or again, Jotoese. Though I feel Jotonian would be more realistic, as they are about the same age of regions, so it makes sense that they were named by the same general language. So also, because Sinnoh and Hoenn are so close, we can probably guess rather easily. So if you were from Sinnoh, you could be a Sinonian. Adding that N at the beginning of the end suffix is occasionally done to make it sound nicer. Again, this is all easy, because Latin is great. But would that mean if you were from Hoenn, you would be a Hoennian? That's a lot of ends, but really, Hoennese is pretty bad. And plus, again, it would make sense that it was similar to Kanto and Johto, as it's pretty close. Hoennian. 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 Now, finally, we get to Unova, which is not a close place. This one we could realistically see being any name, but I feel like Unovian is another good one. Like, it's just the same as the others. But ultimately, Unovin is also good, as this region is based off of America, and American is the demonym. But if the Pokémon world all speaks one language, then it's probably Unovian. But I like Unovin more myself. Now then, the side games. We have a lot less real information to go off of for these regions, so uh, let's just go fast. The Or region's people would be called Orinian. Holon would be Holoni, because I guess they're near Arabia. Almia to Almian, Fior to Fiorin, Oblivia could be Oblivion, but that may sound too much like Oblivion. Stop! You violated the law. Which is where the name comes from, but still, maybe because it's an island out there somewhere, we could get away with Oblivies or Oblivites. Leaning more towards the first. Ronse is also interesting. There's a good trend of Ian or An because these are all English names. So Ronsen or Ronsein, but this region is extremely feudal Japan expired. So Ronsenese could work. 
or perhaps to use an endonym instead of an exonym, we could apply the local Japanese way of saying it. So in this case, Ransego. Rhyme City isn't really a country or region, but you could be a rhymer if you were from Rhyme City, as most cities follow the land scheme, like if you are from London, you'd be a Londoner. Some exceptions apply though, normally if the name ends in ing, you'd be it. Ferum would be Ferumian or Ferumian or something, though honestly Ferumic sounds cooler. I guess we don't know exactly where that one's based, or most of these really. Hmm. Then Pasio would be Pasimian. That was a joke. Passionian? Passionon? That sounds right. One of those. Pasio comes from passion, so it works out pretty well. All right. Sometimes a Pokemon theory gets so big that everybody knows about it. Thus, everybody has talked about it already. Well, recently, I discovered that I too am a part of this collective known as everybody. And yet, I haven't talked about it yet. So it's time to remedy this situation by talking about the title of this video. Sharpedo is a long lost relative of Garchomp. Perhaps even a lost middle form. And now you're thinking to yourself, how could Sharpedo at one point have been the pre-evolution of Garchomp? I mean, fish? Fish? Bipedal dragon? It just doesn't make much sense, but... Oh wait, Dragonite! Dratini is now a fish. It's also possible that Gibble is essentially Sharpedo's brother, who then evolved into Garchomp. There's plenty of details to go around, and that's what we're going to talk about today on Noggin. So you may be wondering how dumb I am. Obviously Sharpedo and Garchomp are different Pokemon, which is valid, and an absolutely right point. But remember, it's Game Freak we're talking about here. They think that adding Bufalant and not having it related at all to Tauros is an okay thing to do. What even is a love disc? Not a pre-evolution to a Lumamola, that's what. I can't believe I actually said that right. I always call it Alamamolanola. But as irritating as this may be to some, these are literally perfect representations of sister groups or sister taxons. What's a sister taxon? Glad you asked. It's a phylogenetic term denoting the closest of relatives of another given unit in an evolutionary tree. Sort of like convergent evolution or divergent evolution, which is kind of the opposite. But, but like what even is evolution in Pokemon? Not right is the answer to that. Covergent evolution is, basically, it's similar creatures that don't necessarily share a previous relative, but they both evolve similar traits, like Stegosauruses and Kentosauruses. Both got large keratin spikes, but they each independently evolved in completely different areas, like opposite sides of the planet, essentially. They don't have a recent common ancestor at all, and yet they both got these spikes because it just so happens to be a design that works really well. So, two completely unrelated dinosaurs got them. It's also similar to how both birds and bats evolved flight, but through totally different means. It's fascinating. But this is the exact opposite of what I think Gibble and Carvana have done. They would be examples of divergent evolution. Basically, two animals that likely share a common ancestor, but their traits and features wound up differing drastically, like Darwin's finches. They all started as basic finches, and when they moved to the Galapagos Islands, and each island has a different food source, like nectar versus seeds, well, Eventually, the finches of the islands diverged and became different species of finches. Some now have long beaks for nectar, while others have stout, thick, strong beaks for breaking seeds. While we don't actively see this happening in Pokemon, because its definition of evolution it would work better as metamorphosis, like caterpillars to butterflies, we can see that our definition of evolution and adaptation does happen in the Pokemon world too. Mew is stated to be the common ancestor of all Pokemon, and Archon is said to be the common ancestor of all bird Pokemon. And there's a reason that prehistoric Pokemon look like prehistoric creatures. Long-term generational adaptation does still happen in Pokemon, clearly. And these five Pokemon are a great example of it. So let's add another bit of information. Gibble is categorized as the land shark Pokemon, an apt name for a terrestrial creature that looks similar to a shark. But then we see that Gabite and Garchomp are categorized as the cave Pokemon. Last I checked, Gibble still hangs out in caves, so why is it that it's categorized as if it's the first shark to be on land? Hmm? I mean, it would make sense to give it said category if it was the fledgling terrestrial creature. Also, here's one of Gibble's dex entries. Gibble once lived in the tropics, and to avoid cold, it lives in caves warmed by geothermal heat. So again, 
why isn't this one called a cave Pokemon too? Anyways, then Carvana's dex entry states that it lives in massive rivers that course through jungles. Hmm? They also live in jungles. How peculiar. Is it possible that they are from the same jungular ancestor that Poke archaeologists keep digging up and confusing ancient Carvana for very similar but different ancient gibbles? Hmm. Or perhaps Carvana is still the same as it was then, similar to how crocodiles are still the same after all these millions of years. But something must have made some of them make the switch from sea to land meaning that something had to push it out of the water. Either it couldn't compete against other ocean predators for food. Uh, oh, I should probably mention, Carvana lives in rivers, but when it evolves, it moves to the ocean. Gotta clear that up. So maybe in its ancient form, it couldn't properly compete against other ocean predators for food. And it should also be noted that even an overabundance of Sharpedos may be those other ocean predators. Or it found a new food source on the shores, a better, more abundant food source. So the Sharpedos who had a better time reaching the shores and making it back to the ocean fared better. Eventually, these tiny little fins became little teeny tiny wags. Looking to the Sinoan seas where Garchomps live, there there really aren't many things that could beat a Sharpedo-esque animal. Possibly there were too many Gyarados or Milotic in its hunting grounds and it had to search for other sources of food, land-based food. Or maybe it's not predator-based and it's just amount of food-based. I mean, what do we have for Sharpedos to eat here? Magikarp? Remoraid? Maybe the occasional Wingle? I'd say Finneon, but I'm sure even Sharpedo forgets that that Pokemon exists. Plus, the water in Sinnoh is cold! It's the northernmost region yet! And being jungle and tropic natives, it's no wonder that Sharpedos aren't actually found in Sinnoh. But Garchomp are, living in caves to escape the cold. Huh. Now here's a true statement. Carvana looks nothing like Gibble. True. But, well, it also doesn't really look like Sharpedo either. But Sharpedo's design is very similar to all three of these land sharks. We have the base skin colors, and then there's red and yellow, though Sharpedo's eyes are the red part, and technically eyes aren't part of your skin colors. However, Carvana has quite a bit of red on it, so it's all up to evolution on what to keep and what to trash. It's complicated. But specifically, the final evolution, or the full grown-up Pokémon, Garchomp and Sharpedo, share quite a few traits. I mean, both have a yellow star-shaped patch of skin on their face regions. They both have fins that have notches in them. They both have rather impressive teeth. I mean, they're all sharks. And even their mega evolutions. Oh yeah, they both get mega evolutions, but even their mega evolutions. They both just get a stupid amount of spikes. On top of this, they all have the capability of having the ability rough skin. All five of them, same ability. And finally, they both have gills behind their eyes. At least that's what I assume these lines are referencing. This is rather important, as they are both in the shape of a normal shark. However, Garchomp's gills are much, much smaller and lower on its body. But this isn't all that odd, as it's now a land-based creature. Its need for gills is almost non-existent. These gill flaps may even be non-functioning. They are just slowly going away. Many species, humans included, have useless parts slowly going away. The reason being that well, they used to be important for our ancestors, but kind of useless now. Why do we have tailbones? Or any of these things? Now, quick theory summary before I bring up counterpoints. The theory goes, the abundance of Carvana in jungle rivers and the abundance of Sharpedo in the nearby oceans led to food scarcity, causing some of them to start seeking food in the shallows, the shores. Of course, this means many of them would get beached and die. But the ones that didn't, the ones that had a better way of getting back to the ocean, lived on to breed. Eventually, little leggies were formed, and as these mons continued to expand their territories further and further northward, they started to reach colder and colder waters. Eventually, the waters were too cold for Sharpedo, and thus, in this area, without competition from the water-based Sharpedos, the landier Sharpedos began to flourish. And find warmth in the caves at night. Eventually, being fully land-based, they lost their first evolution, Carvana, and continued to grow longer legs to do better and better on land, eventually leading to an evolution in Garchomp, the fiercest predator in Sinnoh, as any full-on land shark should be. Now then, let's start some counterpoints, and also explain why I think they are the way they are today. Because of balance. 
Maybe the plan was to have Sharpedo evolve into Garchomp back in Gen 3, but there weren't that many dragon types yet. And I know it's rather weak, but adding another non-legendary dragon, i.e. Garchomp, would be a bit overkill at the time. The dex was already rather extended, so they may have just saved the idea of a shark with legs and created a whole new line for the next generation. Plus, Sharpedo already was a decent type combo. A type combo that could have still worked for Garchomp, but not as well as Garchomp's current type combo. Plus, Sharpedo was cool enough to leave as a final stage rather than a middle stage, so they could have just updated Sharpedo's stats, make it a final evolution, and waited until the next gen for their greatest idea, a land shark. It's an A-plus idea. Pokemon Sword and Shield is right around the corner, and I still haven't done that video all about the Tapus that I've been meaning to do. Well, before it's too late, there's no time like the present. That's why it's a gift. Tapu Coco, Tapu Lele, Tapu Bulu, Tapu Fini. These four deities guard the various islands of the Alola region. Alola is based on the real world's Hawaii, an archipelago and a state in the United States originally populated by Polynesians and now an extremely popular tourist destination both in real life and in the Pokemon world. Alola gets its name from Aloha, the Hawaiian word for hello, but also for goodbye, welcome, and farewell. But it goes even deeper than that culturally and spiritually. Aloha means love, compassion, sympathy, and kindness. Then, when using it as a greeting or a goodbye, it is in a way sending the warmest of regards as one always should. What I'm getting at by mentioning all this is that Pokemon Sun and Moon is very inspired by Hawaiian culture, and thus also its myth. And this is where we will find the bulk of the inspiration for these four Pokemon. But before we get into their mythology specifically, let's go over their etymology. Why are they named what they are? What does Tapu even mean? Well, Tapu has its roots in various Polynesian cultures. It's pretty deep into there too, especially the Maori. It is a concept denoting that something is sacred or holy and thus not to be messed with. If a priest denotes a thing or place or act as Tapu, then it is forbidden to interfere with it or to do it. And in some cases, such tapu things are not even to be spoken of. Voldemort. Voldemort. The English word taboo has similar meaning, as it was taken from these people, along with many other things. Something being tapu isn't always a bad thing, though. For instance, a priest could declare that a certain type of fish is temporarily tapu. This was to prevent overfishing. Though the meaning of the word still remains, it's forbidden to hunt that fish. So in the case of these Pokemon, they are all tapu. They are sacred, holy, and not to be messed with unless they so choose to initiate it. So how about the rest of the names? Well, let's look at Tapu Koko. It's a high strutting bird thing, very rooster-esque, which works. The natives brought chickens with them when they moved to the islands, and Koko happens to be the Japanese onomatopoeia for the sound a rooster makes, a, a cock a doodle doo But that's just the simple explanation. Koko can also refer to blood, but not your sticky red stuff that's all over your insides. Rather, it's the more spiritual definition of blood. It's the link between between you and the Wau Akua. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. The Wau Akua is the spirit realm, as well as the ancestral spirits that live there and live throughout the land all around you. Thus, Koko is your connection to nature in a spiritual sense, and this connection is passed on to your children through your Koko. It's been described as a sort of spiritual umbilical cord. But is Tapu Koko really so deep, or is it just the Japanese sound of a rooster? Well, considering that these are essentially nature deities and that they use the power of nature itself in their Z-move, and Tapu Koko is the first one you meet and plays the biggest role in the anime and is basically the leader of the bunch, you know him well! If any one of them were to get a much deeper name than the others, it would be this one. And in this case, it has a deeper name. Tapu Koko. And then, comparatively, the other three have kinda lame names. 
Lele, the cute little butterfly, comes from the Hawaiian word for butterfly, pulelehua. Bulu, the bull, is easy. It's Hawaiian for bull. And Finny, the marlin fish, is obviously from Finn. But some say that it could also come from Finnish, hence the added I at the end. As this is the guardian of the final island of the island trials, and that the place it resides, the ruins of hope, are where, quote, life ends its journey. Now then, all of them together are the guardian deities, and they also all clearly have a Hawaiian totem pole or tiki inspirations. These days, tikis are pretty synonymous with the tropical vacation-y lifestyle, but they are very historically significant, as they are depictions of gods and great spirits throughout Polynesian mythology. The most common ones we see are rightly the four principal deities of the ancient Hawaiians. Ooh, four you say? That just happens to line up with this Pokemon group. So do these fit? Do the four principal deities in Hawaiian mythology fit these four? Yes. Yes, they do. Ku, Kanaloa, Kane, and Lolo. These are the four main deities in Hawaii. So do their godly abilities line up with these Pokemon? In the case of Ku, for sure. Ku is often depicted with yellow or orange feathers and is the god of war. Tapu Koko is rooster-esque and is the most warrior-esque of the four, clearly, even doing a little haka, which is a Polynesian war dance. Plus, it's found in the ruins of conflict. Tapu Lele is a butterfly that is known for its cruel demeanor, but also for protecting and healing those it finds in need of it. But it's also devoid of guilt, and, as the Dex puts it, can be described as nature incarnate. That makes it fit Kane the most to me. It's considered to be the highest of the four deities, and is the god of creation, life, and the sky. Tapu Lele heals, thus gives life, and being the only one with wings could insinuate sky and the air. Plus, it's found in the ruins of life. It fits well, but the other two are a bit confusing. Lono is the god of rainfall, fertility, and agriculture. Well, that certainly seems to fit Tapu Bulu, the grass-type one that can control plants and cause vegetation to grow. Makes sense that it's found in the ruins of abundance which, ironically, is in the middle of a desert. However, Lono is also the god of music and peace, and Tapu Bulu is described in the Pokedex as very violent. Selfish, even, as it only grows vegetation so it can steal its energy for itself. It's also quite lazy. And what makes this even shakier is that in the book documenting his journey to Hawaii, Hunter S. Thompson describes a depiction of Lono as wearing the head of a marlin as a mask. Ugh. Gross. But okay, so that means Tapu Fini then. Lono is Tapu Fini. I mean, a mask that's a marlin? A mask that's a marlin? Come on! Plus, many points to the mermaid or siren inspirations in Tapu Fini too. And again, Lono, god of music. Sirens, known for their singing. And Lono, god of rainfall. Tapu Fini is the water type one, it can control water. But that would make Kanaloa Tapu Bulu. So what's Kanaloa all about? Kanaloa is the guardian of the underworld and a teacher of magic, and is often depicted as a squid or octopus. Alright, uh, that's not really Tapu Bulu at all, so I guess this one is Tapu Fini, and Bulu is Lono after all, even if it fits Fini more than Bulu. But Kanaloa fits Fini even better, because again, god of the underworld, where you go when you die, Fini, Finish the last island of the trail where life comes to an end. Eh? Eh? Now, how about the way they act? They may be called guardian deities, but a lot of the time they sure don't seem to act like it. Hala even mentions that, although it is said to protect us, our Tapu Koko is a rather fickle creature. And just take a look at the Dex entries' descriptions of them. Guilelessly cruel, malevolent, hair trigger temper, lazy, violent enough to crush anyone it sees as an enemy, terrible calamities sometimes befall those who recklessly approach, and more! Like how Tapu Bulu was once quite literally a bowl in a china shop to smite the people who ran a market and even destroyed an entire village. And come to think of it, the ruins it lives in are in the desert and it makes plants grow just so it can absorb their energy. It, did Tapu Bulu absorb all of the plant life here? None of these things seem like something a noble guardian deity would do. And well, that's because these four are anything but noble. 
they are a bit on the ruthless side, but their ultimate goal, just like with the Hawaiian spirits, is to protect nature, to protect the islands. These Pokémon are the guardians of the islands, not necessarily the people and Pokémon that reside on them. Back to those Tapu Bulu examples, the market was destroyed because it was built by the black sand beaches, and in Hawaiian culture these beaches were sacred, or tapu, land. And the village was destroyed because the kahuna there was corrupt. They have their reasons. But if the Tapus are just protecting the islands, not the people, then why are they worshipped? Well, it could be the classic appeasement of the spirits out of fear of getting on their bad side. Most religions have this to some extent. And when it comes to Hawaiian mythology specifically, well, yeah! There was a lot of that. These four Hawaiian deities would often kill anyone who wronged them, and Ku specifically demanded human sacrifices during rituals of worship. And because these gods are the embodiments of nature, when natural disasters happened, it was often seen as nature's wrath. The gods are angry at the people for their doings, and at times, they may seem fickle, short-tempered, much like how Tapu Koko is described. And plus, the signature move of these four Pokémon is named Nature's Madness. So while they are guardian deities, their ultimate goal is to protect the islands, even if that means smiting some people. And to stay on their good side, the people worship them. Even if they are, at times, cruel. But now on to the next bit. Why are they connected to these islands specifically? Well, it's pretty easy, really. Each of these islands corresponds to a real Hawaiian island directly. And also, every Hawaiian island in the real world has an official color. Altogether, they make a rainbow. And, well, Tapu Koko, the yellow one, is found on Mele Mele Island. Mele Mele being Hawaiian for yellow. It's based on the island Oahu, which has yellow as its official color. See where I'm going with this? Tapu Lele, Akala Island, Maui, pink. Tapu Bulu, Ula Ula Island. Island, Hawaii itself, aka the Big Island, Red, and Tapu Fini, Pony Island, Kauai, Purple, Easy. Now then, you know how the Tapus choose a kahuna for their island? Well, did you notice that they match the colors of themselves as well? And some demeanor too. I mean, Tapu Bulu is lazy, just like Nanu, who can't be bothered to do things, and is often disinterested. But Tapu Bulu is also violent, and uses the dirty tactics of using its plants to hold down its opponents while it rams them. And Nanu is a Dark-type Pokémon trainer, the Dark-type being all about those dirty tactics. Tapu Fini is reserved, and doesn't much care for humans. Hapu is also somewhat reserved, and lives on the least populated island of them all. When you meet her grandmother, she's surprised that she's made friends like at all. Tapu Lele is the most caring of the bunch. It uses its scales to heal Pokémon, even if the damage is because of its own relentlessness and somewhat cruel forms of entertainment. And Olivia is seen as an extra caring individual as well, and goes out of her way to heal Pokémon. Not sure about the cruelness though. Is she particularly violent in the way she battles? I don't know. And and lastly, as mentioned before, Tapu Koko is the leader of the bunch. You know him well. And Hala seems to take the role as the leader of the Kahunas, too. And it was mentioned that Hala sometimes goes into a state of fury, which may be similar to Tapu Koko's short temper. So it seems like the Tapus choose Kahunas based on how many traits they have in common with someone, and that's that. I mean, Nanu even mentions that he didn't want to become a Kahuna. But I guess he was just too similar to Tapu Bulu for Tapu Bulu to pass up. Poor guy. Now then, one more factoid that I didn't know how to fit into the rest of the video. Oricorio changes forms based on which island it drinks nectar from, and its four forms also reflect the guardian deities and the official colors of the island. Pom Pom style is upbeat and energetic, just like Tapu Koko. Sensu's style is slow and reserved, calming in a way, like the waves. Tapu Fini. Bailey's style is fiery and passionate, but it sometimes gets offended and angry. Sort of like Tapu Bulu. And then Pau style is laid back, elegant, and melts the hearts of other Pokemon. Sort of like the caring and loving Tapu Lele. I guess. Well, that trait falls in line with Olivia really well. So, uh, while it's not the most clear-cut thing in the world, I'm sure they were going with something like all this 
while designing these Pokemon and everything. But what's interesting is that the Hawaiians would incorporate hula dances in their worship. So these dancing oracorios, changing their style of dance, may reflect the different deities wanting to see different sorts of dance. And since they are nature spirits, they bless the nectar in some way, which gets the oracorios to change when drinking their nectar specifically. It's a theory. Hey, when did Pokemon Sun and Moon come out? That was 2016, right? Yeah. That was like three years ago, right? Yeah. And you're just now getting to this video? Yeah. Back when Decidueye was first revealed as the final evolution of Rowlet, the grass-type starter in Pokemon Sun and Moon, people were rightfully confused. Why did it... Why did he swap flying for ghosts? And well... There are a number of reasons, hence there being a number of other videos answering the question. But the most viewed one is, uh... He's Mexican. Mexican culture see Mexican folklore organized in Mexico and Mexico. While I wouldn't go as far as to say it's wrong, it's, uh, well, it's not the only thing, as we don't even have to leave Hawaii. So. Let's take a look at this whole line, see their origins, and explain why Decidueye is Grass-type. I meant Ghost-type. Obviously it's grass because it's a tree. It's got leaves all up in its feathers. And based on the name, it's a deciduous tree. I mean, obviously. Deciduous trees are those trees that shed their leaves for winter. Or, their colloquial term, they die in winter. Oh, but there's the ghost typing reasoning! <laughs> All right, but really though, let's start with Rowlet. It's an owlet, a baby owl, and a very round one at that is the name. Judging by the fact that it's from Alola, which is Hawaii, and that it has this face and smooth round body, it's safe to say that it's a barn owl. What are barn owls doing in Hawaii? The same thing all the mongooses are doing. In the mid 20th century, people brought a few dozen of these owls over to help them deal with the rat problem. Rats are a dangerous invasive species to the local ecosystem, and people were having a lot of problems with them. So they brought in another invasive species to help, mongoose. But the mongoose didn't do the best job. So they uh, brought in barn owls also. And help they did. Rat numbers went way down, and so did a lot of other native things, like other birds. Oh man. Rowlet evolves into Darktrix, which throws leaf darts and gets its name from Dart and Strix, which is the name of a genus of owls, more commonly known as wood owls. So, tree stuff, wood, e. Now, Darktrix is not as smooth and round as Rowlet, and it's also got its hairline thing going on. Now get a load of this Pueo Owl, which actually is an owl native to Hawaii. Or at least it's been there longer than we've been recording such things. It's just not great at catching rats, which is why the barn owls were brought in. But the combination of all these rats and the people and the owls that are better at hunting and the Pueo Owls being not as good at hunting their, uh, they're endangered now. Like, critically endangered. And then, you know why they call it Decidueye? Because of these two... Eyes. Typically speaking, we don't see owls with really dominant legs like this, right? It's a very stand out -y trait. But there is one owl in Hawaii that does in fact have legs like this. Though by is... I mean was. It's extinct now. The stilt owl. But they are all dead. Which is why it's ghost type now! It's all it's all dead and stuff! <laughs> but no, no no, no. There's more. There's more. Owls in cultures across basically everywhere, all over the world, represent things like wisdom. Most of us know that. But them having to do with death is also surprisingly common. 
hence that connection to Santa Muerte that Gaiden Goomba made. But also, the native people of the Sierras believed owls guided souls to the underworld. The Apache believed dreaming of an owl spelled doom. The Cree believe owl whistles were summons from spirits. The Hopis, or Hopis, see owls as the god of the dead. The Kwakutl believed owls were souls. And similarly, the Mojave and Nuux believed that after death, one would become an owl. And leaving the Americas, even the ancient Greeks and Romans believed owls could sense imminent death. The Celts saw them as beings of the underworld. In Arabia, there was a so-called death owl that channels the cries from souls of slain men who had not been avenged. Polish folklore also included being turned into an owl after death. And to the ancient Sumerians, the goddess of death was attended by owls. So clearly, owls have loads of powers in folklore and mythology that relate to souls and the dead. Hence, ghosts. But I mean, of course I saved the Hawaiian connection for last. In Hawaiian mythology, everyone has an Aumakua, or a family god, a familial spirit. The souls of your ancestors residing in a plant, item, or animal to guide and protect you. And the most common of these were sea turtles, sharks, lizards, but most of all, of course, Pueo owls filled with the spirits of your dead relatives. Thus, Decidueye is ghost type. Not because it is a ghost itself, but because it is one with the powers of the spirit realm. It's not a ghost on the outside. It's got ghosts on the inside. And it's what's on the inside that counts. Life Lessons with Loxton. Pokemon plushes! There are too many of them. I have too many of them. I'm gonna take a picture. Just the thing that's right next to me. That's just one of them. But I mean, come on, I talk about these things for a living. I gotta have an excuse. Do you have an excuse? Didn't think so. But for every Pokemon plush that exists, there are four others which makes exactly as much sense as it sounds. The Pokemon Company recently revealed a new set of Ditto plushes. The ones where they take basically an already existing plush and make it cheaper to mass produce by removing the detailed face. And yet people still buy them. <laughs> what? I have an excuse. But you hang on just a minute, Busters. Everything is wrong about this one. At least according to various people on the internet. But is this wrong? Or are they all wrong? What's going on with the Ditto Mimikyu plush? And how does it add to the lore of the Pokemon world in a surprisingly significant way? Well, that's what we're discussing today. Ever since the Gen 1 episode of the Pokemon anime featuring a Ditto that sucked at being a Ditto, people have associated this facial quality with all Dittos, even though that was never intended to be how they work. In the games, Dittos work the way they should, the way they were always intended to work. They see an opposing Pokemon, they transform into it. Done! They have the proper eyes and mouth and everything. It's great. And even Mimikyu! And heck, Execute! Pokemon with multiple faces! It works as intended in the games. But at the height of Pokemon Fever, when Pokemon was at its most popular, the anime aired an episode about a particular Ditto. Just one. This Ditto was a unique case. It was a Ditto that could transform into whatever, as it should, but it had a hard time changing its face so it just didn't. That is, of course, until the end of the episode when it got over, or fixed, its issues, and thus make its face match whatever it was transforming into. But apparently, everybody missed that part of the episode, because everybody fell in love with Ditto Face, even though it means that the particular Ditto in question is a complete failure. Oh, you be nice. He's trying his best. Regardless, it got popular. People liked the concept of their Ditto being bad at the one thing it's good for, so it took off. <laughs> Finally! A plush I can relate to. Soon enough, the trading card game started featuring Ditto cards with a transformed Ditto with the Ditto eyes and mouth. And soon enough, it just sort of came to be that it was synonymous with how Ditto works in everything besides the games. And thus the Pokemon Company saw a brilliant merchandising opportunity. Take popular Pokemon plushes and make them cheaper to produce by giving them a cute little Ditto face. People will love it. Ah, oh, finally! A plush I can relate to. 
But now here comes Mimikyu. How would a ditto with ditto face turn into a Mimikyu? Well, like this, apparently. We already have the answer. It's an official plush. But why like this? Because this is not Mimikyu's face. This is. This up here is a disguise that it made to mimic Pikachu, hence the name. It's extremely envious of Pikachu and wants to look like him. This disguise works really well, apparently. It gives it an ability that allows it to tank a single hit with no problem because the opponent hits the disguised head instead of it. So I guess if it's a good enough of a disguise to fool most Pokemon this way, then it would also fool a Ditto into thinking that this is the head too. Thus, this Ditto plush. After all, no one besides Mimikyu knows the true form of Mimikyu. We've seen it without the costume in the anime, but it's just a black cloud with sparkly eyes. It's spooky. But this just begs so many questions. If Ditto knew the true form, the Ditto face would be down here. So clearly, Ditto doesn't know its true form. But when Ditto transforms, it gains all of the abilities and moves that that Pokemon knows, meaning Ditto would have to know how Mimikyu's walk and attack with their ghostly appendages from under the disguise. But, but, but if it knows how to do that, then the face wouldn't be up here because it knows everything about it in order to transform into it. What's going on? Ah! Oh, maybe Dumb Ditto is just that bad at transforming. It thinks that's the face, but it also knows how all of the ghostly arm stuff works, so it does all that too. It's, uh, it's capable of doing all the regular Mimikyu stuff, but it still doesn't realize that its eyes are down here because it's dumb. It's probably a good thing though. Ignorance is bliss. And if people are incapable of knowing its true form without just dying, maybe Ditto just happens to be dumb enough to know most of its true form. But it's too stupid to realize that it makes no sense. So what little mind it has is fine. Ah, oh, finally! A plush I can relate to. Oi! It's pancakes! Alolan Pokemon, or I guess now I should say regional variant Pokemon. It was a super good idea! The Pokemon franchise has been ever inching towards that big, scary, quadruple digit number when it comes to how many creatures they've got in their world. On top of this, some of their ideas for new ones tended to go between it's just an older design again, or this is stupid. So they came up with the idea of regional variants. Now they can go back to the older tried and true designs that people are familiar with and put a spin on them. It's great. And it's accurate to real world animals too. And so far, every Alolan and Galarian regional variant Pokemon has a reason for becoming the way it is. Even if it's not the most obvious thing, the reasons are still there. Most Pokemon have deep and or cool reasonings for being what they are, and these variants were no different. There was, however, one Alolan Pokemon. One with no good reason for being what it is. At least no good canonical one. It's Alolan Raichu. It's got nothing origins. Also, this isn't an Alolan Raichu. Deal with it. I mean, the second worst ones, like Alolan Vulpix and Sandshrew, yeah, it's odd, but at least Alola has a snowy mountain that they live on, so that's the reason. But when it comes to Alolan Raichu, the reason is... Ah! And I quote, Even Pokemon researchers don't know why Raichu's form changed in the Alola region. The people of Alola seem unconcerned by the question. Their guess? Maybe it ate too many sweet and fluffy round pancakes. Quote, It loves pancakes prepared with a secret Alolan recipe. Some wonder whether that recipe holds the key to this Pokemon's evolution. Yeah, not kidding. A multi-septillion dollar company with entire teams for design and lore and... That's it. Mmm, that's all they could come up with. They made this official. They hate you. No. No, they hate me. This whole blurb had to have been put in the game specifically for PokeTubers to never fully understand the ultimate curveball. Well, 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 game freak. You've met your match because I have with me the ultimate counter. Just off screen. But I also have the ability to make things up that become very convincing when I find small amounts of facts to pack them up. And through my charisma and video with a budget, I can make people believe my theories. 
Ha. Huh. So I'm going to deny Game Freak's rights to have a no reason Pokemon. I will come up with a reason. Ha. Huh. It shall be discovered, no matter how stupid or backed up with nutrition science of all things it is. Ha. <laughs> huh. So without any further ado, let's just jump into it. As there are a number of possibilities, and of course I'm saving the best one for last. <laughs> that watch time, yo. So here's a useful tidbit of information. Alolan Raichu gained the psychic type and uses it to float on its tail like a surfboard. But interestingly, Raichus and Pikachus for that matter have always surfed. Pokemon Yellow, yeah, a Gen 1 game, has a surfing Pikachu. And thus, there's also the surfing Pikachu trading card. The anime also had an entire episode about a surfing Pikachu named Puka. And what gets crazy is that unlike every other Pikachu, this surfing Pikachu had psychic abilities. Plus, its eyes are blue, unlike every other Pikachu in Raichu, but very much like Alolan Raichu. Has the concept of Alolan Raichu been around this long? Probably not. Rather, Alolan Raichu is likely a reference to all this, but anyway, there's more. In Pokemon Stadium, Raichu surfs on its tail when it uses Surf because the animators cared. Why does Raichu know Surf? Because it's got a surfboard for a tail, duh. Here's another Dex entry. It focuses psychic energy into its tail and rides it like it's surfing. Another name for this Pokemon is Hodad. Ho ho dad! Well, thank goodness for Google, because a hodad was a term back in the 50s when surfing was hip, because Nintendo wasn't making games yet. And a hodad is basically a person who brings a surfboard to the beach, but never actually surfs. It's a poser, you could say. This could mean that the Alolan people see Raichu as a Pokemon that doesn't actually surf the waves, per se. After all, it surfs always, with its psychic brain waves rather than ocean waves. I guess that explains why Alolan Raichu can't actually learn surf. Alolan Raichu is a freaking poser. Hmm. Well, all that did was prove that a psychic surfing Raichu isn't some sudden surprise idea. It has origins all the way back in Gen 1, but that doesn't explain how it came to be this way. And what pancakes have to do with it. But thankfully, we do have three. Count them. Three. Big theories as to why Alolan Raichu is the way it is. <gasps> What's the few? Well, I guess it's more like two. Count them. Two. And a half. Uh, but they're all sort of interconnected. Though, not all of them involve pancakes. Pancakes! So first, the bit of evidence that's involved in all of the theories. That's Pikachu's involvement with humans. Pikachu are normally found in forests and a power plant that one time, but the vast majority of Pikachus in the Pokemon world live in the forests, in the wild. But in Pokemon Sun and Moon, they are in Howley City, the middle of the city even. It's an urban environment. Conveniently, it's also the only place to catch an Abra, the beginning of one of the most iconic psychic type Pokemon lines. So it could could be that there is an increased amount of psychic energy in this city. Basically, there are other psychics in the area. Maybe that's because this area is better for psychicness growthitude. Hence, the Pikachu's gaining psychic powers, which sounds a little bit odd, but that's, well, that's how evolution works. Well, minus the superpowers. But animals are heavily influenced by their environment, obviously. But not as much as humans influence animals. Have you seen these dogs? that prove that evil exists in the world. Gross! But just like in the real world, breeding exists in the Pokemon world. I mean, I can't even tell you the astronomical amount of times people hatched a Pokemon for a nature or a shiny and then decided they didn't want it because it's not the right something and they just released thousands upon hundreds of billions of Ponitos across the land. Dear God, all those animals must ravage the poor grassy plains, but oh well. Back to Pikachu, this is Alola, the island nation known for its incredible surfing scene. It's basically Hawaii, remember? While there is plenty of Mantine surfing, there is plenty of regular surfing too, hence all the surfboards in the area and surf-themed advertising. Thus, it's quite possible that the people of Alola have been breeding Pikachus specifically to surf, and in doing so, almost created a new species of Pokemon, the Alolan Raichu, who instead of using conventional surfboards like the other surfing Pikachu, evolved their own tailboards and the psychic powers to use those tailboards to surf 
always. And as we see in the anime, Alola is host to a yearly pancake race, a race where Pokemon carry pancakes around the island, and guess who's the champion? An Alolan Raichu. Who's to say this Alolan Raichu wasn't bred for this race specifically? After all, what's a better way to carry pancakes over dangerous terrain? Hmm? There is none. The best way to carry pancakes over dangerous terrain is to just not touch the dangerous terrain because you just float over it. Now, a foot race where some of the members don't use their feet shouldn't be a thing, but whatever. The Raichu's bred for surfing may have also been bred for racing in this way, with pancakes. Thus pancakes being involved? I guess? Though that doesn't exactly explain the eating of them, but in Pokemon Masters, we were able to get a small glimpse into lore hidden away from the mainline games. How's Pokemon is a lowland Raichu. He talks about how trash the explanation of its origins are, and I'd have to agree. However, he came up with his own ideas. Instead of Raichu's love of pancakes being its cause of evolution by itself, he thinks it's the scarcity of its favorite food. It's the lack of pancakes that caused the Raichus to become this way. So we're basically talking the Darwinian Finch theory. How talks about how Raichu actually is in steep competition for its food amongst other Pokemon. Therefore, it has evolved to reach the food faster than the others. And it's a pretty decent theory for a guy like Howe, but I still don't think this is quite right. It may be a part of the story, but it's certainly not the whole thing. Pancakes must be involved. And involved they are. Like I mentioned, Pikachus all over the world eat natural things, but in Alola, Pikachus live in the city, thus eating people food all the time. And as we see in the anime, the people of Alola, they love sharing their food with wild Pokemon. They see wild Pokemon as a family sort of thing. They're sharing berries and such, you know, but sometimes they're sharing malasadas and pancakes. And it specifies too many and sweet and fluffy pancakes. Does it not? So considering that it specifies many sweet and fluffy pancakes, maybe this is what we should look at. What makes pancakes specifically sweet? What makes pancakes specifically fluffy? Two things, sugar and gluten. Sugar gluten? Mmm, sagoy! I mean a rat eating sugar. That's pretty much the same as humans eating straight sugar. It's wrong, all wrong. Ugh. I mean, if humans already have several problems relating to the processing of sugar and gluten in large amounts, then just think about what happens to animals. In fact, there are several animals that can't even process these things at all. Uh, cats, cats can't even taste sugar. It's no use to them. Yeah, yeah. Do you know the effects of excess sugar and gluten on the body? It's not pretty. I managed to lose 170 plus pounds with a large calorie surplus just by managing these things instead of calories. The body can't store excess calories if you don't let it via carbohydrates, which by definition are converted into sugar in the body. Plus, eating more speeds up your metabolism, whereas eating less slows it down. Complicated stuff. But I mean, fresh fruit, whole grain granola, a Kit Kat and a multivitamin. What's the difference? It's complicated and not what this video is about. It's just hard for me not to talk about my life-changing favorite subjects like nutrition in extreme detail. I'm holding so much back, but this video is already so long. <sighs> Let's focus, focus. Back at the pancakes. Say Pikachus in Alola eat a load of sweet fluffy pancakes and similar types of food. Now, how would that give them psychic abilities? Well, psychic abilities tend to be powered by the brain. So I guess we can look at the effects of sugar and gluten on the brain specifically. But first, another tangent. Yes, of course the gluten-free movement is over-exaggerated extremely, especially by companies who benefit from it and websites with fear-mongering clickbait. Is gluten killing your brain? Rain? No. Without celiacs or another major allergy, it's just a mild inconvenience to most. But these days, I'm seeing more and more people wholeheartedly against the whole gluten-free movement for no reason other than they're too lazy to actually look into it. Yes, you can still have problems with gluten even without celiac disease. People can be mildly or fully allergic to anything, and sometimes people can get inflamed by things just because the body is 
the most complicated biological machine in the known universe. So like, I mean, there are people who swell up in the sunlight. There are people allergic to oxygen. I'm flipping autoimmune to my own pancreas and you're telling me that it's impossible to have some sort of negative effect from a foreign protein entering the body and irritating the intestinal lining? Just because you read a commenter with an anime fedora avatar say so once? We're learning new stuff every day, especially in the field of nutrition and the human body. Much of which is disproving everything that we thought we knew decades ago. I could talk about just the explosion of nutrition information in the last decade. Just flipping everything that we knew on its head, but again, that would take hours. All in all, don't be so adamantly against something just because it's not the most researched thing in the world yet. You're no better than the people who jumped on the trend for no reason, dude. Just as pseudo-intellectual. Heck, I'm pseudo-intellectual. This is a YouTube channel about Pokemon science, so I should probably get back to the Pokemon. Pancakes! Alolan Raichu. Put simply, what do sugar and gluten do to the brain? Well, first, here's a fun fact. Did you know that many life forms, humans included, have a second brain? We have a load of neurons around our guts, which helps control our digestive functions. Because honestly, efficient digestion is one of the most complicated things like ever. And this second brain is connected to our main brain too, which is why several foodborne illnesses cause headaches and such. Now you'd think that gut problems would cause a stomach ache, but not always. And that's thanks to the second brain, yay. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity or NC GS is no bueno with symptoms like depression, a foggy mind, ADHD-like behavior, fatigue, and headaches all present after consuming gluten. Yet, they do not test positive for celiac disease. You can think of all this is like a range. You got people who are perfectly fine eating gluten. They can eat as much as they want, no problem at all. And you got celiacs on the other total end of the spectrum. People who may actually die from it. And I guess according to some people, it's impossible to be absolutely anywhere in the middle. Climate change deniers, am I right? But just notice how this food-related list of symptoms affects the brain a ton. And I'm not even going into details or anything. But now, how about sugar? High blood sugar is a detriment to the body. Have you ever noticed when looking up a disease or a health issue of some kind online and under the list of things that make you more likely to get it, you almost always see diabetes as one of them. Diabetes basically leads to all of the problems and diabetes is essentially the inability to process sugar in your blood effectively or at all. But even for non-diabetics, when blood sugar is relatively high, the sugar in your blood in the form of glucose essentially crystallizes into sharp microscopic shards. And as they bump around your veins and arteries, and capillaries, they cause teeny tiny micro damages. And if you've ever played Pikmin, you know that a lot of micro damage adds up. It's quite literally death by a thousand paper cuts. But on the inside, hmm. <laughs> you ever wonder why diabetics lose fingers, toes, sexual function, and eyesight all the time? It's because those are where our tiniest blood vessels are, and thus the ones that get damaged the most. And if sugar is capable of doing all that, <laughs> then you know it has some impact on the brain. Oh. Like dopamine, huh? Oh, dopamine, <laughs> Here's a not so fun fact. Some circles of health professionals are starting to call Alzheimer's disease and dementia two of the scariest and most heartbreaking things out there, type three diabetes. Why? Well, because the leading theories that are really starting to get all this nailed down all point to too much sugar or too often sugar being the main culprit. We already mentioned the micro damage that obviously affects the brain too, but there's more. Previous theories about these terrible things all pointed towards a brain eating plaque that we all develop to some level eventually. These problems arise when you get too much of this plaque or you get this plaque too early in life. And wait a minute, the plaque? Like that stuff that gets on your teeth and eats away at your teeth, especially when you consume sugar frequently? Yeah, that plaque, but in your brain. But unfortunately we don't have brain brushes yet, do we? So our bodies have to have some means of cleaning all this plaque up, right? Oh, oh, there is? Uh, great, what is it? Insulin. Hello darkness, my old friend. Insulin is the hormone the body uses to take the sugar in your blood and store it into your cells. So obviously it's good here. It's taking the blood sugar, which is causing the micro damage and putting it away. But that's not all. Managing blood sugar is just the biggest job that insulin does, but it's full list of functions is huge. And science is still adding to this list frequently, which brings us to why recently the leading theories shifted from it's this brain plaque specifically to it's what we're gonna start calling type three diabetes because one of insulin's other jobs is to actually clean the brain of this plaque. 
But the problem is, insulin pretty much has a to-do list, and it will always prioritize the things on the top of its to-do list before bothering with the things below. Of course, it's always doing all of them a little bit, but you know what I mean. And its number one job is getting excess sugar out of the blood. And this plaque in the brain cleaning thing isn't likely even on the first page of its list. So even if you're not type 1 or 2 diabetic, and your blood sugar never reaches these crazy high diabetic levels, if it's still above what's considered normal fasting levels often enough, well, the insulin is going to prioritize that instead of the plaque. Every time you eat carbohydrates, you are distracting insulin from its other responsibilities. It, of course, as I said, does all of them all the time somewhat, but they are no longer priorities. Now, just think about how we've been pushing and teaching, eat 11 servings of grain per day and several of fruit too. Also eat six times per day and such. And then we wonder why we're suddenly so obese, diabetic and dementia which is a word now. So all in all, too much sugar and or too often sugar plus brain equals bad. Gluten plus brain plus an even minuscule intolerance to it equals bad. A lot of animals have no benefit of eating gluten and thus are often mildly intolerant to it because it's not what their ancestors' bodies are used to eating. Same with sugar, for that matter, which remember, grain always converts into. There's a reason grain-free pet foods are getting so popular, because it makes your pets way healthier and significantly reduces the risk of pet diabetes. Imagine that! You don't eat the thing that gives you diabetes and you're more likely to not get it? Whoa! So all in all, the Pikachus in Alola specifically have been eating a load of pancakes and other such people food. This causes some Pikachu and Raichu to slowly start developing health problems, especially in the headache and brain deterioration variety. So many brain problems. Is there a pun I can make here? Peabetes? Chew? Nah, I got nothing. Uh Pecan cake! Is that, is that not what we're talking about? So these poor, ill Pikachu and Raichu, due to feeling sick all the time, didn't get it on and breed as much as the ones who were doing just a little bit better with the people food. These were the ones with perhaps stronger brains. And these stronger brains eventually, over countless generations, led to Raichus eventually gaining the psychic type, and the rest is history. That is... Certainly a theory. Ooh, it's a teapot. Boop, nice and alive. Wonder how we make a ghost type. Stay tuned. Tea. Tea is what brings us together today. And with us is good old bird keeper Toby. And as I'm sure the educated among you know, Aspritz a bloody mad for a cup of Charlie. Thank you for that reminder on why we seceded from Britain. Hello, welcome to my video essay dissertation where I will be attempting to skew the facts and information available to make you, the viewer, that's you, believe or at least perceive that the new Pokemon creature created by Creatures Inc. and the Pokemon company, Poltegeist, is absolutely perfect. If you were influenced by the thumbnail in any way, please disregard that as it was only used as clickbait to get people to enter this video. It has been shown that any slight negativity present in the thumbnail and or title boosts clicks by a great factor. So much in fact that I am willing to damage my credibility for this video, as it is the exact opposite of the thumbnail. You clicked it, that's what you get. Case in point, here is the original thumbnail. Look, it's terrible. You wouldn't click on that. It's too positive in this negative-focused world. Poltegeist was first announced Wednesday, September 4th, during the Nintendo Direct, when a new trailer for the upcoming Pokemon Sword and Shield RPG revealed four new features for the game. After demonstrating the new avatar customization options, Pokemon Camp, and Curry on Rice, an image of a flying teapot was shown and introduced as one of the new Pokemon creatures. Poltegeist, a ghost-type Pokemon which has a body, quote, made of tea, complete with its own aroma and flavor. <sighs> okay, I'm done with the dissertation. Let's get to the real video here. What the heck is Poltegeist? I mean, we all know what it looks like. It's tea, but a ghost. How else would the tea be able to stay inside of a busted teapot? I mean, look at this! It just doesn't work! Holes in the teapot and liquid don't mix! But why would a ghost even haunt a teapot, let alone haunt the tea itself? Because that's right, Poltegeist is actually the tea inside of the pot, hence why it has weak armor. It's not actually the pot, it's just carrying that around. So it's pot armor. 
easily breakable. See, I'll, I'll prove it to you. See, even if the tea is hot, it spills. We're testing all the factors, even got safety glasses. That means it's real science time now. Also, ouch, my leg that burns! <laughs> And to find out why this ghost would haunt tea, we have to figure out what type of ghost we're dealing with first. Thankfully, the name of Pultigeist is pretty spot on. Just remove the tea pum and boom, we have what we need. Pultigeist is a poltergeist, a German word meaning noisy spirit. A poltergeist is a type of ghost or spirit that is responsible for physical disturbances such as loud noises and objects being moved or destroyed. Think of your classic haunted mansion. You walk into the dining room and the pots and pans are floating around banging each other while they spit in the air and it's spooky. It's, it's rightfully pretty spook. These are the disturbances caused by poltergeists. Why do they do it? Well, because by their very nature, or paranature, poltergeists are malicious ghosts attacking those who enter its domain or even haunting specific people. Maybe they were started as a way for juvenile tricksters to startle people and blame them on spirits. I mean, you could throw a spoon at your mom and claim it was a ghost back then. <laughs> what simpler times. Then, sometimes the earth would shift just a tad, not enough for you to feel, but enough to make your house creak. People at the time had no explanation for this, so many people assumed ghosts. Others believed that poltergeists are actual spirits of the vengeful dead that possess psychokinesis, the ability to affect the physical world. There's all sorts of possible origins. But why would there be a poltergeist now in the Galar region? Well, a teapot is a super common item you see in depictions of poltergeists all the time. And England does love their tea. Hey, Toby! I'm sure you can hear me. Tell me about why the British love their tea! I'd say the day isn't complete without a scone, a chin wag with a mate, and then sitting down for a nice cup of Earl Grey. I have no idea what he said, but it only makes sense that a teapot Pokemon would have to be ghost type, as classical teapots aren't normally made of steel, or any other type of Pokemon type combo. Uh, I could have seen a fire water type, and you know, it, it's the teapot and the heat source beneath the teapot, but, but ghost works really well too, mainly because of my actual point. One of the most well-known and classic poltergeist happenings Spooky. One of the most well-known and classic poltergeist happenings was the Enfield Poltergeist in Enfield, England. It's been the topic of debate in the society for physical research, along with quite a bit of media coverage during and after it. In fact, the popular movie The Conjuring 2 is based off of it. So it seems like a Pokemon game based on Great Britain is a good time in the Pokemon world to just drop a ghost teapot. Tea is absolutely important in English culture. Like. Extremely. I mean, if they didn't have a teapot Pokemon, I think the UK might have actually had a riot about this. Or at the very least, a scoff and a laugh! We like our tea. I mean, why is tea so popular there anyway? Well, unfortunately, they don't really know for sure why tea is so popular amongst them. Some point to the fact that tea was marketed as a medicinal drink to cure ailments, along with their addition to many elite coffee houses in Britain. Amongst women, most point to Princess Catherine of Braganza, the Portuguese future queen consort of England. Freeze frame! Can we talk about how ridiculous formal names are? Good lord! She was often seen drinking tea on many occasions, for the medicinal reasons, but her doing so made it popular with aristocratic women, and they eventually trickled down. Because, you know, fashion and stuff. Also, tea is liquid, so it trickles. <laughs> but it's fashion, but drinks. Same thing happened with the men, but in those coffee bars I talked about. Only the elite drank the stuff at first. And, of course, it also didn't help that the merchants at the time were making loads of money! So, of course, because they're able to sell it for such high prices, they just kept importing it, but then, of course, they had way too much of it eventually, and so prices dropped dramatically. You know, supply and demand and stuff. It got more and more popular. Tell me, Toby, how good's that tea over there? We like our tea absolutely rabid about tea. So, summary. Teapots that are haunted. And now that we've talked about everything but the Pokemon on this Pokemon channel, let's get to the Pokemon for the Pokemon channel we're on. This one. Poltegeist. Let's start off with that name. We've already established that in English its name is Poltergeist mixed with tea, but its Japanese name is Potades, which is actually a brilliant name. In Japanese, it literally translates to, it's a teapot. 
what more is there to say. But at the same time, if you say this name in the context of it being a Pokemon based in what is essentially England, it sounds like the English words Pot of Death. Pot of Death. Pot o Death. What? Ah! It's just so good! Good job, Game Freak. I can almost forgive the water reflections of the trees not being in the right spot. Poltegeist's body is made from black tea, and it is said to have a very distinct aroma and flavor. It will only allow a trainer it trusts to sample its tea. However, drinking too much can lead to indigestion or an upset stomach, so be careful. So Poltegeist is tea. Real tea. But why is it black tea? Because black is dark and it's spooky. Ooh, but why not Earl Grey? And see, little do you know, I used an E in Grey, so it's not the American spelling of Grey, it's English, but uh... Anyway, it's not entirely about the color of the tea. Rather, as it turns out, black tea is the most drunken... drink... drunk? It's the most popular tea in the UK. Did you know that they drink on average 2.5 cups of it a day? Egad. Guys, it's just leafy water. Is the water really so bad over there that you have to flavor it to cover the taste of pee? Must be, the dang pee drinkers. I spritz a bloody man for a cup of Charlie. Funnily enough, England can't even be the biggest tea drinker, right? It's actually the fifth biggest per capita. Turkey holds the record for the most, followed by Morocco, then Ireland, and then England. It makes them the fourth, I miscounted. But that's just a fun fact for you all. Ahem, <clears throat> and if I might be so bold, looks. So back to Poltegeist. We all know its brew is delicious, however, if you drink too much, you will get an upset stomach. But why? Well, it might be because it's tea, for starters. Tea is actually pretty crazy when you look at it chemically. I mean, it's normal water with dried leaves that, when heated, release different molecules and create different chemicals in your body, which then goes into the medicinal uses of the tea. But the stomach problems come from overconsumption. A small amount of tea wouldn't really change your body chemistry as it's just not enough to actually affect you. However, if you drink too much, it can lead to stomach problems like bloating or even nausea. In fact, you can actually get dizzy and lightheaded similarly to being intoxicated as if you drink alcohol. Though, most of the issues arise from drinking it on an empty stomach, as with enough of it, it's able to actually dilute your stomach acids to the point that it causes trouble. And on top of that, most tea, especially black tea, have a large amount of caffeine. And caffeine is created by some plants as an insecticide. It's trying to kill you. Though surprisingly, if you were to eat the leaves, you wouldn't get much of it. But because of our body's super absorption of water, and tea being mostly water, well, now your body takes in all those chemicals like a sponge. And the longer you've steeped your tea, the more of those chemicals you'll find in the water. And well, this Pokemon is haunted tea! It probably has been steeping for years now! And speaking of it being a tea ghost, I guess that explains its multicolored nature. The purple is just ghost, as a lot of ghost Pokemon are purple, including the most iconic ones like the Gengar line. Then, this tea colored part of it is, well, the tea. But if you notice, it fades between the two colors. Where does the tea end and the ghost begin? It's like the only good Joestar's hair hat thing. Where does it start? Where does it end? Nobody knows for sure. And then there's this other blurb. This thing is a pest for hotels and restaurants. Many Poltegeists make their homes inside hotels and restaurants, disguising themselves and hiding among the tableware. They can pour their power into leftover tea and create even more of their kind. So they're often treated as pests. You know, I bet that's why the Galar region is extremely fond of tea. If they leave any of it in the pot, they're going to attract pests. So they gotta drink it all up. Why not just not make any more? I wonder if they have cafes that serve just tea from Pultigeist. Hmm. Also, the idea that it can pour itself into another teapot and now there's two of them? <laughs> That's hilarious. The super simple and quick multiplication is exactly what being a pest is all about. So ultimately, everything about this Pokemon is perfect, as I would expect, as the British really do love their tea. We have tea. And it would full on be sacrilegious if they just didn't have this perfect of a team on in the Galar region. And if you need the thumbnail to match up, then fine. Poltegeist is terrible. Because it's a ghost. Horror! The terror!
Why isn't Golduck the gold one? Well, there's actually a super interesting reason, and we're going to talk about it. Oh, the intro's over. Hey, it's me. And why are we even talking about this? Well, uh, it's because it's one of those days. Filler video. Filler video. Filler video. I guess you just want some YouTuber to read you a Bobapedia page, yeah? Well, here you go. Quote, while Golduck itself is not colored gold, gold is often used in the Pokemon canon to symbolize the psychic type. The gold gummy is the gummy variety loved by psychic type Pokemon, and the Marsh Badge's Japanese name is Gold Badge. Also, if you notice, that badge is gold. So gold, eh? <coughs> Well, as per usual, Bulbapedia's not wrong, but they're not exactly the most in-depth. So let's look into it a little bit more. Let's just open one of my many, many crystal healing ebooks and read gold. Gold is very conductive and regenerative. It balances the energy fields and attracts positive energy. Identified with yin energy, gold amplifies self-confidence, will, and helps recognize the positive qualities of others. Gold can also be used in combination with gemstones to help increase their energies. Ah, I see. Real world science right here. I mean, you can't lie on the internet. Anyways, let's talk about real stuff. Like alchemy. Gold was seen by alchemists as the perfect union of mind and spirit, or soul, as it were. It's much more than a mere lump of atoms mixed together in a buttery sheen. Gold was a metaphor for people becoming divine and more in tune with the powers of the world. Which is, well, a very psychic thing. Think about it, becoming more in tune with your mind and spirit. Think about all of those psychic type trainers. They are all mystics or spiritualists or are Giga Smart. But hold up, because here's the thing. Neither of these Pokemon are psychic type. Sure, they have some psychic powers, but they are not innately filled with what it takes to be psychic type. They are both mono water. Why is that? Also, why are you so much bigger than your second evolution, Psyduck? These plushes, man, they do not make them to scale. Well, the reasoning for their typing is interesting. I promise. It's not because Game Freak forgot. And it may not even be because Psychic was so overpowered in Gen 1. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that was a factor, but there is a lot more to it than just that. I mean, first of all, even if it was Psychic type, it wouldn't have even been that good of a Psychic type. They lack any real good special attack stats in Gen 1. And as for fluff reasons, here's a few ideas. Psyduck is famous for having a massive headache all of the time. Maybe it doesn't have full psychic powers because all of the brain damage that Psyduck's headaches have caused. Or perhaps because of those headaches, it didn't learn how to control its powers. It just grew up with them and thus sometime whenever its body needs to get rid of that kind of energy, it bursts out. Like what we see in the anime and Detective Pikachu. But we can go deeper. Here's my theory. The dot thing on its head. Well, other than being really cool, it seems to be a focus for its psychic powers, right? There are many psychic type Pokemon that have gems or orbs and such for that reason. So that's easy. But what if it's not for that reason specifically since it's not actually psychic type? Yeah, maybe it's not there to focus its powers in an attack. Instead, it's to stop its headaches. It's to absorb its powerful headaches. The Pokedex says that it only uses its psychic powers when the orb on its head glows. So by deduction, the orb is getting charged and then releasing the stored power. Thus, it's easy to assume that the lingering psychic power in Psyduck's head is what's causing the headaches. And now that it's got this orb thing, it has a place to go. So Golduck has no more headaches. So then what kind of orb is it? Well, let's look into some more hippie dip alchemy stuff. Aha, fluorite. This crystal comes in many colors, including red. 
Fluorite is normally held in the mind's eye, which is the third eye, so, you know, the forehead. Well, there you go. Its properties include the ability to absorb harmful psychic energies, the ability to absorb negative powers, and the ability to fend off psychic energy vampires. Okay, we're done with the book, thank you. But uh, still, it fits pretty well, huh? Harmful negative psychic energy plagues Psyduck. And because it's not psychic type, it gets a poor headache from it. But then when it evolves into Golduck, it gets this fluorite crystal, which, to quote, absorbs harmful psychic energies. When the crystal absorbs enough of them, it glows red which then allows Golduck to do a psychic attack despite not being psychic type. So there you go. But still, the, the names are kind of mixed up. If anything, Golduck should be Psyduck because it now has control of its psychic energies. Psyduck. It's a psychic duck. It's got, con it's got control of its powers. Golduck because it's gold. Then again, the gold references the same thing, mastery of the mind and all that, so... Hmm... Maybe if we look to the original Japanese names, we can see where this confusion came from. Its name in Japanese is Koduk, or Child Duck. But Ko could also be referring to Kogame, meaning gold. So we have Gold Duck. And... Gold Duck. Wait a second, it could be like Rattata and Raticate. Raticate's name is Rata from Rat, and then Rattata's is Korata, meaning child rat. So maybe this was the same intent? Koduck was originally meant as child of Gold Duck, rather than just Golduck and Golduck again? Well, at least now we know it wasn't a localization error. The blue one is the Gold Duck, not the yellow one. But hold up now, here's a crazy radical proposal. What if it's not gold? What if the D sound, even in the Japanese name, is just part of duck and not gold? Hmm? What if it's gall duck? Enter etymology. In Irish, gall could be weeping or crying, feeling blue and covered in water then. All right, no, that's kind of a stretch. In Kurdish, it could mean lake. So, a body of water. Then my favorite is the Serbo-Croatian gull, meaning naked or bald, specifically when referring to an animal, meaning no fur or feathers. So we've got lake duck, crying duck, or bald duck. And two of those I could see explaining the blue coloration. And well, bald duck seems pretty good too, especially considering that gull duck is clearly not just a duck. It's part kappa, which are yokai famous for living in lakes and streams and being bald. Plus, the fun fact is that there's actually a Pokedex entry stating that Golduck is commonly mistaken for kappas. So clearly that's the inspiration. I mean, ducks don't have bodies like this. Also, hang on, tangent. This just brings in more questions. Do kappas actually exist in Pokemon? At the very least, this means that some people believed in non-Pokemon yokai. Does that mean Bigfoot is a potential non-Pokemon creature? Oh my, the theories. But unfortunately, Kappas also don't have any psychic powers. Unless stealing your soul from your butthole counts. That's actually a thing that they do. I'm serious. Folklore is hilarious sometimes. Also, while looking into all this, we googled blue ducks, and there is one species of duck in New Zealand that is blue. And it's great. And it's especially great because it's a species of duck that doesn't particularly like to fly. Instead, they are just really, really strong swimmers. Which leads me to believe that gold duck could be based off of these blue ducks mixed with a kappa. And maybe also a platypus. The claws and webbed feet are pretty similar. And while we're actually talking about Golduck for some reason, there are more fun factoids in here. In Gen 2, Golduck could actually be found with the held item Gold Leaf, which looks an awful lot like a golden feather. And the tooltip for the item even states that no trees have ever been seen with gold leaves. Maybe they just called a leaf a feather because leaves are just tree feathers after all. And feathers really are just bird leaves. So perhaps every now and again, a Golduck actually does grow a single golden feather, a symbol of their occasional psychic ability. So it could be that the gold in the name truly is gold and not gull. Though, 
that doesn't mean it can't be both. Most Pokémon have multiple origins. <laughs> we age 10 now, so, so Arbok is Cobra backwards. <laughs> Ekans, it's Snake backwards. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's so what is muck. <laughs> Ouch. But really, though. What is muck? Like, 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 really, what the muck is it? Well, here at Team Noggin, we're delving into each and every Pokemon. Eventually. Probably. My team wanted me to say that disclaimer, just in case I miss the others I don't like, like Ambipom and Heatmore. And today, we spun the wheel of Pokemon and landed on one of my favorite goo-based Pokemon, Muck. By which I mean I bought this Muck plush and I have to justify the purchase. By which I mean I needed a way to figure out how to put Gardevoir in more thumbnails because you guys eat that right up. But really, what is Muck for realsies? Well, to figure that out, let's first take a look at some of Muck's Pokedex entries. We will see quite a few recurring themes. Firstly, it's got a rather horrid smell. In fact, in Pokemon Ruby, it states that it's nose-bleedingly smelly. So, assuming that it gives people nosebleeds upon breathing the air around it... Eeeh. Now that's pretty intense. Like, I know Japanese people have high blood pressure, at least according to anime, in statistics, but nosebleeds? Just a rank stench? Ooh. Also, as summer sets in, the muck heats up, which makes the stench worse. It also eats garbage, and pollution, and sewage, and really anything that smells bad. And we're assuming that this is where the Pokemon gets its poison type from. Really, Muck and Grimer are the 90s pollution PSA of Pokemon. Thus, it coming out in the 90s, and it just be a living 90s pollution. Hence the purple. I could see Muck as a villain in Captain Planet. He's our hero. So, it's stinky pollution, like Deviant Artist using MS Paint, but to figure out exactly what muck is, let's look at its potency. I mean, in Crystal, it is stated that, as it moves, a very strong poison leaks from it, making the ground there barren for three years. The three years?! What makes plants not able to grow there for three years?! That's 1,095 days! Then in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, it states a toxic fluid seeps from its body. The fluid instantly kills plants and trees on contact. So again, plants are weak, apparently, to its poisons. Interestingly enough, one of the dex entries also talks about its dirt-like appearance. Though it is from Stadium. It becomes indistinguishable if it hides in dirt. Touching its sludge-covered body causes horrible poisonings. Touching it can cause a horrible fever as well, and one that needs many days of bed rest to get over. So what I'm getting at is that this thing is stinky, toxic, and looks like dirt, making it the perfect Pokemon. To some. Did you know there are actually fans of Muck? Weirdies. All of them. And before we actually get into it, I know that you people, yes you, the ones already at the keyboard, there is that popular theory that Muck is just a bunch of worms. I'm serious. Tube effects, tube effects, or otherwise known as the sludge worm. They are pretty gross. And when it gets really wet, they love to glob up in a grody mass. And they also like to live in sewers, just like Muck. But Muck has eyes. And a mouth with a tongue, even. It's not like how big Wishy Washy is obviously a mass of fish, but worms. Also, these worms aren't exactly terribly toxic, they're just kind of gross. So while it is a fun theory that a lot of people have as their headcanon... Nah. Okay, let's dive into some poisons. Let's not do that. Let's look at some poisons and figure out what's going on. Now, assessing toxicity is not easy. The chemical state of a substance is important, as is how we ingest it. For instance, if we swallowed liquid mercury, you'd probably get mercury poisoning. However, if you were to breathe in vaporous mercury, you would for sure die. In fact, that's a good start. Mercury, one of the more deadly metals, known as quicksilver to some, it is dangerous to plants, but not all that much. And this is similar to other extremely toxic to us substances, like botulinum toxins, one of the most deadly substances known to man. It's got an LD50 of 5! 
five. Oh, by the way, here, NG stands for nanogram, which is one billionth of a gram. And an LD50 is how we measure how poisonous something is. It's basically how much of a substance does it take to kill 50% of those exposed to it. So in this case, oh yeah, a very small amount to kill scary. But these are all deadly for humans. Muck is just toxic to the point where humans only get a severe fever, but to plants, it's absolute death. So we're looking for an herbicide, really. Like weed killer, but for all plants. But now get this. I'm probably on some FBI list now. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to research which of these toxins is the deadliest. Half of all of the resources we looked through were all redacted, had parts of it blacked out, covered up by big companies and or the government. Ugh. But we managed. What are the best ones out there? Well, it's definitely not glyphosate, a weed killer that is a great contact poison. Good at killing, but unlike muck, it doesn't leave the ground barren for years. Though I suppose muck could be just part of that. Another thing that kills plants indiscriminately is vinegar. In fact, anything that alters the ground's pH balance is good at killing most plants. Heck, if you change the pH balance in the ground enough, it may actually take years for it to grow plant life again. I mean, did you know that just plain old salt could make an area barren of plant life for years? It takes a ton of rain to make the ground usable again. I mean, there's a reason you'd salt the earth of your enemies, making their farms barren for years. It's quite rude. So I guess Muck could be super salty. Like a young Smash fan in air quotes. WHO THE MUCK IS TERRY?! Oh my goodness, look at the time! I haven't fear-mongered yet! Okay, how about this? A popular herbicide called Atrazine. It's the herbicide most commonly found in American drinking water. The European Union banned it in 2004, but the EPA re-evaluated and okayed atrazine use in 2009. While it breaks down quickly in soil, it tends to hang around in water. Almost 90% of drinking water in the United States has atrazine in it. At least according to an analysis of the US Department of Agriculture data by the Pesticide Action Network. But are they really trustworthy? But I mean, it can't be that scary. Why did the EU even ban this weed killer? Oh, because it messes with hormones, affects the immune system, and is linked to birth defects. <laughs> no biggie. I mean, those mega food corporations gotta make as much money as possible, and atrazine is cheap. So cheap! What else? What else? Oh, uh, Agent Orange comes to mind. It was pretty bad. So bad, in fact, that it's on our list of possibilities. It's classified as a deforestant. That's right. Herbicides kill plants. Deforestants kill forests. Agent Orange was made to deforest the jungle. And it worked. It also killed hundreds of kids. Like any, any child vaguely nearby the jungle. It's bad stuff. In fact, it's so bad that you can still see the scars of, of the forest left by it, even though it happened decades ago. Seriously bad stuff. And it's all thanks to the dioxin left in the ground. Yeah, you thought toxins were bad. Now mix toxin with the word die. So it's for sure possible that muck is a mixture of many different chemicals, including some of these, because they kill plants fast, leave the ground barren for years, and make people really sick too. I mean, Grimer is said to come from x-rays from the moon messing with industrial waste pumped out from factories. While the x-rays from the moon thing is stupid and dumb, it being industrial waste does point to its heavily toxic nature. Muck is uck. And likely, all these poisons mixed with sewage and doused in purple food coloring. It's no fun. No fun at all. Big question time. Which came first? The Torchic or the egg. If you believe Arceus created all Pokemon, then the Torchic came first, having been created by Arceus. If you believe all Pokemon are the evolutionary descendants of Mew, then the egg came first, laid by a Pokemon very much like, but not exactly the same as, a Torchic. So which is it? Fortunately, the Pokemon series sidesteps this entire- Well, there goes my attempts at a dramatic intro. As if this shirt and necklace combo didn't ruin it already. Fortunately, the Pokemon series sidesteps this entire question by simultaneously saying that both answers are right. At least some of the time. 
with Arceus and Mew both existing as viable explanations for the origin of Pokemon, but how can both explanations be correct? How can Arceus have existed before any of the other Pokemon, yet Mew is the common ancestor of all Pokemon? Which came first, Arceus or Mew? Well, here's the most commonly accepted, but technically theoretical, answer. In the beginning, there was an egg that hatched an Arceus, and thus Arceus created all of the Pokémon that it is specifically credited with creating. Dialga, Palkia, Giratina, Uxie, Mesprit, and Azelf. As well as, perhaps, the unknown, as I explain in another video here. The theory suggests that Arceus' last creation was Mew and that Mew was designed as a sort of seed of DNA potential that would be able to evolve into a multitude of species. Since Arceus is said to have created Pokémon from itself, you could even argue that Mew contains the DNA of Arceus and its other creations. But while that solves the beginning of time, what about everything afterwards? What about the other mythical or legendary Pokémon? Well, they're in sort of a gray area. Sure, Arceus created the creation trio, and the others we already mentioned, and yet yeah, Mew did evolve into all naturally evolving Pokémon, we get that, but the rest of the legendary Pokémon seem... less explained? Some are easy, especially the artificial ones. Ho-Oh made Raikou, Entei, and Suicune. Regigigas made Regirock, Regiice, and Registeel. Humans made Mewtwo, Genesect, Type Null, and Magearna. Deonce mutated from a Carbink. Deoxys mutated from a virus, though not like a Pokemon virus, just a regular non-Pokemon space virus. Uh, note to self, where did the non-Pokemon things like viruses, bacteria, and plants come from? Arceus? Question mark. And then there's the Ultra Beasts, which we can disregard as they come from another dimension entirely. One that may or may not have had its own version of Arceus, though an Ultra Beast Arceus would be pretty awesome. But all of what we've mentioned so far is just a fraction of the legendary Pokémon. The origins of most aren't really even explained. They've just been around since the ancient times as far as any human is concerned. The two options for their origin left to us seem to be that they are made by Mew or made by Arceus. Though as our last video implied, some legendaries likely have multiples of them. So if there's more than one Moltres or Lugia, we could simply say that they are a species with populations, albeit very small, rare ones, and I'd wager that a population is more likely to arise from natural evolution as opposed to Arceus going on a creation binge. Hmm, let's see, I'll put the Groudon here, and the Groudon here, and sprinkle some Tapu Cocos all around. Oh, what's that, a small child? You want another Palkia? Well, here you go. What accent was that? Now, I know some of you may say, Loxton, obviously legendary Pokémon are meant to be divine and spiritual in some way. They don't lay eggs, they can't breed. But aha, I say, for you have forgotten Manaphy, a mythical Pokémon that hatches from an egg pod-like thing. And breeding a Manaphy can be done, though if you try it, you'll only get a Fion. But the fact that Fion has an egg sort of thing at all implies that there is a way to breed them. We just don't know how. And hey, if every daycare center in the Pokemon world still hasn't figured out where the normal Pokemon eggs are coming from, I don't think Pokemon scientists are going to be discovering the methodology behind the breeding of a Manaphy or any other legendary Pokemon anytime soon. <laughs> Remember when Ash and friends just watch a Solgaleo and Lunala getting it on? And it terrified some of the Mons. <laughs> so innocent, but not anymore. So it would seem that legendary Pokemon do have a method for breeding, just not in captivity or in a regular way. Which, when you stop to think of it, it's it's very it's very duh. Like, duh. How else would Mew evolve into every other Pokemon besides breeding and descendants? It slowly it goes from Mew to not as Mew, and there's more Mews everywhere, and they slowly become less and less Mewish. It's so duh! So that's already evidence enough that points to most legendaries evolving from Mew instead of being created by Arceus. Now, I could stop there, but I've got another reason to think that legendary Pokémon are descended from Mew. And that's Archon. That's right! Archon is explicitly said to be the ancestor of all bird Pokemon. And what do you know, there are five legendary bird Pokemon. Three of them are even known as the legendary birds. 
So if the legendary birds evolved from Archon, and Archon evolved from Mew, then the legendary birds must have descended from Mew, in the long run. And if that's true for these, perhaps it's true for most of all the rest of the legendary Pokémon. So with all that in mind, here's what I think is the most logically consistent timeline. First, Arceus creates its Pokémon, the last of which is Mew. Mew then goes to Earth and starts getting it on everywhere, constantly. That's its life. And over time, it evolves into many different Pokémon. But some of the first ones that they evolve into would be considered mythical or legendary to us. It makes sense for the Mews to evolve into similar Pokémon before dissimilar Pokémon, right? Celebi, Jirachi, Manaphy, Shaman, Victini, Meloetta, and Marshadow are what you could possibly say are some of the earliest evolutions of Mew. The Mew derivatives, if you will. After that, you may have had a beastly, ancient era of Pokémon with legendaries such as Groudon, Kyogre, Regigigas, etc. And perhaps this evolution was guided. They are from Mew, but they are guided by Arceus. Then, just millions of years later would Pokémon evolve the more mundane form of reproduction. And that would give us Anorith. Anorith is an interesting Pokémon, as it's technically considered a sort of proto-Pokémon, though what this means isn't well defined. This may be because of Anorith's unique distinction of being the earliest known Pokémon to evolve and use the known method of reproduction in eggs. Perhaps at some point, legendary evolution gave way to this more mundane system of life that could more reliably reproduce than the rare and mysterious ways that they had done prior. This lines up well with Anorith's conception, being a mirror of the Cambrian Explosion, where diverse body shapes first showed up in animals. Now, I do want to mention that the biggest hole in this idea is that the mysterious legendary method of reproduction must have somehow re-evolved for the legendary birds, but there's actually a term for that in evolution biology, covergent evolution. It's happened many times with venom, and there was that bird that recently made headlines. It went extinct forever ago. It just re-evolved itself. Anyway. Those are the reasons I think it may be possible that all Pokémon, even legendaries, aside from, you know, Arceus and the Creation Trio and the artificial Pokémon, evolved from Mew in one way or another. So Arceus just created the universe. No big deal. Mew created all the Pokémon. Getting it on all the time. More Peko! Pokemon Sword and Shield's new Pikachu cologne. Every Jan's gotta have one. But what even is it? Some kind of... trash hamster? Well, just like the rest of the Pikachus, its name is the same in most languages, so maybe this name can enlighten us. Its name is a combination of the Japanese words for hungry and... guinea pig. Guinea pig?! So like a trash hamster? I mean, I guess! They're both pretty ugly and bean-shaped. <laughs> But, uh, here's a great detail. Morpeko has pockets, where it stores food. A lot of rodents have pockets like this, but in real life they're always in the cheeks. Not like... not like literal pants pockets. <laughs> it's cute, though. And every turn, Morpeko is on the battlefield, it switches into a new form. There's full belly mode and hangry mode. It must be able to fit a lot of food in those pockets for it to fill itself up between turns. This whole mode thing is all well and good. Many rodents have to eat super often because of their little metabolisms. They're just so rapid fast, which is primarily due to how small they are. I mean, they're rodents. It's hard to keep their insides warm because of their surface area to insides ratio. So their metabolisms have to be faster to produce more and more heat. The Etruscan Shrew famously has one of the fastest metabolisms. If it doesn't eat twice its body weight in food every single day, it will starve to death and or freeze to death. E. Gad, I'd be pretty hangry too if my life depended on it. Desperate times for call for desperate measures. You're fat, you look like food. And of course, taking such desperate actions are what leads to it becoming dark type when in hangry mode. It becomes quite rude and voracious and will knock anything out of the way and do any sort of dirty tactic to get the food it needs. That's dark type. But let's talk about that word some more. Hangry. It's for when you get easily peeved and snappy because you're hungry. It's a real thing, which is why it's totally fine that it's a real word now. Now then! I love talking about food and nutrition and stuff, completely changed my life. So, uh, strap in. Also, just so you know, these are my sources. I read a lot of health books because I'm an adult. To be a kid again. Huh.
hunger is super interesting. A lot of people assume that when you are hungry, you will stay hungry until you eat, because it's a signal that you need to eat. It's not true whatsoever. If you just wait a few hours and don't linger on it, your body will completely forget that you were ever hungry. Until the next mealtime rolls around, that is. And if you do this consistently enough, you can eventually get yourself to not feel hungry. Like at all. This was one of the big points that helped me lose 170 plus pounds on a calorie surplus. You just limit your eating to a two to four hour window and it just does wonders. Even if you're eating three times as much as you were before. Of course, first starting out on that, it's always super hard to skip two meals and snacks every day at first, but as it turns out, the vast majority of the time, your body isn't telling you that you are hungry. Which, whenever that is the case, that's the only time it actually matters. Rather, for modern people in the first world, about 90% of the time, it's your brain telling you that you think you are hungry. The reason being because it is used to eating around this particular time of day. But eventually, if you force yourself to change the time of day you eat, the brain eventually gets used to eating at those times. And so the hunger signals at the other times of day just stop happening. <laughs> Whoa, do this for long enough and suddenly your brain is used to eating in the two to four hour window so you don't you just like you like never feel hungry except if you eat kind of late during that two to four hour window but i mean like you know how clear-minded and focused you can get when your brain isn't always thinking about food in the back of its mind it's awesome but anyway when your brain is telling you that it thinks it's hungry it's also getting your body ready to eat thus the stomach growling it's preparing the stomach for food because it's that time of day again but it does do more than that it gets various proteins and enzymes and hormones all pumped up and ready to help the digestion process even though you haven't eaten anything yet it's just preparing in advance one of these is neuropeptide y a hormone that helps store food as body fat it also has a lot to do with brain function. It regulates mood and is linked to aggression if there's too much of it. So if your brain is preparing your body for food, but that food doesn't come as it's regularly scheduled time, well, you get cranky. The brain also tells the pancreas to start some extra insulin production, which stores sugar into cells. But now if the food comes late, well, your blood sugar is going to be lower than it should be. Never to dangerous levels if you're a healthy person, but enough to where now your body has to raise the blood sugar on its own to balance it out again. It does this by releasing the hormones cortisol and epinephrine, stress hormones. So you might feel on edge and more easily irritable. The combination of everything leads to feeling hangry. Hangry is 100% a real thing. Now just apply that to a creature that has to eat twice its body weight in a single day. <laughs> yeah, I'd be pretty pissed too. Tangent I think is interesting. You know those studies that like Mini Wheats always is promoting and is funding that say skipping breakfast is bad and eating breakfast leads to higher test scores in teens? What many of them don't take into account, usually on purpose, is that they're, they're skipping breakfast. They're looking at people who normally eat breakfast and now they are skipping it. This is a very vastly different thing from just not eating breakfast, like, ever. And in many ways, eating fewer times per day is not only the easiest key to weight loss and weight management, but also helps in brain function much, much more than regularly eating breakfast and snacking does. To keep it simple, more blood for the brain when you aren't digesting things. And there is way less carbohydrate-induced systemic inflammation slowing the brain and blood down. Not to mention eating once or twice a day will eventually eliminate the sense of cravings almost entirely. I didn't think that was possible until I did it. I almost forgot what hunger and cravings were like. <laughs> the brain's stupid. But back to Pokemon, yeah. Hangry is a real thing and a real word, so don't make fun of Morpeko for it. It's a rodent. Rodents need to be eating constantly. It's how they do. Oh, and they also run on wheels. Hence, it's signature move. That's a thing also. Normal type Pokemon. Some of them are cute. Some of them are, well, they're boring. And honestly, most of them are a little bit of both. But here's a thought, a query, an interesting question. What if there was no normal type? What would there be instead? Or rather, what types would the currently normal type Pokemon become? And how would the world of Pokemon change? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today on Noggin. The normal type is, uh, 
interesting? Question mark? It's sort of weak, and for good reasons. It's normal type. It's basically the baseline to judge all the other types against. I mean, it's the second most common type of Pokemon, only beaten by water type, but that honestly makes sense. The ocean is huge. Honestly, we still need more fish Pokemon. Now, first of all, honestly, I feel that if normal was never a type in Pokemon to begin with, we'd for sure have some other new type to sort of fill in the gaps. Something like a void type. Typeless. Which I guess normal sort of is, but normal still has its strengths and weaknesses. As it stands, Normal is tied with Electric for the least amount of things to resist its attacks, and Normal vs. Ghost is interesting as they are both immune to each other. Normal's biggest weakness is Fighting-type attacks. It's pretty easy to beat up a plain thing, and this is actually where the meta and existence of Normal types really matters. I mean, if you just got rid of a tenth of the cast that Fighting was good against, suddenly Fighting-type Pokémon aren't as good anymore, especially considering that most of the birds are Normal Flying-type. Remove normal and now they're just flying. Flying resists fighting type attacks, but now they're all normal. Opposite of that, now they're all just flying. So suddenly all these Pokemon that fighting type used to be decent at because the two types would counter each other out and make just a punch be a punch. Now they now the birds dodge because they're flying. That's why fighting is weak to flying. To punch. Have you ever tried to punch a bird? But now, suddenly, not only do fighting type Pokemon have even fewer Pokemon they are good against, but those same Pokemon resist them and are super effective against them. It's a big nerf to our punchy kickers. And that still happens if we replace the normal type with totally neutral typeless type. Or finally introduce the fan favorite, sound type. I mean, honestly, if normal wasn't a type, we would for sure have gotten sound added by now. I mean, there's Loudred! Come on! When the fairy type was added, a good number of previously normal type Pokémon lost their normal type in favor of fairy. So I'm sure the same thing would happen with sound. I mean, there's like... Exploud? But how's about no more dilly-dallying with the meta stuff? Let's talk actual Pokémon, the fun part of the video. What would we change the normal Pokémon into if normal was to be removed? Well, first off, we can just say that all of the dual-typed normal Pokémon just become their second type. Like, oh man, that is a lot of just flying Pokémon. But like, Pyroar would be Mono Fire. I'm, why was it even normal to begin with? Drampa would be Mono Dragon, etc. So for starters, let's group up the changed Pokémon into what we would change them into. Starting with the most common, I feel, normal-type Pokémon who would become Ground-type. These Pokémon are already similar to other ground types. They may have tough hides, live in the lowlands, dig or burrow into the ground. You know, the things that animals on the ground tend to do. So, in this category we have Rattata, Raticate, Watchhog, Patrat, Youngoose, Kangaskhan, Tauros, Miltank, Bufalant, Sentret, Furret, Zigzagoon, Linoon, Bunnelby, who evolves into a ground type already, so like, come on, Buneary, Wapunny, Mincino, and Cincino. I mean, they're chinchilla Pokemon, they bathe in dust. Stantler may be ground, but I guess I could see grass a bit if they wanted to go that route, as it's similar to Sawsbuck. And then there are Pokemon like Persian and Meowth, and maybe Ursaring. I could see them all as dark type Pokemon. I mean, Alolan Meowth and Persian already are because they act like spoiled mean cats, so let's just carry that trade over. And Ursaring is a big mean grizzly bear. Grizzlies are extremely territorial and protective of their babies, and will maul whatever they see as a threat, which could be seen as a dark type thing. Plus, you know, Ursa Ring, Teddy Ursa, the whole moon bear thing, it's nighttime. Then we have some normal Pokémon who would become fighting type, some of them more obvious than others, like Lopunny again. Its Mega is already fighting for good reason, so let's just extend that. It's ground fighting. Gumshoes could also be ground fighting, or even just fighting, as it's all about that gumshoe justice. It's the same reason the Swords of Justice are fighting type, despite not really being about punches and chokeholds. And with that same logic, let's extend that into Stoutland, Lillipup, and Herdier for their fierce loyalty and sense of justice. <laughs> Kick it in sense of justice cause smell. And Apom and Apom have massive fists for tails, so it just feels right. Zangoose could go here also, perhaps a fighting dark type. Mongeese are pretty violent. And it just looks mean, doesn't it? Then I could also see Ursaring and Teddy Ursa being here too. 
fighting. They are bears, which are crazy strong. And there's the whole, I trained my fighting skills against a grizzly bear thing. So they trained their fighting skills against people because it's funny to be reversed. Slacking Vigoroth and Slackoth are also pretty tough. So fighting might fit, but maybe only the middle one. Maybe as just one of their types also. Or maybe add Dark in there because they sleep a lot. Sloth is a deadly sin after all. <laughs> Maybe slacking gets pretty vengeful about being woken up. Badoof could be ground, but I think just switching it to water to match its evolution is fine. It's a beaver. Kamala could easily be grass type because it's actually the log. The koala is the decoy. <laughs> ha, funny joke. But really though, grass type, it lives in trees all the time. It is a master of trees and it attacks with its log too. Hashtag team trees. Porygon, Porygon 2, and Porygon Z are good candidates for the electric type. They are made up of literal ones and zeros in a computer. You know what those ones and zeros are? Whether or not a transistor has electricity in it or not. These Pokemon are literally electricity. Plus physical life, so electric for sure. I don't know why they aren't electric to begin with. Now, if you really don't want to add the sound type for Exploud, Wismir, and Loudred, I guess we could make them steel type. Besides normal, the steel type also has a few sound-based moves, and plus, Exploud is pipe organs, which are made of metal. And come to think of it, I could also see Zangus here. It's got those crazy sharp claws, but no, no, that would make its rivalry with Seviper extremely one-sided. Kecleon, if not normal, would be psychic type. Think about it, it uses mind powers to make you think it's not there. Basically, it's an illusionist, but with real powers. Easy. Zavinda, though, is much harder to retype. Possibly ground. Maybe fighting, since it's comically fighting like a drunken master. But realistically, I feel psychic. Psychic would work out, as it's all about the spirals and making others dizzy with its movements and dizzy punch. Plus, what's more classic to hypnotism than spinning spirals of mesmerization? Dunsparce is another good one, but actually I feel like it could rep the dragon type. It is a legendary creature based off of a snake that can roll out at maximum speed and even double jump. And on top of that, or instead of that, it could be poison type. Again, because of the thing it's based on, the Suchinoko, it's extremely venomous. We got a whole video about it here. Cast form could lose its form system and just be four different Pokemon with their different types, or its base form could be just flying type. I mean, it's a cloud. But that would make its tornado form kind of useless, but, uh, it is what it is. Lickitung and Licky Licky are two rather odd Pokemon. Did you know that they can't lick each other as it stands? Lick is a ghost type move, and they are normal type. How sad. I could see poison because of how gross licking is. Plus, there are plenty of reptiles with venomous saliva. I guess I could also see fairy type because they love food and are pink. A very good reason to make a Pokemon fairy. But there's also the fact that it's partially based off of a yokai that likes to lick bathhouses clean. Yuck. So, fairy and or poison would really fit. Furfru, fairy, I guess? As it's way, it's in the fashion. It's, it's, it's in the fashion, and pink is a color. And it has pink as a fashionable color. Eh? I don't know, man, it's a dog. Normal fits it so well. Other now fairy types include all of the pink and cute mon, so Skitty and Delicati, as well as Blissey and Chansey. I'm unsure why Blissey isn't already fairy type, really. Audino would also be sound if it were added, but otherwise, fairy, because it's kind, caring, and full of heels and buffs. Eevee, though, huh, Eevee is another really good normal type, so it'd be typeless if that was a thing. Maybe ground, but like a super, super weak ground, so nobody can actually use it as a ground type properly. Here's another odd one, it's Smeargle. It kind of stumped me for a bit. Maybe if we look at its moves, we could figure out what type of move it uses most. Oh. Wait, never mind. It's all sketch. Maybe water type as it creates fluid from its tail to mark its territory and paint with and stuff. This one's really tough. I mean, maybe if it was like based on a yokai or a fey creature of some kind, it could be fairy, but, but no, there isn't much for it. So water because paint is a liquid, I guess. Oh man, and I was dreading this one too. Munchlax and Snorlax, where do we start? Normal seems like the best as there really isn't a fat and sleeps around type. Though there would be more than one Pokemon in that type, I suppose. So Snorlax is a bear cat thing that seems to love to eat, even if it's poisonous. Not kidding. 
This thing loves food so much that its stomach is said to be incredibly strong. Even muck's poison is nothing more than a hint of spice on Snorlax's tongue. So either it's immune to poison or it resists poison to a point where it can't be hurt. So steel type because it's immune to poison and it's heavy and metal is heavy. That's, that's bad. Maybe because it eats so much gross stuff, it gets poisonous burps, kind of like Swalot. Or maybe it could be ground, because it sleeps on the ground, and thus becomes one with the ground. Regigigas! I have to go with fighting ground again. Or even just fighting, as that would make it strong against all of the other Regis, which is perfect because it's the master Regi. Plus its move pool already has a rather good list of fighting type moves. And the ground is there because the whole thing about it pushing and pulling the continents around when the world was being formed, you know? Arceus, Type Null, and Sylph Ally are <laughs> difficult too, and honestly I feel like the existence of Type Null justifies a typeless type. I figured that's what they were doing before its type was officially revealed. These Pokémon all have the gimmick of changing their type to match the item you give them, so I guess you could say that they can't not have an item. They need to be one of the other types. If you try to just remove the item instead of swapping it, you just can't. Otherwise, maybe Psychic or Fairy as a default. They are magical legendaries, and those types seem to fit that criteria for magical legendaries. And finally, we have another hard Pokemon to place. It's Ditto. Again, typeless if that were allowed to be a thing, but otherwise, Psychic could work here too, as illusions again. Maybe it takes a lot of psychic potential to be aware of all the cells in your body are and where to move them, a lot of psychic energy needs to flow into the other Pokémon's brain and read its gen genetics to, like, whoosh, come back and transform into that. Fairy could also work because there's plenty of fake creatures that love to shapeshift. It's quite the magical ability. Oh man, Pokémon Sword and Shield comes out in like a week. There's going to be more normal Pokémon. Sounds like a problem for future me! Hey, it's future Loxton. I guess still past Loxton for you, but uh, not as past Loxton as that guy. Whew. But Gen 8 is out now, so we've got new normies to look at. First up, let's cover the slight changes to Zigzagoon and Linoon. They keep their normal typing, but gain dark. This really isn't all that interesting, but the dark type is a reference to their crazy and erratic behavior. They are little punks! The cute little punky dudes! And then there's the new evolution, Obstagoon. The biggest of obstacles. Normal, dark. Normal dark is kind of an odd typing, honestly. Especially when you think of dark as more of an evil or not nice type. Oh yeah, this guy, he's normal, he's everyday, but he's got a dark side. So exactly a punk, I suppose. But if there were no normal type, I don't feel like pure dark would work for these guys either. It would need something that keeps it grounded in society. Okay, I really just wanted to say grounded because it's a badger, after all. Badgers dig. They dig. Dig, dig, dig. Badger. Other normal types in Gen 8 are surprisingly not the birds. For once, Game Freak didn't make the bird a normal type. Hallelujah! But Squava and Greedent, both mononormal. And again, ground seems like a good replacement. Possibly with Greedent being dark type because it's very greedy. Ground dark, uh, greedy's a bad thing. And again, ground squirrel thing. Easy peasy. Next up is Indeedee. Both male and female are normal psychic. An interesting type combo. Extremely powerful of the mind, but also kind of commonplace. However, I don't think these Pokemon are the supercomputers of brain power. No, they are psychic because of their professions. These Pokemon are always seen helping people. I mean, they are based on butlers and maids, after all, and the psychic typing comes into play specifically for this. They use their horns to talk or feel emotions or transfer thoughts between each other. The emotion part is very psychic, but I feel like they might be able to lose their normal type entirely to either be mono-psychic or maybe psychic fairy secondarily, but mono-psychic works better, IMO. Another surprise with this gen is that there actually aren't that many normal types, and I'm kind of happy about that, but we did save the least for last. Wait, no, no, it's good. I love it. Wooloo. Heck, the whole internet loves this thing. And boy, does Hop love his. However, Mono Normal Type again is pretty hard to retype as it's pretty basic. It's a sheep, goat, ram thingy, and Double doesn't make things any easier. It's also Mono Normal, and it's not gonna be all that easy to imagine a world without it because it's just so good. However, 
I'm gonna throw you a curveball. I'm gonna say that if normal type didn't exist, this would be steel type, both of them. Their wool is stronger than you'd think. Plus, according to the Pokedex, they can fall off of a cliff and stand back up unharmed. They really bounce back. It also states that if you make a carpet out of their wool, it's as bouncy as a trampoline. It really puts a spring in your step and springs are metal. Also, steel wool is a thing. And these sheep are tanks already. So, steel type. Really, really durable as heck wool. Yeah. So there you have it. That was future Loxton. If normal type wasn't a typing, that's what I'd retype all of the normal type Pokemon as. But honestly, I wouldn't want normal type to be removed. You need a baseline to compare things to. If everyone is a superhero, then no one is. The villain of The Incredibles was actually onto something. Too bad he had bad hair. So even if some folks find normal Pokemon boring, well, that's sort of the point of them. So Game Freak succeeded at their doings. Yay. <laughs> The name Cursula sounds like a spell. Like, Mwahaha! I curse you with blinding light! Cursula! But actually, it's a Pokemon. This Pokemon, a Galar only evolution of Galarian Corsula. Oh no, it's so sad! Why is it sad? Who hurt you? What's going on? Why does it die? Oh no! Is it us? We did this! Oh no! But why? And how? Oh, oh, it's evolving. Oh. Oh, now it's super cool looking. Oh man, I want more of these. Galar actually made Corsa look cool. So let's make some more. Oh, coral reefs. They are quite pretty. They've got blues, reds, purples, pinks, greens, and that's just the coral. The many, many fish and other marine creatures that live in them truly make the whole place bustling with life. But similar to how this white moose is super cool and this white alligator is awesome, white coral reefs are pretty wicked awesome too. So much awe. I am just in classical awe. So, uh... Well, clearly we gotta make more of them, right? So how do we do that? Well, first we should figure out what this is called. It's called bleaching. So you just dump a bunch of bleach into the ocean? That sounds really bad for the fish. Well, I suppose, as a human, that is a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Two parts bleach for every one part water. Put your coral in, wait two days, and there you go! And that's how you do it small scale. But we've got entire reefs to bleach. So off the top of my head, I think there are like 352 quintillion gallons of water in the ocean. So we're gonna need 704 quintillion gallons of bleach. I don't think there's enough bleach in the world. So we're gonna have to do things the next best way. I guess we'll have to bleach this coral the more natural way. You could say it's organic. So coral reefs, they've existed for something like 400 million years, right? But in just the last 30 years, they've all begun turning white like this all over the globe. And since climate, and since climate change is clearly fake, this can only mean one thing. Someone stole my idea and they're already doing it. Ugh, ugh. No such thing as originality anymore. And whoever's doing it already has a 19% head start. Yeah, nearly 20% of the planet's coral is bleached already. And another 17 only has a decade or two left. How am I even gonna catch up with this guy? <sighs> well, step one is starting. So I gotta know, how are they doing it? What's going on? Well, that doesn't sound so natural at all, so can't be true. So what specifically is causing corals to turn white? Well, what gives them their color in the first place? It's algae. Coral is super rough, perfect little homes for algae to live. This algae eats sunlight to photosynthesize, and its byproduct is then eaten by the coral. But here's the key. If the coral or algae gets stressed, they start not getting along as well as they used to. So they start a messy breakup process. And then when the coral has finally had enough, it kicks it all out which leaves it empty and thus turns it white. And if it stays white for too long, it dies, leaving it permanently white. Neat! So all we need to do is stress out Corsula and it will eventually evolve into our awesome ghost type, Corsula. It's awesome. I just want it so bad. So 
So how do we stress out poor Corsola? What would possibly weigh so heavily on a Corsola's mind? a lot. So much that, uh, well, I found a video. Look. It's completely real. How it doesn't ruin it. <laughs> The reef, the most biodiverse biome on the planet. And the entire biome is dependent on the growth and continued survival of coral. Without coral, there is no reef. But as we've recently learned, the coral is under attack. But by what, you might ask? Well. Here are their greatest serial killers. First, we look to ocean acidification. Many of us know that the burial forests of the north and the Amazon rainforest are vitally important in their roles of the global ecosystem, absorbing carbon dioxide and converting it into oxygen for us and the animals to breathe. But did you know that the oceans share this role? Through various processes, the Gupper Ocean absorbs CO2 and converts it into various other substances. But one of these is carbonic acid, which can affect the pH balance of the water. And with the ever fin increasing levels of CO2 in our atmosphere, the oceans are turning too basidic in some areas for corals to thrive. This overly acidic water slowly wears down their calcification, which not only makes it more difficult for coral to grow, but makes it more susceptible to gillnesses as well. On top of this, rising temperatures and sea levels impact the abilities of reefs, making photosynthesis more challenging and also increasing the spread of disease. Next, we look to fishing. Only 5% of reef-dwelling fish are easily capable of breeding in carptivity. As such, the other 95% of collected fishes for aquariums are conchfish skated from coral reefs, which would otherwise benefit from their population. But of course, it gets worse than that. One method of capture involves sodium cyanide, a chemical that narcotizes the prized fish in the area. But of course, it spreads and kills many more fish in the area. While this process is illegal in most well-off countries, that doesn't remove the responsibility from the fish collectors in those countries. Their fishing gear from beach scenes, gill nets, and anchors break branching corals and suffocate many more. And that's not even mentioning the minor lesions and abrasions they create, leading to only more disease and more coral death. And let's not even get into the methods that use dynamite or grenades. And when you combine this impact with industrial fishing, well, before the 1980s, fishers would avoid letting their nets fall deep enough into the ocean to harm coral, as it could ruin their nets too. But as soon as rockhopper trawls were invented and brought into the industry, the damage grew exponentially, as they allow the nets to roll over rough surfaces including deep-sea coral reefs. So far, it is unknown how long it takes coral to recover from this process, and the worst of this is found in southern Australia, where 90% of the surfaces on coral seamounts are now bare rock, thanks to this process. Next, we look to pollution. When most think of pollution in the oceans, they picture plastic bottles, straws, grocery bags, cigarette butts, and other similar wastes. While these do deal damage, they hardly cause a dent compared to the real pollutants, such as abandoned fishing nets, agricultural runoff, and industrial wastewater. 
all those pesticides and herbicides on our crops slowly wash off as they are watered, and ultimately it flows into our oceans, wreaking havoc on ocean life. And even sediment runoff smothers corals and interferes with their ability to feed and reproduce. Various metals commonly found in industrial waste, for example copper, pacifically, has been shown to interfere with these processes as well. And other chemicals absorb the oxygen right out of the water, leading to eutrophication, which also kills coral and smaller fish. But of course, that doesn't mean you personally aren't playing a role here. The common sunscreen ingredient, oxybenzone, causes coral bleaching and has an impact on other marine fauna. Some 6,000 tons of sunscreen ends up entering reef areas annually. And recreational diving has gained a considerable amount of popularity in recent years. And these 23 million divers a year are all of low skill, and many are naughty. They bump the coral, take the coral, and stress the sea life in the area. While individually these impacts are all small, they all affect the big picture. And thus, we all need to do our part to save the coral. What a load of fracking propaganda! But just in case it's right, here's what I need to do. Drive my car as inefficiently as possible, buy non-organic foods, frequently use sunscreen, buy so many saltwater aquariums, specifically with fish imported from South America and the Philippines, go cyanide dynamite diving as often as possible, eat the cheapest, most industry-fished seafood I can find, live in a coastal city, and of course, never buy anything organic or pesticide-free. That way, I can do my part in stressing the absolute heck out of all of the Corsola, and make Galarian Corsola be all of the Corsola. <laughs> you know, come to think of it, it does make sense that Corsola in Galar specifically would be all dead and stuff. Galar had a head start. England started the Industrial Revolution. Their reefs were the first to die. The lucky ducks. But you know what? One person can't have that big of an impact. So I'm going to need help with this. One man is not enough. So whoever it is that has a head start on this, they must already have billions on their side. Mm, getting all the coral bleached from his idea. So I'm going to need your help too. Together we can speed up the deaths, I, I mean, I mean, <laughs> the awesome bleaching of all the Corsola. So like I said, all you need to do is... Oh wait! Most of you already are! Oh, thank you so much! Keep it up! Our reefs really can't last much longer. They most likely will all be white within my lifetime already, thanks to the actions of me and all of you. Ha! Thanks for helping make my dream come true. And don't change anything about the way you live your life. We're already on the path to a white, white Christmas. I sure hope I won't get in trouble for this. Sarcasm is a thing, and a lot of people... Well, let's just say they suck. Let's let Corsola and Cursula be a reminder or a wake-up call that our reefs are dying at an increasingly alarming rate. So, at the very, very least, do your research on the stuff you buy, and don't partake in unsustainable diving adventures. Maybe plant a tree, or five, or ten. Hashtag team trees. For real though, please plant some trees. I already did, and I felt good about myself for at least an hour. And again, just do your research on all the stuff you buy, because ultimately, doing more research is really using your noggin. With all these Pokemon based on food. I mean, some are more obviously food than others, but still, what's the deal? Ice cream? Whipped cream? An apple turnover now? I mean, I guess the apples and cherries and banana tree mons are fine. They are fruits. I mean, there are plenty of plant Pokemon, and fruit and vegetables are plants, so you know. Also, look, it's Appleen, the new apple Pokemon. But the plant Pokemon aside, are these Pokemon edible? I mean, I mean, yes, but I mean, specifically, more edible than, say, a Rhyhorn. I mean, it's literally a floating dog made of fairy floss, aka cotton candy. Wait, is candy a food? According to the definitions, yes! Food is food when it's edible. Right. 
Wait, what is an edible then? I mean, I could eat this plush technically, you know, with like a fork and a knife, maybe with a little balsamic on it. Mm. Maybe there's something in here I could add. Maybe if I sprinkle on some uh, Shioku no Osaku snack soy butter aji. I'm mispronouncing some of those, I'm sure. All right, no, I'm not gonna eat that. Could eat these though. This is pretty good. What even is it? My poor meal tank. Anyway, let's get more specific. It turns out the definition of edible contains fit for consumption. Basically, if you can actually digest and get nutrients out of it, and it's not gonna kill you or hurt you, then it is edible. So while I could eat just like a wood with some nails, I'm pretty sure like 99.9% .9 positively sure that it's not edible, technically speaking. Also, this does technically make candy a food. So uh, enjoy that information. I guess. But does that make Swirlix edible? I'd argue no. As it turns out, it's not actually cotton candy. Yeah, that's a lie. Rather, it's a fairy dog that eats nothing but sweets itself, and thus it smells and looks like cotton candy. It uses its light sticky fur to entangle foes and distract them with its fur's sweet taste. So what do you suppose Swirlix tastes like? Just like cotton candy, or? So how do you suppose Swirlix does its thing? Well, in all likelihood, the fur itself isn't the sweet thing because that's not how fur works. But this dog could be extruding a sweet oil onto its fur. Basically, all creatures produce sebum, the oil that is secreted through hair and fur follicles. It is made up of triglycerides, free fatty acids, wax esters, squalene, cholesterol esters, and just straight up cholesterol. And basically, it is used to keep fur and skin moist, because when skin and hair get too dry, they begin to crack. The water that was bulking the cells up is gone, creating more space for air to get involved, leading to flaky, crackly, damaged hair and skin, sometimes to the point of wounding, which leads to open sores and infections which obviously is bad. So obviously the body has ways of combating this. Secreting oils. These oils have all kinds of smells depending on the health and or diet of the creature involved. And in the case of smelling sweet, it's more common than you'd think. Eating nothing but sweets like this dog is a path towards type two diabetes. Speaking of which, I have type one diabetes, so I gotta inject every single time I eat carbohydrates. But this stuff is so worth it. Stab, stab, stab. But the fun fact here is that some folks with type 2 diabetes sometimes smell fruity, or like maple syrup, especially as they get active, like when going grocery shopping. This is because their bodies are desperately trying to get rid of as much sugar as possible because there is way too much of it in their bodies. So it starts shoving sugar out of itself any way that it can. And yes, doggy diabetes is a thing, and clearly Swirlix has it. Come on. Grain-free pet food, people. Grains turn into glucose in the body. Pasta is just candy, but with extra steps. Also, the way I like to remind myself of things is sweets are for treats, not for the always eats. And there's an ice cream Pokemon thanks to this man. The Vanillite line is one of the most hated Pokemon because it's an ice cream cone Pokemon. Why is that a thing? But what many folks don't realize is that it's not actually ice cream. Like, read the Pokedex. Come on, the lore thing that the franchise you hold so dearly is based on? These Pokemon are sentient icicles and there have been object mon since forever. And these were introduced at the same time that the sentient snowflake was. So it was a good time for fans of that spooky snowman movie. But if they are just icicles, then why? Why do they have vanilla ice cream on top? Well, because it's just snow. They decorate themselves to look like ice cream. It makes them more cute and more likely to get a loving trainer. But it's more than that. It's actually really cool. Icicles are formed when snow up on a high place, like a tree or a rooftop, melts from the heat of the sun. And then the sun sets and it gets colder and colder. And so the water that was dripping down from the top slowly refreezes on top of itself, eventually forming an icicle. So ultimately, it's decorating itself not just for looks, but to keep itself alive. And you make fun of it for that. Hashtag rude. So, are Swirlix and Vanillish food Pokemon? Technically, no. One is just sweet smelling, and the other is just snow and ice. Which, I mean, you can get hydrated from eating snow and ice, but... I mean, then you could say Avalug is a food Pokemon, and nobody wants that. But now, how about our friend Appelin over here? Ah! It's dead! Appelin is a bunch of question marks. It's actually as much of a food Pokemon as Farfetch'd is. That is to say, it itself is an animal, which I mean, I guess, can be food, but that's a, that's a different topic. Appelin isn't actually an apple. 
it's in an apple. Hence the name, Apple Inn. Apple Inn is your classic worm living in an apple. But the new question is, why is it grass dragon type if it's a worm? Shouldn't it be bug type? Well, worm is another word for dragon in a few old European languages. And this Pokemon in particular may be inspired by the worm of Linton a famous, long, green, British dragon that lives inside of a hill. Apple Lynn? Worm of Linton? Yeah, this line is super creative, honestly. I absolutely love it. Just like how I love Marukawa Red Begum. Oh, it's cola-flavored gum. Can't be chewing this all video. Also, cola's a weird flavor for gum. <laughs> and plus, it makes your tongue red. Old joy. It is good though. And while we're on its origins, there is a near century old apple orchard in England called the Dragon Orchard. It's based in Herefordshire by the Malvern Hills, and Appleton just happens to be found on Route 5 by Turfield, with these very similar looking hills around. Hmm? Granted though, this isn't where Stonehenge or the Cerneopus Giant is in real England, so either Galar is a big mix up jumbling of real England, which it is, or this Dragon Apple Orchard connection is coincidental. But anyway, they could have easily just done the classic worm in an apple, but they went the extra mile. It even has two awesome evolutions. If an apple in eats a tart apple, it evolves into Flapple. The dragon worm got bigger, and it uses the hollowed out apple to fly. It flaps. Flapple. Oh, it's so cute, yet cool at the same time. The tiny little worm ate the whole apple. But at least apples, you know, they have nutrients, so they're pretty good for you. But if Applin eats a sweet apple, it becomes Apple Ton! Oh no! It's so chunky! It ain't thick. It thig. Also, it's no longer in the apple, like Apple in. Now it's under the apple. Apple ton. Under. But also, ton is an old English suffix meaning enclosure, house, or dwelling. This cutie with a booty made a house out of an apple turnover. Oh yeah, also apple turnover. Apple ton. Turn over. An apple turnover is a super popular sort of British pie thing. It looks like the things that are on its back. But here's where things get weird. So according to the Pokedex, kids would peel those bits of skin off of the apple ton and eat them, which... Sounds weird, but apparently this whole top half of Appleton is secreting a sweet, sweet nectar. Sounds like the Swirlix thing again, but this time actually food, because it's nectar. It's grass type, it's part plant. And I like how this one, it came because the Appleton ate a sweet apple. That's why it's the big and honkin' evolution. It ate like six times its weight in sweet. But still, I could see maybe licking it, or like taking your finger and wiping nectar off, but to actually peel off its skin? What? I mean, I guess these parts look easily removable, so maybe that's the point. Maybe it's like how lizards detach their tail or how crabs rip their arms off to escape predators. Appleton just pops off some super tasty skin. I guess reptiles do shed their skin all the time, so I guess it's not that weird. But overall, I like how the two food Pokemon people say are food and that's bad actually aren't food. And then this food Pokemon that people say it's not the food, it just lives in food, wound up actually becoming food. It just goes to show you that you really can't judge a Pokemon by its cover, especially when that cover is the skin of an apple. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, though it's so nice and cold. And I'm in here, cozy, warm, with my... Gatorade Zero. It was supposed to be hot cocoa, but I don't have any, and this is the closest I could come up with. But anyway, today I thought, why not do a little science and figure out how Ice-type Pokémon even work? We've gone over how Fairy and Dragon-type Pokémon work on a mildly scientific level, minus the magic, but I'd like to start a more realistic video about how magical creatures are able to control ice powers, or be made of ice, because I hate being nice to myself. So let's start off with the traits of ice types. Let's start with the most useful effects. All of its moves in contests were considered beautiful prior to Gen 3, meaning they were all special. Then the physical special split came, and now it's all fancy with the physical and special mix. But anyways, the important part is that it's a special type, which still holds up nicely, as it only has 10 physical attacks and 12 special. And it does make sense for most of them to be special or even status moves. I mean, being frozen is one of the worst status debuffs to be. That's how important ice is. It gets its own status condition. Just like how fire gets its own. So how would a creature even be able to do this? Create ice or breathe ice? I mean, one of the most 
classic of moves is Frost Breath. The knee-jerk reaction makes me want to say it's liquid nitrogen being released from the animal to create supercooled gas, basically a thermodynamic reaction. The gas evaporates and is extremely cold, so it supercools the immediate area. Boom! Frost burns. Which we will get to, but let's continue with how they are even able to breathe ice, let alone have body temperatures well into the negatives. Liquid nitrogen is a possibility, but it adds in many more questions. I mean, where would a creature get nitrogen easily and in the quantities that it needs? How does it store such a volatile gas? How do they compress it to a point where it's liquid? These are all crazy issues, which is why I'm thinking more along the lines of CO2 or carbon dioxide. It's a classic compound that's everywhere, super easy to obtain, and it needs way less compression to become a liquid. However, it's not as cold, but still very possible to cause freezing. I mean, if a creature was trying to get nitrogen, it would need to get it from the higher atmosphere, and then, again, liquefy it, obviously with some magical means. Or the creature could instead just generate CO2 chemically and biologically like what most creatures do already. Look, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> And plus, if it's generated this way, then it's already under some level of pressure in the body. Plus, there are many ways to generate extra CO2 than just breathing. I mean, there's the classic chalk example, wherein a creature could eat chalk, and then the acid would decompose it into just CO2 and calcium salts, basically this whole reaction. Think of a fire extinguisher. I'm sure, I'm sure you've all seen those videos of how you can cool a soda can in mere seconds with a fire extinguisher, which is completely safe and worth the time and the effort. It works because it's blasting CO2 and or nitrogen, along with a bunch of other chemicals that help make the fire not be fire anymore, but the CO2 and nitrogen are the part that cools the area off. Now, let's look at air conditioning units. They take in air via the outside exchange or the internal exchange. This air tends to be much warmer than the target temperature, so it uses cool air passovers, basically cold gas compressed inside pipes, to pass that warm air over. Which of course means the air gets cooled, but in the process also heats up the gas. They are sort of balancing each other out. Now, as it stands, making the air get cold enough to be capable of freezing attacks is Probably not possible with this method, but come to think of it, this also just sounds like we're adding a step that doesn't need to be there. Why not just shoot out the supercooled compressed gas? It's totally plausible for a Pokemon to just be using the compressed gas. You see, when you release this gas out into the air, it immediately begins evaporating and uncompressing, creating an extremely cold environment around the gas, which sounds more like how it really would work as an ice breath attack. It's not literally breathing ice, but rather, it's freezing the air right outside of its mouth, and that ice is traveling along its breath. There is also a non-chemical way of creating ice, however, it's a bit crazier and, well, it takes a lot of factors to work. So when you compress air, it gets colder. In a layman's term. In fact, instead of trying to explain it, let's just do a little mini-experiment. Yes, you! Right now! Blow air out of your mouth while your mouth is making a small hole. Blow on yourself. Feels cold, don't it? Now, open your mouth super wide and breathe. This air is warmer. And the reason this is, is because when you're breathing through the small hole your mouth is making, you're slightly compressing the air. So we could say the ice-type Pokemon's lungs are strong enough to pressurize the air to cause freezing. It's... But extreme. Way more than I can do. And its lungs are also heat resistant, as compressing all of that air would generate a large amount of heat. In fact, how would any of these animals even live in the cold temperatures that they inhabit? Also, wouldn't animals in the cold need to resist cold and not produce cold? I mean, if you lived in the cold, wouldn't you want to be a master of heat? So that you could keep yourself warm and also harm the other Pokemon who are just trying to stay warm? You could cook them! Wow! Anyway, the Pokemon location design issues aside, we can get to the next topic. How do they even exist at these cold temperatures? With all this cold, these creatures must be warm-blooded. Or at least, must be a warm-blooded creature that has no need to hibernate. This is where some of the conflicting science happens, and it's all thanks to, again, good old thermodynamics. Basically, you can't just get rid of energy. To make something colder, or less energetic, you need to heat up something else, or use energy to do so. To live, you need to be warmed up so that your body is able to move and be active. 
cold-blooded animals use the sun to warm themselves up. This means that they don't need to eat as often, as their cells don't need to worry about making their own heat. But warm-blooded animals need this heat to stay warm constantly, so they create the heat from their muscles and metabolic respiration. Heck, even the blood circulating in your body right now is creating heat. That's why when you get cold, you can go for a quick run or do jumping jacks. It warms you up. Getting scared does too, it gets the blood pumping. I mean, heck, even your brain can just decide to make you warm because of its power over the body. Ever just sit there thinking of stuff that makes you worried or stressed out and then you go up a million degrees? It's your brain's fault. But how could a creature survive in a freezing environment like most of the ice-type Pokemon do? I mean, some of them are said to have external body temperatures well below freezing. I mean, Aurorus's skin is negative 240 degrees! Fahrenheit, for those of you across the drink. That's colder than the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth! Negative 89.2 Celsius or negative 128.6 Fahrenheit. Yeah, Aurorus is as cold as Jupiter, a planet that's stupidly far from the sun. So let's just say it's cold. But how is that even possible? Well, actually, it makes a bit of sense that these Pokemon would be ice cold on their outsides. They must be extremely good at siphoning the cold out of their bodies by either breathing ice or just expelling cold air in. Aurorus's case. They are getting rid of the cold in their body by making incredible amounts of heat internally, thus keeping them alive. The ice breathing is almost a byproduct of this system. To live in really cold environments, you would need either to isolate your body from the cold outside through means like blubber or long fur, or you would need to be really good at expelling the cold that's in you to where you would be able to outperform the temperature saturation. But with the system, it would mean that your skin's gonna be super stinking cold or super stinking hot, just depending on many, many more factors. But then there are Pokemon that actually have ice on their body, like half of the Pokemon have razor sharp claws made of ice or even huge tusks made of ice. You get it. These things are pretty simple to explain, at least some of them are easy. Mamoswine's tusks are actually made of ice deposits that it gets while grazing, according to the Pokedex. Beartick's ice beard is just its breath freezing from the coldness outside, like real beards in the Arctic. And then, Sneasel. Sneasel makes things a bit tricky with its ice-cold claws. A single scratch from a Weavile's claws will get you frostbite. That's incredible! That means it's not only able to actually damage your skin with its sharp bits, but it's also so cold that it kills off the flesh near the cut. Actually, come to think of it, we haven't even talked about how ice actually hurts you. I mean, it's just cold. I mean, put a sweater on, boom, ice nullified. But in all seriousness, cold is actually incredibly dangerous. It's just that we don't normally see its effects on humans, as most of us live in regions where the air doesn't hurt your face. Did you know you can actually get burns from something too cold? It does the same damage that fire can do to your body if the object is cold enough. Even just holding dry ice or solid CO2 can cause you to get second degree burns. This is because the substance is so cold it actually damages your cells beyond self-repair. So they straight up die. When you get an ice burn, the water in the cells of your skin freeze, thus forming sharp ice crystals and expanding, which obviously damages the structure of your skin cells. Blood vessels near the skin also begin to constrict, meaning the flow of blood to the affected areas is reduced, causing further damage. Plus, this poor circulation can cause your affected body parts to become gangrenous and rot while still attached to you. All fire is gonna do is melt your skin off. Ice is gonna make you slowly die of a rotting arm still attached to you. Pretty crazy stuff, which is why Pokemon use it to fight each other. Heck, some of them even use it as armor. Wait, what, hey, wait. Oh, what, how, 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 how could an animal be able to wear ice? We just talked about how long-term exposure can cause burns. And well, it's because ice, your typical ice, is actually a really good insulator. Or at least, it's not the worst. It's not water. Liquid water. Liquid water is just terrible for it. It, like, steals your heart. It's almost as bad as cold concrete on your feet when you go into the garage to ask your dad if you could do the thing your mom said no to five seconds earlier, only to be asked if your mom okayed it. But back to ice's thermal insulation. Just imagine igloos. Our oh, lonely sand shrew. Super cute. Igloos keep the warmth inside despite being made of ice. 
This is particularly due to their icy exterior protecting the inside from the cold winds. But it's also because ice is terrible for thermal transfer. Instead of the ice absorbing the heat from the inside, it just sits there. And heat rises, so the igloo gets filled with warm air. And it's not that just building a dome of ice will keep you warm, you have to do the sunken tunnel thing and have a raised sleeping platform. All of this stuff makes it warm, but surprisingly, the ice doesn't make it colder. It actually will make it warmer by the simple trapping of the heat. So it's quite possible that a Pokémon like Avalug is actually warmer because of their icy shells trapping the warmth on the inside. Whereas a Pokémon like Beartick would have thick fur to create a warm layer of air between its skin and the outside world. But then we have Pokémon that are actually made of ice. Literally. Uh, there isn't really any science behind this one. Similarly to dragon and fairy type things. I'm pretty sure this is ice magic. I mean, sentient snowflakes and snowy trees. Come on. Magical creatures. But unlike dragon and fairy's magical inspiration, there really isn't a specific school of magic for this other than ice mancy, I guess. But that's just another form of arcane magic. However, if we look to Ice's effectiveness chart, we can see that it's one of the few things actually good against Dragon. Why is that? Well, obviously the main reason is game balancing. Gen 1 Dragons were pretty good, so they had to have some weakness, and there's that whole, like, magical fire versus magical ice, song of ice and fire, and ice dragons and fire dragons, and their rivals, and... It's cool. But I mean, if ice didn't show up, dragons would only be weak to dragon. And you remember, there were not a lot of dragons in Gen 1. Dragons are also masters of the elements by resisting all four base elements, the starters. But isn't ice just hard water? Well, yes and no. Ice is much more than just water. It's the cold. It's the inflexible opposite to water's fluidity. It's smooth without flowing. Dragon is passion and arcane ice is inflexible, cold, distant. A common ailment to reptiles everywhere. The cold is the ever-consuming fire of entropy, the eventual heat death of the universe that wise dragons are always keenly aware of. Plus, dragons' heat for battle is cooled by ice's... Uh... Well, the ice is cold. Also, dragons tend to be reptiles, which are cold-blooded. I mean, have you ever put an iguana in the freezer? They don't particularly appreciate it. So, while some ice Pokémon listen to science, at least in a science fiction sort of way, others, like Glalie or Vanillite, are more just ice elementals. That's a thing in fantasy. It's ice magic. They're like animated elements of ice. I mean, Reg Ice is straight up a golem made of ice. It's a world full of magical creatures, and this is where the video gets all hand wavy. This whole video series is gonna end with hand waviness because, well, it's all made up. How can I actually tell you how creatures could be made of ice? Come on. If I could do that, I'd do it. Stop the ice caps from melting. Yeah. Impidimp seems like the kind of Pokemon that Jesse is going to have. The useless, clumsy imp trying to listen to the demands of a dominant woman? It's quite the trope. But anyway, I love Impidimp. I love Morgrim, and Grimmsnarl is alright too, I guess. That is, of course, if I'm judging them entirely on looks alone. I'm just salty that this awesome color palette turned into... this? But funnily enough, it seemed like most people on the internet sort of had the opposite opinion. A lot of folks really didn't like Impidimp when it was, uh, sort of revealed. I mean, it's so gangly, and it has a ponytail that's just a single bat wing? Why does it only have one nostril? What is this mess? Is this really what we're getting for our first dark fairy type Pokemon? Heck, what even is this whole line? Well, 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 me a few seconds ago, I thought you'd never ask. These Pokémon have some amazing origins, and that is what we're going to talk about today on Noggin. So first things first, why the heck is it dark and fairy type? Well, the Japanese name gives us the biggest hint to its origin. Its name is Beroba, from Bero meaning tongue, and there's also Bero 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 Bero, which is the sound of licking very quickly, repeatedly. <laughs> And also, Beto Beto Ba is their equivalent of Peekaboo! And notably,
Notably, in pop culture, when someone plays a successful prank on someone, they will often do a face of sorts. And one common expression is the classic sticking out of the tongue. <laughs> mm. And just look at Impa Dimp. Is its tongue even able to fit in its mouth? But this makes perfect sense, as fairies are seen as tricksters and will deceive humans just for fun and amusement. But as for the dark side of this line, well, dark types also tend to be mean-spirited, evil even, and tricksters in their own right. Weavile is a great example here. They are based on a Japanese weasel yokai that looks for people to attack in a flash and cut them up a whole bunch, but then quickly patch up their wounds so the person wakes up and they're confused and in pain, but they're not dead. But peekaboo? Peekaboo! How does peekaboo fit into the name? A game that you play with babies where you reveal your face? Well, maybe it's partially inspired by a classical changeling, and not, not the new pop culture shapeshifter changeling, the old folklore of fairies stealing babies and replacing them with changelings as a fun trick. And as people slowly pick up on little things that are wrong here and there, the illusion slowly wears off and the changeling baby starts looking uglier and more inhuman as time passes. Ooh. Talk about the face reveal and quite the surprise. And the Pokedex mentions how these mon crave chaos and negative energy, stating, through its nose it sucks in the emanations produced by people and Pokemon when they feel annoyed. It thrives off of negative energy. It sneaks into people's homes, stealing things and feasting on the negative energy of the frustrated occupants. This is behavior that fits super well with the Fey, as they were fiendish, devilly pranksters and were blamed for almost anything negative happening. Fitting, because a bunch of fey were speculated to have been gods before Christianity steamrolled in and did that no god before me thing. So the gods and creatures of pre-Christian belief all became demonic monsters, which is why these fey Pokemon have mild demon looking features, but nothing super blatantly demonic. Now here's where things start getting deep and super cool. Let's look at Morgrim. He no longer is just a changeling, he's a goblin. And goblin means ugly fairy. Fitting for our friend here. But along with this, he also has had his colors split. Red top, green bottom, and he can manipulate his hair like Bayonetta. I'll get into that later. But for now, let's look at the shape of his hair. It's the biggest hint to his origin. Morgrim's hair spike is in the shape of a pole arm or a halberd. Is there a difference? No, no, that's not what this video is about. Morgrim's hair is a pole arm. Well, that's cool. I wonder if there's a kind of goblin famous for using these. It'd sure be great if said goblin were also famous for having red tops. Oh, hey, red caps. Red caps carry around pole arms and will die if the hats on their heads are not wet with blood. Because of this, they lure people into the woods, or at the very least, out of safety, and kill them to wet their hands with their blood. And the Pokedex entry for Morgrim shows us similar behavior. With sly cunning, it tries to lure people into the woods. Some believe it to have the power to make crops grow. So, huh, Morgrim is luring 10 year olds into the woods so it can use their blood as hair conditioner. So that's dark. As for the part about the crops, it's another possible reference to fey and goblins. As I've said, fey are the past gods. Gods who were prayed to like any other god, often for protection, i.e. Please don't eat me! And some Sometimes prayed to for blessings, like good weather or fruitful crops. And there are other goblins we can look at too, like hobgoblins and brownies. These guys are famous for being little hidden beings that hide inside your house, and they are blamed for things disappearing, things going wrong, or for your place suddenly being clean. Hobgoblins in particular are famous for this, and are the inspiration for things like Dobie from Harry Potter. If you keep them happy, then they would do chores for you in your house while you were sleeping. But they were also naked all the time, or at the very least were wearing raggedy rags. But then if you ever offered them clothes, they get offended and they run off. Or worse, they turn into a brownie. And this could be another reason why Impidimp doesn't have any hair, because he's a little naked brownie. But as for brownies, they do act just like Impidimp. They steal things and prank the owners of a home, just like we saw in its Pokedex entries. But back to Morgrim. Let's break its name down. It consists of Morg and Grim. Grim could be from Gremlin. Fey creatures that popped up during and after the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, I didn't realize that gremlins were such a recent thing in the grand scheme of things. They were beings who were blamed for things like failing machines and engines, which is why in pop culture today you sometimes see gremlins and goblins with, you know, steampunky wrenches and engines and stuff. 
That's neat. Grimm is also Old English and Old German for to anger or enrage. And well, insert impotent Pokedex entries here again. Then morgue could be from morgue, a place where you send dead bodies. But I'm more inclined to believe that it's a reference to Morgan Le Fay. Who is Morgan Le Fay? Morgan Le Fay is a famous witch from the Tales of the King Arthur mythos. She was famous for using fae, fairies, and fairy magic to mess with King Arthur and his gang. One of the most famous tricks she pulled on King Arthur was the famous story of the Green Knight. A large, bulking Green Knight walks into the dining hall of King Arthur while holding an axe, and he offers a game to the king. The knight bows down on his hands and knees, and King Arthur takes a swing at his neck. Then, exactly one year later, it will be the knight's turn to do the same to Arthur. Folklore, am I right? <laughs> Uh, but check out Morgrim's Pokedex entry. When it gets down on all fours as if to beg for forgiveness, it is trying to lure opponents in so that it can stab them with its spear-like hair. That sounds sort of like the Green Knight, getting down on all fours as a trick. Hmm. Also, Morgrim has a green bottom, and its hair being a polearm, which is a spear mixed with an axe, like the Green Knight's axe, it just fits perfectly, especially since this Green Knight is speculated to be a god turned fae. Fitting, since our little buddy here can make crops grow. And speaking of a big green knight, Grimmsnarl. Grimmsnarl has some weird traits, like three fingers, hair everywhere, ugly. But we can look at the inspirations all over to get an idea here. Impidimp is a changeling, and Morgrim is the child changeling hitting puberty and running into the woods to live with its fellow fae. So then, Grimmsnarl is the fully grown fae, and there is actually a creature that fits with this perfectly. The Troll. Works out great too, since trolls are the most famous fae beasts to swap babies with changelings. And they are often described as hairy folk that live in the woods, and they too have ties to witches. Early pagan Norse settlers in places like Orkney and Shetland used the word troll to describe all mystical creatures, or mystical magic-y folk. So troll could fit anything from witches, to your stereotypical trolls, to fae and imps, and much, much more. Later on, though, it did start becoming more specific for the large, hairy people that lived in the woods, which primarily inspired Grimmsnarl. But you can also see the witch inspiration in its facial features. The long nose and green skin, it's your stereotypical Hollywood Halloween witch look. But as for trolls, they were extremely powerful, and people used to blame landmarks on trolls throwing massive stones around. And similarly, Grimmsnarl is strong, as it uses the hair all over its body as muscles. The Pokedex says, with the hair wrapped around its body helping to enhance its muscles, this Pokemon can overwhelm even the champ. Woo! That's strong! Machamp is famous for its strength. I mean, it can send things flying over the horizon. Grimmsnarl can overwhelm that. Well, I suppose that's fitting, considering the massive strength of trolls. And looking closer, even its fingers point to trolls in pop culture because of things like World of Warcraft. Trolls now, stereotypically, have three fingers, just like Grimmsnarl on the whole line. Also, some say trolls slowly turn to stone in the sunlight if they are uncovered, and Grimmsnarl covers itself up with its hair. But, but, speaking of, speaking of the hair, what, what, what's with the whole controlling the hair thing? Uh, Grimmsnarl and Morgrim can both control their hair. What, what's up with that? And does that have any connection to Bayonetta? Well, it turns out the answer is yes. It is a direct reference to olden occult beliefs. Witches contain their power in their hair, which is one of the many reasons witches were typically women, because they have longer hair. The hair holds the magic and the strength. Hair is used in potions and spells, which is why back in the Middle Ages and even before then, it was a common practice to either burn or bury your hair after a haircut. That way, witches can't take it and become more powerful. So I guess on top of explaining Grimmsnarl here, I've also explained why Bayonetta's hair powers are the thing that they are. She's an umbral witch. She controls hair because hair is magic and hair has all of her power in it. All of these witch references do seem a bit odd though, considering Grimmsnarl is a male-only Pokemon, but then again, witch's hair has its strength typically in magic, not in physical power. So I guess by making the magical witch hair more masculine, it becomes muscles. Err. 
It's a theory. But we're still not quite done, as there's still one more form to this line. Gigantamaxed Grim Snarl. Yeah, even the G-Max form has ties to Fae, specifically a particular goblin. G-Maxed Grim Snarl stands more upright and is significantly taller, obviously. But it also gains a unique trait. It gains its unique G-move called G-Snooze, which happens to perfectly reference Finn McCool of old Irish myth. Finn McCool had to fight off a fiery goblin named Ian McMigna, who was also a giant fey prince. The perfect thing to base a G-Maxed Grimmsnarl on already. But on top of this, this goblin had a magical harp that it would use to cause all of those listening to it to fall asleep. Just like G-Maxed Grimmsnarl's unique G-move. And while asleep, it would just, you know, burn their entire town to the ground every single year. But why? Well, revenge. And because it's funny. Heh. <laughs> Typical fey goblin stuff. So ultimately, I was very surprised to learn how deep these Pokemon really were. Much more than just imps and goblins. <laughs> and that's just awesome. Pokemon has had a neato little feature for a while. Fossil Pokemon. You find some fossils, bring them to some Jurassic Park scientists, and boom! Dinosaur Pokemon. Or a plant thing that one time. But ancient Pokemon nonetheless. And then Pokemon Sword and Shield went and ruined! I mean, had a neat, fun idea thing that has to do with it all. But I mean, do you see these? Oh boy, oh boy, is Pokemon becoming Digimon now? Is this, is this Game Freak testing out the waters on Pokemon Fusion? Is that the next gen's gimmick? If this does well and is popular? We all know Dynamax is already dead in the water. But here's where things actually legitimately get way cool. As per usual, Game Freak does an a job on lore and origins for their designs and such. Like, it's just so good that it almost makes up for the lack of battle animations. But this whole dinosaur mix-up that's going on here is a perfect reflection of the Bone Wars. Oh yeah, there's a thing called the Bone Wars. Honestly, I wouldn't have even thought that paleontology was filled with so much drama. Drama that I'm going to get into right after the intro. Back in ye olden days of the late 1800s to mid 1900s, paleontology was full of chaos. Full of people who didn't know what we now know about dinosaurs and had not yet invented things like CAT scans and computer simulations. All they had were shovels and guessing. But throughout this entire time period in Western civilization, and especially in the UK, a vast amount of resources were put into research about our past and into our future. When it came to learning about our history and when it came to inventing things for the future, well, times were crazy, to say the least. I mean, England just had their first dog show. We were figuring out genetics. But as for paleontology, the first dinosaur fossils were discovered by British fossil hunter William Buckland in 1819, and science basically imploded. And paleontologists and fossil hunters all around the kingdom began exploring the world, all to be the next person to find a dinosaur. Slowly but surely, demystifying our distant past. But here's a problem. All these digs and expeditions, they cost a lot of doubloons, or whatever the British used, I don't know, rupees. But rich people and wealthy groups of folk liked fossils, they were cool, and would do really good in museums, which were all the rage at the time. So they funded a lot of digs and expeditions. But, well, this meant that the paleontologists and fossil hunters had higher-ups, and those higher-ups well, they needed results, and these results were often wanted quickly. They didn't care as much about the things that they should have cared about, like accuracy, scientific integrity, or ethics. Hmm. So that's how we ended up with things like a T-Rex skull getting sawed just in half so that we could see what the inside looked like. And more importantly, for our current topic, dinosaur heads, or arms, or whatever, were getting put onto dinosaurs of different species. <laughs> I mean, there were just so many, just loads upon heaps upon piles of general mix-ups too. One of my favorite examples is the Iguanodon. Originally, they thought they had a horn, like an iguana, hence the name. And I mean, you can't really blame them. There's this pointy looking bone and there's no obvious place for it. So, uh, horn, it's a horn. But then some guy later, years later was all, 
But what if it's a thumb? And it turns out that that bone fit there perfectly. And a thumb it was. But as for total mix-ups, one of the most well-known instances of this was with the first restoration of the sauropod, or for the common folk like me, the brontosaurus. Which, tangential fun fact, was just recently discovered. Even though you already thought it existed, but no, you were wrong. Uh, until now, anyway, or recently, because now you're right. You see, there was this guy named O.C. Marsh. He is well known for his many, many excavations and discoveries. In fact, he discovered the Bronto. The old one. But, you see, the old one didn't really exist because... While Marsh was working on the restoration of the Brontosaurus, they had a hard time finding its skull. So he just decided to prop, plop, just ploop, plip, plop, Brachiosaurus skull onto the Brontosaurus skeleton body because eh, it's basically the same thing, right? Except in this case, they really, really weren't. And he had the audacity to not even tell anyone this fact for a good long while, so by the time he did come out, the general public already had formed an image of this dinosaur that didn't actually exist. <laughs> the scientific community quickly changed, but the general public, uh, well, not so much. Heck, even in Jurassic Park, there were incorrect dinos, but... What are you gonna do? The damage has been lasting for forever. I mean, <laughs> velociraptors the size of humans? Ha! <laughs> Hilarious. And then there's the marine elasmosaurus. They put the head on the end of the tail instead of its neck. <laughs> Just like Dracovish. It's, it's the wrong head on top of that, but it's on the end of a tail instead of a neck. <sighs> and then another famous example is when a Diplodocus head was actually an Apatosaurus head, and so they switched it out with a Camarasaurus head, and oh! Oh! <sighs> Things like this happened very often with sauropods because of the way their head and necks were. Their heads were easily detached, disconnected from their bodies after they died, and they would either roll away or be taken away by predators. So sauropod heads are actually extremely rare amongst dinosaur fossils. The more you know. But all of this is just to say that the Galarian fossils, especially the vish part of the names and all that, are great. It's poking fun at the mixing up of fossils, especially heads that definitely didn't fit with the rest of the body. But I mean, can you really blame them? I mean, most dinosaur skulls and skeletons actually change pretty drastically as the dinosaur ages. Meaning, at times, the opposite problem actually happened. Rather than taking a bunch of different species and mashing them into one, Sometimes they would find a bunch of the same species and claim there were three or four different ones, when actually it was just one, but at different stages of life. So needless to say, back in the day, it was fairly difficult to actually figure out an animal based on just rocks. But the actual bone wars didn't help. Oh yeah, that was the hook. I gotta, I gotta explain the bone wars. The bone wars! Two famous paleontologists, that O.C. Marsh guy I mentioned, as well as E.D. Cope, were the biggest names in paleontology, and they had some steep competition. They wanted to discover and name as many dinosaurs as they could. It was a contest, and since they had a load of money, they could hire on help to do things, such as spy on the other guy, throw rocks to literally start fights, and destroy each other's fossils, mess up labels to confuse things for each other, and much, much more. And there were some guys, like David Baldwin, who actually played both sides. He just didn't let the other guy know that he was doing stuff for the other guy, too. Smart man, really. And because they're trying to rush discover all these things, they started making more and more mistakes, and they began publishing paper after paper with problem after problem, and they started attacking each other in their papers too, eventually to the point where their papers were more pointing at the other guy saying he's wrong, rather than bringing in more interesting information. So a load of scientific journals actually stopped publishing them. <laughs> Egad. They just got so careless. Speaking of which, the scientist that makes these fossil Pokemon for you? Her name is Kara Liss. Careless? Kara Liss? Ha. Huh. And then all these messed up dinosaur fossils wound up getting models made and shown off at the Crystal Palace in London throughout the 1850s. At the time, it was a crazy revelation. The world's first dinosaur statue exhibition. But looking back, it's, uh, almost entirely wrong. Again, though, you can't really blame them. 
But these bone wars, this competition, did cause them to jumpstart paleontology, and they discovered over 130 species of dinosaur, which is pretty crazy considering the tech they had to work with. But their story is just one possible origin for these Pokemon. There is more. The fossil mix-up mechanic could also be a sort of parody on things like the Indominus Rex from Jurassic World, which is the body of a classic Tyrannosaurus Rex, and parts of the head of the Abelosaur, and horns made of genetic material from the Carnotaurus and Majongarosaurus Rugatops. I can say words, but also the Gigantosaurus. It's just a big mishmash of dinosaurs. And of course, there's also the fact that the canonical reason why the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies look the way they do is because they use frog DNA to bring the dinosaurs to life. And that Hammond wanted the dinos they created to be as scary and interesting as possible. And they didn't feel like scientifically accurate dinosaurs would do that, even though these lead scientists wanted them to be as paleontologically sound as possible. But that didn't happen, now did it? But what's also really cool about these Pokemon is that their Pokedex entries also hammer home that they are poking fun at how early paleontology saw dinosaurs. Slow, fat, and reptilian. Oh yeah, in case you've been hiding under a rock that only had old school dinosaur information, dinosaurs aren't much like most reptiles at all. They're significantly closer to birds than to modern reptiles, if anything. Yeah, even sauropods, aka long necks. They had bird-like lungs and very light bones. They were fairly fast too, and were fairly active, with tails much higher up than media normally portrays them. And because of that, they were able to run much quicker than media typically portrays them. They're much less fat and slow. And then you know, there's the whole feathers on the theropods. You can't forget those feathers. Dracozolt is poking fun at how monoraptorians are often made to have arms way too small for them. Or perhaps it's poking fun at how fast they are often sighted to run with those absolutely gargantuan legs in proportion to the rest of them. Also, that butt of it is possibly based on the Draconis family. Their skulls are always misorganized, and many of them have extremely different skulls while they are growing, so if you think about it, Draco's ult might actually be correct, except these are two pieces in different stages of dinosaur development. Arctozolts could be poking fun at the fact that we used to think that sauropods would have to have lived most of their lives half-submerged in water, like marshes and lakes, because how else would they be able to support their gargantuan bodies? <laughs> well, it turns out that it's by eating a large metric of food, having lungs that push oxygen throughout their bodies while inhaling and exhaling, and by having really, really light bones and good support systems for their necks, but... <laughs> That's not the point here. The preserving food with the ice on its body part of the dex entry is definitely making fun of how paleontologists used to theorize that sauropods would eat a bunch all at once and then go into a small hibernative state to process all the food instead of our current understanding, which is that they spend most of their time standing still and just moving their neck in a zigzag to eat off of the trees nearest them. Dracovish is also making fun of our old belief that a lot of the bigger dinos, sauropods especially, would have to have lived semi-aquatic lives. And the 40 miles an hour thing could be poking fun at how ridiculously fast the dang T-Rex in Jurassic Park was. T-Rexes definitely could not keep up with a speeding jeep. Their speed was likely between 10 and 25 miles per hour. There was no danger in that scene at all if the dinosaur was accurate, but it wasn't. Jurassic Park's just ruining everything. <sighs> but, throughout all of their dex entries, there are two times it mentions, but it went extinct because... blank. And that's harkening back to the old-fashioned and still all-too-common idea that the dinosaurs went extinct because they were bad at what they did. That's not really true. In reality, they went extinct because of drastic changes to the geography and climate that they couldn't adapt to quick enough. Not that there's much adapting you can do when the problem is that you're dying because the air is suddenly made of stuff that you can't breathe, or because the land is covered in ash again because of just billions of exploding volcanoes, I may be exaggerating. And there was also a meteor that one time. I don't know if you heard, but the meteor theory is basically confirmed now. It's cool. The Gulf of Mexico is where death came to all once before, and we're on the path to it happening again. But yeah!
most dinosaurs were the perfect machine in their own niche. A lot of people think that they were these great lumbering things with sprawled out legs and shiny teeth. But a lot of people would be surprised to learn that most dinosaurs had molars and beaks. Evolution isn't just Mother Nature throwing things together until they work. We aren't more evolved than the dinosaurs, or more superior to them. We just have tools that let us win. It's your noggin. Ultimately, what I'm saying is, these Pokémon shouldn't exist. And are hashtag not my fossil mon. I mean, I love the idea of them, and they should totally exist, but like... They aren't real? It's like surgically combining a penguin and an eagle, like... You shouldn't do that, it shouldn't exist. But I guess it'd be cool if it did. It's a peagle. An eguin. But now here comes a fun bit. What are these pieces? Well, this, which is basically fish, seems to be from the Dunkelosteus, a water-dwelling creature that had an incredibly thick skull. Ultimately though, it's just an ancient fish that lived in the oceans. As interesting as you may find that, uh... Let's move on. Draco appears to be based off of the Draconis genus, or perhaps other small mana raptors. However, the family is rather large and contains many different dinosaurs, but the one we're looking at here would be the common Pachycephalosaurus. Again, it's way cooler sounding than what it actually is. In fact, interestingly enough, this dinosaur already has a Pokemon based off of it, Rampardos. It's the same technical genus. However, this one may or may not have had the hard skull plate. However, this specific dino named Draco Rex Hogwartus, it's actually what it's named, is slightly different, with a much smaller body and no hard skull plate. Though this dinosaur is still part of the hardhead family. However, all of these dinosaurs had a common thing in common, the ability to run rather fast in a straight line, which the Pokedex mentions. So yeah, that's Draco. Also, I feel like I gotta justify my thoughts here. Most fan art recreations of the Draco body make it out to be a Stegosaurus, which is very possible. I might even be leaning more towards it, but Pokemon pull from all over and are rarely just one thing. And I mean, we don't have a Stegosaurus Pokemon yet, and it's got the big spiky plates and all. But the reason I'm thinking it has these Monoraptorian traits is due to the naming. First of all, in every language it references dragons, and it's dragon type. And like I said, there's a whole genus of dinosaurs named Draco or Draconis. And while not as intense, they did also have spikes. Also notably, they had sharp claws like this, unlike the somewhat elephantish feet that Stegosaurus had. Also, Draco's out holds its tail less like actual Stegos and more like those mana raptors. But uh, then again, these Pokemon are all based on dinosaur inaccuracies and mix-ups. So, the Stego thing could still very much be the case. Now, Arcto is a little different, as it's not actually a dinosaur. It seems to be based off of some sort of prehistoric mammal, perhaps a walrus or seal. And while there were huge walruses in the prehistoric seas, there really isn't anything else for us to go off of. But, I mean, Arcto means Arctic. Come on. But I mean, in the case of Arctozolt, this particular body structure just fits ancient walruses more than the other, more dinosaur contenders. We could look at the Mosasaur, or even the Ichthyosaur. I mean, they've got the right direction for the tail, but just not the length. That's more like the walrus tail. But I mean, these two creatures were flippered marine prehistoric dinosaurs that are actually just as much not dinosaurs as the walrus. What's strange though is that the fossil that gives you Arcto is called the Dino Fossil, and it's the least dino of the bunch. So either, this is another joke, I mean, these Bone Wars guys that I was talking about, at one point they confused a bison skeleton for a fossil. <laughs> Jeez. But if it's not that kind of joke, then maybe there is something more to it. After all, to be a dinosaur, all you need is the proper hind limbs that act in a way that is classified in the group dino. And we see that this body actually is presented in two ways. A fish and a biped creature. Neither of which really show the proper body mechanics to let me, without a doubt, put it in the dinosaur category. Being a dino has to do with the hip specifically, and this thing waddles, or flops, as if its hip was super wrong. So it's possible that in both instances they put it super backwards and upside down so it has to work around that, but, or it's just actually not a dinosaur. But this again, 
goes into an old time paleontology parody thingy, as back in the day it was quite common for anything from prehistory to be called a dinosaur, even though most of them are not at all, but hey, whatever. And finally, we have the best one, Zolt, the cute little raptor head. It's yellow, which we all know means it's electric. Also, it's a little dinosaur Pikachu. It's so cute. And so, and so, so sad with the arctic body. Oh, I feel so bad for bringing this thing into existence. It's like, imagine if you gave birth and your baby has a nerve condition that means they are always experiencing the maximum amount of agony possible. It feels so bad. Why does it live? Zolt appears to be based on raptors in general, though particularly the Paravians. Small, short arms, biggish feathers on the arms, speedy for their size, adorable little predators that we thought looked more like this. But it turns out this is more accurate. <laughs> Cute. And do you want to know why these guys had feathers? Well, to help them balance while running super fast. Similarly to how ostriches run and use their wings to stabilize themselves while running. Honestly, ostriches aren't much different from dinosaurs. But despite the feathers, we do know that these things couldn't fly. Again, just like the ostrich. The things that determine if you can fly is your wingspan and of course, your ability to flap with the right strength. And with such a tiny, tiny front breastbone, most raptors, especially this Zolt character, would never be able to generate the power needed to flap its wings to fly. Not that that matters to a lot of bird Pokemon, but whatever. So all in all, I think that this gimmick is a good nod to real paleontology history. I just wish we could get the other halves of these dinos so that we know what they actually look like as a whole. Maybe we'll get them in the next games. But the current halves we have will be cut in the next games, so you, no one no one gets a whole one. They're gonna do that. Calling it now. I mean, it's pretty cool and interesting, but uh, also... And now about this Kellerex. Rex, Latin for king, and Kellex, which in zoology is a cup-like cavity or structure. So, the way it's holding its crown bush ball thing. Also, maybe it has oryx in the name, which is a thing. It's this thing. Maybe. Its antlers are shaped similar to those of reindeer in the tundra of northern Europe, as in the four-way split. But if you then combined that with the straight and narrow antlers of the Tibetan red deer, which live in the mountains and tundra of Tibet. And, I mean, it has Tibetan Buddhist prayer beads for a necklace that I assume are actually berries. Just like the big berry crown. Maybe. It's grass type. But what's with the Triforces on the beads? Well, the Triforce symbol was originally the symbol of the Hojo clan in Japan, which formed Japan's first shogunate. You know, so they were the ruling government and all. And on top of being all high and powerful, the Hojo clan were also known for fostering Buddhism in Japan. So we've kind of gone full circle with the whole Buddhist thing and the powerful king thing. But like, while it's got the face and antlers that work for a deer, it's got the body of a rabbit? And these do kind of look like rabbit ears, I guess. It just seems odd that you'd have a white rabbit starter and then a white rabbit legendary in the same game. But whatever. Snowshoe and Swedish hares are easy species to point to. There's also the woolly hare in Tibet. And come to think of it, the moon has a lot to do with supernatural powers like psychic energy and such. And Chinese myth references the moon rabbit all the time. Specifically, there's a Buddhist white rabbit which concocts the elixir of life, which grants immortality and cures all ailments. Which also just happens to be the ultimate goal in alchemy. And remember, Kellex, a cup-like structure. Could this Pokémon perhaps be a Poké personification of the Holy Grail? Since the main legendaries reference King Arthur a bunch and all. Plus, while there are of course many different interpretations of it, many believed that through the use of the Holy Grail, one could achieve immortality. And all these references to immortality work well, as this Pokémon basically is too. According to the website, it once ruled the entire Galar region in ancient times. Meaning, it's existed since ancient times. Like most legendary Pokémon, but still. And all these rabbit and deer parts fall together nicely too because of the jackalope. But jackalopes are American. But if you go back in time further, like to medieval Europe, there's the Wolpertinger. A rabbit-deer hybrid with wings. And well, 
Deerish rabbit with cape-like wings that can levitate? There you go! Plus, Wolpertingers are immortal! Anyway, we'll likely have more details in a later video all about it, so... That's that for now. And why is the dojo master named Mustard? Well, I googled it. And Robert Mustard was born in Canada, part of the British Empire, and traveled the world to become a Kung Fu Master instructor, and teaches it in various places around the Western world. And here he is in the UK. Which he does often. I have no idea if this is actually where the name comes from, but... Maybe. Anyway, more details in later videos. I'm excited about the new Mystery Dungeon too. It's about time we got one, though I am a bit let down that it's a remake, and that it's swapping the expressive sprites for just generic models. But you know, my dreams will never come true, and I'm already over it. Thanks for watching. Do you have anything to add? What are your thoughts? Let me know down below, and never stop using your noggin. Thank you.